Good morning. I declare open this hearing of the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee for the additional estimates. The Senate has referred to the committee the particulars of proposed expenditure for 21-22 for the portfolios of Home Affairs and the Attorney-General and other related documents. These are additional estimates proceedings and the outcomes to be heard during today's estimates are from the Attorney-General's portfolio. The committee has set Friday the 25th of March 2022 as the date by which answers to questions on notice are to be returned. The committee has also decided that written questions on notice should be provided to the Secretariat by 5pm on Friday the 25th of February 2022. Understanding Order 26, the committee must take all evidence in public session. This includes answers to questions on notice. I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. It is also a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. Officers and senators are familiar with the rules of the Senate governing estimates hearings. If you need assistance, the Secretariat has copies of the rules. The Senate, by resolution in 1999, endorsed the following test of relevance of questions at estimates hearings. Any questions going to the operations or financial positions of the departments and agencies which are seeking funds in the estimates are relevant questions for the purpose of estimates hearings. I remind officers that the Senate has resolved that there are no areas in connection with the expenditure of public funds where any person has a discretion to withhold details or explanations from the Parliament or its committees unless the Parliament has expressly provided otherwise. The Senate has also resolved that an officer of a Department of the Commonwealth shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy and shall be given reasonable opportunity to refer questions asked of the officer to superior officers or to a minister. This resolution prohibits only questions asking for opinions on matters of policy and does not preclude questions asking for explanations of policies or factual questions about when and how policies were adopted. I particularly draw the attention of witnesses to an order of the Senate of the 13th of May 2009, specifying the process by which a claim of public interest immunity should be raised. Witnesses are specifically reminded that a, Senate, that a statement that information or a document is confidential or consists of advice to government is not a statement which meets the requirements of the 2009 order. Instead, witnesses are required to provide some specific indication of the harm to the public interest which could result from the disclosure of the information or the document. A reminder, mobile phones should be switched off or turned to silent mode. Senators, departments and agencies have been provided with advice on the arrangements in place to ensure the additional estimates 21-22 hearings are conducted safely. This guidance is also available from the Secretariat. The committee appreciates the cooperation of all attendees in adhering to these COVID safe arrangements. In order to comply with social distancing requirements, senators and the secretariat may use their electronic devices to communicate with one another during the hearing. We ask witnesses' forbearance to do so and apologise in advance for any discourtesy. Officers called upon for the first time to answer a question should state their full name and position for the Hansard record, and witnesses should speak clearly into the microphones. I, I also wish to add that consistent with the practice of this committee, questions which may involve a danger of prejudice to proceedings before a court will be ruled out of order. It is imperative that the decisions of courts are not prejudged either by senators or by witnesses before the committee, and this convention reflects the committee's respect for the rule of law, the presumption of innocence and the independence of judicial proceedings. Uh, this practice is consistent with the discussion of the Subjudice Convention in Odges pages 259 to 266 and 536 to 537. I now welcome the Attorney General, Senator the Honourable Michaelia Cash. Welcome, Attorney. Would you like to make an opening That's statement? Fine, 
I now call officers from the Attorney General's Department in relation to cross-portfolio, corporate and general matters. Ms Jones, good morning. Would you like to make an opening statement before we go to questions? Thank you, Chair. No opening statement. I just wanted to note um, Senator Carr uh, wrote to me yesterday requesting some information to present before the committee. We're in the process of finalising, gathering that information, and I hope to be able to table that letter uh, due the course of the morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms Jones. Uh, we will no now go to questions from senators, and I give the call to Labor senators and to Senator Watt. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending today. Can I just begin with some questions about the announcement yesterday that the sexual harassment claim against former High Court Judge Dyson Hayden has been settled? Sure. And just by way of background, uh, obviously, the events leading to this included an investigation by Dr Vivian Tom, who found that Dyson Hayden, former uh, High Court judge, had sexually harassed six complainants. Yesterday, the lawyers for three of the women announced that their cases against the Commonwealth had now been settled. And, Minister, I noted that you put out a press release um, to the same effect. Um, this is obviously a deeply disturbing uh, situation for the women involved, and I think for many women in many workplaces. Um, and I'm sure we all want to see workplaces made safer for women, and these kind of events just should not occur, especially in our nation's courts. And before I ask some questions, I just want to again put on record and acknowledge the bravery of the women who did speak out. Um, that is a difficult and challenging thing to do. Um, and I also want to congratulate Chief Justice Susan Kiefel for the compassionate and forthright way in which she's dealt with these difficult um, circumstances. Um, Minister, can I start with you? Are you aware whether, is this the first settlement that has occurred in Australia involving a sexual harassment claim against a federal judge? I would need to refer that to the department. Do we have someone at the table, Secretary, who's able to answer that question? Um, attorney, I'll, I'll just check whether um, Ms Parani uh, has that information. If not, we can if take not, it on notice. We'll, we'll take it on notice for you if we, we're unable to provide the information. OK. I, I saw a um, claim to that effect in some media coverage yesterday, so I just was interested in checking that. And uh, which arm of government actually paid the settlement? Was it the department? Was it the High Court? Was it who, who was it? We'll get Ms Pirani to answer those questions for you. Uh, Tony Pirani, First Assistant Secretary, Legal Services Pol Policy Division. Uh, Senator Comcover, so Department of Finance, um, Comcover ran that matter on behalf of the Commonwealth. Right. On behalf of the, so the, the Commonwealth was the respondent as opposed to a particular department or the High Court of Australia as the Commonwealth as a whole. That's yep. correct, Senator. Yep. Um, how much in aggregate was paid under this settlement? I don't have that figure, um, Senator. That is a question you probably best addressed to Comcover, who are the entity responsible for running the matter. You must know, Minister. My understanding is that, well, in the first instance, Senator Watt, it would be highly inappropriate for me uh, to discuss or reveal such information. Um, I, I will not be detailing the settlement amount. Um, that information will remain between the Commonwealth and the claimants. Um, this has been the commonly accepted approach among governments of both persuasions. Um, I'm not asking to know, there were, there were three women as I understand it, who settled their claims. I'm certainly not asking to know the individual amounts that they were paid. That would clearly be a breach of their privacy. But I do think if public funds are being used here, it's appropriate to ask what the aggregate amount is that the Commonwealth has paid. Uh, well, again, um, I've answered that question in relation to any further information that may or may not be able to be provided, uh, Senator Watt, I will take that on notice for you. Why do you think that the public doesn't have a right to know, in aggregate, 
how much has been paid to uh, settle a sexual harassment claim against Chair. a High Court judge. I've provided an answer to Senator Watts' questions and I've said any further information that I am or am not able to provide, I will take on notice for Senator Watt. Is it correct that the settlement agreements with each woman included a non-disclosure agreement preventing disclosure of the amounts of compensation involved? I will refer to Ms Pirani for you. Um, my understanding that is correct, Senator. Right. So, S Senator, if I, if I could help, now, in terms of the um, uh, agreements, uh, they, the, the settlement uh, and the um, issues uh, negotiated in there, uh, in this instance, uh, they certainly allowed for um, discussion around the nature of the conduct uh, and the details. Uh, those issues were not subject to non-disclosure, and that was through agreement with the parties. And the, the confidentiality obligations were um, negotiated with the parties. So uh, on, on that basis, uh, in terms of n not being able to provide information about the, uh, the amount, uh, that was subject to the discussions and the final form of the agreement with the parties. So is it only the amount paid that is not able to be disclosed under that agreement? The, 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 Correct, and, and I think um, you'll see from the um, media release that was made by um, the uh, attorneys representing uh, the parties. Um, who asked for these? Who asked for the non-disclosure agreement, and in particular, the uh, non-disclosure of the compensation amount? Was uh, it the Commonwealth or the women who had been harassed? I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. I, I don't know the answer to that. Minister? Ms. Jo no, I don't have the answer to that as well. But in terms of a settlement deed being, I mean, you're a lawyer, Senator, what being governed by confidentiality obligations um, is not unusual, obviously. Um, in terms of the confidentiality obligations, they reflect the requirements of the directions and the standard position, as I've already stated, that is taken by the Commonwealth, regardless of who is in office at a particular uh, point in time. But the point that the Secretary makes um, is the correct one. Um, the confidentiality obligations under the settlement deeds do not prevent the claimants from making public statements in relation to their experiences and other aspects of the claim. Okay. The reason uh, I ask is that there's a, I don't know if you've seen it, there was an article published late yesterday, I've got copies of it here, in the Sydney Morning Herald uh, by Jacqueline Maley which says the amount of the settlement cannot be disclosed under the terms of the non-disclosure agreement with the Commonwealth, but it is believed to be a large sum the women are very happy with. At the behest of the Commonwealth, the women signed a non-disclosure agreement agreeing to keep the amount secret. So is that article correct? Was it at the behest of the Commonwealth that the amount of compensation paid has been kept secret? Well, again, Senator Watt, you are a lawyer and you would know that it would be inappropriate uh, to refer to any discussions that took place between the parties. Um, I have provided you with answers to questions to the extent that I am able to. Any further information uh, that I am or am not able to provide, I will take on notice for you. Well, I don't know how it was that Ms Maley um, found this out, but it seems that someone is talking about the fact that it was the Commonwealth who insisted on the non-disclosure agreement, not the victims of Dyson Hayden's sexual harassment. Is that true? Uh, well, again, I haven't seen the article by Ms Maley. Well, it's merely an article that has been reported by a journalist uh, in the press. And again, uh, parties negotiate settlements. Uh, parties negotiate confidentiality obligations. This is subject to a deed of settlement that has been signed off between all parties. And again, Senator Watt, um, I am able to provide you with the information that I have to date, but anything further I would need to take on notice for you. What possible reason under the standing orders do you have for not informing the public about the amount of money they have had to fork out in compensation for the sexual harassment of a 
High Court judge. Uh, well, again, Chair, what I've stated is I've taken you that on notice, that on notice in respect of any further information that I may or may not be able to provide. No, no. My question was what possible reason do you have for withholding this information under the standing orders? Are you uh, claiming a public interest immunity? No, I've basically said I will take that on notice, Senator Watt. Chair, I've been quite specific in my answer. You're taking on notice any why further you information can't say? that I can provide to you. I know you've done. I know you've taken on notice the amount that was paid. My question is, what is your reason for withholding this information from this committee? What and I've how do you how do you justify that under the standing uh, orders? Chair, and what I've said is, I will take that on notice. The answer to the question in relation to the settlement, I will take on notice. I've advised you that. I've, asked, that, I've asked the question three times now. I'll give it a fourth go. S Senator Watt, can I just um, ask you to pause there? The, the attorney has indicated that she has taken your question on notice. Uh, it's not open to you to continue to ask the same question. Well, could, I, could I invite yeah, you to ask not another open question? To, you to decide which questions I ask with respect. Excuse me, Senator Watt. It's a breach of the standing orders to reflect on any member or senator, including the chair. Well, I didn't. Do, excuse me, Senator Watt. I'm just going to ask. I'm just going to make it very clear here. I did not indicate to you the questions that you should ask. I simply reminded you of the rule that once a question has been taken on notice, it's not open to you to continue to ask the same question. Could you please move to your next question? Senator Watt, it really probably is the questions that you were directly wanting the information to is probably better put to ComCover. They were actually the people at the settlement. So you're doing the hospital pass to them? No, no, not at all. The you're claim. the Attorney General. It's an agency under your control you with that where this sexual harassment that occurred. I'm able to to date, Chair. I've said Senator any other Watt, information. Please allow, please I was trying to be helpful to Senator Watt in saying ComCover may be able to give you further information that I'm unable to. Minister, are you aware of what Commissioner Kate Jenkins had to say about non-disclosure agreements in her Respect at Work report? Uh, you would have to. I, I, I understand there was comments made, but Senator Watt, I don't have them at hand. Okay, so in her Respect at Work report, Commissioner Jenkins discussed the problems that can arise from the use of non-disclosure agreements in the context of workplace sexual harassment claims. And what she wrote at page 647, or sorry, what she concluded at page 653 was that the Commission is of the view that better guidance is urgently needed on the use of NDAs in workplace sexual harassment matters, especially because of the risks that they may rely on clauses that are contrary to public policy principles. They may enable harassers to escape without appropriate penalty and also engage in further sexual harassment, and power imbalances or unfair bargaining processes have been used to the complainant's disadvantage. If it is the case, as has been reported, that it was the Commonwealth who insisted on this non-disclosure agreement, isn't the Morrison government acting directly contradictory to the report of Commissioner Jenkins by using power imbalances or unfair bargaining processes to keep these victims silent? Uh, no, Senator Watt, you've actually misunderstood what uh, Ms Jenkins was referring to when she made those recommendations. Uh, Ms Jenkins was actually referring to um, the recommendations were directly related to stopping claimants from the discussing their experiences uh, or the allegations that have been made against them. And as you'd be aware in the statements that have been issued uh, and certainly in what you yourself have referred to, the confidentiality obligations under the settlement deeds do not prevent the claimants from making public statements in relation to their experiences and other aspects of their claim. Uh, so, Senator Wrong, you are completely wrong. Well, I'll check uh, thanks Commissioner very much, Jenkins' Senator report and see We have gone correct. over your time, so I now, uh, as per our practice, we are sharing the call in 10-minute blocks, and I now give the call to Senator Van. Thank you very kindly, Chair. Um, can I ask some questions about the Corporation's Amendment Improving Outcomes for Litigation Funding Participants Bill, please? <coughs> get the appropriate people to yes. the table for you, Senator Van. We're just pausing, pausing, pausing for, for a chair swap. Dr Smirtle is coming now. Thank for, you very for, for much. Movement. And let me have a drink of water in the meantime.
Would you mind repeating the question, Sorry, thank you, Senator Van? Yes, um, well, I, I just framed. I was just uh, um, going to ask some questions about that bill, the Improving Outcomes for Litigation Funding Bill. I haven't put a question first yet. Did you want to introduce yourself, please, Dr. Smirtle? Alban Smirtle, Assistant Secretary, Legal System Branch. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I understand that this bill is technically a Treasury bill, but its work is practically shared between both departments. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. Um, and what is the division of responsibilities? Um, in terms of division of responsibilities, I think um, issues that relate to the, um, the cap, the rebuttable presumption, and, and similar things around the, the construct of the, the model, a, a Treasury's responsibility, but we certainly um, can um, you know, have a few things to say if there's some questions on that, but we'll defer to Treasury. And then in relation to the, I guess there's been an issue around the constitutionality of the bills and also um, open class actions versus closed class actions and, and the applicability of common fund orders, that's the Attorney General's Department responsibility. Thank you. And can you please explain the bill uh, in broad terms? In broad terms, the bill is about um, increasing access to justice and fair, return, fair and reasonable returns to um, claimants in class action matters. Um, previous inquiries by the Australian Law Reform Commission and particularly the Parliamentary Joint Commission on Corporations and Financial Services um, found that the returns um, trending over a period of time to litigation funders were potentially disproportionate and, and the, the government was keen to ensure that the um, claimants and the class action claimants were given primacy and the better returns would be prepared to be returned to them. So in essence, the bill increases the court's discretion to be able to look at returns to class actions claimants. Um, it's now a rebuttable presumption that um, 30, that no more than 30% could go to the litigation funders, um, including lawyers involved in litigation funders. So the and ambulance chasing firms? Sorry, not my place to comment on that, um, Senator. Um, but it is a rebuttable presumption, so not in every circumstance will it be the case that, um, that 30, more than 30% is unreasonable. It's for the courts to decide. So there's a discretion built in there for the courts to work through a range of prescribed factors. But clearly the onus is on the, um, the returns going to claimants, primacy being given to the claimants themselves, that they should at least get 70%. That the, I think the ALRC found that over a period of time that if litigation funders were involved, only around 50% of returns would go to claimants, and if they weren't involved, 85% um, would go return to claimants. So um, looking at the figure of 70% is seen as um, ensuring primacy to the claimants, a fair and reasonable return to them. It's so much, much better. Um, I understand that the bill has several key objectives, um, one of which is being to ensure that only members of a class action um, litigation funding scheme are persons who have agreed in writing to be members and are bound by the terms and conditions of the scheme's constitution. Why is that the case? Um, it, it's fundamentally about observing the, the common law <coughs> rule of privity of contract in that the courts over a period of time have developed um, things called common fund orders, which basically means that a class action can be commenced. Um, I think there's a minimum of seven people that need to be, members need to be involved, and the class action can be commenced. And, um, but then um, when it's time for settlement or for decision, um, if the court orders a, a common fund order, then the, the, the litigation funders commission can be multiplied out against basically the whole class. Um, even those that haven't signed up to the litigation funding agreement to start with. Um, so that's seen um, by government as um, not particularly desirable because of the privity of contract principle that people can be um, held to pay the litigation funders commission despite not ever having signed up to the um, agreement itself. Now clearly there's a problem there with um, potentially free riding occurring as well, that if, if a class commences and then people come in, um, and then aren't subject to any sort of fee imposts and they're seen as free riders. So there are other mechanisms there that have been approved like funding equalisation orders, which the government, um, which the High Court has commented favourably on, and this bill certainly allows, that at least allows all the costs that the people that have signed up to the litigation funding agreement can be spread out across the entire class if, if other members come on board. Um, so common fund orders are potentially problematic because of that 
um, effect of multiplying out fun, um, funding commissions across the whole class without people actually having turned their mind to it and signed on to the litigation funding agreement. In effect, it's just a financial product used in a litigation setting. That's correct, isn't it? Um, I'm not a financial person, but it's, it's an order that's been um, yeah. approved by the federal court but and other courts. But um, certainly from our perspective, the government's perspective, it really needs a privative contract that people should actually turn their mind to it and sign on to it and fully understand the terms of something they're signing on to before they're subject to that. Um, the agreement. Like, like we would insist on any other financial product and that's why informed financial consent to funders fees is, is important, is that correct? Correct. Um, I understand that the bill provides that non-members of such schemes should not be paid any amount of claim pro proceeds unless firstly that amount is permitted under claims distribution method set out in the funding agreement and secondly that the method has been approved um, by the court as fair and reasonable, is that correct? That's correct, Senator. It's a clearly important mechanism that the, the government has put into the bill is that the, um, there is a discretion there for the court and it ultimately approves the, the agreements that are, are put forward. Um, the, the court itself needs to determine that it is fair and reasonable and, um, and the court also has the power to vary an agreement if it finds that the um, agreement is, is not fair and, and reasonable. Um, so the court orders that and then if it's, the court approves the agreement then um, the um, agreement is applicable and, and members can be paid out. At some point the, the class has to be opened to allow um, other members to, that weren't part of the initial agreement to, to come in and that's what I was talking about, the funding equalisation orders which permit the agreement, uh, avoids the free riding problem and allows the, the funds distribution and the fees to be shared across the whole class but without the multiplier effect of the commission um, for litigation funders which common fund orders provide. Uh, thank you. Um, I also understand that the bill requires that if a court um, makes a common fund order, the funding agreement is not enforceable? Last question, Senator. That, that's correct, and that, that's the problem that, that I've been adverting to. The common fund orders allow the commission, um, the legal um, litigation funders commission to be multiplied out across the entire class, which um, even those that have not actually signed up to the litigation funding agreement so that's, um, the government thinks that's not the proper way to approach things, that people need to be aware of what the commissions and other fees are up for. And so um, common fund orders aren't prevented, but they're not going to get the seal of approval from, from the court um, to, allow, you know, to enforce the agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Van. I now give the call to Senator Waters. Thanks, Chair. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, being here today. Just coming back to the Dyson Hayden case, Lawyers for the applicants have previously been very critical of the Commonwealth for prolonging negotiations and delaying resolution of those cases, of those three brave women. In November 2021, following a further delay, their lawyer said, quote, the inaction of Attorney General Michaelia Cash and Prime Minister Scott Morrison is prolonging their trauma, end quote. How many times were proceedings delayed at the request of the Commonwealth? Attorney, before I invite you to answer that question. Uh, can I just ask the document from which you are quoting, do you need to see a copy of that document? Do you have the document, Senator Waters? No, I've just got that quote, but it seems, Senator, what might assist? I'm sure that you're familiar with the quote, though. It was widely covered. I've got some other copies to it. Thank you very much, Senator Watt. Are we just distributing? And just can you just clarify the source of the document, the source of that quote, um, Senator Waters? It's the lawyers for the women. It, but where was it printed? Where was it published? I don't know. It was a quote from the lawyer. The question goes to how many times the Commonwealth delayed the proceedings. But was it in a newspaper article or a journal or a television article? An article interview? by Sam Maiden oh, in news.com. Thank you very much. Thanks, Senator Watt. And that's been tabled and distributed now. I'm happy to respond in the first instance. Thanks, thanks Attorney. Um, Senator Waters, I reject the characterisation um, that you have put in relation to the settlement process. Uh, the Commonwealth has engaged constructively with the claimants to resolve their claims. Um, you would be aware that the issues involved were complex issues. They required expert opinion um, and they required ongoing engagement between the Commonwealth 
and the claimant's legal representatives. Um, and again, as I've already stated in my answers to uh, Senator Watt, um, there are confidentiality obligations under the settlement deeds, which both parties agreed to, um, which do make it inappropriate to comment on certain matters, but I do reject the characterisation um, that you have put in relation to the settlement process. But I'm happy to get Ms Pirani to provide you with further information if she can. Thank you. I'm not seeking to characterise. I'm simply asking the question of how many times the Commonwealth sought uh, proceedings delayed. Um, Senator, the matter was run by ComCover on behalf of the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand that probably the best course would be to direct that question to them. Um, the, this department became involved in the matters in about October last year, and we've always acted very quickly and turned things around very quickly in order to keep the matter moving. We've been very conscious um, of the need to resolve it as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, Senator, so uh, uh, just in, in terms of our department's involvement, the Office of Legal Services Coordination plays a role in supporting in considering settlement outcomes. Uh, we, we do not, uh, unless uh, the department itself is the instructing department, we do not get involved in the details of the actual litigation matter. So it is uh, correct, as um, Ms Parani said, that that question in terms of the specifics of uh, the Commonwealth uh, in that matter is uh, a matter for ComCover. And that was the point, um, Senator Watt, is that I was making previously, Chair, when I was responding to Senator Watt. Um, the questions are more appropriately put to ComCover. Okay, thank you. Well, look, I'll push on. You might be able to answer some of these other questions. Will any assessment be undertaken as to whether the Commonwealth met model litigant guidelines in relation to these proceedings? I imagine that might fall within your purview. Uh, Senator, yes, we are responsible for um, the model litigant principles. Um, generally, the way that that operates is, again, it's the responsibility of each agency to ensure that they observe those principles. And if there is a view that they haven't, then there's a reporting obligation to the Office of Legal Services Coordination. Um, so, it, again, that would be a matter for ComCover um, Sorry, to address. Can I, can I just make sure I'm understanding you? Are you saying they've got, to, they've got to self declare that they don't think they were a very good litigant? That doesn't seem like a great process. Is there not some kind of oversight process where the Attorney General's department might say, assess whether or not the litigation was conducted in accordance with those guidelines? That would be open to us um, to do. Um, it's not something that we do as a matter of course. Um, we tend to rely on agencies or um, parties to litigation um, to raise matters okay. with has us anyone if ever, concerns. Has anyone ever dobbed themselves in as not complying yeah, with the model litigant guidelines? Um, yes, Senator. We, right. we get reporting quite regularly on, on okay. those Senator issues. Waters, I think you'd understand um, that the Commonwealth takes its model litigant obligations very, very seriously. But you've also now heard from Ms Pirani in relation to when this department first became involved, it is more appropriately a metaphor com cover. But just to repeat my answer in terms of the question that you did put to me, um, which was that I do utterly reject the characterisation that you put to us as this department in relation to the settlement process. Um, we engaged constructively with the claimants to resolve their claims. Okay, just for, again, for the record, it was the characterisation of the women's lawyers that I was putting to you. So simply asking for um, a response, which you've, which you've, uh, you've given in your, in your own way. Thank you. Um, so just coming back to that oh, point. Chair, sorry, I think we've got um, another. Did you just uh, want to add to that, to add to the answer? model litigant obligations. Um, certainly uh, within the department we have um, a framework that we work within but we do go out proactively and work with agencies to make sure they understand and we do training around model litigant mm -hmm. and around all of the obligations under the legal services directions uh, and certainly if um, we become aware other than through an agency that there is a concern about whether they've discharged their model, model litigant ob obligation then we will uh, ask them to um, 
in, in a sense, look, look at that and come back to us and we will have a look at that as well. So um, whilst it's not necessarily going through each uh, claim or matter that, that comes through the department, because there are, uh, as you would appreciate, quite a number each year, um, we do have that, that more proactive um, training and, and information and, and certainly engage with agencies very regularly. Okay, thank you. Well, given that the lawyer for the women um, did raise such concerns and given that I'm here now asking you about uh, the conduct of the Commonwealth in the case, will the agency exercise its ability that you've just mentioned it has to now investigate whether or not ComCover complied with the model litigant guidelines in the Dyson Hayden sexual harassment case? So, so I think... Um uh, Senator, what, what we can do is um, certainly uh, work with ComCover as the agency, as the, as the body that was running this litigation um, and ask them to um, work with us on this and, and go through that, that, that question. We, I don't you, think, you will now do that? I, I don't think we have actually uh, received any um, complaint uh, about a, a particular issue with the model litigant obligation, but certainly uh, we'll reach out to ComCover to see if, if they have received anything um, and, and see what we can do there. Okay, so you will reach out to them to see if anyone's complained to them. Will you reach out to them to assess whether they did in fact comply with the model litigant guidelines? I think what we would do, um, and Ms Pirani might have some more details, but I think what we would do is um, we have a series of documents that we usually um, provide agencies and ask them to work through. So I expect we would be able to do that with ComCover. But I will just need to, um, to, to, we'll need to talk to them first just to see what has come through as well. Okay, so depending on what they say, you might or might not so investigate their complaints? I suppose it might, it might more be about is there a particular issue that has been raised that says where uh, there is a concern about discharge of the model litigant obligation? Okay. Well, I think the concern is the Commonwealth asking for delays, which so, is well, I, pretty Senator, we, clear to be the concern. We, um, we, we wouldn't preempt. So I think Ms Harvey's uh, said that we will engage with Comcare as far as I'm aware, uh, that we have not been advised of any formal complaints raised by the uh, claimant's lawyers, but that's just my own knowledge. We'd need to check that and take that on notice. But okay. um, as Ms Harvey ha has indicated, um, she, uh, w the department will contact Comcare. Okay. So just for clarity, you've got to wait for a formal complaint before you as the department can proactively investigate compliance with the model guidelines? I don't think it's necessarily a case of having to wait for a formal complaint, but it's about understanding what the nature of a complaint might be. Right. Just to be if, clear, it's, it's just that kind of decision. As the Secretary did say, nothing has been raised with the Attorney-General's Department in relation to this matter and whether or not ComCover did comply with the model litigant. They are expected to. The government takes the model litigant rules very seriously. As I've stated in my answer to you in rejecting the characterisation that you had put to me as part of the settlement process for this department, uh, the Commonwealth had engaged constructively um, with the claimants to resolve their claims. And the point that I also made, which is a, an important one, the issues involved were incredibly complex. They required expert opinion and they also required ongoing engagement between the Commonwealth and the claimants' legal representatives. Last question, Senator Waters. Thank you, please. Chair. In the context of set the standards um, and the desire to encourage staff to come forward with allegations, does the Commonwealth's approach to these proceedings and the criticism that they've um, come under for it send a message that it will treat survivors sensitively and respectfully? Well, I don't agree with the criticisms that you have raised. I have articulated the position of the Commonwealth uh, that we worked constructively or engage constructively with the claimants to resolve their claims. They were complex matters. They required expert opinion. They required ongoing engagement between the Commonwealth and the claimants' legal representatives. And um, you will see with the announcements yesterday, uh, the claims have been resolved to the satisfaction of all parties. Thanks very much, Senator Waters. I'm now going to give the call to Senator Molan. Thanks, Chair. And uh, my questions are in relation to the social media anti-trolling bill, which I believe is being <clears throat> debated today in the in the House. Um, uh, who should I direct those questions to, Minister? The relevant officer who is now coming forward, Thank Chair. You. Thank you.
And if, if you would like to introduce yourself, uh, Assistant Secretary, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Michael Johnson, Assistant Secretary, Defamation Task Force. Uh, thank you, Assistant Secretary. Um, I, I believe that the social media anti-trolling bill uh, is connected to the Voller decision. Could, could you just give us a very brief explanation of what that connection is, please? Absolutely, Senator. Um, so the Voller decision, which was a um, case before the High Court, um, confirmed a judgment of the, of the lower court underneath it that, in effect, a entity who has a social media account, in that case, it was a Facebook account, um, can be characterised as the publisher for the purposes of defamation law um, of comments um, posted to their Facebook page. And so the same principle would then apply to other social media platforms. Um, as a result, any Australian social media account holder um, would be characterised as the publisher of comments made by third parties, people who they don't know, people who they don't interact with other than on the, on the platform, um, including in situations where they have no knowledge of the, of the comment being posted. Um, by being the publisher for the purposes of defamation law, with a few steps that follow after that, um, they could potentially be held liable if that comment is defamatory um, against the person who they allegedly, who the comment allegedly defames. And that, that's good, Mr. Johnson. I think that, that that's a good explanation. But even if they, even if uh, those comments are anonymous, how does the, how does if, well, if comments fact, on the, I say a small business yep. website was anonymous? Yep. So in fact, where they are anonymous, that heightens um, in terms of the outcome of the Vola decision before this bill yes. um, enters into play. That actually heightens the problematic situation for the social media account holder. In defamation law, there can be multiple entities that are characterised as the publisher when a comment is made. Um, to, to an ordinary person, you might just think the person who makes the comment is the publisher and they're the ones who should be held responsible for their comments when yes. they're defamatory. Um, but in defamation law, several entities can simultaneously be characterised as the publisher. And that essentially would allow the person who suffers the, the reputational harm from the comment to choose which respondent or defendant they bring proceedings against. If the commenter is anonymous, um, that means that they pretty much cannot bring it against the commenter, the yes. person who actually did the comment. Um, and that leaves um, the account holder, as well as in this context also the social media platform, as potential respondents that they can bring defamation proceedings against. Um, and so as a result of VOLA, it means that you, me, um, a, a social media account holder could actually be sued successfully for defamation because some anonymous person put in a comment attached to my yes. post um, uh, that, um, that is defamatory. And, and we, need, we, need to, we need to address that in the bill, but aren't there sometimes when, when people need to remain anonymous? Isn't, is, uh, uh, is that handled in the bill at all? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, um, Senator. Um, so the bill does two things um, to <coughs> seek to address the situation you're exploring here. The first and most um, acute measure well, simple measure even in that respect in the bill, Senator, is uh, the bill amends or modifies the outcome of VOLA to, in the extent that it says that the social media account holder is a publisher and is therefore potentially liable in defamation. The bill instead says the social media account holder is not a publisher. Now that leaves, okay. that leaves potential publishers in this three-way context that we're talking about on a social media platform being the person who actually made the comment and the social media company. So that remains two potential defendants, the person who suffers the harm can bring the proceedings against. What the bill does, the bill protects the social media account holder from that, that they're out of the equation. That's the first thing that the bill does. The second thing the bill does, because the, the prime underlying principle of the bill is that it is appropriate to centre defamation disputes between the person whose reputation is harmed and the person who actually made the comment, the originator. Um, the bill acknowledges that where the, where the commenter is anonymous, that is a very significant barrier to be able to bring those proceedings. So the bill provides a number of mechanisms to support the person whose reputation is allegedly harmed to identify the commenter for the purpose of bringing 
uh, defamation proceedings against them. Now, your question was, does that mean that nobody should be anonymous online? And the answer is, is too many negatives there, I'll be careful to answer. It is very appropriate to be anonymous online, Correct. and this Correct. bill does yes. not prohibit, prevent, disincentivise uh, being anonymous online. No, it, that, that, and that's good, and does, but does that not connect with the Online, uh, online Safety Act? And, and, and my interest in that is deep for the fact that uh, my family was involved in this. And, and, uh, but that, that particular aspect of identify or not identify, the methods we take to uh, compel organisations to identify, th th then that links in with the Online Safety Act, does it not? There are certainly both overlaps and similarities between yep. this bill and the online safety regime. Um, there are, however, key differences. Um, the most important difference is that this bill operates in respect of defamatory comments. Yep. Uh, the Online Safety Act operates in respect of various versions of online harm. Okay. They can overlap. A, a comment can be both defamatory and harmful on the basis that that is, is defined in the Online Safety Act, but they can also be different. It's like a Venn diagram. Um, the, the other important aspect is that the measures <coughs> of the Online Safety Act, because it's about harm generally, um, it provides powers to the uh, Commissioner, the Safety Commissioner, uh, to respond to that harm in a way that is, is, is uh, characterised as a um, harm against public. Um, even though it is against an individual, akin to criminal type situations. Whereas the defamation bill um, is aimed to assist the pathway towards a defamation action, which itself is a civil action, a, a private legal proceeding between two private people. Um, so the bill does not compel a social media company to release the details of... Okay. Um, of the anonymous poster, mm -hmm. it incentivises them to do so. But it also the bill also includes two very important safeguards to to find that balance between if you make a defamatory comment, you essentially lose your um, privilege of being anonymous online. Okay, good. And if you're making um, proper, appropriate, um, be careful with that. That's very subjective language. So I'll be careful with that language, but comments that aren't defamatory, you should retain your ability to be anonymous online. And so no, two no, that, and that's good, and that's very, yep. that's very, very important. But yep. th th this fits in then uh, uh, as to uh, 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 the, the, the government's expected model defamation reforms, doesn't it? And I think, I, I, I think that the, uh, it, the online safety commissioner, the e-safety commissioner, has spoken about this. Uh, can you uh, inform the committee on this? Certainly. I, um, just to clarify your question, Senator, I am assuming you are referring to the uh, review and the reforms of the model defamation provision Correct, that is being defamation. undertaken yes. through, the, yes. yeah, through the meeting of attorneys general. So the, that um, process is, did is I very- say, did I, I think I, I, I said model defamation reforms. I may not have. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Because it's yep. the state and territories, not Thank just you. the common, yep. Thank you. Yeah, so there is a, there is a model. Yep. Defamation law, um, which is primarily, yes, last primarily for the states and territories to implement, and they have implemented it. Um, the states and territories, with the Commonwealth as a very close partner in the process, is currently going through a process of reviewing that, those model provisions, which are implemented in each state and territory. Um, one aspect of that current review process is looking at the defamation liability of internet intermediaries. Um, like I said, that's a very important process yes. that the Commonwealth is closely working with states and territories in. There is overlap between the subject matter of this bill and the reform process. Um, the bill is deliberately very narrow. Um, take one example, the bill only deals with social media. Um, arguably, the provisions on the bill could also be extended to other digital platforms like web pages, review sites, a whole range of things. And, ha and how would that occur? How would that occur? How would the extension the occur? At time, so I'm and we'll, we'll cut that out there, yeah. Uh, no, sorry, yes. Assistant Secretary. We, Just very briefly, like could you answer that question? Just keep it very succinct, please. Certainly, certainly. So. Um, it could be extended just by amending the terms, um, but it was kept narrow um, to address the very acute issues that were arising from and related to the Vola decision whilst leaving the rest of that space to this very important meetings of Attorney General review process okay. to happen. Th thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very personal one in this topic. Thank you, Senator Molan.
Thanks, thank uh, you. Minister. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Molan, and thank you, Attorney. Yep. Uh, and I give the call to Senator Watt. Thanks, Chair. Can we just return to this non-disclosure agreement that, according to newspaper reports, was insisted on by the Commonwealth rather than the victims of Dyson Hayden's sexual harassment? Um, Minister, just at the end of my last set of questions, I think you claimed that Commissioner Jenkins' report uh, that she raised concerns and the argument for potentially getting rid of NDAs was about um, protecting or, or giving victims the opportunity to talk about their experiences. I can't remember exactly what you said, but it was words of that effect. Do you remember? Uh, yes, I that do. Point? I'm just having a look. To, but, but yes, basically, to ensure that they were able to talk about their experiences, mm. etc. So can, I'm having trouble identifying anywhere in Commissioner Jenkins' report where she makes that point and that she limits her concerns about NDAs to the opportunity for victims to talk about their experiences. Where, where in her report does she, um, if you like, green light NDAs when it comes to the amount of compensation that people are paid? Oh, that, that, oh, sorry. Thank you. Oh, Ms Chigi is here. Thank you. Uh, Senator Sarah Chigi, Deputy Secretary, Integrity and International Group. Um, so Ms Jenkins' report obviously recommended best practice guidelines and in the content of the report, um, the narrative that accompanies us it is very much about victims being able to tell their stories um, is, is the explanation for why the issue of non-disclosure agreements needs to be considered and best practice principles developed. Doesn't giving the opportunity to victims to tell their stories also include giving them the opportunity to, if they choose, to reveal the compensation that they've been paid? That's not what the, the report is very much about, sharing the story of their experience, Senator. The, you'll be familiar, Minister, that um, Commissioner Jenkins um, noted the range of concerns that had been raised with her about the use of non-disclosure agreements in sexual harassment cases, including that they can contribute to a culture of silence, which disempowers victims, covers up unlawful conduct, and facilitates repeat offending. Um, isn't the Commonwealth's insistence in this case on a non-disclosure agreement that prevents these victims from talking about the compensation they've been paid, isn't that contributing to a culture of silence which disempowers victims, covers up unlawful conduct and facilitates repeat offending, exactly like what Commissioner Jenkins talks about? Oh, I completely reject that, Senator Watt, and I'd refer you back to the evidence chair that has just been given by Ms Chidgey. I don't believe, and I don't have it in front of me, but I do not believe that Ms Jenkins ever made that link. My understanding and my recollection is that Ms Jenkins' primary concern, and in particular, as Ms Chidgey has already alluded to, uh, in particular, the context of the report was the primary concern is that these confidentiality agreements or non-disclosure agreements can limit people's ability to tell their stories uh, and seek support. And as I have already stated to you, um, that they are able to do, the claimants. So I, I utterly reject what you are stating. Let me ask one of my questions in a different way. Was it the victims of Dyson Hayden's sexual harassment who asked for this non-disclosure agreement so that they couldn't disclose the compensation they received? Uh, Senator Watt, these negotiations are conducted between the parties and, as you know, as a lawyer, they are confidential negotiations. But this is public funds Following being used. the negotiations, the Commonwealth and the three claimants have reached a settlement under the settlement deeds and it makes it inappropriate for me in particular to make comment on certain matters. But as you know, they are negotiated between the parties mm. and that is what occurred. I have no further comment, Chair, in relation to this. Did, did the Commonwealth require the non-disclosure agreement around the compensation paid as a condition of settlement? 
Again, Chair, it would be completely inappropriate for me to comment on any matters surrounding the Commonwealth settlement with the claimants. The, the, the difference and with... Senator Watt knows that. No, no. The difference with your ordinary civil action is that it's public funds that have been used here for compensation. That is why it's appropriate to use a, an estimates hearing to inquire into this. So it's a pretty simple question about whether the Commonwealth insisted on non-disclosure of the compensation amount as a condition of settlement. And if that is the case, then your argument that, oh, look, this is just something that the parties agreed, that has no foundation if you've made it a condition of settlement. They had no choice if they wanted to settle these claims. Senator Watt, can I just interrupt for a moment? Uh, you have used different words in your question, but I'm just mindful that the attorney has already taken on notice the substance of your question. Uh, so while I'm not ruling you out of order, I'm just reminding you that the... I reject the characterisation. ...that this has been taken on notice in substance. OK, so just finally, again, returning to Commissioner Jenkins' report, respected work, where she recommended that the Commission, in conjunction with the Workplace Sexual Harassment Council, will develop a practice note or guideline that identifies best practice principles for the use of NDAs in workplace sexual harassment matters to inform the development of regulation on NDAs. Now, your government claimed that it accepted <coughs> Commissioner uh, Jenkins' recommendation, saying that the government will ask the Workplace Sexual Harassment Council to develop a practice note that identifies best practice principles for the use of NDAs in workplace sexual harassment matters. So on the one hand, you're out there telling the public, particularly the women of Australia who experience the vast majority of sexual harassment, that you're going to do some work to identify best practice principles for the use of NDAs. And on the other hand, when you're actually a party to litigation on this very matter, according to media reports, you're insisting on NDAs. Aren't you going completely against what you said that you would do? Senator Watt, I completely yet again reject your <coughs> characterisation of this. In relation to, it is recommendation 38 of the Respect at Work report that you are referring to, <coughs> the government agreed with recommendation 38 and our response at the time was that we would ask the council to develop a practice note that identifies best practice principles for the use of NDAs in workplace sexual harassment matters. Um, Chair, I will now ask Ms Chichi to take Senator Watt through uh, the progress that is being made in relation to this. Well, it is fully funded. Chair, I haven't asked and, about that. Uh, Senator Watt, you have made certain characterisations which I disagree with. We accepted the recommendation, it is fully funded and work is underway. And Chair, if I could ask Ms Chidji just to bring the committee up to date just, on where just, we are. Just uh, very briefly, thank you, Ms Chidji. Um, Senator, the department is doing the work on those uh, best practice principles in partnership with their work commission and we're consulting respect at work council. Um, and in fact, that work is due to be considered by the respect at work council for the second time this coming Friday. Um, the, uh, we've, we've sought guidance from uh, um, all the members of that council, law members. firms, legal protect practitioners, non-government organisations such as the Federation of Ethnic Communities Councils and the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Women's Alliance, for example. Um, and it is very much the case that the focus for those best practice principles is around the issues of being able to share experiences, discuss allegations, um, um, is the, the focus of that work in line with the issues that uh, Ms Jenkins identified in respect at work. So, Minister, at the very same time that your department is out there consulting about, you know, how we can make sure that NDAs don't get abused um, to disempower victims, when you have the opportunity to deal with a particular case that falls under your portfolio, your government is insisting on a non-disclosure agreement uh, that prevents these women talking about the compensation that they've received. Doesn't this show that all of the promises that you've made, your government has made, that it's going to clean up its act when it comes to the treatment of women are completely hollow? Well, again, Senator Watt, 
I completely reject your characterisation of this matter. You are mischaracterising mischaracterising Ms Jenkins' recommendations, as both I and Ms Chichi have advised you, and I'm happy to read it out again. Ms Jenkins' recommendations relate to deeds that stop claimants from sharing their experiences. This has not been done in this regard. The claimants are able to share their experiences. Uh, Senator Watt, we take these matters very, very seriously. You certainly take Despite covering up the compensation amount that seriously. You are claiming um, and share, again, a total mischaracterisation yet again and a deliberate one by Senator Watt. Uh, Senator Watt, we are at time, so we are going to have to move to any other senators who have questions in cross portfolio corporate and general matters. Yes, Chair. Uh, Senator Waters, you have the call. Thank you, uh, Chair. I'm actually not sure if this belongs in this part, but I'll, I'll give it a shot anyway. Um, it's just pertaining to the respect at work uh, recommendations and the um, consultation paper released oh, late last night. This part? Yep, absolutely. Ms. Chigi We're here. Table. Okay, yes. Ms. Chigi, thank you. Um, at the last estimates, you indicated, I think it was you, Ms. Chigi, that the consultation regarding the next tranche of legislative amendments to implement the respect at work recommendations would commence in December. That is, the consultation would commence in December with a view to legislation being finalised in March or April. The draft paper report was released last night. What was the cause for delay? Um, Senator, uh, the department did significant work on preparing that consultation paper and it uh, took longer than we had originally anticipated to finalise that paper. Is that because of the complexities of the drafting or? Uh, yes, and as you would have seen, it's quite a substantial paper that um, uh, go through a lot of the issues in some in some detail um, mm. to assist those who might be providing feedback. Mm. Um, so the draft report's been released. Will the final report be released before the election? Sorry, the consultation paper has been released mm. and then um, uh, the survey uh, and consultation process will run to the 18th of March and then we'll use that to provide advice to government. So will we see draft laws to enact those remaining respect at work recommendations before the election? Uh, that's a matter for government, but okay. the consultation will proceed until the 18th of March. Okay, so Minister, that's not a lot of time between the 18th and the, t uh, the week of the 29th, oh, which is I the last say, we've sitting week. We've made significant progress, um, Senator Waters, as you know, in relation to uh, respect at work. In fact, 42 out of the 55 recommendations have either been fully implemented um, or fully funded. Work is underway and all remaining recommendations. Yes, that's what I'm asking well. about. Um, and, and I think you know that in terms of the recommendations, there were some that were referred to the private sector. There were some that were referred yes, to... Yes, just the ones that are in your bag that you're consulting on as of last night. Sorry for interrupting, but no, no, I'm no, going to okay. get just cut just off by sure the chair. Yep. Uh, so will we see, given that the consultation report has now been released and it's open for consultation until, I think you said the 10th, but then also the 18th, the 18th of March, the 18th of March, of March yeah. and the, the final sitting week to pass any uh, reforms that could flow from that is what, 11 days after that. So we can assume we won't see all of those respect well, at work recommendations implemented the before the election. The government will consider the feedback from the consultation, but we need to ensure that anything that is proposed we get right. But we do need to consider the feedback from the consultation. As you're aware, these are very complex issues um, and we need to get it right for both the employers um, and those in the workplace. So we will consider the consult. At the okay. Feedback. So you're reserving your right to not proceed with the reforms. I'm saying we'll, we'll we'll have a look at the consultation, the feedback that comes back from it. It's a very very significant area. So is it your intention to legislate all of those respect at work recommendations that belong with the Commonwealth or uh, not? Well, we need to actually consider the feedback that comes back to us before we make any further decisions. That will depend on what the feedback. And if is. your business group donors say they don't want a positive duty to keep their workers safe, what will you do? Senator Waters, you're now just being political in relation to what is a very important Well, I have area. tried to get an answer. I'm we trying a different way now. To get this right. As I've said to you, when I came into the portfolio, 
Within about two weeks, I had managed to settle the respect at work response, and it was one that was overwhelmingly endorsed by all sectors. 42 out of the 55 recommendations have either been fully implemented or fully funded. Well, the main ones and are the ones that remain. We continue to work on the other recommendations, and as you've said, Ms Chidji, or as Ms Chidji have said, that work is underway. But we do need to ensure we get these right. We don't want unintended consequences, and that is why we've put out the discussion paper. This is the point of the consultation, to consider the feedback from all parties um, going forward. And again, my question is, if the business community says they don't want a positive duty, despite the recommendation for employers to provide a safe workplace to all their workers, will the government legislate the Sex Discrimination Commissioner's recommendation for a positive duty? Well, or will again, you again stymie it, like you voted against it mid last year when I moved for amendments to, to introduce that positive duty? On what is a very important I just issue. want to know what you're going to do. I don't have the feedback in front of me. If you know something that I don't, in well, why did you vote against it last time? Senator Waters, if I could just paper. ask you to allow the minister to answer her question. Minister? I would love her to answer. That's fine. Oh, thank you. Senator Waters. OK, well, I'm going to take that as a, a failure to commit, despite multiple opportunities, to legislating all of the respect at work recommendations, which I'm kind of not really surprised about considering you voted the way you did when I moved Chair, for well, a positive duty. In relation to Senator Waters will obviously characterise this in, in the way that she wants to characterise Well, please it. correct me if that's wrong. And this is what we're here for. very political, which is disappointing in the way that you have approached the questions. Well, it's disappointing in we don't have a positive duty already and 17, we might not still. Which um, is Senator Waters, duty. could I just ask if you could... Um, direct any question to the minister um, rather than commentary. I'm just going to explain why it's important to get it right and why we need the further policy consideration and the consultation to examine the merits. And this is something that was actually commented on in the Respect at Work report in terms of ensuring that you don't actually create two different regimes that employers don't actually know what to do with. Um, so what we are canvassing is to ensure such a duty would operate effectively alongside, and Senator Waters, you already know this, existing duties that already exist under work, health and safety laws and the Sex Discrimination Act, including to ensure that additional complexity, and this is something we do need to be very careful of, is not created for those seeking to use the protections. Significant thought also needs to be given before providing the Commission with inquiry and regulatory powers for discrimination and harassment in addition to existing dispute resolution functions. It's also important to ensure that any positive duty in the Sex Discrimination Act, which is what you're referring to, is designed carefully so that it operates as intended. And again, this was something that was canvassed in the report, does not result in unnecessary duplication, confusion and uncertainty. So it is important to take this out for further consultation, to get the feedback and to then consider that feedback. Yes, but the consultation is late and now that means it won't get done before the election. So it's just all very convenient uh, for the government, not so convenient for women workers. Um, okay, uh, Chair, I've got a few questions that I hope are brief on other um, matters that I believe fit in this section. You so, just two more minutes in this okay. block. Um, um, we heard from Wajia, the uh, Workplace Gender Equality Agency, last night that progress was being made on recommendations 42 and 46 of Respect at Work regarding the development of good practice indicators for measuring and monitoring sexual harassment, prevalence, prevention and response. Um, can you tell me more about Ms. Chichi that, can take uh, Senator Waters through that, that progress and the timing on, of measuring sexual harassment? Or Ms. Brayshaw, one of the two. Is this in relation to Senator Elizabeth Brayshaw, Assistant Secretary, uh, Human Rights Branch? Can I ask, in terms of your question, is this in relation to <coughs> the work that Wajia has been leading under Recommendation 42 and? 46, is that your question? I asked them about that last night and they gave me some um, indication that it was a, a, a fair way off uh, and I'm wondering what work the Attorneys Department is doing to progress recommendations 42 and 46, whether it's about data collection 
um, or just the development of good practice indicators for measuring sexual harassment generally, where is it at from your perspective and what time frame are you working to? Minus Last question, Senator. Waters. Thank you, Senator. My understanding in terms of where we're at is that we've had an update to the respective work council on the work that WGIA has undertaken, and that is part of um, that we're looking to be informed by the work that WGIA is doing as to how that feeds into that work. So I don't think I have a more I don't think I have more information than okay. what WGIA provided. So WGIA is the the sole agency or the lead agency. What what role is WGIA your is department playing? WGIA is the lead, but okay. in terms of the information and the, how it feeds into the respective work response. It is relevant to the work of the respective work council and also the work that the department is doing in terms of coordinate, coordinating across the recommendations. Okay, so you're not working on RECs 42 and 46 per se. You say you're playing a coordinating role, is that right? That's my understanding. Okay. I said it Waters, we will have to leave it there and uh, we have gone over your allocated you. time for this block. Uh, Look, I just wanted to raise a couple of questions in relation to progress on respect at work and I just want to clarify uh, that it was the government which commissioned the respect at work report. Correct. Um, is, it, uh, is it right to say that the changes recommended by the report to deal with sexual harassment uh, would relate not just to discrimination law but also to work health and safety and employment laws and so there is a considerable layer of complexity in the consideration I'm of happy for these recommendations. I'm happy for Ms. Chuchi. Ms. Chuchi will take you through that. Um, uh, yes, that, that's right. It extends across all of those uh, legal frameworks, um, looking uh, not just at uh, the Sex Discrimination Act provisions, but um, also fair work and work health and safety provisions. Um, and that is particularly relevant to the issues we've just been discussing with the consultation paper. Um, and that consultation paper for that reason, for example, on positive duty, um, outlines all the things that are in place across those various legal frameworks. Um, for example, the existing vicarious liability um, obligations on employers under the Sex Discrimination Act, as well as uh, the duties that already apply to employers under work health and safety law. Um, and for that reason, um, uh, there's complexity and the need to consult um, to look at the intersection of all of those frameworks. And it is the case that the recommendations are directed not just to the Commonwealth, but also to the states and territories, uh, to independent agencies, uh, to industry and other key stakeholders. So there is quite a lot of work to be done right across the board. That's right. And uh, the conversations in the Respect at Work Council have very much recognised that and that um, that it's a cross-sectoral ongoing uh, process uh, in order to implement the recommendations of the Respect at Work report. Um, but uh, it's also the case that um, the government has taken the lead on establishing the Respect at Work Council to enable those cross-sectoral um, discussions and consideration um, and has been working with the private sector, states and territories through the meeting of attorneys general um, uh, and uh, uh, workplace relations ministers um, to uh, support all of those recommendations. Thanks, Ms. Tucci. Just finally, I just want to understand the role of the Respect at Work Council, uh, including its role in the implementation of recommendations. Um, so, uh, so is it twofold? Um, the Respect at Work Council collectively uh, is a forum uh, for uh, consultation um, and feedback on a whole range of the recommendations. Um, uh, and so it has met, it met five times last year and we're due to meet again this Friday. Um, and it has worked through consideration um, of uh, quite a number of the recommendations of the Respect at Work report. Um, also, the council, its um, individual members also have particular responsibilities in taking the lead on implementation of recommendations. Um, uh, so they continue that work, but uh, use the, for the council as well um, as an opportunity to consult more broadly. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Chigi. Uh, I'll now hand over to Senator Watt. Thanks, Chair. Um, can I just move on to the Taxpayer funded legal assistance for ministers and ministerial staff, please.
Um, we've got the right people. Thanks. So we've talked about this in previous hearings and in brief terms, uh, the taxpayer funded legal assistance to ministers can be provided under the parliamentary business resources regulations. And under those regulations, the Attorney General can approve the provision of financial assistance to a minister or former minister in relation to any legal proceedings that arise as a consequence of them holding or having held the office of a minister. That's a fair summary of how those regulations work? That is the regulations. Thanks. In what? So specifically, what I'd like to ask you about is a document that was tabled on the 23rd of August last year, which showed that the Attorney General approved taxpayer funded legal assistance for Liberal MP and Minister Michael Sukar in relation to a defamation claim made against him on the 9th of August 2021. I've asked about this before and when the department was asked about this at the last Senate Estimates hearing, the department essentially said that it couldn't provide any information at all. We took the step of writing to the department prior to today's hearing advising that we would be asking questions about this, so hopefully we can get some answers today. In this taxpayer-funded litigation conducted by Minister Sukar, who did he allegedly defame? Hadai Orr, Acting Assistant Secretary, Office of Legal Services Coordination. Ms Orr, um, is it possible for you to take off your mask? Sorry, it's just a bit hard to hear. It Thank you. Uh, it wouldn't be standard practice to provide information that's not been provided in the tabling statement. This is on the basis that it, be, it could impact the progress of proceedings, which may not be formal legal proceedings before a court. It may be in advance of that. Has, has action been initiated in a court in this matter? I'm not aware that action has been initiated. So I take it the complainant has essentially threatened defamation action against Minister Sukar? That is my understanding, that an approval was given on the basis of um, potential proceedings in relation to defamation. So can you explain to me how it jeopardises those legal proceedings to simply advise taxpayers who it is that Minister Sukar allegedly defamed. There's also the question of privacy of private citizens. Normally the department would not disclose information about a private citizen in advance of legal proceedings being instituted in a court because that is a private matter. Did Minister Sukar, Minister, this is probably best to you, did Minister Sukar have consideration for the privacy of these people when he put his hand out to have his legal expenses paid for by taxpayers? Well, Senator Watt, in terms of my role, um, I undertake my role, as you know, and you've alluded to this or you've referred to this, uh, through the Parliamentary Business Resources Regulations 2017. It sets out, and I think you and I, or, or should I say the committee, um, went through this last time. My role is to receive the advice from the department and to make a, de uh, to make a decision uh, in relation to the approval or not approval of assistance um, and expenditure uh, in relation to those regulations. That is my role. On what date did Mr Sukar make the allegedly defamatory comments? I would have to take, we would that, take that one to notice for you, Senator Watt. You, you don't, I mean, we did, we wrote to the department ahead of today's hearing indicating we'd be asking questions about this. Surely you've got a brief that gives you the basic details of this action and the application for funding? Uh, I have information in respect of the approvals and the dates of approvals and, and the minister that gave the approval. I, I don't have information about individual claims. Minister, do you, I mean, you, you approve this expenditure, you work with Minister Sukar, you must have some knowledge of the matters um, surrounding this case, on approximately what date did Minister, Minister, Minister Sukar make the allegedly defamatory comments? Well, uh, again, Senator Watt, if I could just stop you there, that question has already been asked and taken on notice. Well, so that is correct, Chair, but mm. if Ministers simply just want to turn up here all day and take things on notice when 
they're perfectly reasonable questions that can be expected to be within their knowledge. S I Senator think we're entitled Watt, to ask to press. Senator for an Watt, as I as I have um, stated previously, um, it's not appropriate to reflect on a witness for taking a question on notice. It is open to witnesses to do so, and you should not reflect on them for doing so. Well, so, I'm do you have any other? Assist, I'm trying to assist. The I don't know. Memory. Uh, it's, she... it's not a matter of your assistance, if that's just the rules of these proceedings. Do you have any other questions? It, the information that Ms Orr has given to date is the information that the department has, which I believe uh, was to the effect of, on the 23rd of August 2021, the assistance was approved for um, Minister Sucker in relation to defamation claims made against him, I understand, on the 9th of August 2021. You have referred, Senator Watt, to the approval that was tabled in the House of Representatives on the 24th of August 2021 and the Senate on the 25th of August 2021. That is the information that we have here. Anything further, Ms Orr has taken on notice for you. Did Minister Sukar or any other member of the government speak to you about this matter, Minister, prior to your approval of the funding? Uh, no, they did not. Um, so you've never heard, have you never heard who it is that Minister Sukar allegedly defamed or when that allegedly occurred? Uh, again, Senator Watt, my role is in relation to whether or not the assistance should be provided. My role is set out under the Parliamentary Business Resources Regulations 2017, which sets out the requirements for the legal assistance. And I'm happy, again, if you would like for the department to take you through uh, what those requirements are and the considerations uh, that need to be gone through. Well, I'm well aware of what they are, and I'll come to that in a minute, but that didn't answer my question. My question was, have you never heard who it is that Minister Sukar allegedly defamed or roughly when that occurred? Again, Chair, um, I was satisfied, based on departmental advice, that Chair, the this is not an answer to my question. Uh, I am Senator, answering your question, Senator, Senator Watt, Watt. As you know, you can't direct my, a witness how to answer a question. My question whether you have heard about Senator this. Senator Watt, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to pause. Um, could you please allow the you, Minister to respond to your question? I received a brief, Senator Watt, from the Department, which sets out the relevant facts for me. I was satisfied, based on departmental advice, that the proceedings related to performance by the Minister of ministerial duties. I was also satisfied that the minister acted reasonably and responsibly. It would not, and Senator Watt knows this, be appropriate to reveal any further information about the claim against the minister, as Ms Orr has already stated and was stated last time, as it relates to a legal dispute. Well, again, how does it jeopardise potential legal proceedings to simply Tell the public the date that Mr. Sukar allegedly made these defamatory well, comments taken when taxpayers too. are Senator paying Watt, the bill. That was taken on notice by Ms. All some time ago. That's right. It, that's been taken on notice, Senator Watt. What what were what was the nature of the comments that Minister Sukar allegedly made, and exactly how did they relate to his ministerial duties? Again, I would need to take that on notice. I don't have details around the comments. Well, that were made. If, if the department has recommended to the minister that Minister Sukar's legal expenses be paid, that must mean that the department believed that the defamation action and the comments that Minister Sukar made related to his ministerial duties. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. So, could you please tell me? how the, the comments that Minister Sukar made related to his ministerial duties. As I've said, I would need to take that on notice. Why? Because I don't have that information in front of me. Ms Orr and Ms Jones, we wrote to you before this hearing saying that we would be asking questions about this and we can't get answers to basic questions such as how this matter relates to Minister Sukar's duties. Senator Watt, I again remind you not to reflect on witnesses when they have taken a question on notice, please. Do you have any other questions? Well, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, look, I, I, I've been quite patient with this. I wrote yesterday about these matters quite specifically in relation to the questions regarding legal assistance, 
The Minister has stated that she was satisfied that she was to authorise this payment, and one of the criteria for payment is that this uh, question was to relating to the Minister's duties. So, what, so and, Senator and the what are you seeking? A sorry, question. Senator a Carr, simple, are you seeking the call to ask a question? I, I'm asking. Uh, the one, it's a point of order. It's a simple question. And what's the point of order, Senator The point Senator of Carr? order is the department simply cannot close down a line of questions by taking on notice Senator when they've been given is, plenty of notice of to actually answer the I question. Rule, Senator How Carr, is this? Can I, How is this inconsistent? Senator Carr, could I now rule on the point of order? Yes. Uh, there is no point of order. Oh, uh, witnesses are, are entitled to take questions on notice. Uh, I appreciate that you're not happy about that, but witnesses are entitled to take questions on notice and they should not be reflected upon for doing so. Um, Senator, what we now are now at over your amount of time, so we are going to move to morning tea. Oh, we will on. suspend for 15 minutes. Tea, and Chair, and I, the, the morning I've tea break is not until 10.30. Yes, but we are over your time and- I've still got questions, Chair. And Senator Waters has got questions, but I didn't feel that for a minute, two minutes, that it would be appropriate well, to could, ask I Senator Waters to start. I finish so, off. So what I'm no, no, Senator, what you are over your time. What I'm suggesting is that we go to morning tea, and Senator Waters, rather than giving her two minutes now, I will allocate ten minutes when we resume. Well, uh, we chair, are suspending chair, and we'll, chair, we'll resume in fifteen chair, minutes. Thank you. Chair, can I suggest? So we have we have can I suggest Senator that Watt. the department go and get the basic information Sen about Senator this Watt, matter that we this, asked for yesterday over suspended. the morning tea we break. We will return in fifteen minutes. Thank you, Chair. He is now in session. We are continuing with cross-portfolio corporate and general matters with the Attorney-General's Department, and I give the call to Senator Waters. Uh, thank you, Chair. I uh, just want to return to my earlier questions about the progress on sexual harassment indicators and the work that Wajia is doing. Um, just refresh myself on the transcript. Get Ms Chichi to the table. Thank you, Ms Chichi. So I did ask Wajia about this last night, and they obviously stand ready and willing to um, implement any new data collection measures, but they can't start collecting the data until this department settles the indicators. So my uh, question, thank you, um, Ms Brayshaw, is what's the progress on those uh, sexual harassment uh, or good practice indicators for measuring and monitoring sexual harassment prevalence prevention and response, please? No, thank you, Senator, and thank you for the opportunity to clarify. I was yes. just speaking to my um, Deputy Secretary about the need to be able to clarify it. My understanding is that um, Wajia is waiting for us in terms of that work on indicators. Mm. Mm. Um, the work has started, but we haven't finished it. There's been a range of projects that we've been working on in terms of the whole response to respect at work. And so the work is continuing, is my understanding. From the Can I just ask the people in the fancy box to turn the microphone volume up a smidge, please? Thank you. Um, so sorry, Ms Brayshaw, just that last sentence, you said the work has started. So we're, we have, we've started the work and it's still underway, but we're not at a stage where we've been able to share that with Virginia at this stage. My apologies for my earlier. I see. Thank you. And so what time frame are you uh, working to to get to a position to then share that work with Wajia? I don't have a specific time frame, but we are conscious that this is a priority work in terms of the range of recommendations. And so the team is continuing to progress that along with other parts of the response to respect at work. But I don't have a, a okay. time Okay. So how can it be a priority but not have a time frame? Senator, I think what I was trying to say was I don't have a specific timeline for when we'll complete that piece of work other than to acknowledge it's underway and mm. that we have been undertaking that work alongside other parts of the work we've been responsible for, including the consultation paper and other pieces of work for the Respect at Work Council. Yes, I understand. And it's all important. How many people have you got working um, specifically on recommendation uh, 46, which is the, the indicators? Senator, can I take that? Um, I Senator, I'd say we, we don't... Yeah. We work across the, the team on the implementation of the report, so we don't necessarily have a single person okay. dedicated to a single recommendation, given we're working across a range of recommendations in that team. I think we've got the resources in general for implementation of the report that we can take you through, if that would be helpful. Uh, perhaps if you could provide that on notice, Ms Chidji, noting that I've got a very strict time frame. Here. Yes, and we can uh, take on notice uh, 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 whether we've got a sort of um, 
uh, expected time frame. Yes, um, I might mention as well, uh, we have had some in initial conversations about those indicators with the Respect at Work Council, but yes. um, as Ms Rachel said, there's uh, further work to be done. Okay, and what's the relationship there? Who makes the decision? Is that the role of the council or will that be the department's role to actually decide on the shape of the indicators? Um, we're leading uh, the work, but very much um, a, a, um, a process where we would want support from stakeholders. Obviously, the Australian Human Rights Commission and Ms Jenkins being mm. a key mm. Uh, person there, but also uh, Wijia, um and others. Um, and just pardon my bad memory, Ms Jenkins is on that council also, isn't she? She's the yes. chair of she the council. She chairs the council. Okay. Yep. Um, have, has the um, Human Rights Commission and Ms Jenkins' team in particular been given extra resources to continue on with this work? Uh, yes, they have. So okay. they have been resourced uh, uh, to, to uh, also um, support implementation of the Respect at Work Senator Waters, would it help if Ms Chichi took you through the additional resources that have been provided to Ms Jenkins? I am interested in that, but I also have a few other questions. Is there a stage later in the program where we can Human talk Rights about... Commission yes. tonight, potentially? Yes. I don't know if Ms Jenkins has been called, but you could potentially put it to... Mm. And we, we can Crouch provide that on notice as well. Look, perhaps if you could provide it on notice, Ms Chigi, because obviously there's... Um, the, the bulk of work delivered was, was landmark and all of the recommendations you know, I support and it seems like there's multi-partisan support, albeit a bit of a delay in the rollout. But it's really important that the Sex Discrimination Commissioner and her team, who've developed the expertise, are properly resourced to keep going with the implementation so that the, the rollout is faithful to the recommendations. Yes, and you'd be aware that um, overall the government's committed $66.5 million for implementation um, and part of that has gone to the Human Rights Commission. Okay, thank you for providing a bit more detail and notice. Um, so we don't have a time frame on when the indicators will be developed and Wajia notes that their ledge requires a, a one year uh, notice period before employers have to uh, um, uh, have a new reporting parameter. So it's getting pretty late. Um, can I suggest humbly that a time frame be developed and stuck to so that we can get that uh, important uh, recommendation actually happening. Thank you. Um, you've mentioned the Respect to Work Council's due to meet again. I think you said Friday, Ms Chiji. Can you tell me, is it this Friday and what's on the agenda for that meeting, please? Uh, it is this Friday, Senator. I don't have the agenda in front of me. I know non-disclosure agreements was one yes. uh, topic we were talking about, um, but it would just take me a minute um, to actually find the agenda. Thank you. Would you mind doing that? And I'll ask a, a, a separate question then, um, which might be for a different person. I'm interested in the stats on how many applications have been made uh, since the Fair Work Commission was able to make orders for stop sexual harassment orders. Um, I don't have that information. It might be best directed to the Fair Work Commission, who I think is appearing tonight. tomorrow. Tonight. No, tomorrow. Okay. Oh, tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay. Oh, the Fair Work, Work Commission, sorry, not the Human Rights yeah. Commission. Yes. Uh, Senator, tomorrow. they appear before the uh, Education and Employment Committee tomorrow. Okay, thank you. And while Ms Chigi is looking for the Respect to Work Council agenda, my f other final question is the status of the ANU research on damages and costs in sexual harassment matters. When will their report be published? Um, sorry. I'll just see if Ms Brayshaw is able to find that. Uh, in the meantime, Senator, I've just got that agenda. Correct. Um, uh, so the um, council uh, is uh, looking at the implementation, um, I think it's led by the Human Rights Commission of Recommendations 51 and 52, Guidance on Services and Referral Pathways, um, consulting with the Australian HR Institute on implementation of Recommendation 45. Uh, the development of an accreditation framework. Um, as mentioned, um, the Department and the Fair Work Commission um, will be consulting the Council on the implementation of Recommendation 38 with uh, guidance on non-disclosure agreements. Mm. Um, and then we'll provide some updates as well from the Human Rights Commission on a range of recommendations, um, an update from uh, the Department on ILO Convention 190. Um, uh, are there sort of key aspects? Okay. Um, just in relation to the positive duty consultation uh, paper which was released last night, I just had a look um, at the consultation process and it's a multiple choice 
survey. Was the Respect at Work Council, did they have any input into the shape of the consultation on the positive duty report? We prepared the consultation paper, but we will be consulting the council um, uh, and we will be conducting a series of roundtables, I think between uh, starting on February the 28th. Um, so we will be consulting Respect at Work Council members, but also beyond that. Um, so the survey supports part of the consultation, but we'll also be um, accompanying that with more in-depth roundtable consultations. Okay. And what sort of folk will be invited to the roundtables? I presume it's invite only. Uh, yes, so I think employer, employee, representative organisations um, um, for one. Um, uh, uh, Ms Rachel has the list of invitees. Um, in terms of the range of participants, what we're hoping to do is both um, build on those who were consulted at the Respect at Work Act consultations last year, um, but also very interested to hear from those from business and industry, government, union and legal. This and is academic. in the round tables as opposed correct. to the multi-choice survey? That's, yep. that's correct. Okay. And also those advocacy groups that have been representing um, people um, in claims. So trying to get quite a broad range of experience on all sides of how... Yes. Um, Any actual claims. survivors? I think we are looking to seek to have people with lived experiences, but the invites for these consultations haven't gone out as yet. Can you say that again? You're, I, I missed the first part of your oh, sentence. Oh, sorry, I was saying, yes, we are looking at, in terms of groups, um, to be able to, those that have had lived experience, mm. to be part of those consultations, or those that have represented and supported them, depending on who, who is you know, interested and able to attend, but I haven't set the, the, the actual invite list hasn't been finalised, okay. it hasn't been sent but out. But that's a commitment that oh, survivors will be on that invite list? Yes. Okay, that's good. And how many roundtables will there be, please? I think that is still to be finalised, but it, but it will be a number to be able to cover all those various groups. Mm. And when will, um, what's the date of the final roundtable? Will, will they all be conducted in the same time frame? that before the 18th of March? Yes, that's, yes, that is the intention. Okay, in person or um, online? Uh, I think we would both offer uh, both opportunities if we can. Mm. Okay. Um, and presumably those roundtables won't be multiple choice ticker box. They, I, I hope, will be more of a qualitative that's approach right. to con consultation. Yes, Senator, there'll be an opportunity to explore the issues in the, the paper um, mm. because you'd appreciate there's quite a, the six areas, um, including the positive duty, mm. cover a range of issues mm -hmm. um, from costs and representative hearings to other things. So, mm. yeah, it'll be important to be able to have a conversation. And what role will the Sex Discrimination Commissioner have in assessing the uh, consultation or oh, assessing? the feedback that's provided through the consultation. Is there an ongoing role for Commissioner Jenkins in that regard? Um, we, uh, as we have throughout the process of implementing Respect to Work, work very closely with Commissioner Jenkins and would expect to continue to, to do that and to consult her, um, well, both through the consultation process, but then as we um, compile the feedback and prepare advice for government. Mm. Okay, and again, there's no time frame for when we'll then see the draft legislation to implement the positive I've, duty. I've given you the consultation time frames and then we'll work after that to prepare advice for government. Mm. Is that the sort of thing that could happen in caretaker period or not? Uh, it, it wouldn't, uh, I think in general, uh, be the kind of thing we would do during caretaker, mm. um, as it would be policy advice. All right. Thank you. Senator uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes, you, I was just going back to your special. earlier question oh, yes, around the, the research. research being yes. undertaken by ANU. My understanding that this research um, is due to deliver its final research in March, so it will be coming shortly. Okay. And um, pardon me, just one final question. What progress has been made in relation to funding working women's centres across Australia? I can sneak that one in in this session. Oh, that was obviously one of the um, yep, Ms. Jenkins Chuchy recommendations. Yes, yes. Yep. Do, um, and sorry, I uh, just uh, give me a minute. Um, and on that same point, that. will will they be invited to the um, consultation on the positive duty roundtables? Senator, I think we have. Um, I have think we have them in mind to invite them. Yes, yes, we have them in mind to invite. Okay, making their funding all the more important. Um, have you got did you, did you want to? 
Senator, in terms of um, my understanding with work in women's centres is that the government is providing a further 350,000 mm. um, to support the continued operation in Queensland and Northern Territory, um, which will bring the total commitment in 21 to 22 to 550,000, and that this interim funding is being provided while the government considers future funding arrangements. What was that last bit? Sorry, your microphone's really still not loud enough. I'm sorry. Which sorry, is your Senator, fault. is that better? Yes, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Minister. Uh, that, that the interim funding is provided while the government considers further funding arrangements. Mm. So this is funding in 21-22, okay. the additional funding. Noting, of course, that the recommendation for, was essentially for Australia-wide working women's centres, which just on that, has though, not yet um, happened. I think we have discussed this before, Senator Waters. Mm. So just to confirm, um, we are providing the additional 350,000 in 2021-22 to support the continued operation of the Queensland and Northern Territory uh, working women's centres. And, and we've discussed funding before, which does, um, as has been referred to, bring the total government commitment in 2021-22 to 550,000. Um, this is obviously interim funding while future funding arrangements are considered. Just in terms of the comment though that you did make, um, recommendation 49, you are right, was directed at both Commonwealth and state mm. and territory governments. Um, I convened an extraordinary meeting of attorneys general on the 9th of June 2021, uh, where members agreed to task officials to review the scope of services provided by working women's centres and other like services, and to consider the feasibility of funding of services, including under the National Legal Assistance Partnership 2020 to 2025. So, there is a body of work um, that is being undertaken, in particular by the states and the territories, on this matter. Thank you. I, uh, I said, uh, Senator Waters, we will need to move mm. to uh, Senator Watt. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, Senator Watt, you have the call. Thanks, Chair. Like Actually, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, Senator Carr. Minister, I want to return to the issue of the payout, uh, the Commonwealth payout, to, to the three women that have been harassed by Justice Hayden. And I want to uh, be clear that, um, so we get a few facts as, uh, clearly stated. Um, I'm seeking, as is Senator Watt, the amount of money that the Commonwealth advice on the amount of money the Commonwealth is paying out in total, in aggregate, not the individual payments. And that uh, I understand that you've taken that question on notice, that you have not claimed public interest immunity. No, I've taken that, that, on I notice, just, I just want to be clear of the facts Correct. on this matter. I've taken on notice, Chair. Uh, now, that it is asserted that this uh, NDA, this non-disclosure agreement, has been put in place at the behest of the Commonwealth and that uh, the uh, matter is um, seeking this advice is consistent with the powers of the Senate and the privileges of the Senate. And would, to that effect, I would ask you to consider this matter in providing this information uh, Minister and, and Madam Secretary, uh, because it will be readily available. This doesn't require deep research by the department or officers. Uh, that it be made available by the lunchtime break. And then to support that, I'd like to table the advice of the Senate clerk, um, and because there is no uh, agency within the Commonwealth that is entitled to withhold information from estimates hearing on the basis of confidentiality clauses. That's a matter for the Senate to determine. And that there may well be a public interest immunity claim that could be made, which has not been, but it may be made on the basis <laughs> of unreasonable invasion of privacy. But I'm seeking information and aggregate, not on the basis of individual uh, monies to be paid, and so that to mitigate any risk or to individuals. Uh, so I'd ask uh, for that matter to be considered, Minister, and that information to be provided uh, by lunchtime. Now, 
In the normal course of events, these are matters that the Senate would have to determine if uh, you're not able to meet this request. Oh, would you yes. agree? Um, uh, I have taken I the matter on I notice. I Minister, will not be I bullied, well, not, Minister, not before, before you answer. It. How is that a bully? How is, where's the bullying? Uh, uh, Senator simple... Carr, could I just... Um, this can, be, can I just respond in relation to the question on notice? And I'm just, as I speak, reading the clerk's advice. Uh, it's not open to the committee to ask for a question on notice to be provided by lunchtime. Hmm. There may be an op it may well be possible that the attorney's department or the attorney is able to furnish further information, but there is a set time frame by which questions on notice should be provided. Of course, it's always open to any department, uh, departmental official to provide a question on notice earlier, uh, if, um, if that is possible. And, Minister. And I, thank you. And I have said we will take the matter on notice to properly consider it, but as I also said in response to questions earlier today, um, the approach taken has been commonly accepted as the approach among governments of both persuasions, Senator Carr. You've been around a long time. And you would also therefore recall that when Labor were in government, out-of-court settlements with both Mohammed Hanif and Goodwin Gretsch remained confidential. That has been the process that has been put in place by both governments. Goodwin and that Gretsch. is why Goodwin Gretsch. I have said that I will take the Goodwin matter Gretsch on notice. Was, Goodwin Gretsch? I will take uh, the, the matter Labor on government? notice. I don't think so. That is it. Well, if I'm wrong, I will take that back, but I will take the matter on notice and properly consider it for you, and now in light of the advice that you have provided. And, and Minister, that's what I was seeking. Would you and consider, said, consider this request? Notice, I don't know where the bullying suggestion might come out. Right? It might what a preposterous your, suggestion. It might be your tone, Senator. Uh, your, uh, or, or your defensiveness. Your, your, your predilection Carr. to cover things up. S Senator Carr. Can I just ask you not to reflect on the witness, on the minister? You uh, the minister me of bullying and you're going to ask me about not to reflect. Yeah, let's just, let's just maintain a cool temperature. Uh, Senator Carr, do you have any other, and I'm still reading through this letter from the clerk which has been tabled, and thank you very much for that. Do you have any other questions Senator in relation? We'll return to Senator Watts. Uh, uh, Senator Carr, no other questions. I okay. have many other questions, as you know. We'll be here for some time, but Senator Watts. All right, thank you very group. much. Yeah. We've got uh, about um, four minutes remaining in this block. I expect you'll want more than four minutes, Senator Watt, but I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Chair. Can thank we you. just return to the taxpayer funding for Minister Sukar in relation to a defamation claim? And I trust that over the last half hour or so, the department might have been able to get some of the details that we wrote to them yesterday, asking them to be prepared for. Um, Minister, I think I'm right in saying bef that before the break, you, were, you said that you had approved this taxpayer funding because you were satisfied that um, the, matters, the, the matters for which Minister Sukar was seeking funding were related to his ministerial duties. Is that right? Uh, as part of the approval process, the parliamentary business resource regulations that you are aware of and we have discussed previously, uh, set out the eligibility criteria for a minister to receive legal assistance. On that basis, the department provides me with a brief <coughs> and in relation to this matter, I was satisfied. Okay. So, if you were satisfied that uh, the defamation claim related to Minister Sukar's ministerial duties, can you explain how they were so related? Um, Chair, I might then, by way of explanation, just address the issue more broadly for you, Senator Watt. Um, current and former ministers, as you are aware, and we have gone over this before, can apply for assistance from the Commonwealth for legal proceedings brought against them <coughs> that arise because they hold or held office as a minister. And so we've established that. The parliamentary business resource regulations set out the eligibility criteria that must then be worked through uh, for a minister to receive legal assistance. The regulations do not enable assistance to be provided to a minister to bring or to initiate the proceedings. In terms of 
what you are referring to. The regulations require the relevant Attorney General to inform the Parliament of each decision to pay assistance as soon as possible after approval, including reasons for the decision and any limits on expenditure. I mean, uh, just point of order, Chair, I hope you are taking into account this very long answer to no, a no, question I'm actually I didn't going to ask address when you're allocating time to Senator, me. Senator Watts, you've asked me a question, Senator Watts, uh, and I am responding just on to the, it. Just on the point of order, um, Senator Watt, there is no point of order, but I do appreciate the, the point you've raised, and I would ask the Chair, Minister to... Chair, I've just to, got a little uh, bit more, but it goes to what Senator Minister, Watt... Minister, I would ask that you Understood. answer the question in a reasonably yep. so succinct way. So the regulations way. require the Attorney-General, as I've stated, they also require the Attorney General to table a statement each year which specifies the expenditure for each matter yep, for the past financial this. year. Beyond the tabling statement, it is not standard practice for further information to be provided about the matter. And this is going directly, Chair, and this is why I've set this out. Where does it say to that? To the question that Senator Watt has provided. The obligation to table information about approval for assistance appropriately balances the need for privacy. Mm -hmm in relation to individual legal matters and making information regarding assistance publicly available, hence the tabling in the parliament um, of the report. It would be inappropriate for a minister or department to comment on individual matters due to the potential for disclosure to impact upon any proceedings, or for example, disclosure could infringe the privacy of the claimant. So that goes more broadly to what we were discussing, Chair, prior to the morning tea break and mm -hmm. what the information that Senator Watt um, is now asking for. Where, do, where does the regulation say that it is not standard practice to go beyond saying, uh, providing the details to Parliament? That's not in the regulation, is it? No, that, that is not part of the regulations. No, that's just your, your decision to not, the Minister's decision no, it is to not. it's standard practice where does it say that? Regardless of who is in office, Senator Watt. And you, as where I've does stated, it say this? the obligation to table the information about approvals for assistance appropriately balances the need for privacy okay. in relation and, to individual legal matters. And, and that's the reason and making that, information and that's the reason that was regarding given, assistance publicly available. That was the reason that was given for not informing the committee of who Minister Sukar allegedly defamed. That was the reason given for not giving the committee the date on which he allegedly made these defamatory comments. But what I'm asking is how uh, Minister, comment, uh, Minister Sukar's actions or comments related to his ministerial duties. That is the key question for deciding whether taxpayer funds can be provided to Minister Sukar. So how did his actions relate to his ministerial duties. And again, oh, Chair. Oh, Senator, if I, I can uh, assist. Um, uh, in this instance, we're in the circumstance where whilst uh, the person has uh, written to uh, Minister Sukkar to advise of a, an intention to initiate proceedings, those proceedings have not been initiated in a court of law. Uh, so we're in unusual circumstances from what uh, we might normally be with these type of applications, and that's why we're uh, um, unable to provide the details that you're uh, re requesting um, in order to protect the and preserve the privacy of the person involved. But I'm not Ms Jones, so sorry, just to clarify, sorry, Senator Watt, just to make clear that some of these matters have been taken on notice, so you're not Correct. saying that you won't answer the no. question. And just to look at the, just to remind all senators of the rules, in taking questions on notice, and I refer to the Senate rules, it's usually because the information sought is not readily available, or the question has implications which the witness would like to consider before responding. So it's, on, it's in that context. So, I but understand. minister, if you're not prepared to say to this committee how Minister Sukar's actions relate to his ministerial duties, you're effectively sending a bill to taxpayers to cover his expenses without justifying how that payment can be made under the regulations. Well, in the first instance, and I'll just confirm with the Secretary, there have been no invoices in relation to this matter. And I'll just confirm that with the sure, Secretary. Sure, but... That is, that is correct. But Senator. he has had approval to incur legal expenses and to have them paid by the taxpayer. 
I mean, this scheme is not there so that ministers can just wander around defaming whoever they like in whatever situation. Chair, that, that is, that is I'm not, an inappropriate No, no, no that, I'm that. saying that's, this scheme does not exist for that. This scheme exists to pay the legal expenses of ministers where they're being sued for something that's connected to their ministerial duties. And I'm seeking clarification about how this approval relates to his ministerial duties. And I understand that. And what we've said is to properly consider what we're able to provide, we will take that on notice. So why did you consider it appropriate for taxpayers to and put the again, bill? And again, Chair, I've stated we will take that on notice to see what we can properly provide to the committee, Senator Watt. Um, uh, we are over time. I've given you a bit of grace, Senator Watt. Uh, perhaps we could move um, to Senator Van and then return to you if you have any more questions. Uh, I could so probably I, wrap up this bit in two minutes if you'd like me to. If you've got, what, two more minutes yeah. in relation to this issue? All right, thanks, yeah. Senator Watt. So Just two you, more minutes. So at this point in time, uh, taxpayers have not paid anything for Minister Sukar's bills. I'll get the secretary. That reminds my understanding of the status. Senator, what, what I can confirm is that the department has not received any invoices in relation to this matter, so we have not approved any expenditure. And uh, does proceedings have not been initiated? Um, are the parties in discussions? Like, where is this whole thing up to? Uh, the department doesn't have that information. Right. Um, okay, I'll come back to another form of legal assistance shortly. Thanks very much, Senator Watt. Um, Senator Van, I'll give um, you the call. Thank you kindly, Chair. If uh, Ms Chichi would come back to the table, please. I've got some questions about the Respect at Work Council. <coughs> Good morning, Ms Chichi. Good morning. Um, Ms Tucci, could you please set out for the committee what resources have been provided to the Australian Human Rights Commission and the Respect at Work Council to assist them in implementing the Respect at Work report? Uh, yes, Senator. Um, I will just take me a minute to get that. So I think I mentioned before the overall funding the government's provided for the implementation of the report is $66.5 million. And then the funding for the Human Rights Commission to implement particular recommendations as part of that, um, I think, uh, is um, one point, um, uh, just under $1.4 million. Thank you. Um, I understand that the Attorney General's Department receives $7.1 million in funding specifically to support implementation of the Respect at Work Council, and that the Department has been asked to support various agencies such as the Human Rights Commission, um, including by providing them money to undertake specific projects. Can you please confirm whether the uh, Human Rights Commission has received any funding from the Department under this MOU, and if so, how much and for what projects? Uh, uh, yes, Senator. So um, under that MOU, we provided that um, total of $1.37 million. Um, uh, and that uh, includes um, uh, uh, funding, um, I can give you the amounts, um, uh, $304,000 um, to develop a training of pa um, package of training and education materials. On 304. The Sorry? $304 million. Yes, that's um, $304,000 um, to develop um, training and education materials on the nature, drivers and impacts of sexual harassment in the workplace and rights of responsibilities of employers and employees. Um, uh, we, uh, they also have um, $265,000 um, for development of the dedicated online platform. Uh, for uh, practical and accessible information resources to help workplaces um, ensure they're safe and free from sexual harassment. 
there's also uh, $467,000 um, to conduct a national survey on sexual harassment um, uh, with a focus on the workplace, um, um, and that will uh, take place this year. Um, we have also given them, um, in each case, amounts of $166,000. Um, uh, the first amount uh, um, in that order will uh, go to improving data collection and information sharing around sexual harassment, um, and the second amount, uh, uh, the same, um, will be uh, to develop consistent guidelines and resources on pathways for action and referral of workplace sexual harassment mm -hmm. matters. Thank, thank you very much. Um, has the uh, Human Rights Commission been supported in any other ways? such as through being given additional staff? Uh, yes, the department has um, also uh, uh, assisted with the provision of additional staff uh, to support Commissioner Jenkins. Um, and I don't we'll see whether Ms Brayshaw has the numbers. I might have to take that on notice about how many staff we've provided. Um, it might have been something like a couple of the year ones. If, if you would, that would be great. Um, and has the department been assisting the Human Rights Commission with any of these projects or will they be assisting in the future? Um, yes, we've been working closely with them. We've got a secretariat in our department um, and work uh, closely with the Human Rights Commission, both on recommendations that we're taking the lead on as well as um, supporting them with the recommendations that they're taking the lead on. Thank you, Ms Tucci. Uh, thank you, Chair. That's all I had on that. Thank, thank you very much, Senator Van. Uh, we are now able to move to legal services and the families group. Uh, so we have completed our examination of matters concerning cross-portfolio, corporate and general matters. And so if I could call relevant officers to the table. Chair, uh, just to clarify, yes. I can see some quizzical looks. Yeah. Um, I, I think we can probably continue asking these questions about legal assistance. In this, assistance group. In in this legal group, services. that's right. Yes, yeah. Senator Watt did clarify yeah. no, no, that. Thank you. Just... He's happy to continue asking some you know, related questions in this group. Understood. And on that note, I will give the call to Senator Watt. Thank you, Chair. Um, so just continuing with legal assistance to ministers, uh, and I, I have some questions about the assistance provided to Minister Reynolds. Yes. Um, and I am conscious of the subjudice rule, so I'll be very careful about how I ask these questions. Um, Thank you, Senator Watt. I, I am most grateful because yes. it's a, a very very important issue we will need there to are, take. But there are some basic factual questions that I think we're entitled to no, ask. No, 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 not, no. It, it, if it goes to any matter which may prejudice any yep, proceedings before a court. So please, please just uh, so exercise in, great care. As I said, I intend to do that. Thank you. In April 2021, the Minister for Finance approved taxpayer-funded legal assistance for Senator Linda Reynolds in relation to an AFP investigation. In a Senate estimates hearing on the 26th of May 2021, the department confirmed that the legal assistance relates to the investigation into the allegation made by Brit Ms Brittany Higgins. How much has the legal representation for Senator Reynolds in this matter cost the taxpayer so far? To date, um, no expenditure has been approved in relation to that approval. None. Um, the, and what exactly was the legal representation approved for? In what, for what reason did Minister Reynolds need legal representation? Um, I would need to go and I'll, I'll take on notice, but it would have related to her ministerial duties mm. as required by the regulations. Mm. Was it in her capacity as a witness, a potential witness in this matter? I'll take that on notice. Um, Again, we did write yesterday indicating that we would be asking questions about these matters and I, don't, I think it's reasonable to expect that witnesses would come prepared. So if we could get some answers you know, sometime today on this, that would be appreciated. Um, the AFP investigation into this matter has now finished. So is Senator Reynolds continuing to receive taxpayer-funded legal assistance or has that ended too? I refer you to the previous question uh, answer that uh, Miss Orr gave. That to date uh, there hasn't been expenditure. And is that a con and given? I understand that there's been nothing to date. 
My question is about whether the approval for legal assistance has now ended and that legal assistance won't be funded going forward. Uh, the approval is still current. There could potentially be expenditure. Right. Um, in any trial, I imagine it's possible that Senator Reynolds may be a witness. Is it normal for witnesses to have their own legal representation funded by taxpayers? It, that could certainly be under the regulations. You can provide um, uh, legal assistance for representation. Okay. Has any other minister or assistant minister applied for taxpayer funded legal assistance in relation to this matter? Uh, are you asking in relation to the AFP inquiry? The AFP investigation into the allegations made by Ms Higgins. All of the approvals um, that have been given have been either tabled um, or, or will be tabled in accordance with the regulations, which yep. I think is within three months after the financial year. Yep. My question, though, was not about what's been approved. My question was whether any other minister or assistant minister has applied for taxpayer-funded legal assistance. We Could wouldn't we take that on notice and have a look. Are you saying in relation to the same matter? Yes. We'd need to take that on notice and have a look at it. We will take it on notice, um, but I would note we wouldn't normally provide information about um, applications made but not approved. The regulations require reporting on applications that have been approved. Okay. And uh, Senator I'm Watt, can I just pause for a moment? I, I'm not ruling you out of order, but just in relation to any matters concerning an investigation mm. by a, a law enforcement agency in terms of asserting particular matters, can I just ask that you exercise extreme care um, because these matters are potentially relevant in proceedings currently before the ACT Supreme yep, Court. Understood. And I know, that you, I know that you are being very careful and I'm, I'm most grateful to you. We all care deeply about not prejudicing any matter before a court, so thank you very much thank for you, your Chair. forbearance. Understood. Um, I recognise that approvals are tabled, but can you just remind me whether any other minister or assistant minister has been approved for taxpayer-funded legal assistance in relation to the allegations made by Ms Higgins? Yeah, again, Chair, I think the point that the Chair made, we do need to be very careful, Senator Watt, because they are live proceedings. Can we just take that on notice to consider whether or not we're even able to give that information? I don't, I don't know what the answer is, I but think I am the, really the, wary now that the we're in ground Minister, the question that goes to is, live proceedings. Minister, the question, I believe, is <clears throat> in order. Uh, so, if you wish to we'll, we'll take, take it on that notice, on notice Watt. to consider the implications, as I've read out before, Thank in you. relation to the rules, that's fine. But just to, to reiterate that I believe the question is in order. We'll, we'll take it on notice to properly Thank, consider. Thank you, Minister. Um, have you, Minister, been approved for taxpayer-funded legal assistance in relation to the allegation made by Ms Higgins? Um, I would not disclose whether or not I would never name someone. I have currently two approvals, but it is not unusual for an attorney general to have claims made against them. But no expenditure has been occur incurred in relation to either of them. Right, but Mike, I mean, you're the person who approves legal assistance no, to ministers. No, not if, if you are, there is a set procedure set out for when the Prime Minister or the relevant minister is involved, or the Attorney General is involved, and it goes to the Finance Minister. Okay, I was going to ask about that. Yep. Um, there, there's a set procedure under the, the regulations. Okay, and but they would have to be satisfied that... Uh, under the regulations, the normal procedure. Yep. But you're not willing to say whether you've been approved for taxpayer-funded legal assistance Oh, it, it's the same procedure. It's in relation to the performance of your duties as a minister. Yeah, I know the, I know the rules, but I'm asking you whether you can advise the committee if you have had approval for taxpayer-funded legal assistance regarding the allegations made by Ms Higgins. It goes back to what we have spoken about before. You would not normally give details in particular because the claimants have not given permission for their details to be disclosed. Um, that's not... I'm not 
It, this is about a criminal, criminal, criminal investigation. In relation to a criminal investigation, I would take that on notice absolutely because it is live proceeding, Senator Watt. What, so you're not in a position to rule out that multiple ministers or assistant ministers have received... No, I have, we've said we'd take it on notice, but my understanding is no, but we will take it on notice to ensure that we are correct in providing that information. Mm -hmm. Senator Watt, can I just remind you that you should not infer any meaning um, in relation to a witness deciding to take a question on notice, other than, as I read out before, um, it's open to the minister to consider the implications up before the there minister There are live responds. proceedings on foot, yeah. as you know, Senator Watt, and we don't in any way want to prejudice them. No, and nor do I. And I, I know, no, your line of questioning, I know, you, you are being careful, yeah. but... Senator yep. Watt is, is being very careful. Um, it, can, I, can I just make the point that roughly half of the time that I've been allocated for questions is being used for commentary... But, so, please, can we have a go? Have any ministerial staff had approval for taxpayer-funded legal assistance in relation to the allegations made by Ms Higgins? Um, matters concerning ministerial staff are a matter for the Special Minister of State, oh. so questions should be directed. Um. OK. Um, earlier this year, the Attorney-General approved taxpayer-funded legal assistance for, quote, a claim made against Senator Reynolds on the 20th of January 2022. What was the nature of that claim? As previously advised, we wouldn't normally give information in respect of the nature of a claim in the sense that it may reveal private um, information about a claim or potentially prejudice um, proceedings. Um, how does it... How does, but I was just struggling to understand how it jeopardises legal proceedings to inform the committee and therefore taxpayers about the nature of claims that taxpayers are on the hook for? The regulations set out the, the matters that um, the minister must be satisfied of in approving a claim, which is that it relates to their ministerial duties. In terms of giving details about the claim, um, if a claim is not before a court, it's a private matter and there might be privacy implications in respect of an individual. If a matter is before a court, it may be the case that we could provide some information, but we would need to consult so I can take that question on notice and check whether there is further information we can provide. I'm just interested to know, for instance, is it a workplace claim? Is it a defamation claim? I'm not, not, not seeking to understand the exact circumstances, just the general nature of that claim. And I think that's what I was explaining to you before, Senator, what in terms of the regulations. And again, it, it, it's regardless of who is in office. This is no reflection on a particular. It's regardless of who. <coughs> the regulations set out what does need to be tabled in the parliament and then the obligation itself, and again, this is for both parties, um, it's not standard practice for further information to be provided about the matter. You've discharged your obligation in relation to the tabling uh, in the parliament. And as I said previously, the obligation to table information about approval for assistance appropriately balances the need for privacy in relation to individual legal matters and making information regarding assistance publicly available. And then I think I also put on the record for you, it would be inappropriate for a minister or department to comment on individual matters due to the potential for disclosure to impact upon the proceedings. For example, disclosure could infringe the privacy of a claimant. And that's what the official was referring to. Okay. Senator and Watt, we will need to move uh, to other senators. We can return to you, of course. So do you I want me to, do want me to just finish off the two or three questions I've got about Senator Reynolds? Yeah, yeah and we can work out whether or not we can provide you the yeah. information or we have to if take If you've got a notice. couple of questions which will complete this The Senator topic, Reynolds questions, uh, yes. I, I will extend that grace to you for a couple of minutes. So this, this claim, the one uh, made against Senator Reynolds on the 20th of January this year, has this claim been resolved? Again, I will take that on notice as to what we can provide for you. Well, do you know the answer? We don't have that information. We would need to follow how, up. And how does this claim relate to the exercise of Senator Reynolds' ministerial duties? Again, Again we'll take, take that on notice for you, Senator Watt. And how much has Senator Reynolds claimed so far in relation to this claim made against her? Uh, no expenditure. None? 
Thanks. That's it for Senator Reynolds. Oh, th thank you very much, uh, Senator Watt. I'll now give the call to Senator Waters. Uh, oh, sorry. Apologies, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, sorry Senator sorry. Thorpe. Uh, <clears throat> my question's in relation to the National Legal Assistance Partnership funding. We'll just get the relevant officers for the table. In the meantime, uh, my question is, has the Minister or the Department consulted with the states and territories on the adequacy of the Commonwealth contribution to the National Legal Assistance Partnership funding? Uh, thank you, Senator. <clears throat> uh, Adam Knott, Acting Assistant Secretary, Legal Assistance Branch. Um, in relation to consultation on the adequacy of funding under, under the National Legal Assistance Partnership, uh, funding really is a, um, a common issue that we hear from the sector and the states and territories. There's a lot of discussion around uh, funding under the, under the NLAP, as it's called by us. Um, recently, in the last budget, there was additional funding that was provided for a range of targeted measures. That funding has now been uh, mostly rolled out to the states and territories. We continue to engage with the, the, the state officials through a interdepartmental sort of committee group that we have, as well as um, seek feedback through an advisory group, which is made up of sector representatives. Thank you. So have you consulted with uh, ATSLs about their funding and whether they have enough funding under NLAP? Uh, yes, so the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Services and their peak body, uh, NATSELS, uh, they are members of the advisory group uh, that supports the states and territories and the Commonwealth in the implementation and the delivery of the Excellent. So, and what did they tell you? Um, uh, most recently, the conversations have been focused on uh, the additional funding that's been recently provided to support expensive uh, cases uh, and coronial inquiries. That's been a um, long-running, I guess, topic uh, for discussion. Uh, in the, um, uh, as part of the closing the gap measure recently, there's been some additional funding provided for that purpose. Mm. So it's been quite a positive response that we've had from them uh, around the, the delivery of that additional funding to support that particular need that they've identified. Thank you. So do you recognise that the contribution to NLAP by the Commonwealth is seriously inadequate? Oh, Senator, that would, that's not really a question I could answer as a matter of, yeah, sort of chair, opinion. Chair, that, but you're asking for an opinion from the official. I, I apologise. I was actually checking something with the Secretariat. I, I didn't quite I'll hear. take that back. Uh, um, if you could just, if you are asking Senator for an opinion, Senator sure. Thorpe, oh, then, well, then it's not open. Information that can I, be provided to I, you. I might be able to assist in, in broad terms here. Um, the, there is always an ongoing discussion about uh, legal assistance and, and it is an area of great need. Um, since uh, 2020, there has been a significant amount of additional funding provided uh, through various measures, um, uh, which m many of which have gone through the National Legal Assistance Partnership, although some sit outside of that as well. Um, so, um, for example, there's been uh, dedicated funding for legal yeah. services to um, women. My, my, sorry, just to bring you back to the question, my question is not about what you're funding, it's about the inadequacies of the funding. Uh, I'm not asking if you've contributed to NLAP, I'm asking is the contribution enough because based on what all the different parties are telling you, is the funding provided enough to be able to make, meet the need. So, Senator, if I might just come back to the NLAP quickly, though. Um, so that is the, the Commonwealth's uh, contribution towards legal assistance funding. It doesn't contain um, the state uh, contribution, for example. That's not, that's not in there. Uh, we, we, as, I, as I said earlier, we do hear regularly from stakeholders about uh, legal assistance and there is a significant need and, and I think that is well understood. Um, but we have been working um, and through um, the last few budgets and, and uh, mid-year economic financial outlook uh, processes have been, uh, there has been additional funding provided. So it's certainly um, you know, something where we are continuing to work across the legal assistance sector um, 
and we meet regularly with them. Will you increase that them. in the in the coming financial year, NLAP? Uh, Senator, the, um, the National Legal Assistance Partnership will continue until 2025, um, and the, the funding in there is already set out. And will it be increased? And uh, any uh, increase in funding is, of course, a matter for government. Um, but we will continue to, uh, as we do, engage readily with our stakeholders on where that need is and, and what it is looking like. Are you aware of the disparity between mainstream legal services and Aboriginal legal services in terms of salaries? Uh, Chair, that's not a question for the official. Well, I would, um, Minister, I don't see that this question is out of order to the extent that this is a matter for the department. If it's not a matter for the department, then it's not relevant. So perhaps the department could explain whether that is in the scope of your responsibilities. Um, well, I'll, I'll start off and I'll ask um, um, Ms Harvey to expand, but obviously we provide funding under the agreement uh, to legal aid commissions. We provide funding uh, to the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander services. Uh, then it's a matter for them to determine them. salaries within their organisations. Uh, I, I acknowledge the, the um, general point around uh, how each of the individual organisations are able to manage their global budget and uh, apply it to salaries. Um, that is at their, uh, at their discretion, um, but it's subject to their overall funding envelope. Absolutely, it's subject to their funding. So black lawyers in the black legal service system don't get paid the same as a, as a lawyer in a mainstream service. So um, I think that's a real issue that um, the department needs to take very, very seriously. So uh, just on that, uh, if you if you are aware of this of the disparity between an Aboriginal legal service and a mainstream service, because we can't pay lawyers the same as the mainstream, that's the fact of the matter. So could you please provide on notice a breakdown for each state and territory? Uh, the disparity compared to legal aid commissions, state prosecutions and other equivalent state employers of lawyers. Uh, and we'd like a breakdown state and territory. Uh, if you don't have, do you have this information? Senator, I, I don't think that would be information we would necessarily have. Um, so what we would have is certainly under the NLAP and other agreements, uh, the funding provided by the Commonwealth to um, the, the, essentially the three parts of the legal assistance sector. Uh, what we don't necessarily have is what the states and territories contribute to those parts of the different parts of the sector, and I don't think we would necessarily have the different pay scales because they'll be set um, you know, in, in a legal aid commission, for example. It'll be it'll be set by that particular organisation. I think there's 130 or something um, community legal centres. Mm. They will all set their own. So based on the funding they receive from the Commonwealth. I'll go to my next question because I know time is limited. You've got two minutes. Senator. Does the Minister yeah. or the Department know the rate of attrition and loss of lawyers from Aboriginal and, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services to state legal aid commissions and prosecution services on account of this disparity? Again, Senator, I don't think that is uh, information that we would, would readily have available. What, Why not? what I would add to that, Senator, though, is uh, I think Ms Harvey has outlined, and as did Mr Knott, the fact that um, uh, we have regular direct engagement with NATSLs and individual ATSLs, uh, and um, they raise with us a, a range of issues relevant to the operation of their organisations. Um, uh, in terms of spe specific percentage figures, um, I don't, that's, I, I'll, I'll stand to be corrected, but I don't think that's something that we require reporting on underneath the, the NLAP. Um, but we certainly uh, talk to them on a regular yeah, basis. Yeah, and thank you for that, that because they've, I'm asking questions from them. Uh, so you would then know uh, the, the file loads is that true or not, that you would understand the file loads between a, a 
black legal service and a mainstream service. Do you, are you aware of that as a department? Have you looked at the file loads? Senator, um, so we, as, as Ms Jones uh, noted, have regular conversations with uh, NATSALs and with individual ATSALs. And so these issues are issues that we're aware of in a broad sense, I suppose. But what I'm saying to you is I don't necessarily have a, a breakdown that I could provide you of that. So could you uh, take that on notice? It to, to, we can certainly take on notice to see if we have that breakdown. I, yep. I look at my colleague, I don't, I suspect we don't, but certainly we, we may. So we're happy to yes. take that on notice. Senator, that's right. We're, we're unlikely to have that level of information. So uh, because the funding runs through a national partnership agreement, uh, uh, the funding is provided to the states and territories, and then they have the day-to-day -day sort of operational relationship with individual organisations. And that's in recognition that um, state governments are closer to sort of the communities that these services are serving uh, and better understand what their legal needs are. Uh, so they would be having those uh, operational conversations around load, um, uh, staffing pressures, that sort of thing yeah. with state governments. I, I understand that. I, look, I just have one more, and this may help you, uh, and that is, have, have you undertaken any recent surveys of met and unmet legal need for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country? Uh, Senator, I think the last major um, national survey of uh, legal need was conducted in, uh, I think, 2010 or 2012. Yes. Um, there hasn't been a uh, national study of legal need since that time. Mm. Uh, however, uh, states and territories have undertaken a range of work within their jurisdictions mm. to understand legal need uh, in each jurisdiction. Uh, and those, that work feeds into um, a thing called collaborative service planning and jurisdictional mm. planning. So, so are you aware of the unmet uh, Senator needs Thorpe, you did promise for Aboriginal me that was your and Torres Strait Islander people in this country? Senator Thorpe, we are going to have to... I'm sorry, I can return to you, but that was your last question and we're well over your allocated time. Uh, we will return to you if you so wish. Uh, I'm now just going to ask a, a few questions. In relation, and this is just also in relation to the same issue being asked by Senator Thorpe, yeah. uh, is NLAP funded primarily by the federal government or is this a shared space? If you could just explain the nature of mm -hmm. this type Certainly, of funding. Senator, I'm, I'm happy to start and my, my colleague might fill in a little bit more of the details. Uh, so the National Legal Assistance Partnership is a partnership between the Commonwealth and all of the states and territories. And it's the mechanism through which the Commonwealth provides funding um, legal assistance funding and so uh, that funding then goes to each of those states and territories and that's um, all set out in the schedules which are published on our um, the Attorney General's Department website um, and that funding is then um, allocated so there are different streams and so for some streams it's um, funding that that must go to a particular service so for example for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services it's quarantined and there is a stream that must go to them other streams um, the the states and territories will then make decisions about exactly which legal service it goes to um, but that is the uh, the Commonwealth's contribution towards uh, legal services, it, it, legal assistance, sorry. Um, for example, um, in, in the area of family law, that's something funded, uh, it's a Commonwealth responsibility funded by the, by the Commonwealth. Um, states and territories also provide funding through, um, primarily through legal aid commissions and community legal centres and also through outsource. Uh, can the department outline if there are any funding increases in NLAP from the Commonwealth? Uh, certainly, Senator. Um, so, in the, uh, in the most recent, no, sorry, in the 2021-22 budget, um, that was the most recent budget, uh, there was um, uh, money provided, um, so $129 million was provided uh, to deliver legal services to women, including those experiencing or at risk of family violence. So that went through the National Legal Assistance Partnership. Uh, there was $60 million um, in funding for clients with mental health conditions. There was uh, $43.9 million for specialist workplace and discrimination lawyers to assist people 
experiencing workplace sexual harassment. In it, that was in response to the Respect at Work report and went through the NLAP. Um, and there was $83.1 million for maintaining and enhancing the family advocacy and support services, um, which also went through the NLAP. Maybe uh, I could just ask you, because I know there are lots of different there was additional divisions, um, what's the value of the current NLAP agreement over the five years, and how does that differ from the previous agreement? Just trying to get a measure of the Commonwealth's contribution. Certainly. Um, the, uh, the NLAP as it stands now is around $2.3 billion over five years. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't have the figure for the previous agreement currently at my fingertips. Um, but my colleague does that represent an increase in funding? That does represent an increase in funding. So my colleague, Mr. Knott, might have the previous one. Yeah, Senator, the the previous national partnership agreement uh, contained, I guess, a, I guess, a different configuration of funding streams. So it's very difficult to compare one um, to the other. Uh, however, what uh, what I could say is that since 2020, uh, which is when the current uh, national partnership agreement commenced, the government's invested uh, over $725 million in additional funding uh, into legal assistance. And Compared with the previous five years? Uh, I, just since that time. Right. Yeah, so since, since 2020. Well, to the extent that you can provide more details on notice, so we just get a proper understanding, that would be, um, that would be terrific. Yes. All right, thank you very much. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, Senator Watt, are you seeking the call? I am. Senator Watt, you have the call. Um, just a few more questions on legal assistance to ministers. Um, according to the Hot Topics brief, which the department prepared for additional estimates in March this year, uh, sorry, last year, um, and which it released under FOI laws on the 22nd of October, 2020, then Attorney General Christian Porter approved assistance for Minister Alan Tudge to assist in an inquiry. According to that brief, the assistance related to the preparation of a witness statement by Mr Tudge in connection with an AFP investigation into a matter which occurred whilst the minister was undertaking his ministerial duties. Um, at, the, at a Senate estimates hearing on the 26th of May last year, the department confirmed that the AFP investigation related to an incident that occurred and an event Mr Tudge was present at. Uh, what was the event? I would need to take that on notice. Ms Orr, could you just take your mask Sorry. off so we can hear you properly? Sorry. Thank you. Ms Orr, I'm really trying, and I'm, this is not about you as an individual, but every single example of legal assistance I've asked about today was flagged before this hearing, and every time I'm told that questions have to be taken on notice. In terms of the approvals granted and the expenditure, um, we're certainly able to provide, but when it goes to details around the claim itself, we will generally need to take them on notice to consider what information we can provide. With How was the event related to Mr Tudge's ministerial duties? I mean, if he was just at the pub having drinks with people, that's surely not related to his ministerial duties. If he was at an official function, depending on the function, maybe it is. So what, in what way was this claim relating to his ministerial duties? So we'll, uh, as Ms Orr said, we'll look to take that on notice and consider what additional information we can provide you, Senator. I think we've previously been told at estimates that the investigation did not relate to Mr Tudge's own behaviour. Is that familiar? I believe that's correct. Did it relate to the behaviour of his staff? Again, I would need to take that on notice to confirm what we can provide. So we can be told that it doesn't involve a minister directly, but we can't be told if it involves his staff or anything else about the claim. I think the witness just indicated she'd take it on notice for you. Minister, can you understand our frustration that we have provided notice to your department that we'd be asking these questions, questions about the payment of taxpayers' funds to assist ministers and Almost every question we've asked, we have not been able to get an answer to. Like, what was the point in us giving you advance warning? Again, I think I've clearly set out the information that can be provided and can be provided publicly. Um, this is a cross government, as you know, Senator Watt, regardless of who is in office. Um, the witness has appropriately taken your questions on notice to determine what information, if any, or not is able to be further provided. 
Uh, has the investigation come to an end? And if so, when? Again, I'll take that on notice. Were any charges laid? I'll take that on notice. Did Mr Tudge provide a formal witness statement? I'll take that on notice. Uh, why would Mr Tudge require legal assistance to provide a witness statement if that's what he did? I will take that on notice. Uh, Minister, you, you've got strong views about this. Shouldn't ministers just cooperate with police investigations? Oh, well, Senator Watt. Um, you know a bit about this. You have been down this path so many times before. I'm not going to reiterate it. The minister was, <coughs> I understand, approved assistance in accordance with the regulations. Because you certainly wouldn't support your Senator Watt, if I can just, if I can just approved assistance. In Senator the Watt, uh, it, it is contrary to the standing orders to reflect on a member. I'm just asking that you can bear that in mind in, in relation to your questions. How much has legal representation for Mr Tudge cost the taxpayer so far? Uh, there's been nil expenditure in relation to that approval. What about other approvals involving Mr Tudge? I would have to take... Are you asking ever? Yep. I would have to take that on notice to, to, to be sure about an answer. Um, and finally, Minister Fletcher, on the 7th of May, 2021, the Attorney-General approved assistance for Minister Paul Fletcher in relation to a claim made on the 21st of April last year regarding an employment matter. The Department confirmed in, in response to a question on notice following Senate estimates that the matter related to Australia Post. Um, could you confirm that that matter related to Ms Christine Holgate? Uh, I'll take that on notice. Because you don't know or because you want to talk to people about whether you can answer? Because I want to consider what I can appropriately provide. Did, you, did anyone in the department think to consider that before coming along today, given that we flagged we would be asking questions about this? Uh, um, obviously, Senator, um, with the letter we received yesterday afternoon uh, indicating areas of interest, um, we um, prepared, uh, as we were proposing to anyway, uh, the issue remains of uh, needing to ensure that we can assess uh, the appropriateness of information and balancing uh, the challenges around privacy uh, matters that are before the court or subject to investigation. I mean, it just really makes estimates a bit of a farce, doesn't it, if question after question is just taken on we'll notice. take that as a comment, Senator Watt. The officials have these are questions given about, the information these are that they are able to give you. These are questions trying to... to share information that they need to go away and properly consider. These are questions trying to assess whether taxpayers' funds are being used appropriately. And Senator Watt, as I have already stated, and again, this is across government, regardless of who is in office, in terms of what you are required to table uh, in the parliament in relation to the decisions, and then that is appropriately balanced with the obligation to table information about approval for assistance in balancing the needs of privacy, in relation to individual legal matters and making information regarding, regarding assistance publicly available. And again, as the, uh, the officials have stated, um, and that's why they've taken your questions on notice, it would be inappropriate to comment on individual matters due to the potential for disclosure to impact upon a proceeding, or for example, disclosure could infringe the privacy of a claimant. So again, Chair, the officials have properly taken the questions on notice and, as the official has stated, for further consideration. Um, how much has it so far cost taxpayers to provide Mr Fletcher with legal assistance in relation to this matter? Uh, to date, nil expenditure for that approval. And did any other minister, including the Prime Minister, receive any taxpayer-funded legal assistance in relation to the Christine Holgate matter? Um, I'll take that on notice. Are you asking, was there approval for mm -hmm. the Prime Minister? I will take that on or notice. Or any other minister? And if so, uh, how much has been spent? Um, I don't think I can take it any further, given Thank we you, know Chair. that the answer will Senator all be on notice, taken on notice. Uh, yes, Senator Van. Thank you. Um, Ms Jones, did I hear you right when you said the, uh, the, the notice that uh, Senator Watt provided you was yesterday afternoon? We received the uh, letter in the department yesterday. It was dated yesterday to me. Okay, so it's not really, couldn't be clarified as you know, any lengthy notice or allow you to do the sort of work that, that he's sort of insisting that you provide today? I, I just note it was yesterday. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Van. We've got uh, other is questions. Is anyone seeking the call in relation to legal services? I will. Yep. Uh, Senator Thorpe, you have the call. Right. Thank you. Uh, where was I? So I was talking about the uh, discrepancy, if you like, between how black services get funded compared to others. Chair, are we going uh, back to the topic we're on? Just we'll bring the relevant witnesses to the table. OK, that'll give me some time to work out where I'm up to. <laughs> um, so back to the I'll issues wait. that you were canvassing before, Senator Thorpe? Yes. Just for the, for yes. We'll just get the relevant Please. officials for you, Senator Thorpe. I just want to go back to um, the surveys of met and unmet legal need for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across states and territories. Uh, can you tell me why the, your department isn't looking at that and hasn't looked at that for, well, I heard earlier since, what was it, 2010? Uh, so, Senator, the, uh, the last national survey uh, of unmet legal need was conducted by the New South Wales Law and Justice Foundation, uh, and I think it was based on data collected in 2010 and then uh, analysed and reported in around 2012. Since that time, there hasn't been a national survey. Uh, however, what has happened is that through uh, both the current uh, National Partnership Agreement and the previous National Partnership Agreement, there was a process established uh, called collaborative service planning uh, and jurisdictional planning. Uh, and a key component of those processes, which have been running now for about um, seven or eight years, has been around individual jurisdictions looking at uh, uh, legal need, pressure points, mm. uh, collaboration so, between yeah. uh, service providers in those uh, My question sectors. is around the Commonwealth. I, I, I just want to know what is the Commonwealth Department doing around the un unmet needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country and the lack of service delivery, our Aboriginal legal services, are having to shut their doors because of the discrepancy between what they get funded and what the mainstream services get funded. We can't afford the same lawyers as the mainstream services. And we have 500 Aboriginal deaths in custody in this country. And we have ongoing child removals. Yet our services are struggling. Why, why, why is the, what's the difference between black and white services? Why do we get less money? When, when we've got more need? Um, Senator, there's not much that I can really add to, the, to what I've previously said and my colleagues have previously said uh, around the funding that goes into, uh, through the National Partnership Agreement. Uh, there are multiple streams in there. There's a, um, a baseline amount of funding for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, a baseline of funding for community legal centres yeah. and legal yeah, aid commissions. Yeah, I understand that. I, I, I understand that. But doesn't it not concern you that you don't know the rate of unmet legal need in this country? Is, isn't that your job? Uh, Senator, we're certainly aware of uh, various reports that have been uh, released over the years, feedback that we receive from service providers um, around uh, pressure points in the system uh, and where there is unmet legal need. Um, so yes, we are aware of, of that uh, and we feed. Can you provide that information yeah. then on notice, the do, unmet needs for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander what I people? I do, just to assist you, just also so you've got this in front of you, just in terms of um, the, the legal assistance that the Commonwealth can provide, and then I might get um, Ms Hervey to take you through the negotiations, what's discussed with states and territories, etc. So what we're talking about at the moment, as you have referred to, is we provide funding to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island legal services, as you have called ATSILs, uh, around Australia under the National Legal Assistance Partnership, so that's what we've been referring to. 
Under the partnership, in terms of 2020 to 2025, they will receive over $440 million over that five-year period. I think prior in your previous round of questions, um, you had asked whether or not there had been an increase. So in 2015 to 20, under that same agreement, they were receiving 390.24 million. So in determining that um, when you go into negotiations, additional funding has been provided. So you've got the 390.24 under the previous to 2020-25 is now yep. 440 million. Now, this is where the funding does also come from different streams. That figure does not include the additional funding announced in the 2021-2022 budget. So in May 2020, you would be aware we committed additional funding. It was around 63.3 million yep. uh, into frontline legal services. Yep. Uh, sorry, to, sorry, Minister, I'm just going by my timing question. Um, and it's not about it's about the disparity. I'm just taking you through the, what the about funding is. What evidence do you have to fund us less and and others that aren't us more? What is how do you come up with that? And we have the sat we in fact we have more uh, red tape to go through than the mainstream. We have more of a caseload than the mainstream when it comes to the the issues that colonisation has brought upon us. So does the minister or the department intend to carry out such a survey to obtain information on the, on the adequacy of funding regarding unmet legal need, salary disparity or attrition between legal aid commissions and ATSOs? Do you plan to do that? Because you need informed decision making, right? Senator, um, at, at this stage, uh, we don't have a, a plan to um, uh, to conduct another national uh, survey. As Mr Knott has talked about, that the last one was uh, conducted by the Law and Justice Foundation of New South Wales. Um, we do, uh, through our engagement uh, with ATSALS and with NATSALS, um, have discussions about particular areas of legal need. I think um, the, um, so for example, the, the funding that was provided uh, in the budget last year under the, I think it's the budget last year, maybe it was May, for under, for the, under the Closing the Gap uh, implementation plan, which went to um, specific funding for uh, participation yes. in coronavirus. Again, it's not about the funding, cases. it's I, about having a look at how much a lawyer gets when they walk into legal aid, what's their salary compared to walking into the black legal service? I, That's what I'm asking. And I can tell you now, se it's much less. Why? Senator Why? Thorpe, I think um, we, we can't attract good lawyers because we're paying them peanuts because we're given peanuts. So, Senator Thorpe, just to remind Senator Thorpe that this question has already been asked and to the extent that you're able to take it on, on notice. notice. Senator Thorpe, is there any other part of that question that you haven't sought information about that you'd like to to raise with the department? If I could perhaps just add one thing, Senator. Thanks, Ms Harvey. Um, uh, uh, so I, I, I appreciate that um, uh, I was talking about the coronials and expensive cases. I, I raise that because that is a conversation that has gone on about le where legal need is. Um, under the National Legal Assistance Partnership, the funding that we provide, that the Commonwealth provides, um, for example, the funding that goes to legal aid commissions is uh, essentially for Commonwealth legal matters. So it's for Commonwealth criminal matters and for family law. There are um, also provisions in there for, for family violence uh, when it's connected with family law. Uh, in, um, for the community legal centres, there's a little bit of a mix in there around whether it's for federal or for state matters. Uh, the, the funding that we provide to uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, this doesn't go to necessarily to your question about uh, amount, but it goes to uh, that. that is really not, uh, it's not quarantined for Commonwealth mm. matters. It Thank is you. able to be used for all matters. Thank and you. It is a joint responsibility 
of the Commonwealth with the states and territories around legal assistance. Thank funding. you. Can, can I get, uh, please, um, your department or the minister to yep. uh, bring back on notice what is the disparity between paying a lawyer that walks into the Aboriginal legal service and one that works into a mainstream? And can you please give me some justifi justification on why we get paid less than the service down the road? It's been taken on. Because we can't maintain that. We're sick of, you know, Thanks. getting the, the crumbs. Um, thank you very much, it's Senator Thorpe. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank, Senator. thank you so much. Uh, I will now return to Senator Watt. Senator Watt, you have the call. Thanks, Chair. Um, my next bracket of questions is about the what the government calls its social media anti-trolling bill. Uh, Senator Watt, just in relation to that matter, uh, I know Senator Mullen asked some questions about the bill. Uh, I have since been informed that there was a decision taken. I understand. Advice. Oh, no, you're, yes, sorry. Chair, no, you're eating yes. up time. We've already spoken no, I'm not, about I this. Won't inv I won't erode any of your time, but just uh, if I could ask you in relation to the advice given by the clerk that this, is the, this bill is now before our committee. We are <coughs> running a bill inquiry. Uh, I will extend you the same grace as Senator Mullen. My apologies, I wasn't aware of this advice back from 2010. So if I could just ask you to keep your questions of a general nature, not to drill down into certain sort of clauses, because these are matters currently before the committee in another Absolutely. forum. Thanks, yep. Senator Will do. I'll do exactly what Senator Mullen did. Um, the, the government, there's been many people within the government, the Prime Minister, the Attorney, others, who've said that the purpose of this bill is to protect women and children in particular from online harassment. Is that correct, Minister? That's one of the purposes of the bill. In particular, it addresses urgent concerns arising from the High Court's decision in the Fairfax Media case yep. and VOLA, um, which we obviously had evidence given to, uh, earlier today. And it also empowers Australians to respond appropriately uh, to defamatory comments defamatory comments by anonymous trolls. Right. So one of the purposes is to prevent, for instance, people online, you know, abusing others, questioning their mental health, making all sorts of accusations about them. Is that, that right? Well, I've, I've said empowers Australians to respond appropriately to defamatory comments by anonymous trolls. Mm -hmm. So would it, be, would it be intended then to prevent social media posts such as the one we saw last night from Senator Holly Hughes, where she attacked uh, Rochelle Miller, uh, who has made allegations against Minister Tudd, saying, wow, you have some serious issues. Honey, lots of therapy. So implying that Ms Miller I, has mental health problems. I'm not aware of that, problems. Chair, so I'm not going to comment on it. I'm not aware of that. But what I can do is, and this was when we were speaking with Jim Mole, uh, Senator Molan this morning, uh, in relation to, in particular, this bill, um, it addresses the harmful impacts of defamatory material posted online anonymously, and in particular, unmasking the anonymous trolls. So um, anonymous trolls are targeted by this bill, but trolls who put their name to their tweets, like Senator Hughes, implying that someone who is alleging serious abuse, they can still make accusations about mental health of people with impunity. I, I will get the official to take you through that. No, no, the Minister, that no, 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 Minister. I'm asking you, and, and as the Minister, if I that kind of behaviour from your senators... I can appropriately refer that. You need an explanation as to what the bill does. The bill assists in unmasking anonymous trolls so that you have the information in the event that, A, you would like the information taken down, or alternatively, B, would like to pursue an action. If you already have that information, you don't need to unmask the troll. Um, the, on the 1st of June last year, The Guardian reported that Harvey Norman had taken the extreme step of deleting its Twitter account after a campaign calling out Harvey Norman's refusal to repay tens of millions of dollars of taxpayer-funded JobKeeper payments despite the fact the company doubled its profits during the pandemic. Are you aware of this? In relation to the online trolling bill? Yep. No, I'm sorry, Senator Watt. Well, I'm are not. you aware of um, 
these reports that Harvey Norman deleted their Twitter account. Sorry, I'm just um, struggling well, it, to understand the relevance. Um, Senator it, it, Watt, sorry, please don't, just for a moment, I just remind you that your question needs to be relevant to the department. Uh, and the scope of the department's work yep. uh, and expenditure. So could you just please explain the how yep. that is relevant well, to the department's functions, please? The Guardian report went on to say that Harvey Norman had deleted its Twitter account after mass blockings of critics and bizarre emoji responses to those who challenged the company over the action. So would that kind of posting about Harvey Norman or any other company be the type of behaviour that would be limited under this bill? Well, again, Chair, we went through this, Senator Molan, this morning, but what I might do is get Mr Johnson, Senator Watt, to take you through what the purpose of this bill is. Well, I don't, I don't need a long explanation of the purpose of the bill. I'm asking whether that behaviour would be regulated by this bill. I can answer that, Senator. The bill does not limit behaviour. The bill seeks to and allow, provide tools for a person who receives defamatory comments on social media to commence defamation proceedings against that person. I'm not familiar with the example you've raised, but with it being, it sounds like against a company, the application of defamation law may be limited. Um, but if uh, it was a situation in which um, a person received social media comments that were defamatory, which is, again, overlapping with, but not the same as online abuse that's not defamatory. This bill is about enabling people to pursue defamation proceedings when the current barrier to doing so is not knowing the identity of the person. Where the identity is known, in the previous example you referenced, that barrier does not exist. So current defamation avenues are already available. This bill, in that respect, doesn't need to take a step. Um, it's not that there is no avenue, that avenue already exists. This bill seeks to essentially open a door that currently blocks sometimes. Okay. Has Jerry Harvey ever contacted the Prime Minister, the Attorney General or the Attorney General's office uh, to advocate for the government to introduce legislation that would allow him and his company to obtain personal information about people who criticise him or his company? Well, not that I'm aware of, Senator Watt. Could you take that on notice in terms of the Prime Minister yes, and your office? Yes, but not that I'm aware of. And, and, so, Prime Minister and your office. Um, has the Department or the Attorney General or your office consulted Mr Harvey or any other executive from Harvey Norman in relation to this legislation? I haven't personally. I know that it is subject to a committee inquiry, so that may well be part of the committee inquiry process, but no. Has the Department? Uh, so the bill was released as an exposure draft on the 1st of December with comments invited from anybody publicly until the 21st of January. No submission was received from Harvey Norman or Mr Norman in that respect and the department did not otherwise engage um, with him or his entity. Okay, they've never sought a briefing or anything like that? Um, they've never sought a briefing on the legislation? I, as far as I'm aware, Senator, uh, the department was never contacted uh, or otherwise engaged with, with Mr Harvey or his organisation. Okay. There's been a bit of conjecture about what the real purpose of this bill is and how much of it is really about trolling, how much of it is really about defamation, especially given it arose from the Vola case. And I noticed that the detailed explanatory notes that accompany the exposure draft are quite revealing. At the top of the second page, the bill has a different title. It's referred to there as the Social Media Defamation Bill 2021. Um, as opposed to the social media online trolling bill. Um, can the department confirm that the original title of the bill was the social media defamation bill? Uh, Senator, in early drafts of the bill, that did have the, the title on it, yes. And who changed or requested the change to the bill, to the title of the bill, to become the social media anti-trolling bill? Was it the Attorney General or her office? Uh, all instructions to the department um, Senator, to come through the Attorney General's office. Um, Including that? I'll have to take on notice the precise um, avenue that that came through, uh, but many aspects of the bill changed um, from its early iterations. Um, um, did the Prime Minister's office request either the Department or the Attorney General's office to change the title of the bill, to dial up the anti-trolling? Oh. Uh, the department doesn't have um, visibility of, of whether it came from the Prime Minister's office. Like I Minister, said, all, all of our instructions came from the Attorney General's office. So, Attorney, did you or your office receive requests from the PMO to change the title of the bill? Senator Watt, 
I'm a little confused as to why you're going on about the title of the bill. Well, this is an incredibly important piece of legislation. When we announced it and released it, it was widely welcomed, in particular by you know mums and dads out there. I, I'm, you want to sit here and make fun? No, 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 no. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Don't that accuse me of doing something that I'm not doing. That is designed to assist people who are subject to trolling online. But leading barristers have said that the exposure draft bears no relationship to the government's stated objectives around trolling. The Law Council president says that defamation, um, the, the draft bill will have very little impact in improving online trolling. Um, how, is this bill really about online trolling or is that it's, just what the government's saying? It is about protecting Australians who are subjected to defamatory comments online, in particular when those comments are made by anonymous trolls. That's what they're known as, anonymous trolls. If you want to sit here and criticise the protection of Australians out there, like Senator Molan has alluded to this morning, who are subjected to this behaviour and talk about the title of a bill, then shame on you, Senator no, 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 Watt. Just, shame on I you, don't, Senator no, no, Watt. We I, are no, in no. time. Minister, so, final uh, chair, question, Senator chair, Watt. No, just, final, final question. Chair, That's fine. You've, you've told me that I can't uh, make imputations about witnesses, and the minister has just done exactly that to me, so I'd ask you to get her to withdraw and be consistent in your rulings. Um, Senator Watt, if I, I have not offended asked, you, Senator Watt, I have not by asked saying anyone to shame on you. Yeah, Senator Watt, for literally Minister, answer, Minister, asking. Sorry, can I just, Senator Watt? There's not a basis for me to ask the the minister to withdraw that comment. Uh, I have not asked anyone to withdraw any comment today. Uh, but it's, you are at liberty to raise your concerns in relation to what the minister has just said. No, I'm just all I'm trying to understand is whether this bill actually does what the government claims it does. Let, let me There's tell a series you one of, of much more Can I just finish my question? There's a series of far more eminent people than me or you who have said that this bill is really about defamation, not about online trolling. Um, the bill was originally called the Social Media Defamation Bill. It mysteriously gets changed, uh, presumably at the request of your office, to change it to online trolling. Um, I'm just questioning whether it really does what it says. Uh, well, the answer is Minister, yes. before you answer, can I just ask, do you need any information about those quotes that Senator Watt has well, raised? I, I'm, I'm happy to Are answer Are you happy to Senator answer the Watt. question Trolling without... Trolling itself, as we all know, is not a legal term. It refers to a spectrum of online behaviours ranging from the merely annoying to the criminal, including posting defamatory material or otherwise attacking a person's reputation. This bill deals with the defamatory aspects of trolling. Can I also make the point, Senator Watt, because you see, we do take this seriously, given the impact of this type of behaviour sure, on I've men kids. and women I've kids, out I there. Agree. So, for example, online trolls accuse Cleo Smith's parents of being involved in the four-year-old girl's disappearance, despite the police repeatedly saying they are not suspects. And no one supports and that. And Senator Watt, you are sitting here asking me to explain the title of the bill. No, I'm, ex I'm asking you Senator Watt, I am going to have to move to other senators. We are well over time. To establish whether the bill does well, what you and the Prime Minister can know plan. where the Labor Party well, stands well, I, I, on one of the most is important ridiculous. issues Minister that is ridiculous and offensive. Min could I just ask for Minister? That is offensive that you as Minister and Senator Watt. Supports that behaviour. Senator Watt. Senator Watt, could I just ask you to pause? Senator Watt. Could I just ask you to please pause? What I would like to do, I'm very happy to return to you on this matter, but I would now, we're well over your allocated time, could I please give the call to Senator Van? Thank you. Uh, thank you kindly, Chair. Um, maybe to Ms Jones and Ms Johnson, I'm not sure which, uh, or Ms Harvey, I shouldn't prejudge. I understand that there is research from the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, from, 19, um, from 2017, I should say, that most defamation matters are bought by everyday Australians. Are you aware of that research or is, is, is that... 
roughly am, right? Senator. Yes, I am aware of that. Um, so I think the study you're referring to is, is, you said it's a study from 2017 that looked at the period from 2013 to 2017. Um, and it found that um, only 21% of defamation claims during that period uh, were commenced by people who could be characterised as public figures, which means, sorry, my maths, 79% uh, um, would be uh, brought by other people. Yeah. And, and it would be a reasonable guess or assumption that uh, trolling has only increased since 2017, in the past five years, just with the volume? Uh, so a, a couple aspects to that um, question, Senator. Um, as the attorney mentioned, the term trolling is a, a general term, yep. a collo colloquial term, if you will. So it covers many different um, types of online um, harm and poor behaviour. And there's many measures of government that address the, the different aspects. Um, the e-safety um, commissioner has responsibilities in, in that space <coughs> on a wide range. Um, and there are statistics to show that that is generally increasing over time. Some of that is because measures are being put in place um, to address. So the, the statistics previously, there was no avenue to bring a complaint to, for, for example. Um, there is also evidence that defamation specifically um, is increasing or claims being brought um, is increasing. So I have statistics here about federal court filings um, okay. on d defamatory matters. Can you tell us about those? Certainly. So this is total for Australia. I've got breakdown by states as well, but total for Australia, but commencing in 2016, um, we have six. 2017, there's 26. 2018, 32. Uh, 2019, 51. 2020, 67. Um, and then 2021, which is ends at the 26th of November, unfortunately, it's when my statistics end, is 58. So a small drop, but not for the entire sure. year. So that does show a general increase in uh, defamation filings. That's not limited to online. Uh, that could be you know, statements in the media or newspapers, but it does include um, online as part of that. So in addition to the e-safety statistics that show, generally speaking, there are, there's an increase in, in online harms being reported, um, and there is a, a, what's that, a five or six year period in showing that filings in the federal court um, a jurisdiction, at least, have had defamation matters being increasing over time. Um, until this set of uh, estimates, I also sat on the Environment and Communications Committee um, and have heard much of that evidence from the e-safety commissioner. Uh, one of the key points of evidence that she has also raised um, in estimates and, and elsewhere is that 70% of online harm is against um, women and girls, uh, females in general. Um, so would you suggest that these laws are, are also have the effect of pr helping protect women? Uh, these laws, so this law in particular, the social media um, anti-trolling bill, um, aims to protect all Australians, uh, but uh, definitely to the extent that um, uh, segments of the Australian population who are particularly vulnerable to defamatory um, attacks online, um, this bill will be particularly helpful to those individuals. But it's fair to say that it, it's a bill designed to protect Australians from online harm. To one particular version of online harm, absolutely, that is that it's, it's, its intent. Thank you, Mr Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Van. Sorry, Chair, can I ask one follow-up? Uh, yes, you can Just indeed. And Senator Van has run short with his time, so if, you, if we could run up to half past 12. No, no, but... so very, um, very thank, quickly. Thanks and very I think much, this Senator is, Scar. And I think this is a, a very important point, but the bill actually provides a mechanism where the anonymity Correct. of someone who's using a, a tag or some sort of descriptor that um, conceals their identity the bill provides an actual mechanism where that anonymity can be removed so the person who's the subject of the trolling attack defamatory comment can actually bring an action a civil action against that person directly so they're not shielded behind the confidentiality of the media service provider is that correct that is correct Senator. so that's a key point it's not just a shield against defamation actions in terms of the person providing the uh, Facebook page or something and them being liable, it actually provides a mechanism for the person who is subject to online trolling to find out the identity of the person who's engaged in that vindictive, harmful, defamatory act and to bring an action against them. That's correct, isn't it? That's completely correct. Thank Senator. you. 
Can I just add one clarification to that? Uh, and if the social media platform refuses to provide that identifying information, as I understand it, then they will be deemed to be the responsible publisher, which will then provide a cause of action for the person who has been allegedly defamed. So it's a little more nuanced than that, Senator. Um, that, that is a simplified version of, of what happens. Um, I won't take too much time, but um, the bill at the outset deems the social media company to be a publisher, which for the most part reflects current law. So it just restates the law, but prevents the person needing to so prove. So overturning VOLA deems the publisher, to, deems the social oh, so media platform aspect, to be. In that aspect, it actually is consistent with VOLA. Uh, in deeming the social media user to not be the publisher, it overturns VOLA. Yes, thank you. In deeming the social media company to be the publisher, it is uh, likely the same outcome that the principle from VOLA, because VOLA was not about the company, it was about the user. It was about Fairfax as a social media user. Um, so it's confirming um, likely confirming the law in that in that respect. Um, so they start as being the publisher and therefore potentially liable. But then the bill provides a, a conditional defence available to the social media company if they fulfil a number of requirements. One of those requirements is to disclose the contact details of the uh, originator in the circumstances contemplated by the bill. Um, I, I think it's important to frame it not as um, the social media company refusing to provide those details because the bill deliberately sets up a framework that um, in the first instance requires the originator to consent to their details being provided. And so if they don't consent, the social media company won't be able to, to disclose them. And that's an important safeguard for privacy purposes. Not every time someone says, I've been defamed, is that actually legitimate? Um, and it could be abused um, to find the contact details of somebody who is legitimately operating anonymously online. Uh, there's then a second element, which is a court order process, which allows the court to actually examine more closely if it's appropriate to disclose the contact details. Um, so either if the originator consents in the first stage or if a court considers it appropriate in the second stage, then the details can be provided. And if for whatever reason the social media company is unable or unwilling to disclose those contact details, then the social media company does not get access to the defence and is therefore potentially liable. They will then have access to other bases of, of defamation law, proving that it wasn't defamatory in the first place and all the other aspects that defamation law operates, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't have access to this defence if they're not able. And as a result, the person who's faced with the defamatory comments will always have either the originator to bring, contact de uh, to bring proceedings against because they have their contact details, or if they don't have their contact details, they'll be able to bring the proceedings against the social media company. So they will have a respondent. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. Um, it being just after 12.30, we will break for lunch for one hour and resume just after 1.30 p.m. Thank you. The committee is now in session. We are continuing with Legal Services and Family Families Group. Uh, we don't expect uh, it will be too much longer before we move to Integrity and International Group. Uh, but I will now give the call to Labor Senators. Senator Watt? Actually, we don't have any more questions. You don't have any more questions? So we're happy to, but I think Senator Waters might. All right, oh, lovely. Okay. Senator Thorpe. Um, yeah. Senator, Senator Thorpe, Thorpe is seeking the call. We are keen to keep it What subject matter will be uh, Family call. violence, prevention legal services. Thank you very much. You have the call with Senator Thorpe. Thank you. Are, are you right? Senator Thorpe, I was just going to say, um, the Family Violence Prevention Legal Services sits with the National Indigenous Australians Agency. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if we're... I, 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 sorry, I don't want to preempt any questions you might have, but um, I think we can ask if they're around the FEPLS... All right. Let, let's see how we go, hey? Unless, That's yeah, all right. Unless it's, unless it's about them coming into the NLAP. Yes, it's yes. exactly yes. about yes. that. Yep. Yep. And yes. we can Sorry. direct you. Yep. Great. Thank you. Well, I'll get right into it. Um, when will the government provide the Family Violence Prevention Legal Service sector and the National Family Violence Prevention Legal Service Forum a roadmap with timeframes for the key milestones required for this transition? Uh, example for the negotiation of funding agreements, data adjustments, changes to performance frameworks, 
preparation of new budgets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Senator, I might ask my uh, colleague, Mr. Knott, to um, yeah. answer. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, as uh, Ms. Harvey mentioned earlier, the Family Violence Prevention and Legal Services are currently being administered and uh, have the responsibility of NIAA. Uh, uh, I think uh, mid last year there was an announcement from government that they would, as you say, uh, transition across to uh, the NLAP, so the National mm -hmm. Legal Assistance Partnership, uh, as the mechanism for it to deliver their funding from the 1st of July uh, 2023. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so NIAA are uh, leading that process overall. Mm -hmm. So uh, I suspect a lot of these questions are probably uh, best direct, directed to them. Um, I am aware that they are um, putting together a roadmap, I guess you'd mm. call it, for implementation. The process from here, points of engagement with the peak body, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the key dates uh, for decision making, Great. setting out the frames of what um, their inclusion in the NLAP mm -hmm. would look like, if indeed that is where it lands. So we've been, um, in terms of AGD's role, uh, we've had several meetings with the forum and the members around the way the NLAP currently works, uh, particularly arrangements uh, that are currently in place for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services. Mm. Uh, so that engagement's been quite positive. It's going quite well, I would say. Um, but it is for NIAA yep. uh, specifically so, to map out the, yep. the process from here. So will current funding levels of family violence prevention legal service organisations and the, the National Family Violence Prevention Legal Service Forum be at least maintained or ideally un increase under NLAP? Uh, Senator, it's probably specifically a question for NIAA, but certainly um, the conversations that I've been involved with involving NIAA and stakeholders, um, my understanding is the intention is for the funding to be maintained. Uh, additional funding would really be a question for NIAA. Well, no, it's coming into AGDs, that's what we're asking. Sorry, we couldn't hear that. Uh, it's coming into uh, your, portfolio. Your, your portfolio, so that's why the question's being asked. Yes. Yeah, so I'm the, sure NIAA will hand me back, handball yeah. me back to you. Yeah, so the, the intention is um, for the funding for the FEPLSs, for the delivery mechanism of that funding uh, to go through the NLAP. Um, there isn't an intention for, uh, I guess, overall responsibility or policy um, function and roles to shift uh, into AGD. Well, the money, the questions about the money. Yeah. So if, if, if I might help, Senator, so the, the National Legal Assistance Partnership is essentially the mechanism for the Commonwealth to give money to yeah. the legal assistance sector through mm. the states and territories. Um, the appropriation for that actually um, sits in the Treasury, although we look after the NLAP. And the idea is that there may be, over time, a range of legal assistance that could go through that mechanism um, so the, there's a consolidation, <coughs> pardon me, um, but that AGD wouldn't necessarily always have policy and funding responsibility for each of those um, streams, if that makes sense. So, so has there been a needs analysis or any kind of other research that uh, will determine funding allocations to the family violence prevention legal services sector with the transition to NLAP? What processes will be used to determine funding after the transition? Uh, Senator, that probably is a question for NIAA in terms no, of the, the, the funding uh, allocation uh, that comes into the NLAP. So what will happen is um, if, if all states and territories um, agree, that's probably a key um, point to put at the outset, if there is agreement for FEP lessers to move uh, into the NLAP in terms of the funding mechanism. Uh, the uh, forward years, so the final two years of the NLAP, their funding profile would be set in terms of a funding stream uh, within the NLAP. Uh, and then beyond that, so beyond 2025, the FEP lessers will be in the same, I guess, position as all legal assistance providers in that uh, funding uh, through the NLAP comes to an end because it's a 2025 mm. um, partnership agreement. After that, uh, presumably, uh, a, a new partnership agreement will be negotiated with all states and territories, mm -hmm. and that's an opportunity for Commonwealth and state government to look at um, the requirements, the purposes of these organisations in terms of the delivering services, what their funding profile would look like at that point. 
and, and that's consistent with sort of history. Um, we're currently up to, I think, the fourth or, or fifth partnership agreement for the delivery of Commonwealth funding to states um, <coughs> for legal assistance services within each jurisdiction. So will, fam will these Aboriginal family violence legal service then have to compete against other legal services? And can your department provide assurances that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander program funds will not be redistributed to non-Aboriginal organisations? Yes, yeah, Senator. So the conversations that we've had um, with NIAA and the sector to date, uh, the, the intention at, at this point is to have um, quarantined funding streams uh, for the FVP lessers. So it's similar to the arrangements that are currently in place for Aboriginal legal services and community legal centres. So under the current uh, partnership agreement, there are quarantine funding streams and, that, and the NLAP is very clear that states are not able to move money between those funding streams to sort of shift money from uh, Aboriginal legal services to legal aid, for example, or vice versa. So. The, the intention is to have um, the same sort of arrangements as what are uh, in place uh, for the Aboriginal legal services currently. Um, the, will the, the, current... the, big, the big, sorry, the big um, caveat to put on that is that it is all subject to negotiations with the states and territories. Yes. So, and those conversations are really uh, in their sort of early days, yeah. uh, and there is a, quite a lot of time to run yet until. The arrangements do need to be finalised by the 1st of July next year. So, so currently the Family Violence Prevention Legal Services receive base funding only. Under NLAP, will there be an allowance made for CPI increases <clears throat> over funding years, as occurs with the CLCs? Um, so the, the, the funding profile that the FVP listers have when they enter um, the NLAP uh, is really a question for NIAA, that they will be the ones that are sort of would tell us what the funding for these forward years looks like, uh, and that's what will go uh, into the NLAP. So back beyond, to that. beyond that, uh, it's really a question sort of for government when the entirety of the NLAP is re uh, reviewed uh, and, and likely remade. In terms of the current arrangements for the other funding streams in the NLAP, yes, they, are, um, they all increase year on year. Uh, as you would sort of normally expect. There's, we don't, um, current arrangements for the other service streams aren't um, flat, in a, so to speak. Thank you. I just have one more question. <clears throat> uh, so will the current data recording and reporting requirements for family violence prevention legal services be maintained under the NLAP, or will there be a new reporting regime introduced? If new reporting is required, will additional funding be provided to assist in data transfer? Yes, and it's a good question. That, that, that's a good example of one of the questions that we um, need to work through closely with NIAA and the sector to understand um, the data sort of requirements that are currently imposed on them, um, what they currently collect, mm. and how that fits against the requirements of the NLAP. Um, one of the, uh, uh, I guess, favourable points to make, I suppose, is that there's a data standards manual that the sector uses, uh, which sits sort of outside of the NLAP, and it, it sets out, I guess, the definitions for different sort of legal uh, law types, client types, that sort of thing, and it's already in use by all parts of the sector. So there is some familiarity there around um, when one service is talking about, you know, uh, an information service, what does that actually mean? And uh, each sort of part of the sector has that same sort of baseline. So there is some commonality there, but it's certainly an issue uh, that we will be working through uh, uh, with the sector. Thank you. When, when will that work be done? When, when will that work be done? Uh, I, I think that, that will fit into the roadmap that NIAA are developing. So um, I think it will set out kind of points of engagement, uh, uh, I'm, I'm aware that the sector is keen to set up sort of a, um, an, an oversight committee, an advisory group um, with different names to sort of be the key point of engagement uh, in terms of the, the process and setting up the new arrangements. Uh, so I suspect uh, there will be many more meetings to come to talk, to talk about data with the sector. So. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Senator Thorpe. And that now concludes. Senator Waters, you weren't trying to draw my attention. No, I was just Sorry, turning my apologies. page over. Uh, that now concludes You'll the committee's. You'll find out soon enough. <laughs> and that now concludes the committee's examination of the Legal Services and Families Group of the Attorney General's Department. We will now move to the Integrity and International Group. If I can ask officers from that group to come to the room. Thank you so much. And I give the call to Senator Watt. Thanks, Chair. I'll just wait for the officials to join us. Um, Minister, as you know, the Prime Minister stood up and promised, promised to establish an anti-corruption commission before the last election, where months out from this election, can you give us a clear answer on behalf of the government about whether legislation to establish an anti-corruption commission will be introduced to parliament before the election? Thank you, Senator Watt, and I think you canvassed this, or Senator Waters canvassed this yesterday also with uh, Senator Birmingham. Um, we have been very clear in relation to our model. We have finalised our model on the Commonwealth Integrity <coughs> Commission, uh, and as you know, that model seeks to provide an umbrella framework that addresses the different roles of the many existing entities across the Commonwealth that are responsible for anti-corruption activities. <coughs> and I'm sure if you'd like that you can be taken through that um, later. Uh, you'd be aware that we've finalised preparation of the bill. The bill has been consulted on, and in fact, I believe there are several hundred pages. Yep. Minister, uh, just in the interest of time, the bill, can you just give us a clear answer about whether legislation be will be introduced? To be very clear, and I have consistently made this clear, and in particular in question time. The bill that we have presented is the bill that we are able to take forward. Labor has been very, very clear. You do not support our bill. On that basis, we've been very, very clear in the terms of the model of the Integrity Commission in the legislation that is drafted. You don't support our bill. You have not put forward an alternative to that bill. Okay. And on that basis, at this point in time, we won't be proceeding with it because you do not support it. And we've always said we would require bipartisan support. So it, the government will not be introducing legislation before the election? At this point in time, there is no support for our bill, Senator Watt. There is no support for our bill. You have made it very, very clear. If you are willing to give a commitment to pass the model of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission that the government has designed, then we would work cooperatively with you to pass that as quickly as we can. But it has been very, very clear, and I'm sure that you're more than happy to put this on the record today, um, by the public statements in particular, uh, that that would not be the case. Well, we won't be getting that cooperation to pass our bill in the model that we have, and therefore the government's not progressing with it at this stage. Well, thank you for clearing this up, because I think anyone who's interested in this issue has been pretty confused over the last week. You'll remember, I'm sure, last Monday, the 7th of February, the Financial Review had an article headlined, No Time for Federal ICAC Cash. Attorney General Michalia Cash said, class action reforms and a Federal Integrity Commission will have to wait until after the election as the government pursues laws on religious freedom and online trolls in the final days of parliament. So that was your position last Monday. But then on the same day, the Prime Minister did a press conference where he was asked about this. And he said, when asked whether legislation would be introduced, he said, well, we'll see. So are you telling me that the government as a whole, including the Prime Minister, has now resolved to not introduce legislation before the election? As I, uh, Minister, sorry, just before you oh. answer, 
Um, do you need to refer to that article to which no, Senator I'm aware Watt, uh, of, of the thank article? You. Thank you. Um, the question I was asked was what were the government's priorities last week, and they were religious discrimination. I'm sure we'll be discussing that uh, later on today. That is a commitment that we also took to the 2019 election, and we sought to pass that bill last week. They were our priorities. Uh, but in terms of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission, we have been very, very clear. We are willing to commit to pass the model of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission that the government has designed. And as I have stated, we would work cooperatively to pass that with Labor and the Greens, should they determine that they would also like to be a, a part of this as quickly as we can. But it is very, very clear from the public statements that have been made uh, by both the Labor Party and by the Australian Greens that that is not going to be the case and therefore the government's not progressing with it at this stage. Okay, so why did the Prime Minister on Monday contradict what you had said by saying he left the door open to it being introduced? Oh, well, he didn't do that. I, I disagree. Well, he said we'll see. He said we'll I, I see. disagree. Well, he was, he's, he was asked, um, so you think that you'll be able to get it through, being the, this legislation before May? Prime Minister, well, we'll see. How else again, can you interpret that other than him leaving the door open? Again, Senator Watt, we have a very, very clear model. We have finalised our model around the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. I did have a copy of Labor's model, and I'm sure that I will be able to find it. It is approximate, in fact, I, th I think I have it, Chair. It is two whole pages, Senator Watt. I would hardly call that a commitment to a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. We have a very, very clear model that seeks to provide, as I've stated, and I'm sure you can be taken through this, an umbrella framework that addresses the different roles of the many existing entities across the Commonwealth that are responsible for anti-corruption activities. We finalise preparation of the bill, and unlike yours, with all of two pages, that's it, that's your model, Senator Watt, two pages. We have a bill with several hundred pages attached to it. You'd be we aware have said we would be willing to pass the model of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission that the government has designed. Minister but both the Australian Labor Party, Senator Watt, and the Australian Greens have been very clear. You do not support that model. Well, Chair, I get picked up for repetitive questions. Maybe repetitive answers could be in the same category. Minister, you No, you don't get... Uh, I think, um, Senator Watt, on that point, you have been picked up for repetitive questions, which is an issue under the standing orders. The same does not apply in relation to the witness, but you can ask the witness another question. Minister, you'd be aware that you. there's a number of members of the Liberal Party who've spoken publicly against the flaws in your proposed model, mm -hmm. including the member for Wentworth, Dave Sharma, the member for Higgins, Katie Allen, and the member for Bass, Bridget Archer, some names that I reckon would be pretty familiar to you after the events of last week. So it's actually not just Labor who have concerns about your model, is it? Well, again, the government's <coughs> position is clear. We have a model and we are committed to that model. We invite you to work with us to implement that model, but you have been very, very clear. You would prefer to play politics than actually implement policy with your two pages. And on that basis, given that you are not willing to work with the government, given that you have not put forward anything other than two pages, a press release, we will not be progressing at this stage with the legislation. All right. So, as I say, last Monday, the Prime Minister said, we'll see, when asked whether the government would be introducing legislation before the election. Is the reason he was leaving the door open to that because he had a plan to go to Cabinet that night and try to cook up a deal with Cabinet, which would have seen the introduction of this anti-corruption commission? See, because again, we know about that now because of Peter Van Onselen's article. Senator Watt. You demand a very important piece of legislation that the government has introduced in relation to unmasking online trolls and assisting people bring defamation actions. With your questions now, you are demeaning 
the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. You are yet again showing why Labor will not work with the government. Is it demeaning to have members of your cabinet leak the discussions in cabinet about this bill last Monday night? That's pretty demeaning, isn't it? Well, Senator Watt, I would never comment on cabinet deliberations. Is it, uh, is it, do you think it's appropriate for the Prime Minister to use an anti-corruption commission as a bargaining chip in a deal with your own MPs to get another unrelated bill through? Because that's what he seems Senator to have done Watt, from this Senator Watt, you article. are now just dealing in innuendo well, and no, smear. That, well, are you nothing denying what— Nothing more and nothing less. Are you less. denying this, the government the chair of this has article? been very, very clear. We have a finalised model around the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. We have a bill that is several hundreds of pages long. The Labor Party's alternative is nothing more and nothing less than some political spin and two pages. If Senator Watt is saying that the Labor Party are happy to work with the government cooperatively to pass our bill, well then he should state that now for the public record. So do you deny the contents of this article? Last which, question, Senator Watt. Can I have two, please? The, are you denying the contents over. of this article, which say that the Prime Minister took a plan to last Monday night's Cabinet meeting to secure enough votes for the religious discrimination bill by also agreeing to put a National Integrity Commission bill on the notice paper for debate? Senator Watt, I learned a long time ago not to run commentary on media articles. They are just that. And in any event, I have always, always abided by the rule, you do not reveal cabinet matters. OK, my last question here, Chair. Thank you. This, this article from Peter Van Onselen um, says that cabinet erupted at this proposal, that Minister Paul Fletcher spoke strongly against the plan, along with others who raised concerns about retrospectivity provisions in the bill. Which rort exactly are ministers most concerned about if this is retrospective? Is it car park rorts? Is it sports rorts? Is it Leffington Triangle? Is it Christian Porter's donations? I mean, there's a wide range of rorts I can imagine they'd be pretty concerned about and therefore not want it to be retrospective. Which is the biggest concern? No, well, see, Chair, Chair, uh, um, sorry. No, no, Chair, I'm more than happy to respond. Yes, they erupted at the idea that it would be retrospective. Because you see, Senator Watt, this is where now you have decided to become political and demean this line of questioning. Because I'd be interested to know what Senator Kim Carr's views are on the current expulsion of Miss Vagila. Chair, Let's chair, have a look. Chair, you have decided point, to get political, chair, chair, Senator Watt. Uh, Minister, I, if I could just ha ask you to hold. Um, you have, excuse me, Senator Carr. Senator Watt has raised a point of order. Uh, what is your point of order? My point of order is relevance. Uh, for starters, the minister is not answering my question. And secondly, the matters she is going to have absolutely no bearing on the expenditure well, they do. of this department. Uh, Chair. Uh, on the expenditure of this department. You've pulled me up on that already today. I'd ask it that you enforce the same rule with the minister. Uh, thank you. On the point of order, Senator Watt, uh, it is the case that the minister does need to be relevant to the question that you have asked. Uh, and I would ask the minister to be relevant. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the, the question is, which is the biggest rule? Sorry, Justice, please don't talk over one another. Is the, which is the biggest rule that you're concerned about and your ministers are concerned about? That, uh, Senator, Senator Watt, I would just ask you to re re remember that you cannot reflect on any member or senator, so please be very careful with how you phrase your questions. I will rule that in order. Uh, Thank you, Chair. But just be very careful in terms of reaching that threshold, Senator Watt. Uh, Minister. Well, to respond to Senator Watt, because clearly he merely wants to play politics, Ms Varghila has recently stated... Point of order, Chair. Given how that is Mr this possibly Albanese relevant? Is campaign how, uh, on order? On sorry, Minister. On the, listen, maybe we'll find out. Sorry, Minister. Um, on the point of order, uh, what is your point of order? How is relevance? How are the... Are allegations involving the Victorian Labor Party possibly relevant to the expenditure of this department uh, or the matters that I've been asking you about? Thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, it is the case, Minister, that you do need to be relevant to the question, so I'd ask Chair, you to return... Point of order, Chair. Excuse me, I'm in the middle of ruling on Chair. the point of order. 
Uh, so I would ask you to return to the substance of the question. Thank you. May, may I just remind um, Senator Watt that you cannot ask or direct the minister as to how she answers the question, providing she is relevant. But I would just direct it you to answer. It goes directly to Senator Watt's politicisation of this. Given that Mr Albanese is campaigning on a federal ICAC, expelling an, M an MP for referring matters to IBAC is hypocritical and sends the message that ICAC is merely camp a campaigning instrument for Mr Albanese and he is not serious about fighting corruption. And again, Senator Watt, I say to you, we have a settled model of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. That is the model we are prepared to legislate. You have made it very, very clear that you do not support that bill. It's as simple as that. Uh, Senator Watt, we have well and truly exceeded your time. I will now move to Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, staying with this topic of the Commonwealth Integrity Bill, what is the date of the most recent version of the government's draft bill? Um, we will take that on notice, Senator. Okay, if you can possibly look that up um, while we continue speaking, that would be very useful. We've spoken at previous estimates about the amendments that were drafted to address the various issues that arose during the uh, copious rounds of consultation. Does the most recent version of the bill address those issues? Um, Senator, ultimately the, the model and the legislation is a matter for government to decide. And I okay. think as the attorney has well, said, the model that was provided for consultation for the exposure draft is the model that the, the government um, uh, is standing by. Yes, and so Paul, perhaps the minister can take the question then. Does the latest version address any of the concerns that arose during consultation? Uh, as I've stated, and we've been very clear, the model that the government has finalised is the model that is currently available. And it seeks to provide, as I was saying to Senator Watt, and I'm more than happy for the committee to take you through it or the officials to take you through it. The umbrella framework that addresses the different roles, as you know, uh, of the many existing entities across the Commonwealth that are already responsible for anti-corruption activities. Thanks, Minister. I, I realise the model is the model, but I'm asking, does the most recent version address any of the issues that were raised in the consultation periods? Well, the government believes that the model that it has is the appropriate model. That is not, so clearly not, the question that I'm asking. Well, the government believes that the model that it has, Chair, is the appropriate model. I'm sure you do believe that, but I'm not interested in that. I'm asking whether or not any of the versions that you delayed for years under the premise of consultation have actually incorporated any change based on that well, the very convenient consultation. The and we believe that the model that we have is the right model. Chair, I'm point of order I don't on know flagrant how I refusal to answer a direct feedback, question. So, so Senator Waters, on the point of order, what is your point of order? Uh, well, it, the minister is clearly not answering the question no, no, that no, that's I'm not repeatedly a asking. Are you, are, you ask, are you raising a point of order on relevance? Yes. Uh, so on the point of order, uh, it's not open to any senator to demand or to request a, a certain type of answer. The minister was being relevant and there is no point of order. Thank you. Senator Waters. Okay, well, it's gonna be a bit of a long week if we're not expected to get answers to our questions, but I suppose it's been a long 11 years in that regard. And Senator so Waters, just to remind you of the standing orders, senators can't insist on a particular type of answer. The minister did answer your question and it was relevant, so oh, the, she minister, didn't. the minister we all was know in that. order. All righty. Well, is the current version any different from the previous version, Ms Chidji? I think as the attorney said, um, the model that is publicly available mm -hmm. is the model that was released for consultation and that is the government's model. Okay, so the model that you released for consultation is the same as the one that you're now committed to. Ergo, you haven't made any changes as a result of that consultation. I think I've just got the answer to the question that I Which was in fact I seeking. Well, I'm not going to waste my time in a debate about semantics, but it sounds like despite the many rounds of consultation, nothing has changed. Can I ask now then, um, it's been reported, as uh, Senator Watt referred to, that the Prime Minister proposed to introduce a Helen Haynes-style ICAC bill for the purpose of trying to get support on a different bill. 
Was the attorney's department consulted about the possibility of introducing such a bill? Senator, um, the department has continued to um, support the attorney and her office in relation to the Integrity Commission bill. In relation to um, any um, uh, 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 specific issues about the timing of introduction or when it will be introduction, that's a matter for the attorney's office and, and we, we simply support in terms of providing briefing on the bill. Okay, so the Prime Minister or his office didn't ask for the department's assistance on creating this new Helen Haynes style bill. Um, attorney, did the Prime Minister ask you for any assistance or to commence any work to draft such a bill? Again, there have been discussions around a Commonwealth Integrity Commission for some time right across government and in particular amongst senior ministers. And we have been very, very clear. The model that we have finalised is the model around the Commonwealth Integrity Commission um, that we support. That's okay. it. So you said no to the Prime Minister and then Cabinet said no to the Prime Minister and so we're stuck chair, with the same model that's chair, ignored successive consultations Senator and you still Waters won't introduce it to the House. Uh, and we have a bill that passed the Senate two years ago Minister, that your party and, won't and bring Senator on Waters, for a vote. Minister, if I could just um, allow um, Senator Waters to complete her question. And if you disagree with what she is putting to you in the question, then it's open to you to say so. So, Senator Waters, could you just uh, ask your question again, please? Thanks, Chair. So, but are there any? Yep. Please uh, continue. Are there any drafts of the bill, uh, of any bill that might uh, have been prepared to satisfy the Prime Minister's description of a Helen Haynes-style ICAC bill? Were there any drafts well, of Senator that bill? Senator Waters, I'm not sure where this description is coming from. Do you have a document from the Prime Minister. To? Uh, yeah, it's the same PVO article that Senator Watt referred it's to. It's an article in the media. Yes, okay. and, well, and I'm asking very, you the question, and you again. can say no if that's the case. But there have been any many would discussions be good at this point. over a very long period of time, and we've been clear that the government has finalised a model around the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. And as I've said, and I'm sure I can have officials take you through it, the model seeks to provide, as we have been speaking about the umbrella framework that addresses the many different roles of the existing entities across the Commonwealth that are already responsible for anti-corruption activities. We have finalised, as you know, the preparation of the bill that has several hundred pages attached to it. And I have been clear, and I'll make this same offer to you, will you commit to pass the model of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission that the government has designed? And no, the answer because to it's terrible. has been it's no. a protection racket. So no, you know that to answer your question. But please carry on. I've answered the question. Righto. Um, okay. So when was the decision made to not introduce the model? That's the model. That's the model that you've referred to. <laughs> when was the decision made to not introduce the model to the house? I'm not quite sure what your question is. On what is. date the model was is the, the decision? Model is the model is the model. I'm paraphrasing what you've said to me. When was the decision taken to not introduce the government's version, your version, of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission bill? What date was that decision taken and who took that decision? Senator Waters, we have continued to say that we are committed to implementing and passing the Commonwealth Integrity Committed legislation. We have had a number of competing priorities, including COVID-19. Our priority for last week was the passage of the Religious Discrimination Bill. And at this point in time, there are two sitting days left for the Australian Senate. We have a model. The model is out there for all to see. We have said we're willing to commit to pass that model but the reality remains the Australian Greens and the Australian Labor Party do not support that model. Nor do any of the experts in the successive rounds of consultation that you used as a stalling technique for, what, three years now? Uh, my final question on this topic is, unsurprisingly, in the recent Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, Australia's ranking has fallen from 7th to 18th. And the Transparency International Group explicitly credited uh, that drop to the lack of progress on an anti-corruption commission, despite the Senate having passed a strong bill for it more than two years ago. 
that the government refuses to bring on in the House. Has the department been briefed on the report? Has Ms. the department briefed the minister on that report? Have you, minister, read that report and have you briefed um, any of your cabinet colleagues on that Ms. report? Ms Bogart will take the question. Thank you, Attorney. Esther Bogart, Assistant Secretary, Fraud Prevention and Anti-Corruption Branch. Uh, the department has uh, considered the report and been briefed by Transparency International Australia on mm -hmm. the report. Um, the Corruption Perception indexed, uh, Index methodology is based on the perceptions of the extent of corruption in the public mm. sector from the perspective of business people and country experts. It's not based on actual experiences of corruption and it also takes into account Australia as a whole. So the Commonwealth, states and territories and business. Um, so there can't be a natural conclusion drawn between the lack of an anti-corruption commission and that index. I can talk you through the methodology if you'd like and where Australia has fallen down. It's quite uh, dry in terms of the, the sources of that information, but I, I'm happy to share that with you. No, you look, want. I've read that and I've read the part where Transparency International specifically say that they credit the drop in the ranking because of the delay in the only remaining jurisdiction in the country not having a corruption watchdog. Um, so oh, you have a final to the other elements Senator Waters, of Senator the Waters, we are at time. Do you have well, a final question? Please? I do. It was Thank the you. one that I've just asked. Have you briefed the minister on that report? We haven't specifically briefed the minister on the report. The report comes out annually. We did provide some information to the, the minister's office that uh, at the day that it came out. Okay, minister, uh, thanks have very you much, read Senator that report? Waters. I will now move. I have read the give... summary and I have discussed it with my relevant advisor. And I think it is an unfair characterisation, Chair. In terms Sorry, of what's... look, I was talk. I was actually about to give the call to Senator Van out of okay. the seat just to ensure the seamless operation of estimates. Um, could minister. you just repeat that last? Question, Senator. I think going through Senator the methodology Waters. is actually very important, Senator Waters, to understand what they were actually looking at, and in particular the type of countries that ranked above us. So, Chair, if there is that opportunity, some senators may wish to understand what the methodology actually well, was. Well, we might uh, look. I'll leave Thanks, it Chair. open to Senator Waters to raise that question, but we do now need to move to Senator Scar. Oh, okay. Thank you, Chair. So I, will I, give I, the, I will give the call to Senator Scar. I'm definitely interested, <laughs> Minister, and uh, as, as someone who's um, lived and worked in Papua New Guinea, ah. also in Southeast Asia, uh, I'm very familiar with uh, Transparency International's work. So, Ms Bogart, could you walk us through uh, the methodology that applies to give us a better understanding with respect to their rankings? Certainly, uh, Senator Scar. Uh, so the methodology is based on a range of different indexes um, or international ranking systems, and they relate to governance, risk and economic competitiveness. Um, we understand um, from the briefing with Transparency International and some of the methodology in the background that uh, Australia's score declined between 2020 and 2021 um, is almost entirely attributable to one of these ranking systems, the Institute for Management Development's World Competitiveness Ranking, which measure, measures how countries achieve long-term value creation. Sorry, what's it called? The Institute? <laughs> Of, for management development's world competitiveness ranking, and that dropped uh, by um, 29 points uh, from the previous year. But is, we it, is that out of 100 or...? Out of 100, um, yes. And so what happened between 2020 and 2021? To... Uh, it, it's, look, I, I wouldn't want to speculate on it, but we understand that it has uh, something to do with um, business efficiency and declines in business efficiency over those two years. Right. Okay. It's quite curious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, can, I, can I go back to um, some of the key points in relation to this issue, and that is uh, we do have, with respect to law enforcement officers, and, and law, the law enforcement function of government and any corruption watchdog, namely ACLE, the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity. Is that correct? Yes, Senator. Right. And is it true that ACLE's uh, jurisdiction has been expanded in recent times to actually cover 
more government agencies uh, in particular with respect to that law enforcement jurisdiction. Function. That's correct, Senator. So Ackley's jurisdiction was expanded um, from the 1st of January 2021 to cover uh, four new agencies, the ATO, ASIC, APRA and the ACCC, um, and that was implemented through regulations which, as I said, commenced on the 1st of January 2021. Uh, Ackley's jurisdiction was further expanded to uh, cover the Office of the Special Investigator, um, which commenced on the 14th of December 2021. And to support that expansion, um, Ackley was allocated $54.3 million over the forward estimates in the 21-22 budget as an ongoing budget measure to, right. to supplement um, Ackley's expanded jurisdiction and support that uh, until the CIC commences, at which time Ackley will be subsumed into it. Yeah, and, and my understanding is, and I, I, I'm bringing to this, these questions the benefit of it, having been chair of the, the relevant parliamentary joint committee, uh, Ackley, uh, the, the concept was Ackley would form one of the divisions of the new Commonwealth Integrity Commission, and, and Ackley has actually been working on, on, the, on that basis, i.e. that it would be one of the two divisions of the Commonwealth Integrity C Commission, and it's been resourced in order to do that in preparation for the introduction of a commission um, in accordance with the, the draft bill that's been um, issued by the, uh, by, the, by the government. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. Under the, uh, the exposure draft legislation for the CIC, there is a law enforcement division which would be what Ackley is now. It would be subsumed into the, uh, the CIC when it commences. Right. Um, is, it, is it correct to say that in terms of the consultation, in terms of different models, one of the main issues has been this issue around public hearings, whether or not there should be public hearings or not? Is that a fair comment? That's correct, Senator. And, and what, are the, what are the competing views that have been presented through the, through the consultation process? Because I understand you have engaged in meaningful, meaningful consultation process. Uh, what have been the, the different views which have been proposed in that regard? Uh, there, there have been different views on um, the use of public hearings. Uh, one of the views and, and the, government, uh, the government's reasoning behind not having public hearings for the public sector division in the current bill is that it could potentially prejudice uh, criminal uh, trials that occur as a result of an investigation of a criminal corruption matter. Yeah. Um, and so public hearings are not included in the in the current legislation yeah. for that purpose. The objective of the CIC will be to investigate serious criminal corruption, and so public hearings may not be um, uh, could potentially prejudice later prosecutions. Right. And in in terms of that, one last question. Mm -hmm. um, just in terms of that point in in relation to public hearings, is it correct? that Ackley has the power to, to convene public hearings, but in all the time which it's been in existence, uh, for some of the reasons you just outlined, it has never seen fit to actually convene a public hearing. It's never considered it to be in the best interests of its mandate to actually hold a public hearing. Is that correct? I can confirm that Ackley has, um, in its time, never conducted a public hearing. Um, you would have to ask um, the Integrity Commissioner uh, why, uh, why that hasn't happened, but my understanding is it has never been done. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Scar. Senator Watt. Thanks, Chair. Um, just one question before I pass to Senator Grogan, if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. The exposure draft for this bill has now been out for consultation for well over a year. After all that consultation, Ms Bogart, can you point us to any significant differences between the exposure draft that was put out for consultation and the settled model or what the Prime Minister tabled in the House last year? Uh, so I can confirm that what the Prime Minister tabled in the House was the exposure draft that was released on the 2nd of November 2020. So there were no changes? Not, no, oh, there were not. Wow. So, Minister, not one issue raised in the consultation process was taken into account by the government before tabling its legislation? The government considered the feedback and determined that the model that it has <laughs> is the appropriate model. That, and that everyone who put in a submission saying it was terrible was wrong? And you were right. Yep. The government considered the feedback and determined that the model that it has is the appropriate model. Right. Thanks, Chair. 
Uh, thank you very much, Senator Watt. Uh, Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, just following on from that, can I ask, um, obviously a significant number of people have contributed to uh, their views to the, um, to the bill, to the exposure draft, um, and not one of those has been taken on board, as you just identified. Um, have you gone back to any of those people and explained to them why you haven't taken on board any of their recommendations or you haven't taken on board any of their concerns? Uh, no, Senator, we have not. Not at all? No, Senator. It's a little disrespectful to completely ignore every ounce of advice and not even provide a sort of summary of we've decided X. When some of the, um, some of the commentary on this exposure draft that may or may never end up being a bill introduced as an appallingly weak sham designed to hide corruption. That's from the Centre for Public Integrity, which is you know, a think tank led by former senior Australian judges with experience in integrity matters. Well, Senator, there were a number of different viewpoints as part of the consultation process. And Senator, but, um, it is a body that has very significant powers for investigating serious criminal corruption. So the full suite of telecommunications interception, surveillance device powers, the ability to compel answers to questions um, and powers beyond that. Your point being? That it has very substantial powers, Senator. That wasn't, my, I mean, no offence. My, my question was really about a significant number of people. I mean, you've only got to look, look at the list of people who've submitted to this inquiry and some of the, the deeply held concerns about the shape of this uh, Commonwealth Integrity Commission that, as people have said, is unlikely to avoid any sort of corruption or identify much at all. The, the, the core principles that um, Labor has put forward, and I, I will note, um, Minister Cash, that, that you have said at this hearing and many others <clears throat> that if, if people don't like your model, they should put forward their own. Um, and I will note that we're not the government and we have been very, very clear about the principles. Maybe we'd like to go through those principles and you can just tell us what it is that's so yeah, bad no, about them. Yeah, I think that's actually what um, Ms Tuji was attempting to do in terms of the feedback that you said had been provided. Um, what Ms Tuji was saying was in relation to the model mm. uh, that we have put forward, it, already, it builds on what is already in place. You, you've heard um, from Ms Bogart what is already in place. So it builds on the already strong anti-corruption arrangements that already exist at Commonwealth level. In terms of the model that we have put forward, it would be a specialist investigation body for the most serious forms of criminal corruption um, and with the resources and powers necessary to fill that, fulfil that role. And that's what Ms Chichi, I believe, was actually uh, referring to in particular. Um, it would have greater powers than our Royal Commission, including coercive powers to compel the provision of information and answer questions, telecommunications inception, uh, interception and surveillance devices and search and arrest powers at the same time, and I think appropriately, it would balance its investigation's purpose with protecting the fundamental principles of our justice system and protecting individual reputations from undue damage. I think that is a very important uh, part of it, it. Indeed, if I could just stop you there, I think the challenge being that um, what significant experts have said is that this is a spineless, toothless, secretive approach and it would have no power to examine the activities of politicians or those close to them. That, 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 that's, that's really quite damning stuff. Like, I appreciate that you've put out a draft, you think that it builds on um, what's already in place, but a significant body of experts disagree quite strongly with that perspective. And if the idea of a national anti-corruption commission is to hold people account and to make sure that we do not have corruption going on in our country, then it is highly surprising that you have taken none of that advice. Not one word has changed in, from the exposure draft. 
Well, Senator, I, I don't agree with your characterisation. And as I've or just significant number of experts the in this so field are that across the Senator Grogan, Senator Grogan are very, the minister did very wait until you completed your question. Could you please give the minister the and opportunity some, to respond? If the committee would like the powers taken through, because I think Ms Chigi was actually referring to those powers, they are very, very extensive, as I've stated. And I think what, what the situation we have here is that we have a fundamental difference of view on that. Um, a fundamental difference of view on what powers should be in place to keep people honest, to ensure that there is no corruption in our country. And I'll say again, a significant body of experts in this field across Australia are saying that the bill that you are putting forward, that, well, that you're now not putting forward, um, after umpteen years, I believe in 2018, it was nearly ready to be released, and we're now in 2022, and we still don't have anything. Well, I disagree with that characterisation, and I also disagree with the statement that you've made that we don't have anything. Um, as I have already explained, uh, we've been very clear. The government has finalised a model around the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. And as the officials have articulated to you, the model itself is providing the umbrella framework that addresses, and you will have heard from the officials, the different roles of the many existing entities across the Commonwealth that are responsible at this point in time for anti-corruption activities. Uh, the government has been clear, we are willing to commit to passing the model of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission that we have designed. Um, but both the Australian Labor Party and the Greens, they're not supportive of that model. And Nobody neither are a significant is. body of experts in this area Nobody. across the country. And I would ask, what would you say to um, Geoffrey Watson, SC, former counsel assisting the ICAC, who says that it's designed to cover up corruption, not expose it. Oh, well, I fundamentally disagree with him. Why did you bother consulting then? Well, I, I, I would agree. Why, why consult if you're not going to listen to any of the views that were provided, not pay any attention, not one word changed from your exposure? Well, it's a again, glorious Chair, waste of everyone's time. We considered the feedback, and on the basis of the feedback, we determined that the model that we have is the appropriate model. Appropriate. And so again, if the committee would like the officials to take them through the substantial powers that the proposed body does have, and as I've said, Senator, including coercive powers to compel the provision of information and answer questions, telecommunications interception and surveillance devices, and search and arrest powers. Um, I am more than happy for that to occur, Senator. Well, I think we all know what's in it, and therefore the responses that have been provided One more minute, Senator have Grogan. been very clear that the significant body of people who do not agree with you, do not agree with this approach to having an anti-corruption commission, which we certainly believe to be a vital aspect, a vital piece of legislation that should go through the parliament. Do you have a final question, Senator Grogan? Oh, I think I'm just going to rally with a statement here and just say that I think that this is a, it's, it's actually an not appalling open to place Sorry, for us to land Sen so Senator close Grogan. to an election Senator with Grogan. no okay. anti-corruption commission please? after Senator three, Grogan, four young, can long years. Can I ask years. you to pause, please? You don't have the call. It's not open to senators to make statements. The, the role of senators is to ask way. questions. I, okay. I give a fair way of leeway in terms of the preamble to a question, but uh, if you don't have a final question, we will go to Senator Waters. Is he going to call again? Uh, yes, thank Senator you. Senator Waters. Thank you very much. Um, I too share the incredulity of a wasted four years. However, I wish now to move on to whistleblowers. Uh, at the National Whistleblowing Symposium in November last year, the Assistant Minister Amanda Senator, uh, Senator Stoker said how committed the government was to strengthening and enhancing the public sector whistleblowing scheme in the Public Interest Disclosure Act. Uh, we have previously been advised that agency consultation has occurred in relation to proposed amendments to the Act, but to date we haven't seen any progress. So my question is, what is the current status of the reforms to the Public Interest Disclosure Act? Um, Senator, the department has been uh, working on uh, 
legislative amendments that would implement um, the government's response to the MOS review, um, and we've been consulting within government uh, on those. Okay. When did you start working on those? Um, you see my colleague uh, can provide those dates. Senator Philip Ng, Acting Assistant Secretary, Security, Emergency and Administrative Law Branch. Uh, we've been working on that ever since the 16th of December 2020, when government released its response to the MOST review. Okay, so you've been consulting for a while. We've just, uh, seems to be a bit of a uh, broken record here. Um, is there a date for when you will conclude your consultations and propose some reforms? Senator Waters, um, the officials are all here in good faith, working hard. Uh, could I ask you not to reflect on any witness, but particularly on the officials from the department, please? I'm not reflecting on the well, officials. Were you, well, you were I've, reflecting I've, I on genuinely the... feel sorry for the situation that they're in. I'm well, sure you they're were, trying to fix the system. I would just remind system. you not to do so, please. Well, I wasn't, but I shan't. Mr Ng, did you need me to repeat the question before uh, so that, As Mr G has indicated, the department has been continuing to progress the amending legislation to address the feedback and receive from that consultation across government. Timing of the introduction of any amendments is obviously a matter for government. Okay, so how many rounds of consultation has this one been through? Senator, the consultation has occurred within government. We haven't characterised it as a series of rounds. Um, but it has occurred, as I mentioned, uh, since the government released its response to the MOS review. And Senator, okay. there's probably sort of different parts to that consultation where we've spoken to uh, uh, other integrity agencies in particular um, with a role like the Ombudsman about specific elements. We've also then then gone on to consult in further detail um, on possible draft provisions as well. Okay. Um, so subsequent to that and, and had uh, multiple interactions with um, agencies that have um, a particular interest and stake in it. Okay. So have you reached the stage of draft provisions? Uh, we do have some draft provisions that we're working on with the Office of Parliamentary Council. Okay, and when did you um, give drafting instructions to um, OPC? Oh, we'll have to take that on notice, Senator. Uh, okay, uh, so would you consider that the consultation is concluded or is it ongoing? Um, I think we're doing some remaining consultation. Uh, we've done a substantial amount already, so we're um, at the concluding end of that. Okay. Do you have a date for when a draft bill will be released for public comment, assuming it will be put out for public comment? Uh, that's a matter for government to determine. Minister, dare I ask, is there a date for releasing the draft bill? Uh, the government is still considering that, but I'm happy for Ms Chigi to take you through the progress that has been made to date. Well, look, I'm happy for that also, but can you do so in the context of my next question, which is, is the establishment of a whistleblower protection authority, which is what the um, multi-party committee recommended in 2017, is that under consideration? Um, Senator, that wasn't recommended by the Moss Review. Um, no. And so, as I said, what we have been looking at is implementation of the government's response to the Moss Review. Okay. Just on that, and I don't wish to interrupt you, but the uh, Joint Parliamentary Committee report in 2017 did recommend a whistleblower protection authority. Has that been um, within scope for your consultations and considerations? Um, we've been consulting on implementation of the MOSS review, and clearly the Ombudsman at the moment plays the central role um, in taking complaints and overseeing the operation of the public interest disclosure regime. Um, so the things that we have been uh, looking at um, is reforms that align that scheme more closely with the private sector whistleblowing scheme, improving support for disclosers and those involved in the disclosure uh, investigation, um, uh, and uh, also uh, looking at more regular reporting by intelligence agencies to the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security as well. Um, and overall, um, looking at um, uh, simplifying the regime to make it a lot more usable, particularly mm. by um, uh, those who wish to make a disclosure. Mm. Um, can I ask the reason why the recommendations of the um, multi-party committee of um, the parliament are not in scope for consideration of the reforms? I understand the MOS review is 
seminal piece of work. It's appropriate that be considered and responded to, but why not also the joint committee report? I think, I mean, it's significant that that, that was not something recommended by the MOS review, so uh, that would suggest uh, as part of that review that there was not seen to be a need for a new authority, um, particularly given the Ombudsman's current role. Okay. Um, has the department provided any, any advice to the minister or the assistant minister regarding the implications of the reforms for litigation against Witness K? Bernard Caleri, Richard Doyle and David McBride. Senator, sorry, can you just repeat that question? Has the department briefed the minister or the assistant minister on the implications of the draft reforms to the Public Interest Disclosure Act in relation to those four whistleblowers? Uh, so, Senator, uh, I think prospective reforms don't have necessarily an implication no, for not cases normally, that are on foot. Um, and as I mentioned, I think... Uh, Mr Moss didn't uh, recommend uh, changes to some of the fundamental elements of protecting intelligence uh, agency information as part of the regime. What we are looking at is increasing reporting from those agencies to the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security around public interest disclosures. Mm. Okay, I'll come back with some further questions on notice about that. Thanks, Thank Chair. you very much, Senator Waters. Uh, Senator Van. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's, we may wish to have Ms Bogart back at the table. Um, <coughs> but I'll, I'll put the questions to the Secretary first, if, um, if that assists with speed. Um, Secretary, are you aware that uh, Mr Geoffrey Watson, uh, I believe SC is his uh, postnomial, serves on the Board of Directors for the Centre of, for Public Integrity? which I think some of my Labor colleagues uh, have been quoting as an expert source. Senator, I'm sorry, actually, I, I didn't have that detail, um, so I may have to defer to um, Ms. Ms Bogart, Bogart about today. that. Uh, I'm also not aware of that detail. Um, are you aware that he formerly had involvement with the New South Wales ICAC? Yes, I'm aware of that. Uh, and are you aware that the inspector of the ICAC made a report in 2019 in regard to his conduct as counsel assisting in Operation Spicer? I have a vague recollection of it, but not, not a lot of detail. Are you aware in his report, the inspector declared that uh, Mr. Watson's conduct was, and I'm quoting, inappropriate, unfair, and amounted to a, a serious lapse uh, of procedural fairness? Wow. No, I'm not aware of that. Wow. By the government. The dirt file. Classy. Rather than listen to what Grace Taylor yesterday. In, interjections, uh, interjections are really disclosed. classy. Uh, Senator Van, well. you have the call. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to have the call. Um, and are you aware that, that the inspector described Mr. Watson's questioning as sneering, contemptuous, verges on bullying, and is inconsistent with the duty of fair conduct? No, I'm not aware of that. Are you aware that the inspector also declared that Mr. Watson's independence as counsel assisting? have been compromised? No, I'm not aware of that. Are you aware that according to the inspector of ICAC's report, Mr Watson's conduct was a significant, and I quote, a significant failure of process which damaged the public standing of the commission and should not have happened? Sorry, Senator, not, oh, not aware. Mm -hmm. I just wondered a line of question. Mr. Watson is, I guess, is not a, a, an employee of the government. I don't think he's involved in any government funded activity. Um, I, I just wonder what, you know, if, if there's a line of... What's the, um, is what, what's the point of order, um, just, Senator Patrick? Um, relevance yeah. to estimates. Uh, he, has no, he has no role I, in I, government. Uh, he has no, uh, he's not funded by government. Uh, no, no. We're no, I realise that. So if I can just rule on the sure. point of order. Um, Mr Watson was referred to in previous questioning in relation to... Uh, expertise. The expertise with ICAC. Um, the test of relevance is broad, and on that basis, um, there is no point of order. But I do remind senators that it is important, of course, to ask questions which are relevant and meet the test of relevance as set by the Senate. Senator, thank you very much, Sen Senator Madam Patrick. Chair, Senator Van Dien. Uh, yes, Senator Under Carr, the Senate standing order. orders, citizens are entitled to be treated. Uh, properly and there are rights of reply. That's exactly right. Uh, and I think they should be pointed out as well. We're not free to pillory 
uh, anyone at will here. I, I uh, can table uh, the uh, inspector's report. Uh, uh, so, uh, Senator uh, Van, uh, we're uh, just uh, on the just Senator, on the point of Senator, order. Senator, I'm just making an observation. There sure. are there are uh, standing orders that go to adverse comment being made against citizens of this country by members of the Senate. And may I speak to that Senator point of Van, order, sorry, Chair? May Senator I speak Van, to that point of no, order, please? Just, just wait for Senator Carr to finish on the point of order. I, I just so I'd call on you, Madam Chair, to draw to that to comment. the attention of all members of the committee. Thank you very much. Thank Senator you. Van, it, Senator Van, on the point of order, please. Yes, you have thank you. Um, I was not reflecting on Mr Watson. I was oh, merely quoting from a report. Uh, so just to rule on the point of order, and I always give the Deputy Chair a little bit more leeway when raising points of order, the, Sen the uh, Senator Carr is quite correct. Uh, there are issues um, in relation to raising um, adverse comment about a particular person, and what the normal procedure is under the standing orders, the Secretariat will then contact the person uh, to whom has been subject, about whom has been subject the adverse comment and give them an opportunity to um, reply. There actually has been other adverse comment made about other individuals, which was made yesterday, Senator Carr, and the same opportunity will be extended. So thank you and very I'll much. And I'll seek to table that report. Uh, do you have a copy of the report? I don't with me, but... All right, well, you, that's, that's open to you if you wanted to table that. Um, Senator Van, um, you, you finished? Thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, I will now give the call to Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just going to the whistleblower uh, protections, um, Senator Cash, you would know the agreement that you reached with uh, former Senator Xenophon in relation to uh, whistleblower protection. Um, it's actually uh, the, the letter or the agreement that was struck between yourself and, and Senator Xenophon was actually published in the back of the committee report. Um, it had some time frames around it. Uh, I, I reminded uh, Senator Cormann at the start of this parliament, and I note that, uh, that uh, uh, Mr Porter made an announcement that whistleblower legislation would be dealt with uh, this parliament. Uh, I, uh, I presume from the time, it's reasonable to presume we're not gonna get to the point where that, that's dealt with. I'll get Ms Tucci to take you. In relation to, I'm not sure about a deal that was struck that you're referring to. Senator Xenophon hasn't been here for some time. Sure. It's, it's, in the, it's on the back page of the, uh, of the, of the report. Uh, the the um, report in, the joint parliamentary report into whistleblowing. Um, the, the arrangements um, between the government uh, and Senator Xenophon, and it was in relation to passage of the ABCC legislation. It involved the You're inclusion. Going back quite a number of years now. Sure. Well, but that's the point. The whole point of this was to get reform in, in whistleblowers. In the last parliament, it was dealt with by um, 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 uh, Ms. O'Dwyer uh, in the corporate sector, but really the, 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 the public sector, nothing substantive appears to have been done. Was, yeah. Senator, was that inquiry into the private sector whistleblowing provisions? No, no, Treasury... it was a joint, uh, it was a joint committee. Um, was that the Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services? Yes, that's services? the one. Yes, I think that particularly looked at private sector whistleblower protections, but um, uh, we'd have to take on notice anything that related to the public interest disclosure scheme. Well, really, in some sense, it's a question to you, uh, uh, Attorney. There were promises made that appear not to have been uh, um, properly fulfilled. Again, I would also have to take that on notice, and I'm happy to talk to you after this, Senator Patrick, and get further information. Okay. I noticed, I noticed in your list of things that you were doing, you didn't mention the prosecution of some of these whistleblowers. And, and, and it's a serious question because it goes to uh, confidence. So Richard Boyle, for example, was mentioned by Senator Waters. Um, uh, no question that he was a whistleblower. I mean, you might say that Mr Kaliri's prosecution doesn't involve that because there was no public interest disclosure. Um, at, but uh, in relation to Mr Boyle, there absolutely was. And yet um, uh, it appears as though he's not being protected under the 
provisions of the PID Act. Have, has anyone here looked at, looked at that? Um, obviously, there's a prosecution going on in relation to uh, his um, the allegations about releasing tax uh, ATO information. I don't want to go to that. Uh, but that, that action flowed from uh, a public interest disclosure, which the Senate Economics <coughs> Committee examined, uh, examined in camera, but the public finding was that the, uh, the, the public interest disclosure um, investigation was superficial. And one would argue that were it not for that superficial investigation, the events that have been alleged in the, in the court case would not have happened. Uh, Senator, we've informed ourselves of publicly available information on um, matters that have been dealt with under the scheme. We've obviously had comments from agencies and we're also aware of um, court comments uh, on the operation of the PID Act as well. Okay, but, but in terms of uh, the, the policy itself, the confidence that people can, that people can have in any whistleblower legislation uh, in circumstances where the government has chosen to prosecute people who have blown the whistle. Mr Boyle is a case in point. Um, Senator, the reforms are focused primarily around responding to the Moss Review, which mm -hmm. was obviously an in-depth examination of the operation of the PID Act. Um, but as part of what we're doing it is particularly looking at clarity for both disclosers and agencies um, uh, to give them greater certainty about the operation of the scheme and greater support for those who are making disclosures under the Act. Okay, but that's but I, I couldn't comment. That, you know, I'm not going to comment, mm. obviously, on any particular intersections with individual matters. Well, um, in some sense, you can go about reform, but under the current regime, uh, it, you know, because we might not see these reforms for some considerable period of time, there is a current regime in place, and under that current regime, we have a situation where someone, and it is not, the, 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 no one uh, would, um, would query this as a question, as a statement of fact, uh, Mr Boyle lodged a public interest disclosure. He lodged it to the tax to the tax office. It's been looked at here in uh, uh, in the Senate a few times. But you, you, you would appreciate the, the 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 point I'm making that you, if people are getting prosecuted having um, disclosed certain information under under a PID scheme, that completely undermines confidence in the scheme. Um, and I couldn't comment on that, Senator. Um, I couldn't comment on individual matters, and the issue uh, um, of whether someone's made a PID could well be relevant to a matter that is currently before the court. So mm -hmm. it, w it just wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on a particular case. Um, what I can say is that we're implementing the Moss Review and some additional right. reforms well, beyond let's that. Let's keep it generic. Has... And, and very much looking at the issue of the experience of those who make disclosures and uh, uh, it is clear that the regime um, uh, needs to be more certain, clearer, and have uh, things that give greater protection um, and support for those making disclosures. Well, Attorney, we, we've talked about this in, an, in, in another committee, um, the, the prosecution of Richard Boyle. Yes. Um, and uh, I know you were going to, weigh, going to go away and have a look at that. Uh, I wonder if you did, and if we, in, in looking at that, you considered the effect that prosecution of whistleblowers has on general confidence in the public about whether or not they should blow the whistle. Um, Senator Patrick, and I know you have raised this with me at previous estimates, and in particular as to whether or not um, the government would intervene or the Attorney General would intervene to discontinue the matter. And as you and I have, have discussed, um, it is not appropriate for me to intervene to discontinue this matter. Um, again, as you and I have discussed, it would be extraordinarily, well, it would, would, would be extraordinary um, and then given by its nature represent political intervention in a process that, and again, we have discussed this uh, at previous estimates, um, conventionally has been independent. 
Yeah, but the, the but as you know, the Judiciary Act allows you to intervene. It, and I, um, I think you and I have canvassed this at, at previous sure. estimates in relation and to why it would not be appropriate to and, do so. And and it is it is final a, question, Senator Patrick. It is occasionally uh, well, it can be inappropriate to exercise a power, but it can also be inappropriate not to ex exercise a power. And again, I impress upon you that I think this is an instance where that is the case. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Patrick. Uh, before I give the call back to Senator Watt, I just wanted to, ref to add to my uh, answer, or add to, not add to my answer, add to my comments in relation to adverse comment, uh, just for completion. So just reading from the rules of estimates, adverse evidence is estimates in estimates hearings should be handled the same way as in other committee hearings, although the committee is not able to hear such evidence in private session. The usual approach would be for the committee to write to the person or organisation seeking response, which could then be incorporated in the committee's transcript of evidence, report or published as additional information. Uh, Senator uh, what? Thanks, Chair. Just a couple of questions about uh, press freedom. Others have covered quite a few of our questions, but um, as, as was discussed earlier, on the 16th of December 2020, um, Mr Porter, as the then Attorney General, announced the government agreed to all 16 of the Intelligence and Security Committee's recommendations in relation to press freedom. How many of the recommendations has the government actually implemented? Is the answer zero? Uh, no, Senator. Um, uh, a number of them have been um, implemented. Um, the government response uh, to the Moss Review implemented recommendation nine. Uh, we've implemented compulsory training on the protective security policy framework, um, implementing recommendation 13. Um, uh, and obviously we have some responsibilities within this portfolio, but others sit elsewhere, particularly in home affairs. Okay. In its, maybe if I could get you to take on notice then a sort of more full response about the recommendations that have been implemented. Yes, we'll do that, Thanks. Senator. And in its, recommend, sorry, in its response to recommendation seven of the committee's report, which recommended that the government consider the introduction of new defences for public interest journalism in the Commonwealth Criminal Code, the government said that the Attorney General and the Attorney General's department will lead implementation of this recommendation as part of the review of secrecy offences. Has the department's review of secrecy offences specifically considered the introduction of new defences for public interest journalism? Um, that uh, is work we're undertaking at the moment. So we have done initial work as part of that review to identify the range of secrecy offences and non-disclosure duties across the Commonwealth. Um, and we're in the process of finalising um, uh, uh, some principles and um, uh, questions to go out to Commonwealth agencies um, for the next stage of that review. Okay. Will the department be making any recommendations to enhance or add new defences for public interest journalism? Uh, uh, Senator, uh, that would be sort of premature to comment on that because we're still, that review process is still in train. Minister, can I put this to you? Does the government have any plans to introduce new defences in relation to public interest journalism? Again, I think Ms Chichi has provided um, where we are at with the process at this point in time. Okay. And finally, uh, Minister, will the government be introducing legislation to implement the Intelligence and Security Committee's 16 bipartisan recommendations in relation to press freedom prior to the federal election? And if not, why not? Uh, so, sorry, uh, uh, Senator, which... Which recommendations are you talking about? We've discussed well, public interest disclosure. I think there yep. are a number of other recommendations that um, uh, you would have to ask the Home Affairs portfolio yeah. about. It's split between two sure. portfolios. Sure, but I mean, I'm asking you, I suppose, on behalf of the government, um, for everything I'm hearing today suggests that consultation is still underway. So... There are a number of different recommendations, Senator, so we're consulting on some. Others sit very much within Home Affairs portfolio, um, um, so those questions would need to be put to them. 
Right, but from the Attorney General's department, there are recommendations that were made in that report that won't be implemented by the time of the election. Is that right, Minister? Well, again, I think Ms Chidji has taken you through what the process is, and a number of them do sit um, with Home Affairs. At this point in time, we're continuing to progress the amending legislation to address the feedback received from the initial rounds of consultation. I think that is correct. Yes. Um, and I, I mentioned we had completed some recommendations, Senator, but others are still in train. Sorry, I, I've just had one more question um, suggested. Uh, the committee has also said, the committee as in that did the inquiry, also said that the department's review of secrecy offences should be prioritised, finalised and reported by June, the 20, June 2021, and the government agreed to this recommendation. Obviously, we're well past that date. Yep. Has the department completed its review? No, Senator, we haven't completed why, that review why is that? yet. Um, because uh, there are a significant number of provisions um, uh, and complexity in the differences. Um, so we needed to undertake um, quite a lot of preliminary work to look at everything that's out there in Commonwealth legislation, which is a very significant number of provisions in the hundreds. Um, and we're moving to the next stage of having um, prepared some um, proposals for Commonwealth agencies to consider. Right. Could I pass my remaining time to Senator Carr, please, Jean? Um, you can, but after Senator Carr, we are going to need to move to six-minute blocks because we are running substantially behind time. Yeah. Can I seek some advice, please, on the question of Mr Bernard Collery? Are the officers there that can help me with that? When you say seek advice... Yeah, well, I'm asking questions. Oh, sorry, you mean... Yeah, you, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, that's I what I'm saying. Advice I'm being, uh, yeah, no, no, I'm... Uh, <laughs> Being polite here. Sorry. That, that may not last I'm very so long. <laughs> so impressed, Senator Carr. That's right. All right. <laughs> All right. So, um, Minister, thought. these are actually matters that I think we'll direct at you. Uh, now, as I understand it, it's been three years, you spent $4 million, 50 preliminary hearings, and yet there's no trial date yet been set. Why is the Commonwealth continuing to prosecute Mr. Cleary? Ms Chidji will provide you with that information. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator, obviously the prosecution um, is a matter that, uh, that's being undertaken by the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions. Um, the Commonwealth, um, in line with um, uh, the provisions of the National Security Information Act, um, is seeking to protect national security information. Mr Cleary has obviously exercised his right to test those provisions and appeal decisions, mm. um, but the Commonwealth is, uh, is uh, seeking um, uh, uh, those protections as it's able to do under the NSI Act, um, and the ACT Court of Appeal remitted the matter to the uh, trial judge in the ACT Supreme Court to further consider those issues. Yes, so there's no actual date yet being set for trial, the the it? trial date is a matter for the court? Mm. Yes, and uh, obviously while the issues to do with the protection of national security information are being dealt with, the trial okay. date has not so yet been set. Can I just be clear, the four million, uh, that, is, that, is, that enough, is that the actual correct amount of money that's been spent so far on the prosecution, Mr Kaliri? Um, witness K, that's the two Philip, together, is it? I'll ask my colleague Philip Ng to take you through the figures. Mm. Senator, that four million figure, which I think you have before you, is one that incorporates also the Witness K prosecution. Yes. Um, and as you recall uh, from previous estimates, that initially that was billed under a single file, um, mm. and uh, hence that four million figure includes both the cost of Mr. Caleri and Witness K's proceedings. So, how much has been spent since the Witness K matter was concluded last year? Uh, Thank you, Senator. I noticed uh, that was one of the questions you, you put to the department uh, yesterday. The figure since the conclusion of the Witness K proceedings, so from the 19th of June 2021, being the day after Witness K was sentenced, to the 31st of January 2022, is $424,642.38, excluding GST. Thank you. Now, does that figure include the expenditure by the Commonwealth DPP, the Federal Police, and the department itself? 
uh, I might address it this way, Senator. So the amount includes the services of the Australian Government Solicitor and external legal services. It does not include the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecution's internal staff costs, but it does include their external counsel costs. Um, it would also include solicitors and counsel fees and legal disbursement costs. When it comes to the department, as uh, you, you may be, you would be aware, Senator, the department uh, doesn't, for staff within my branch, does not have dedicated staff for a single matter. They sit across matters, and as such, the department does not keep records of, of those figures right. of time spent. But it could include more than that. That figure that you've given us of 422,000 since June it could, does not include all additional costs, does it? Well, Senator, that figure includes the costs that I, that I mentioned being the external yeah, sure, sure. The My point is it could include other costs that you can't disaggregate from normal departmental expenditures. That's correct. Senator. That's yes, correct. thank you. Now, look, as I understand it, last October, the ACT Court of Appeal overturned the ruling which would hidden evidence about Mr Cleary's trial from the public, saying it was a very real risk of damage to public confidence. Now, is it the case... That, <coughs> have I got that right? Uh, Senator, I think it would be more correct to describe it as remitting the matter to mm. the ACT Supreme Court judge to determine what orders were appropriate. Yeah. Having regard... To uh, to the Commonwealth's proposal to put on further now, I, I've said on many occasions I'm not a lawyer, but the whole principle here is one of open justice. And while it's not an absolute requirement, it's, it's a vital principle in our justice system. It's actually essential to our health of our democracy. That's not an unreasonable proposition, is it, in this occasion? So, sorry, Mr. Senator Carr, I think you and I have had this discussion yeah. at previous... We'll probably go on having it, I trust. No, 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 and I think we need to agree to disagree in terms of, you know, uh, the national... Well, you're talking about the protection of national security information. Um, that information is able to be protected under the National Security Information Criminal and C Proceedings, mm. Civil Proceedings Act 2004, and as you know, enables the protection of national security information while maintaining, and this is the point that you make, the proper administration of justice, and it gives the court, as you know, certain powers to make orders it considers appropriate yeah. in the particular proceedings. And the Commonwealth's position is that, to the extent possible, the proceedings should be held in open court. However, there will be times whereby we do need to seek the protection of national security okay. information. I'm always a little bit confused because are you saying that you wouldn't seek the protection no, 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 of look, national security information? I understand, information? I understand the subtleties of your argument here, but what concerns me is that the Court of Appeal has made a, a very strong ruling on this, but as I understand it, you've now sought to introduce new secret, well, super secret evidence into the proceedings, uh, which Mr Cleary's lawyers themselves are not allowed to see. Is that correct? Uh, the Commonwealth is seeking to introduce court-only evidence, and that is being considered by the court now. Yeah. And it, would it be excluded from Mr Caleri's uh, own lawyers? Is that correct? There's discussion about special counsel arrangements before the ACT Supreme Court, but ultimately, as the attorney had said, uh, uh, it's very much that the court ultimately has the power to make orders that it considers mm. appropriate. But and I'm not wrong about that, am I? Administration of justice. As I say, as you know, a simple citizen here, a senator might say, of some standing, I just say to you, it does appear to me as if you're saying that the accused lawyers are not allowed to see this evidence. We need to do be careful, Senator Carr, because as Ms Chigi has said, the matter has been remitted back mm. to the ACT Supreme Court. And these proceedings mm. are ongoing, Chair. Yes, I yes, I, I am. So we do I need am, to be very, very careful. I am listening very carefully in relation to these matters. I think... Uh, because subdued to say, of course, is a very relevant issue here. Um, the, the, Senator, I might just be clear as well that the court-only evidence is evidence about the sensitivity of the information. It is not evidence going to okay. the criminal trial. So, am I correct? Did Mr Justice... Final question, did, Senator Did Carr. Justice David Jussop question whether or not there would ever be an end to the case, claiming that you, as Attorney-General, is continuing producing new evidence, updating the court on new developments in national security, and he, in fact, put to your lawyers, and I, and I quote him as I understand it, 
That is, is there any prospect of this matter ever being completed, or will it be stuck in a perpetual vortex of updating? Is that an accurate statement of what uh, was said to your lawyers, uh, Attorney General? My colleague might might know. Uh, Senator, know. Uh, the, the the matter is is bef is before um, is before the court. Uh, I'll have to confirm with the transcript as to exactly the remarks made by Justice Mossop at that time. I, I would note that there was a hearing on this very issue on the before the ACT, ACT Supreme Court last week on the 9th of February, at which time the court reserved its decision, so this matter is very much before them. We just do, Senator Carr, we do need today. to leave it there. No, we, we've I'm gone over. I've got one question. Um, All right. I might finish one quick this. question, please. Uh, it might be a little long. That's not important. Is it a statement or a question? <laughs> no, it's a, it's a genuine question, you see, because this really does come down to the issue of the discretion of the attorney. As I understand it, it is the attorney that makes decisions based on what you perceive to be in the national interest. Uh, the public interest, I should say, and we've had this discussion about the difference between the public interest and the national interest. Yeah. Now, what I'd like to know is this. Can you explain to, to us what is the public interest in the ongoing approval of the decision to prosecute... Senator Carr, can, sorry, I'm just going to stop you there. Could you... I'm just going to ask you we in relation to careful, ongoing Carr. proceedings, Correct. not to make any comment in relation to the merits of Correct. the case. Up until now, you've spoken about the procedural matters, but in relation to the merits, well, if exactly, I could just ask you to exercise, questions. exercise care, please. It's all procedural questions, you see, because I'd like to know... That's fine, but don't go to the, the merits of the case, please. ..for the ongoing approval of the prosecution, given the lack of progress in that prosecution, with no trial date being set, and Senator noting the enormous and continuing expenditure of limited Commonwealth resources, as I say, in excess of four million, and noting that these prosecutions relate to revelations about events alleged to have occurred 18 years ago relating to allegations... Uh, of so, Senator Carr, I'm going to stop you there. I would ask you not to canvass the allegations. Well, uh, this is uh, that issue is, we do well, have. Well, let me just say this. It so, is, uh, no, Senator Carr. But it does go to the no, issue uh, of please, the national interest. No, please, can I just interest. ask you? Can I ask you to pause? You, you've been very careful up until now, but if I could ask you not to canvass the allegations, right. well, just to confine okay. your question to but matters I, my, of procedure and the attorney's powers, right. please. My concerns go to the fact that this was allegations regarding senior members of the government of 18 years ago and allegations that go to and noting that after pleading guilty, the Se primary... Senator Carr, you, I would ask you, please, I'm going to rule the question out of order if you persist with stating the allegations. Well, we, this, have, these no, are no, live no, no, proceedings I've, before I've made, a court. I've made my, I've made my uh, observations. We are, we are, many now, people look, might be aware of what the allegations are, but I would ask you not look, to repeat them in, in the committee at the moment, please. The, and after pleading guilty, the primary offender in these matters Witness K was given a three-month suspended sentence, which is already concluded, a 12-month good behaviour bond, which the ACT court acknowledged that was when he unlawfully revealed confidential information about Australia's actions in East Timor. Uh, uh, Senator, Senator Carr. Senator Carr, I have just asked you not to discuss any of the matters that are currently before the court. Well, well, I, I understand that these are being canvassed in other forums, but... The convention of this Senate is a very important one in relation to sub judice, and the last thing that we would want as senators is for any no, of this evidence, no, excuse the me, yeah. for any of this evidence to be used in any manner that might prejudice current court proceedings. No. So I'm going to. I think. I think the I attorney and Mr. Um, Eng has. My question yet. Mr. Curry is. Senator Carr, I am about to rule the question out of order if you, unless you can bring it back to matters of procedure well, and the attorney's I'm powers. I'm asking the question about the public this interest here. here. I do regard it, it would not be appropriate to talk about this question of the public interest because it does go to the matters Directly at issue. Directly to the matters at issue. Okay. Senator, I think you might recall that the previous 
previous estimates we had yeah, previous discussed. Commonwealth them. Director of Public Prosecutions, who would make that judgment about public interest, uh, claimed public interest Senator, immunity. Thank you very much. Senator but Carr, I'm sorry, that, that's, the, that's your final question. I, I, we are I, going to move well, on. No, no, I just make no, no, the observation. Senator Carr, this I, I did give you a final ministerial discretion. Senator Carr, you don't have the, it's the not call. Just a matter of DPP. Senator Carr, you don't have the call. I'm now going to give the call to Senator Thorpe. Thank you very much, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, these questions are around the ongoing um, torture in Australia. On the 20th of... Sorry, just to remind you, you have six minutes. We are very anxious six to minutes. move. So we are very anxious you. to move to AGS, so if you could make your questions when, very quick. Torture in Australia. But what topic? 20th of January 2022 was OPCAT was a deadline for the implementation of our obligations under OPCAT. The government uh, has missed the deadline. So are you aware that your own hand-picked appointment to the Human Rights Commission has written that the Commonwealth needs to provide, and I quote, additional funding and the lack of an overarching national framework for implementation have been identified by some states as key stumbling blocks. And I table that document here for the secretary. Thank you, Thank you Senator Thorpe. Um, I, just, can I just clarify, what, which document are you reading from, Senator Thorpe? The article, ABC article. Okay, thank you. Give a copy to the minister. So I don't have the article, Senator, but I, I can uh, talk to some of the issues that you raise. Um, uh, in terms of the commencement of obligations, uh, the Attorney General wrote on the 20th of December to the UN Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture to seek a further one year extension for Australia to implement the optional protocol um, uh, in accordance with Article 24.2 Thank of you. that convention. Uh, and that is, as I understand it, uh, under consideration by the UN subcommittee. Um, the Attorney General has also written to all states and territories to notify them of that. Um, the department, um, the attorney has uh, discussed implementation at the meeting of Attorneys General uh, last, most, at the most recent uh, meeting of Attorneys General last year. Um, and the department continues to work with states and territories. The Commonwealth has also given additional funding to states and territories to enable them uh, to implement the optional protocol. Um, and we've been working them, with them as well on an intergovernmental agreement Thank about you. those arrangements. Thank you. And I can take you through the states and territories that have already Could got you provide that on notice? Only because I have probably my time's ticking down and yes. you're taking a lot of it. Happy so to I'm going to go that. to my next question um, with all due respect. Uh, the Commonwealth has previously noted in question LCC AE 2050 that the initial focus of OPCAT will be on primary places of detention. How did the Commonwealth arrive at its list of primary places of detention? And who did you consult to make this decision? Um, uh I might have to take on notice um, the work we did to arrive at that, um, but that list is based on the places where uh, we've identified that the risk of harm is greatest, and so that's adult prisons, juvenile detention centres, police cells, certain closed psychiatric and disability units, immigration facilities and military detention facilities. Um, the discussions we've had with the states and territories is that the um, NPM network can consider then over time the scope of other places um, that uh, uh, should be brought in and dealt with as well, but Thank we will you. focus on that uh, set of Thank areas. You. Thank you. Uh, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission's Serious Incident Response Report for April 1, 2021 to May 2, 2021 found that there were 1,876 Priority 1 incidents, including 778 unreasonable uses of force, 149 unlawful sexual contacts and 448 cases of neglect. These mandatory notifications came from only 47% of the total number of registered aged care service providers. 
So this is probably the tip of the iceberg. Why do you not consider aged care facilities as places of primary detention? Uh, uh, Senator, we're conscious of uh, uh, considering monitoring arrangements for aged care facilities and secure dementia units uh, where there's involuntary detention and looking at those over time. Uh, in line with guidance that comes from um, the SPT, uh, which talks about you know, determining areas of priority and focus having regard to proportionality um, uh, and the fact that uh, the idea is you sort of start with the key areas and expand over time. Um, we do intend to look at that, but have, uh, in terms of practical implementation, started with that list of greatest risk. This government has failed elders across this country already. There's no regard for our old people right across this country, and we've seen that in the pandemic. So we know that the government already has failed aged care totally and utterly. When we include aged care into the scope of the NPM? Senator, um, that will be a matter for consideration with states and territories, but we have worked with them, as I said, to really focus on uh, identified areas where improper conduct is greatest. Aged care um, and secure dementia units are certainly ones we're aware of that we will look at, um, but they're not in the primary focus for the, ver the initial uh, implementation. Thanks, I'll put the rest on uh, notice. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Thorpe. That concludes the committee's examination of the Attorney General's department in relation to in the Integrity and in International Group. We were intending to go through till 3.30. So you do, you have got a few more questions? We're, yeah, we're happy to pull it up at 3.30. What were, what were you proposing to do, Chair? Uh, well, I was, if there were no more questions, I was proposing to go to the AGS now, but if you have some more questions oh. uh, on integrity, I will give you the call. Just I'd... very keen to move as quickly as we can. So if we can wrap up uh, the integrity and international group by 3.30, that would be terrific. We've. Uh, we've sort of covered our AGS questions. It was the ones that Senator Carr asked, um, and we don't have anything for enabling services group. So, right, so depending you. whether others that will allow yeah well, that will allow us straight after the break. All right. I know. I do. I do believe I'll need to check with other senators about whether they have questions, but we do. There will obviously be a chance for us to catch up on time. Uh, so we are expecting to only ask limited questions of the AGS and the Enabling Services Group. But let's just push through and try and move through uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, Senator, what do you have the call? Sorry, Chair. Just, uh, can I just double check? Yeah. If, if no other senators have questions for AGS or Enabling Services Group, we would just propose to use the remaining 10 minutes for Integrity and International. But if other senators do have questions for AGS and Enabling Services Group, we could cede to them so that we can start AAT at 3.45. Well, one other senator has indicated that uh, he may have questions for AGS, but I'll need to double check whether that's still the case. Okay, maybe Senator Grogan could ask some questions for Integrity International while we work that out. Yep. yep. Okay, Senator Thanks. Grogan, you have the call. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Cash, uh, in your second reading speech on the government's uh, Respect at Work Bill, yes. um, you said, in respect of a positive duty on employers to prevent sexual harassment, sex-based harassment and discrimination under the Sex Discrimination Act, further policy consideration and consultation is required. Now, that was on the 1st of September 2021. Um, can you advise us, has further consideration of policy or consultation ha occurred? Ms. Ms. Chuji will take this for you. We, yep, that's fine. Um, on six of the remaining legislative recommendations, and that includes uh, the positive duty. So uh, we're starting that consultation process, that consultation paper and a survey is out publicly We'll hold round tables as well. Could you, um, sorry, could you just give me the date for that? It was put out when, sorry? It came out yesterday. Yesterday? Yes. We can get you a copy of it if that would assist as well. Senator yeah, that Brogan. would be lovely, thank yep. you. Gosh, that's a long time, isn't it? Um, 
this this is a pro is this a priority to get through this piece of work? I'm, I'm just very conscious that September through to February is a lengthy period of time for what is a very very important piece of work and one in which um, a great deal of anxiety and hurt has been expressed over those number of months since your statement in September. Um, could you give us a sense of the kind of priority that's being placed on this work? Yep, and I'm happy for Ms Chidji to take you through um, the detailed response, but I think we did discuss this earlier today, but 42 of the 55 recommendations have either been fully implemented or fully funded. Work is underway on all remaining recommendations. Um, and as you know, no recommendations have been uh, rejected. Um, the government committed, I think, as you also know, $66.5 million for implementation of the roadmap uh, in the 2021 um, and the 2021-2022 uh, budgets. There's a number uh, of initiatives that have already been implemented. So, for example, uh, last year, passage of the Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Act. Uh, 2021, uh, an amendment to the Fair Work Regulations, establishment of the Respect at Work Council, and that itself is going to lead implementation of a number of key Respect at Work report recommendations. We also looked at and have substantially boosted legal assistance um, to provide for specialist lawyers and workplace and discrimination law expertise. That was almost $44 million um, in funding. We also provided to the Human Rights Commission, it was $1.37 million to progress 10 recommendations out of the Respect at Work report, including the development of practical tools and resources to support greater education and awareness of how to address sexual harassment in the workplace. And these tools, and Ms Chidji, I don't know if she can provide you with an update, but they're currently being tested with stakeholders. Uh, just in terms of, there are 13 recommendations that are actually being progressed with the state and territories, because not all recommendations, mm. as you know, were directed at the Commonwealth Government. Some were directed at the Commonwealth, some at the Commonwealth states and territories, and then some at business and other stakeholders uh, more broadly. In terms of those 13 recommendations that are being progressed with states and territories, um, these are including through intergovernmental fora and the development of the next national plan to end violence against women and children. Uh, more broadly, in terms of the issue that you raised, um, the department has commenced the public consultation uh, on the remaining legislative recommendations. The consultation, and I will get you a copy of that paper, yeah, so, so you do have can it. Can I just interrupt you there? Um, that, that's the just because I know we have such limited oh, time. Yeah. Understood. Um, um, so yes, it would be good to get that consultation. Yep. Um, I cynically wonder if it's released yesterday had anything to do with um, the letter from the deputy chair, but I will just plough on and go to some different questions, but it would be great to see that consultation I'll piece. I'll get it printed off for you. Um, so the Australian Human Rights Commission just wanted to run through a few issues there in terms of the balance between um, they're, they're on tonight. Are they? For the, yeah. No. This is very much about. Okay. Yeah. No, this is very much about the kind of funding pace, so like where yeah. they're where they're sitting. That's fine. Yep. Um, Departmental issues in relation to yep, human that's rights. Fine. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, so the work within the commission obviously is is very important to all of us, um, and we're just wondering if you can give us a bit of a sense of the staffing numbers. Uh, whether there are any caps on staffing and whether you believe there are sufficient staff to undertake the very, very important work that is, that is um, tasked to them. So I think, uh, Senator, the Commission would be best placed to talk about their staffing numbers. Um, like all agencies, they have an ASL cap, but that is, they're not near that ASL cap. It's not holding them back. Um, uh, and 
Um, their resourcing, I can say, has been their sort of core resourcing for their core functions um, has continued to be around $16 million. Um, I think uh, uh, with some additional money, the I think most recent financial year, there was $20 million, but that included some additional funding for this year for the Royal Commissions as well. But generally their funding has uh, uh, remained uh, pretty steady over recent years at around 16 million. Um, and then the so commission also gets resourcing for particular project work that they're undertaking in addition. So um, uh, would you say that, that you believe it's sufficiently resourced for all that it's tasked to undertake? Uh, well, you might want to ask the Commission that this evening. Uh, just you're asking an opinion of an officer of the department. Uh, and so no, well, it could well go to the additional projects because the range of additional projects being undertaken. Um, Would you like to rephrase your question because you were asking an opinion? Is the organisation sufficiently funded to undertake the work that's in front of it, including obviously the, the series of additional projects such as the ADF review? international programs, fee-for-service training, that kind of thing? I think that that is probably the you same question, Senator. Yeah. But, but the I'm point asking it again because the yeah, chair no, no, no. And the point needed me to remove the... As well, and I'm happy for Ms Chidji to take you through this. So, for example, in relation to the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, uh, Kate Jenkins, the Respect at Work report, the government has provided additional resources uh, to assist her in discharging the functions. I don't know if you'd like to no, get a that would be part better of the understanding that you were referring to, Ms. Chigley. Uh, yes, the 1.37 million that uh, uh, we took you through earlier with the so components for that. Projects sit in the four million because there were 16, but 20 in the last year. Uh, um, uh, it's probably more complicated than that, but I, basically I was saying there's Broadly. 16 million for their core functions that's been relatively stable over recent years. And then um, some amounts on top of that, both appropriations, but also project funding. Um, so I think the project funding we've provided for respect to work comes through a memorandum of understanding um, rather than direct appropriation, which would be the 20 million. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Senator Grogan. We've got a minute left. Senator, what do you have a minute's worth of questions? A minute's worth of statement. Oh, Murray, do something brief. A minute's worth of statement, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let us go to afternoon tea early, please. That's a mean question. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Come, you <be. laughs> Um, You'll let me have a cup of tea. Yeah, or would, could I extend? We could even give you a chocolate biscuit, Senator Watt. On this one occasion. Can I have a chocolate pass. biscuit, please? Yes, yes, Minister. <laughs> All right, well, we Thank will suspend you. for afternoon tea. Are we at, coming back to the AAT? Uh, we are, we, we are yep. coming back to the AAT. We do not require the AGS, AGS or the Enabling Services Group. Thank you. Uh, they are both dismissed. Thank, Thank you, you know, for uh, waiting. While, while we're doing that. Yes, yes. Um, I haven't had a chance to check this with my colleagues, admittedly, so they could speak up um, if they disagree. But I think we could, we probably, given time, where we would be happy to not ask questions of the archives. I'm not sure if Senator Carr had any there. I mean, I, I can ask the minister. I can ask the minister uh, a direct question if I need to. Let, like, I, the only thing I want to know is how the director appointment process is going. That's about all. I, Senator, uh, Senator Watt, in relation to further forward in the program, let's take that offline, and then we can inform everyone accordingly. Yeah, but that's it. But it's important to allow the officers. The opportunity not to uh, appear. Yes, but we, we can, can perhaps that. do that in the next 15 minutes. So sure. uh, let's suspend now and then we can clarify the program in relation to the committee's requirements in 15 minutes' time. Thank you very much. It's now in session, and it's my pleasure to call officers from the Administrative Appeals Tribunal appearing via video conference. Good afternoon. Would you like to make an opening statement before we go to questions? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Jamie Crew, uh, Acting Registrar. The committee will be aware the former President, the Honourable Justice David Thomas, and former Registrar Sian Latham have both resigned from the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. The Honourable Justice Berna Collier, Judge of the Federal Court of Australia, is currently the AAT's Acting President. She is ably assisted by the division heads, other deputy presidents, and others in senior positions 
to ensure the core work of the tribunal continues. When the former registrar left in January 2022, I became acting registrar. I'm assisted by a senior executive group and will continue to work with our members and staff to deliver the services required by tribunal users. These temporary arrangements will be in place until a new president and a new registrar are appointed. As interim leaders in our respective areas, Justice Collier and I are mindful of the need to continue to look for ways to improve AAT services. We will consider what can be implemented as appropriate and we will otherwise prepare to provide recommendations for the new president and registrar. Regardless, we will ensure that AAT continues to do its core work to finalise many thousands of applications through a high quality merits review process that is accessible, fair, just, economical, informal and quick. Thank you and I welcome questions from the committee. Yes, yes sir, Minister. Uh, the question is, is it possible to reproduce the video conference link on the other screens in the room? I don't know whether it is. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that one for broadcasting to see whether that is possible and we'll do okay. our very best. There is one. Yeah, but there's nothing on it other than the crest. Oh, okay. So we've got an issue with the monitor below me. So if that, if, if uh, broadcasting who do a magnificent job could work its magic, <laughs> that would be great. Thank you. Uh, we are now going to go to questions from senators and Senator Steele-John is seeking the call. Senator. Disabled people who are uh, desperately trying to get the basics they need from the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, I'd like to start off by asking how many applications to the AAT have been made by NDIS participants in 2021, uh, particularly between January and December of 2021. Uh, Senator, I have the data in relation to the number of applications that are filed from the 1st of July 2020 to 30 June 2021. Uh, in the NDIS it was 2,160. I can tell you for the period 1 July 2021 to 31 December 2021, the number was 3,140 in that six month period. Okay, so just to clarify, between June 2020 and July 2021, it was 2,160, correct? Was correct. That, yep. And then from, and when, when, what was the time period for that second figure? It's six months from 1 July 2021 to 31 December 2021. Oh, yes. Okay. So what you're telling me there is that you had more applications, nearly a thousand, almost a thousand more applications in the six months between July 2021 and December 2021 than you had in the previous financial year. Is that correct? That's correct. How many of the, how does that compare actually, first of all, that's, we'll come back to that in a second. How many applications were made to the tribunal uh, by NDIS participants between, uh, say, in the same financial year period, 2019-20. Do you have that figure? I do. Uh, 1,780. 1,780. Okay. Um, and how many NDIS matters have been resolved by the AAT between January and December of 2021? Uh, we've got financial year's data, Senator, so yep. I could give you the financial year data. Yes, yep, go on then. So for 1920, the number of finalisations was 1,527. Yep. For 2021, 1,448. Yep. 
and for the six months from June to December uh, 2021, uh, 1,356. Okay. Um, and how many in that, uh, in that financial, in those bracketed periods of time, so we've got a consistent data set, how many of these NDIS applications were finalised without a hearing? Uh, the number of matters that were finalised in uh, the period 2021, I understand, was 2%. So I'll, I'll have to see if we can get the exact figure. And I think that's consistent for the period. 2% was consistent for the six months for July to December. OK. But obviously more matters. Yep. And just because I'm not the fastest note taker in the world, so in, um, in terms of that latest period of July, uh, July 2021 to December 2021, in terms of resolutions, could I just get that figure again? As in finalisations? Yeah, sorry, finalisations, <laughs> yep. Yes. So, for 1920, it was 1,527. Yep. For 2021, 1,448. Yep. And for from 1 July 2021 to 31 December, the six month period, it was 1,356. Okay, so for that 1,356, um, what was the average cost per case to resolve to the tribunal? I don't have that information, Senator. I'd have to take that on notice. All right. If you could take that on notice, that'd be good. Is that something that you might be able to circle back with uh, at some point today, or will that be a longer process for you to get that information? That would be a longer process, Senator. Okay. It's not something we have readily available. All right. Um, now, if I remember rightly, um, back in 2019, which is I think the last time I asked some similar questions, the average time for resolution at the tribunal um, used to be about, I think it was six to eight weeks with the maximum being 12 weeks. Um, fast forward to, to where we are now in 21. Um, I'm just wondering what you can give us in terms of uh, average time to resolve cases. So the data we use, Senator, is the median time to finalisation. Yep. And, the, and we record that in weeks. So for the period 1920, the median time to finalisation was 18 weeks. Yep. For 2021, the median time to finalisation was 23 weeks. Yep. And for the six month period, July to December 2021, it was 19 weeks. Okay. Um, final question uh, to you on, uh, on this piece then, and I'll then hand back to the chair. Um, I'm really concerned to see that, that just in this six month period that the the latest six month period you've got you've you've actually done more than you did in the previous year you've overshot it by about a thousand what can you tell me about the 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 drivers of that increase i think um senator is just an increase in applications from uh the ndia um, or maybe I'll have to find some data in relation to the changes in the different areas. Yes, if you could, that'd be great. So which period particularly, Senator? If I look at the period um, 2021 yep. and the six months just gone. Yep, that's the one, yep. So there was a 58% increase from the six month period just gone against the same period last year. Yep. For access to the scheme. Yep. There was a 400% increase in that period 
against the same period last year in relation to plans. Jesus. Okay. Yep. There was a 250% increase in relation to recovery of compensation. Yep. And there was a 50% decrease in nominees. Sorry, when you say a, a decrease in nominees, what, what, it was what? small numbers. It went from nine to two. So they're very small numbers. Okay, thank you. Um, and just to clarify, 58, 400%, 200% in relation to those areas, is that, that driven by uh, participants making applications to the tribunal? In that's when you said uh, driven by applications by the NDIA, is that the, N the NDIA making the applications so or the participants? No, sorry, Senator. So it's applications in relation to, to decisions made by the NDIA. In so relation to decisions made by the NDIA. I thought so. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Crewe. Uh, that, that's it for me, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Steele-John. Uh, Senator Carr. Uh, if I could ask the officers a few questions about... Uh, it's one of the um, tribunal members, Fiona Ma. We got some information here on Fiona Ma that can help me. Prior to November 2018, Ms Ma was a part-time member of the Migration and Refugee Division. Is that correct? That's my understanding, Senator. Thank you. Now, I make it clear, I understand that Mr. Ms Ma's father is the former High Court uh, Justice um, uh, Ian Callaghan. That's also correct, isn't it? That's my understanding, Senator. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I just want to make it clear that they're uh, about that relationship. Um, now, in early 2018, Mr. Callaghan was uh, commissioned by the government to conduct a review of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which was completed in December 2019. That's correct, isn't it? Uh, yes, Senator. Thank you. And so in November 2018, while Mr. Callan's review was still underway. Ms. Ma was promoted to a full-time senior member of the AAT. Is that right? I just have to check the date, Senator, that she was Thank appointed. You. Perhaps I can come back to that, Senator. Well, sure. Now, look, I, and I know you'll tell me that that appointment was made entirely. Uh, on merit, it, it's just that it, given the political sensitivity about Mr. Cullen's review, I'm just wondering, um, was it ever the issue of the perceptions of a conflict of interest ever canvassed within the AAT? Well, I'm unaware, Senator. I wasn't here at that time. Right. Is anyone here can help me with uh, that inquiry? Um, I'm not sure, Senator, but perhaps we could um, take that on notice. Um, but I can confirm the date of appointment as the 3rd of November 2018. Thank you very much. So, um, Minister, uh, the Cabinet approves the appointment and promotions at the AAT. Was it the fact that Ms Ma, given a uh, relationship with Mr Callaghan and the review was underway, uh, and the, independ the uh, independence of the tribunal. Was that brought to the attention of yourself or to the Cabinet? Are you talking about the appointment in 2018? Yes. Uh, well, this is part of the Cabinet process, so I certainly yeah. wouldn't discuss Cabinet deliberations. No. But I just need to understand the point you're making. No, the conflict Are of interest issue. Because someone's related to someone? Yes, it's a conflict of interest question. Was that ever brought to your attention? And any of these conversations? Uh, again, I wouldn't discuss cabinet deliberations. And no. It was some time ago now, Senator Carr. No, but you, you can't take that on notice to establish whether or not there was a conflict of interest declaration I can take it on notice for you, regard. but again, I hope you're not implying that because someone is related to someone. No, no, no. no. Well, well, in fact, the issue of uh, familiar relations is an issue for conflict of interest, and it is normally a part of a declaration. Again, I wouldn't discuss Cabinet, but I'm happy to take it on notice Thank for you. Thank you. Uh, now, so, Ismar completed um, 
she was promoted again, I might say, in December 2020, uh, this time to a full deputy president, and she's, um, salary for that's about half a million dollars a year. That's correct, isn't it? How one of the officers help me with that? Yes. Or perhaps the minister won't know the detail of that. I'm sorry, I thought you were looking at the officers. No, no, but, but I, it's a no, I don't uh, expect you to know the answer to that question. Yes, yes. Senator. Thank you. Um, now, Ms. Mark completed in 2018-19, 29 applications um, for which she was paid $295,000. It's $10,000 for each of the applications finalised. Is that a fair description of the evidence that you've presented to us? I think those may be the number of finalisations, Senator, yeah, in that period. You. And in 2019-20, she completed five applications. That's it. I'm, I'm correct about that? Five? I'll just grabbing that information. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Yes, Senator. Thank you. And she was um, earned a salary of $329,000 that year. That's $65,000 per application that were finalised. Would that be correct? I think, um, Senator, in December 20, as you'd indicated, uh, Deputy President Ma was appointed as division head of the NDISD. So she had other responsibilities right. okay. um, in that period I see. as well. Fair enough. So let me just go to 2021. There's two applications completed. That's two in the entire year. And a salary there of $415,000. That's $200,000 per application. Would that be correct? The number is two, Senator. Yes, that's correct. And, and presumably you'll tell me that the oversight of the division uh, at the president's request meant that she was pretty busy with other responsibilities. Is that, is that the well, argument? There are other work as well, Senator, in relation to um, uh, consent <coughs> matters, directions, hearings as well that right. she undertook. I see, I see. Look, so if we go through the situation and compare it to other officers, I mean, I see that Ms. Diana Bent, Bink, that is BNK, she's a senior member of the tribunal. She was given an administrative role providing oversight to the Social Security and Child Support Division. Now, these are all in the tables you've provided me. This is my source here. Um, much larger division than the NDIS. Ms. Bent uh, managed to finalise 1,000 applications in 2018 2019 alone and then another 1,000 in 2019-20. And I'm just wondering, Ms. Mark gets promoted with a very limited number of applications. Ms. Bent doesn't seem to make the promotion list in the same way. Is, is that correct? I'm not sure um, what you're asking, Senator. Is that, uh, I'm I mean, just wondering, appointments is there a disparity? are a matter for government? Yeah, I'm just asking, is there a disparity here? Well, there's certainly uh, the workloads or the cases in each of those divisions is quite different. So it, you wouldn't be comparing the same uh, types of finalisations. The social services and child support division generally finalise a large number of applications uh, with a median time of around eight weeks. So it's certainly a different type of caseload sure. and not easily to compare numbers. Okay. Well, so. Ms. Ma is appointed as division head. She's finalised three applications in the division. Not three in a year, three applications. Is that correct? For which year, Senator? Well, no, no. Ever. Three in the total. In the division. I've only got the financial year data, no, sorry, okay. Senator. I can so, try and track the division could, data separately. If you separately. could do that for me, because I'm having a bit of trouble following this. It's why I read your tables you provided me. Three applications, and she's appointed divisional head in the NDIS division. 
yet there are other officers in other sections that seem to have much more experience. Can you explain that to me? Well, I can confirm I found the number of three, Senator. Um, but again, um, I'm not sure it's a matter for me to comment in relation to whether the reason Deputy President Ma was was appointed. Right. I see. Is there anyone there that can help me with that? Are all those senior officers gone? Just one minute in this block, Senator Carr. Sorry? I'm just, is there, not, none of the senior officers can assist me with that. Would you like to take I that question on notice? Uh, Look, happy to take that to, on notice. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Crew. Right. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like to go on to another area if I could. Um, but uh, Mr. I'm um, sorry, Senator Carr, we are. Senator, do you mind if, you're, if sure. this is a natural break? Sure. Um, we are at the conclusion of your block of time. I'll now give the call to Senator Scar. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it won't be as controversial as well, I Well, well, he may well be, Senator Carr. Uh, acting, uh, acting Registrar, you've, uh, do you come from outside of the AAT or from within the AAT? Uh, I was appointed as the National Director of Tribunal Services uh, in July last year. Okay. Are, are so I've you been with the Tribunal for about six months. Okay. Are, are you aware that the, the previous Registrar, um, just taking on some of the, the theme that Senator Carr has been pursuing, provided quite fulsome answers to questions on notice, uh, providing responses from various AAT members with respect to their workloads and some of the adverse publicity, to be frank, that was generated uh, in, a num in, in the media following some of the, uh, the hearings last year? Yes, I am. And I'm not going to mention names. I don't, I don't want to mention names. I want, I want to try and um, keep it at a, a principal level. Um, though I, I send a car, I, no reflection on you in doing that. I just want to try and, and, and lift the discussion up. Um, there, there, there are a number of points which uh, are almost thematic in terms of the explanations which were provided by members in term, when they were, they were questioned or they were responding. They were given the opportunity to respond in relation to concerns raised about their workloads. Um, is it true to say one of those uh, issues that was raised by a number of members was health issues? Is that correct? In fact, one of the members was undergoing cancer treatment yep. uh, at the time. Do you remember that? I do recall seeing um, a response. Okay. Do, in that do, regard, yes. Okay. Do, do you also remember uh, one of the responses that was raised by a number of members was their starting date? So on some occasions, uh, their starting date was thought to be, say, December, but they really didn't get sworn in, complete their induction training until, say, March, and then they weren't allocated any cases until, say, May. Are you aware of that issue? I am aware, yes. Okay. Are you aware of the issue being raised around case allocation, that in some cases, ca cases might, might take uh, not very long to determine because there's a threshold issue around jurisdiction, whereas in other cases they can be extremely complicated. You could have self-represented represented, um, applicants. Uh, you could have applicants battling with perhaps mental illness. Uh, and, and very complicated issues which make uh, the hearing far more complicated. Are you aware of that issue being raised? I am, Senator. I'm aware of the variation across case loads and within case uh, divisions as well. Okay. And I, I, I want to... There was one case in particular, um, and I, I don't particularly want to mention names, as I said, but one case stood out to me, this issue about re-weightings. Re and I've, I've got a fundamental concern about this benchmark system, and I think it needs to be looked at. And mm. I'm, I'm going to ask you what uh, Justice Collier's uh, considering um, in terms of recommendations. But there was one case I saw where uh, one of the members who'd been subject to some publicity and subject to questions uh, from, was the subject of questions from this uh, committee. There was a lack of 
um, waiting given to what's referred to as additional case days. And in the case of this member, um, it was actually calculated that um, because they hadn't sought re-weighting in terms of their additional case days, their benchmark didn't take into account, and I found this quite um, mind-blowing actually in terms of quantum, didn't take into account 170 additional case days, which it should have taken into account. And I calculated that to be 34 weeks of hearing time. So you're aware of those sort of discrepancies arising because the individual member doesn't seek a re-weighting with respect to the complexity of their cases. I, I am aware that some members do seek re-weighting and some members don't. And, and, and for those members who don't seek re-weighting, it can actually prejudice them in terms of their performance statistics, their KPIs, because they don't reflect what would be a reasonable re-weighting. Re is that a reasonable proposition? Uh, it could give an indication, but that's just one parameter in relation to their performance, Senator, so it's not the only measure. So if you're looking at that as the only performance measure, I could see why it would indicate that, but it, from the tribunal's perspective, it is not the only measure in relation to performance. But another measure, and it was actually raised in, 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 the, in the case I, I read the detail of, um, was that uh, uh, the number of what I refer to as jurisdictional sort of cases where the, the case could be easily disposed of because there was a fundamental jurisdictional issue, uh, that particular member didn't have many of those cases. The cases they were getting allocated with the more complicated cases. That can happen as well, can't it? Yes, it can. Okay. So then, as we, as we take all those threads uh, and, and, and consider the, um, the fact that, and to be frank, acting registrar, a number of the members actually uh, were provided the opportunity because of the questions from this committee to actually provide responses to the criticism which they suffered uh, in, in the press in terms of how their performance was, uh, was represented. In, in light of those matters, uh, what are the sorts of issues which you refer to in your opening statement that Justice Collier and I are mindful of the need to look for ways to improve AAT services? Are you looking at ways to address those sorts of issues in terms of case allocation, in terms of benchmarking performance, in terms of making sure members are given a reasonable opportunity to provide their input before statistics and performance measures are provided to committees such as this, so that we make sure we get the full context and all the information to conduct a sober assessment of their performance. Justice Collier and I certainly haven't discussed that level of detail or particularly around benchmarks or weightings, etc. Um, I wouldn't ordinarily be involved in those discussions. They would ordinarily be between the president um, or acting president and the division heads in relation to that process, at least at first instance. Um, I think Justice Collier is mindful that uh, we can't stand still while we're waiting for the uh, appointment of a new president. So uh, wishes the work of the tribunal to continue but we've certainly not looked at making such significant changes at this point in time. Right. Well, can, it, can I suggest to you that an example of this issue, Senator Carr has raised questions, which he's quite entitled to do, and he's been very diligent in terms of raising questions in these matters for some time, in relation to a senior member of the AAT. Presumably, um, it is appropriate, don't you think, uh, Mr Acting Registrar, for the input of that uh, of that member to be sought with respect to um, what it is that they're spending their time on uh, and in terms of their workload and their duties to make sure to make sure that this committee and indeed the wider public are given an, given an appropriate uh, understanding of what it is members of the AAT do on a on a day to day basis. Isn't that important? It is important, yes. So is that, is, is that something you might consider discussing with uh, Justice Collier after this hearing? I'm happy to have that discussion with Justice Collier. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and, and best of luck during your period as uh, Acting Registrar as well. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Scar. I'll now give the call to Senator Patrick. Thank you. 
I was trying to sneak away to get a coffee, but uh, <laughs> I can do that afterwards. Um, <laughs> uh, I just want to ask some questions in relation uh, to um, uh, migration matters. Um, this falls out from a visit I did to Cooper Pedy. Um, uh, I met with a number of constituents up there who uh, all had 187 visas refused by the Immigration Department and had lodged AAT appeals. And um, they'd done so in the last two to three years. Now, three of these constituents have been waiting for a hearing uh, for more than three years and two for two and a half years. Now, it turns out after I left, uh, there is now some progress with the matters. I just take that down to the attorney, keeping a close eye on what I'm doing uh, on Facebook and Twitter. Um, but uh, um, I, I, it sort of astounds me that you have a matter that sits on foot with, with, with no progress for um, with no progress for um, three years. So uh, just an opportunity to um, to, to hear your side of the story in relation to this, if, what the difficulties are, why these people are, uh, are waiting for so long. So, Senator, I think the, the point about the, the amount of time it's taking is purely related to the number of matters. So, for example, the cases on hand um, in the division uh, at the end of... Uh, 21-22, I'll just grab that. Thank you. Uh, the number of cases on hand is 50, at the 31st of December, 2021, was 57,201. My understanding is the work in the division has doubled since amalgamation um, of the tribunal back in 2015 um, and remained consistently high levels from 2017. So how many matters are you progressing each year? So 57,000, is, is that a number that's falling or is it growing? And how many matters do you generally um, conclude in a, in a, in a year? So I can give you the numbers from amalgamation. Did you want to go back that far? Yeah, if you, if you don't mind, just to, just to give a, I can draw a little, a rough, a rough little graft, graph here. So I, I can talk about um, lodgements in the period first and then finalisations perhaps? Yes, please. So if we go back to 2015-16 uh, at amalgamation, there were 18,534 lodgements. Yeah and 16,111 finalisations. Yep. In 1617, there were 26,604 lodgements. There were 18,908 finalisations. In 1718, 37,933 lodgements, 17,960 finalisations. In 1819, 36,172 lodgements, 20,892 finalisations. 1920, there were 29,981 lodgements, 26,398 finalisations. In 2021, there were 15,969 lodgements, and 23,246 finalisations. And the six months, 21-22, uh, 31st of December, there are 11,504 lodgements and 10,349 finalisations. So, so the, the story that that tells is that the number of applications firstly jumped quite significantly uh, in about 18-19. Um, um, and I wonder, is there, was there a cause of, f f for that? And then, in general, we say that there are you know, typically 
several thousand more applications than are than capacity to finalise. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, I think that relates as well to the number of members available in the division. Um, okay, so let's go back to the change in the number of applications, going from sort of 18,000 to 26,000 to, 30, uh, to 57,000, sorry, uh, 37,000. Um, do you have any, what, what was the cause of that? Yeah, I'm not aware, Senator. I'd have to take that on notice. Okay. Might have been some you got it. policy from government or something. Um, okay, so what's the general approach to deal with this? I mean, it's 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 like you've got this problem. And look, I, I'm in I'm in litigation in the federal court in relation to the Information Commissioner for exactly the same reasons. And the jurisprudence on this is if you sit on an application for more than uh, you know, a sh you know, short period of time with, without doing anything. Um, uh, there's an obligation in law that if, if there's a, uh, a decision to be made by an authority and that uh, decision doesn't have a time frame, that the parliament expects that the, the decision be made in a timely manner. And the judicial officer will look back through and if there's a file sitting on a desk for three years, um, you know, there, there's clearly scope for uh, judicial intervention to make an order to, to make a decision. And, and look, I'm, the way I'm looking at this, I may end up, after dealing with the Information Commissioner, coming back around the boy and doing the same thing in relation to migration to force the government to resource this properly. I mean, do you have a view on that? Is that is it reasonable for people to sit and wait for three years and not have their file touched? Senator, I might ask. Um Ms. Sabet had had to the senior reviewer from the IAA, um, who may be able to assist sure. with answering questions in relation to this division. Uh, Sabet had had senior reviewer Immigration Assessment Authority. Um, Senator, just for background, the Immigration Assessment Authority sits within the Migration and Refugee Division. Thank you. Um, in terms of the broader question about the reasons for the increase, um, that's probably a question better directed at the Department of Home Affairs because. Obviously, our caseload is completely dependent upon their processing uh, priorities at any one time. Um, if you look at the figures, um, the number of um, members of the tribunal has increased over time, but not proportionally uh, in line with the increase in applications. Uh, so we now have, um, as I think um, the acting registrar said before, some 57,000 on hand applications in the Migration Refugee Division. But we continue to be funded at similar levels as we were um, over the last six years. Okay, so I'll come back to the, the um, judicial view that you can't just sit on a decision uh, forever. Um, is this, when you're handling this, this matter, is it um, first person on the queue, first person off the queue, or is there, a, is there scope for intervention uh, uh, and, and is it done by state as well? So if you're in South Australia and there's fewer members, um, you know, that you, your time might be longer. If you're in New South Wales, there's more members uh, and fewer applications potentially. Um, it, it takes shorter. So how, how, is it, how does it look on the, the, the state landscape? Uh, my understanding is it's not rigid in terms of state allocation. Um, there are, um, as I understand it, complex arrangements for uh, the processing and prioritising of cases. And in certain cases, people can make a request for prioritisation, which will be considered. Um, the division does have an early case uh, assessment team that looks at how we can prioritise and process and get cases uh, that are suitable um, to members as quickly as possible. There will be some cases, um, I think particularly in the, the protection visa area, where it's deemed that a face-to-face -face interview has been necessary and they have been delayed um, by the pandemic, unfortunately. The tribunal has made um, quite significant strides in developing um, remote hearing capability and we undertake a, I don't have those figures with me, um, but we do undertake a large number of hearings um, by video. Okay, and I think, telephone. Okay. I don't know, um, One more minute, Senator Patrick. Yeah, I might just look to the attorney in terms of resourcing. This seems to me to be a problem here. 
whether or not the government is considering more um, members to be able to deal with the backlog. Was that on the radar? Ms Harvey to address that. Uh, Senator, um, there has been some additional funding provided uh, over the last, uh, in the last budget. Um, so there was, uh, understand, 54.8 million over the forward estimates uh, it provided an additional funding to address the backlog of migration matters. Um, so I think as part of that, the AAT uh, was to receive an additional 18.9 million with additional funding also being provided to the federal court. Um, and that's to help su support the Migration and Refugee Division uh, deal with some additional case, will deal with additional cases. Um, I'm just seeing if there was other additional funding as well, but there certainly uh, has been that additional funding in the system uh, quite recently. And well, I guess we'd expect there's a lag in, in the ability to respond to, or, or to be able to see a change in that. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what what kind of timing we anticipate. Uh, I don't know if my colleague can help me. Dr. Smurdell might be able to provide a bit more detail on that, Senator. Senator Alvin Smurdell, Assistant Secretary, of Legal System Branch. In terms of the, the funding, how it's being implemented, the AAT is probably in a better position to talk about that, but. A couple of other things to mention as well in this space, and, and Senator Carr mentioned previously about the Callanan Review, which um, is, hasn't been fully implemented yet, but um, elements of that have been occurring. And, and in fact, um, yesterday afternoon, the, the um, Courts and Tribunals Legislation Amendment Bill um, passed through the Parliament, and that contained yeah, some I, try, I did try to amend that uh, bill as it went through, actually, in relation to appointments, but I was unsuccessful. Labor didn't support me, but anyway. Okay, that, I guess that's on appointments, but in, rela <laughs> in relation to fun. the um, yep. procedural <laughs> side of things, there, <laughs> there have, certain, yep. okay. there have been right. some elements. Uh, Senator Patrick, you are... I'm happy to leave it there. I'll just yeah, you are at your say time. at some stage, um, after I've finished my Information Commissioner uh, proceedings, I, I might be an expert in this and come back round the buoy for migration if I can find a way to get standing. Uh, thanks, Senator Patrick. Uh, I will go back to Senator Carr. Thank you. Thank you. If I could ask uh, questions relating to Justice Thomas' recent uh, resignation. Um, I think um, we should uh, begin by thanking him for his service to the tribunal. Uh, but can I get an explanation as to why he resigned? That's a matter for the President, Senator. But you have, there was no explanation given. Minister, do you have any explanation? Uh, no, I spoke to, he fined me to give me the courtesy that he was considering it and it was a decision for him. And, but he gave you no explanation? Uh, he was returning to the federal court, was my understanding. I see. Um, how much notice did he give you of his intention to resign? Uh, I spoke to him in approximately November of last year. And this was effective uh, from uh, what date was his uh, resignation effective? I understand it was the 1st of February, but I will just get the officials to confirm that. But he, adv he advised you in November? Uh, he advised me in November that he was taking leave to consider um, his position, and then he advised me in January that he would be resigning, and I just advised him to follow the normal process. Thank you. Would you recall the date in January that he advised you that Unfortunately he was... not, no. I mean, I could take it on notice Thank for you, you. But, but not off the top of my head, no. Thank you. Senator, I can confirm that um, Justice Thomas resigned as uh, the AAT president from the 1st of February 2022, after uh, a period of leave which commenced on the 8th of December 2021. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what was the date of he notified the department of his intention to resign? Uh, I don't know that we have a particular date. Um, I can take that on notice, Senator. I see. Thank you. Were there, was there an explanation given to the department as to the reasons for his resignation? 
Senator, it wouldn't be uh, usual for an explanation to be provided to the department for that type of position. It's a matter to, for the uh, attorney okay. uh, or, in certain circumstances, the Governor-General. I think in this case he was, the process was he resigns to the Governor-General. That, that's yes, the yes, process. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah, no, I appreciate the point you make. And with regard to the registrar's uh, resignation, and once again, I'd like to thank her for her service to the tribunal. Um, but did she give an explanation for her, her resignation? Oh, I the registrar really indicated no. she was... Sorry, Mr Acting, Acting Sorry, Minister. I'm... Yes, Mr Acting Register. So the former registrar indicated that uh, she was uh, resigning to pursue other professional challenges. I see. There was no explanation given to the department uh, in that manner? Senator, I did have a conversation with Ms Leatham, um, uh, and she did indicate that she uh, had another opportunity, noting that her uh, term as registrar, I think, was due to expire in early April. So, as is often the case when people uh, see that their uh, appointment is coming near expiration, she uh, had uh, been looking at other opportunities and um, I think uh, was very excited to be going to sure, do something else. Sure, okay. Would you recall the date on which that occurred? The conversation that I had with her, um, I, I'd have to take that on notice, Thank you. Uh, Senator. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Minister, do you recall the date on which you were advised? Uh, no, I don't, Senator Carr, but I can take that on notice. Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Um, so, on the 20th of October, the Senate referred an inquiry into the performance and integrity of uh, the Australia's administrative review system. Um, and within a few months, the President's resigned, the Registers resigned, uh, before the committee had had a single public hearing. Now, we learned over several years now that under uh, the, this government, there's been uh, a bit of a problem on accountability. I'm just wondering. Was there any connection between the Senate's establishment of that inquiry and these resignations? I, I don't believe so. It certainly mm -hmm. wasn't raised with me, Senator Carr. Right. I mean, they're decisions for the individuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just go through a couple of matters. On the 8th of December 2021, it was reported in The Australian that President Thomas had asked his deputy presidents to write letters of support for besieged registrar uh, Sean Leatham. Do you recall the, well, I'll ask uh, Minister or the Department, we need the, one of you, familiar with the article? No, I'm not, Senator Carr. Do you have uh, a copy see. of it? Well, we could probably find a copy for you. Um, Senator, I can confirm I'm not familiar with the article. I see. I see. Um, well, look, the, the issue um, went to the assertion that this uh, event had occurred. Um, because so what events in the car? This was the that the that the president, as President Thomas, had asked his deputy presidents to write letters of support for the besieged register. That's the now because it was also asserted uh, that when the tribunal was asked about it, the president had indicated he'd not approached deputy presidents to ask them to write unsolicited letters. So perhaps the acting Registrar can give me some assistance here. Is there any truth to any of these matters? Whether the President Thomas asked Deputy Presidents or anyone else at the tribunal to write letters of support to the former Registrar? Uh, Senator, I don't know. I'm not aware of any conversations with other individuals. I can say that the President did ask me to provide a 360 degree uh, Feedback review. When was that? Certainly not, not unsolicited support. I'm unaware um, of the exact date, um, but it was certainly just uh, a 360 degree, the usual process that would ordinarily occur um, in relation to individ for individuals. So were there any? It wasn't, yeah, were I there wasn't any... requested for a letter of support. Okay. Were there any letters of support? Uh, actually generated, the, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. 
And I'd ask, uh, Minister, were any letters of support or to the Assistant uh, Attorney General received uh, from Deputy Presidents of the Tribunal in relation to the former... I, I don't Registrar. believe so, Senator Carr. Mm -hmm. Did, uh, I guess um, I'll put it to you bluntly, uh, Minister, did you ask either the President or the Registrar to resign? No. Again, that was a decision for the individuals, and I think the Secretary has stated the reason that the uh, former Registrar grave that she, I think, was believed had another challenge. I see. That's correct. So it wasn't a question of your confidence? You had no. No. That issue never arose? No. Mm -hmm. that the, um, and again, that was the same, same principle in regard to Justice Thomas, was it? Is that that is correct. Yeah. That was a decision for him. Yeah. Have there been any uh, deputy presidents or senior members resign recently? Say in the last three months. Um, we'd need to take that on notice, uh, Senator, um, or refer it to the AAT. Just well, one perhaps more the moment. AAT. Sorry? I was going to concur <laughs> with the um, Secretary's observation. Um, we'd have to take it on notice okay. that the AAT Can might the have AAT to AAT assist me? Have there been any other resignations of uh, Deputy Presidents or senior members? I'm not aware of any. Senator, but I would have to check to confirm that, sure, so I might you. take that on notice. What about ordinary members? Has there been any ordinary members uh, resign the last three months? Uh, I'm sure there have, Senator, um, but I'm not uh, aware of exactly how many, so I'd have to take that on notice. Thank you. Look, it's been, uh, it's been reported that the, the Ministry of Appeals Tribunal has hired a former tribunal member uh, Mr. Tony um, Caravella, an ANU law professor, uh, also uh, Robin uh, Crichton, and former family court judge, Mr. Peter Murphy, to provide the tribunal with advice on member evaluations. Now, is, is there any truth to that? Uh, yes, Senator, I might ask my colleague, um, Jacqueline Fredman, to um, provide you some more information in relation to that. Thank evaluation you. and case appraisal program. Right. Thank you, Senator Jacqueline Fredman, Chief Corporate Officer. Uh, the matter to which you refer relates to components of our professional development program. There are two elements in relation to member performance. There's a um, periodic evaluation program uh, this occurs during the first 12 months of a member's appointment and it's designed to um, allow um, to have the member evaluated by an independent person who examines a range of factors and then the member is um, provided with an individual development plan. The second element to which you referred was the appraisal process and this is one um, that serves the purpose of providing the president with information to assist him or her to be able to provide uh, recommendations about reappointment of members. So it occurs in the final 12 months of the member's term. And again, it's an evaluation of their performance. It looks at a range of factors such as um, the quality of their decision making, um, performance data. Um, and range of other information to assist the president to make to assess um, the suitability of somebody to be reappointed. Thank you. We, Senator Carr, we, we are going to need to move. Sure. I'll, I'll just, let me just deal with this. Uh, i just get it clear. So this is a long established program, is it? It's, we established it several years ago and we have a panel of eight people um, in late 2019 and again in late 2020. We undertook a process, um, a merit selection process in effect. So we called for expressions of interest. Um, we advertised externally seeking expressions of interest of people to undertake the evaluation and appraisal roles. There was a selection process undertaken and in both those rounds, we formed a panel of eight people. So the individuals you mentioned earlier are part of that panel. Okay. Can you give me a list of the eight people? Uh, take that on notice, if you could, please, and when they were appointed. 
Thank you. Certainly, and, Senator, happy and, to and do that. If you could, please. And just um, the nature of the advice that has been provided by the eight people in the time of their appointment. So the roles they undertake? Yeah, the roles they've undertaken, but the nature of the advice that they've, under, that they've provided in the period in which they've been appointed. If you could do yes. that. Thank yes, you very much. Thanks, Senator. Senator Carr. Look, I've just got a number of questions that I wanted to seek some clarification on. I, I firstly just want to move uh, to the issue in relation to the former president. Uh, I understand that a series of media outlets, including The Australian, The Guardian and Crikey, have issued apologies to Justice Thomas after erroneously linking his judicial appointment to his brother's political donations. Is that correct? Well, the answer is yes, it's correct, but are you directing that to the AAT? Well, I'm probably more correcting it, directing it to the Secretary. That is um, my understanding. There was a... Um uh, an apology printed in the Australian newspaper um, uh, in light of um, assertions that had made, been made previously in the Australian. Chair, I'm happy to read the apology out for the Hansard record. Thank you. Thank you, um, Minister. Um, for the context and benefit of the committee as follows. Last week, the Australian published articles concerning a donation made to the Liberal Party by Geoffrey Thomas and the announcement of the appointment of his brother, Justice David Thomas, to the Federal Court of Australia and the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. The Australian did not intend to suggest that there was any connection between the donation and those appointments, nor did the Australian intend to suggest there was any connection between press reports on the donation and Justice Thomas's resignation from the AAT. The Australian apologises to Geoffrey Thomas and Justice David Thomas for the hurt and harm caused. End of the apology. I also understand, as you have referred to, Chair, that several other media outlets have also apologised for suggesting there was any connection between the donation made by Mr Geoffrey Thomas and Justice David Thomas's appointment. Um, Minister, I want to just refer briefly to the Shadow Attorney General's media release. This is the Mr Dreyfus on the 1st of February 2022. Uh, he said in this media release, the Attorney General must ensure that any further appointments to the AAT, particularly the President, are chosen solely on the basis of merit, not their party political connections. Uh, what would you say in response to that statement by Mr Dreyfus? Well, Mr Dreyfus may want to consider the apology that was published by the Australian newspaper if he was indeed referring to uh, the comments that had been made by the Australian before the apology was published. So you would reject any inference that the president, the former president was appointed yes. other than on merit? Yes. Thank, thank you very much, Minister. I just want to move to the issue in relation to benchmarking, and I'd like to direct my questions to the acting registrar. There's been a lot of media coverage reflecting on a number of members, indicating that they were underperforming. And yet, as we have examined previously in this, from this committee, uh, I would put it to you that your benchmarking is fundamentally flawed, and that's perhaps why you are looking at how you can better reflect on the work performed by your members. For instance, in one case, uh, there was a report that a member did no work in a financial year when, in fact, he wasn't even sworn in. There have been numerous cases where members have been reflected on saying that they've been underperforming due to the low number of finalisation of cases in a given year when, in fact, in a number of cases they didn't even start work uh, until late in that financial year. Uh, there's also a failure of the AAT to categorise cases, so the migration Division, for instance, has a category uh, of complexity of cases. I think the Social Security Division is moving to categorising cases. Other divisions are not. And that means that it's a very unsophisticated way in which you are reflecting on the work performed by your members. What do you say to that? Uh, Senator, I would say that the, the, the benchmarking arrangement in the MRD has been a long-standing uh, approach. and it's primarily used for as an allocation process rather than a performance process. Um, 
I, sorry, um, I'm well, just going to cut in here, Mr. Crew, because we've obviously got limited time. Uh, I wasn't talking about case allocation. There were and have been numerous specific references to underperformance by members under circumstances when the, the data has been fundamentally flawed. Are you aware of this and, and what do you intend to do about it? So I think, Senator, what, we, what occurred on the instances I think that you're referring to was a lack of uh, context or additional information in relation to the reasons why they didn't perform work. So, well, for example, as you indicated, dates of appointment, whether they'd been sworn in or not, but, rather but, than just having a, a number. Mr Crewe, that's pretty fundamental. If you say that a member performs a low number of cases in a financial year, and yet they don't start until the April, almost the end of the financial year, I mean, isn't that relevant? So, Senator, I think in relation to our responses for the Senate inquiry, we've pr tried to address that issue so that didn't, we didn't repeat uh, the issue that had occurred previously. Uh, we provided uh, as much contextual information as possible in the responses so that um, it could be better understood and provide a, a more accurate reflection of what's occurring. Well, that's a very welcome change because the information you've provi provided in relation to the work of some members has been most inaccurate because of the incomplete or missing information. Uh, can I just ask why have you not moved to a transparent system where cases undertaken by members are categorised so that there is a proper understanding that some members are performing or, or are adjudicating on cases that are very simple, might take 20 minutes and other cases might take many, many days, sometimes even weeks. Mm. Why are we not seeing that level of transparency? I think, Senator, the information that's been provided has simply been total numbers of finalisations and not that additional contextual information. Yeah. So we'll look to um, change what we're doing or, or look to review how we might better provide such uh, information so that uh, it is clearer in relation to um, the different types of work that are being undertaken. So you say you're going to look to change the way you do things. So are you going to move to a system whereby cases are categorised so that there is adequate transparency, so that Australians can see that when a member is performing work, one is doing a case that might take 20 minutes and then another member might be doing a case that might take you know, three or four weeks? I think, Senator, um, there are opportunities for us to improve the way that we report on that. Um, certainly, uh, it's something we will look very closely at. So what are your plans in relation to changing the way that you do business? And you say that you're going to look at it. What's your commitment? Because I think one of My the issues has been, and we've highlighted uh, in recent estimates, and particularly in the last estimates, is there's been some major administrative flaws, which is sort of ironic, given you are the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, but major issues with your own administration in terms of not, <coughs> under, not even understanding whether a member has been sworn in. I mean, that is just so fundamentally basic, isn't it? So I think my undertaking, Senator, will be to um, raise the particular issue with the tribunal leadership group to see how we might progress that And what's the timeline for those changes and reform? Because I would put to you that major reform is required. So in terms of major reform, Senator, I note that we have both an acting president and an acting registrar <coughs> um, and are looking forward to the appointment uh, to both of those roles at the earliest opportunity. Uh, so we can obtain their views on how we can improve the way uh, we might operate into the future. So he'll, he'll be responsible for the implementation of those changes? Well, it depends what the changes are, Senator. So I think the first point is to have the discussion about the issue itself and then work out the way forward and then determine who's responsible. Ultimately, yes, it will be uh, the registrar responsible for implementing any new, ultimately responsible for implementing any new procedures. Uh, but the first step is to have the conversation. Uh, look, I'm also um, just wanting to flag, I'm concerned about the way in which 
Ms Ma has been referred to in this hearing. I, I understand that Senator Carr has raised questions in relation to perceived conflict of interest. But reflecting on Ms Ma uh, and giving the impression that she has not worked particularly hard, uh, I have an issue with that. I am concerned about that. Uh, if she's engaged to do a job which may principally not involve hearing cases, uh, then that's very important information. Can you please provide us with more information in relation to Ms Ma's duties, please? So I think, Senator, as I'd indicated earlier, it hasn't just been case finalisations, but there are a number of uh, consent determinations, uh, directions hearings, plus the ever-increasing workload in the NDIS division uh, means that she continually looks at ways to improve the way um, uh, users can access the system, how we can get decisions made more quickly. Um, she's implemented a number of uh, uh, initiatives, including a national uh, triage process, uh, is improving the way we undertake and the frequency of our outreach programs, uh, is working on updating uh, a practice direction for the division, um, and is also continually um, liaising with the uh, NDIA in, in relation to ways we can improve um, the way matters are, are <coughs> done at the tribunal. So the number of cases she has heard it does not in any way reflect on her hard work at the AAT. No, she works very hard, Senator. Thank you. I will now very briefly give the call to okay. Senator Scar, who's just got a, a clarifying question, I understand, and yep. then we will so, go to Senator So, Mr Crew, this is, this is one of the frustrations we have. So, uh, Ms. Ms Ma, as, as head of the division, uh, the NDIS division, I think we've heard evidence that there are thousands uh, two and a half thousand or something cases. So it's so an incredible number of cases. And as head of the division, I would look to her as a member of this committee as having a key role to triage mm -hmm. and to conduct directions hearings, try and get the flow of cases moving through the system as quickly as possible so those applicants get justice as quickly as possible. So those who are entitled to things they don't have get their entitlements recognised. That's an absolute fundamental purpose of the AAT. So when we hear that oh, only three completed cases, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't reflect all of the work that the member's doing with those responsibilities. So when you say directions hearings, um, that, that, that takes up a lot of her time, presumably, in terms of trying to triage matters, do directions hearing, hearings keeping matters flowing through the system. Can you give us a feel for the, for the amount of workload that Ms Ma is undertaking in that regard? So for the year uh, 2021, uh, there were 194 uh, events in relation to Ms Ma. Um, Sorry, 194 events you were referring to this. Total case events. Right. So they can be directions hearings, case management hearings, trying to get matters dealt with um, and allocated to progress them, as opposed to being case finalisations. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Right. All right. Thank you. Uh, Senator Scar, thank you. And also, just in relation to the extent to which uh, Ms Ma considers that there may have been adverse comment in relation to her performance, it's open to her, of course, to adopt the same procedure in relation to adverse comment as any other person raised in these proceedings, and that is to contact the Secretariat and seek a right of reply, and we would certainly invite Ms Ma to do so. I'll now give the, car, the call to uh, Senator Steelejohn. Um, all right, picking up where we left off, I want to ask you, Mr. Crew, given that uh, the time you quoted to us, I think, in relation to uh, your, the average time for uh, resolution of a case in the last six months of 2021, uh, was 19 weeks, I think was the figure that you gave us. Can you tell me how that compares to the final six months of the previous financial year? 
So again, Senator, we only have it in financial years. Um, and so I can tell you for the financial year uh, 1920, it was 18 weeks. Yeah. Uh, for 2021, it was 23 weeks. And in the six months to December, it was 19 weeks. And given that the, the you've given us, I think that that's the median time, yeah? The median average time? That's the median time, yeah. yes. So could you give me a picture of, 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 of the, within that, that period, what's your shortest case turnaround? What are your, your longest case turnarounds? We'd have to take that on notice, Senator. All right. Um, yeah, if you could take that on notice, that would be, um, that would be great. Um, I also, I note that what you've told us in your, in our previous chat about an hour ago, um, you've told us that in the whole of financial year 20 to 21, you dealt with 2,160 cases. Um, in relation to the NDIS, yet in the first six months um, of, in the six month period between uh, end of, uh, of uh, the following financial year, the most recent data you can give us, you've dealt with 3,140. Now that's a significant increase, um, and I'm wondering about the, uh, the cost in position that that has placed upon the tribunal. What, what information can I'll you give just, me about how much that has actually cost you? I'll just confirm that that's the number of lodgements rather than cases we've dealt with. Um, so it's, they are the lodgements to the tribunal. Yes, uh, sorry, I'd have to take on notice. Yes. 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 So I'd have to take on notice uh, any information in relation to costs. All right. If you could take that on notice, that'd be good. Um, thank you. Uh, now we've got a situation where a lot of people are making a very, very long time to have their case finalised at the AAT. Um, I wondered if you could tell me if uh, there is a process within the tribunal for applicants to make a complaint um, in relation to the length of time that it is taking to, to seek a resolution. Um, yes, there is. Okay, and how many? Um, I'd have to, yeah, could you? I'd, if you could give me some information on how many times that process has been utilised, that would be useful. I have to take that on notice, Senator. I thought we may have had it, but we'll take on notice. All right. So there, there is a process that you can complain to, and is that in relation to the AAT generally, or is that specifically in relation to? duration of time to resolve? Uh, generally. Okay. Um, and can you give me for uh, financial year 1920 um, and uh, 2021 and the six months you've got up till now, um, numbers of complaints um, uh, in relation to AAT applications by NDIS participants? Yes, Senator, we'll take oh, that on, on notice. notice. All right. Um, now, I've dealt with a number of, uh, in, in my capacity as a, as a Senator for WA um, and the disability portfolio holder for my party, my office deals with a tremendous number um, of constituent cases in relation to NDIS participants um, who are before the AAT. And one of the most frustrating continual uh, patterns um, is that the NDIS seems to be appearing continually before directions hearing, specifically, though not exclusively, without further uh, instruction, and this is causing further delay. Um, I'm wondering if the tribunal, and I think you actually mentioned this a little bit earlier in relation to your answer to Senator Henderson, um, whether the tribunal has seek to communicate with the NDIS um, to endeavour to find ways to speed up the resolution timeline. So Deputy President Ma has regular uh, discussions, either in herself or uh, through others, with the agency in order to improve the way 
that uh, matters are progressed through the tribunal in an effort to try and speed up the time. And, and what, what topics are covered in those frequent communications? Are there, are, there, are there consistent topics, are there consistent issues that you are raising with the agency? I'm not aware, Senator. I'd have to take that on notice. All right. Uh, can you tell me um, how many times, uh, can you give me some figures in relation to how many times the agency has appeared at directions hearings without, without instruction? I'm not sure that we record that information, but I'll take that on notice to see if we, we have something. All right. And just breaking out from applications to the AAT to actual hearings um, uh, before the tribunal in relation to NDIS participants, uh, how many hearings were held uh, in the, the uh, uh, windows of time that you've previously given us? 19, 20, 20, 21, and the six months you've got till now. Yeah, just one moment, Senator, and I'll grab that information. I certainly have uh, 2021. Um, so the total number of hearings for the financial year 2021 was 54. And I'll have to take on notice the other years, Senator. 54, 54 hearings, did you say? Hearings, that's correct. And how many, uh, across those 54 hearings, uh, how many individual cases are we talking about? So that would be 54 cases. Oh, so, fi so 54 hearings in relation to 54 individual cases. So for individual cases. So the hearing is the finalisation from a member. Of the thing, yeah. So they conducted a hearing and delivered yep. a decision. So just so that I understand, in 2020, 2021, you had 2,160 applications, but you held only 54 hearings. So Senator, we, we utilise ADR processes in the division and uh, around 60 to 61 per cent of matters resolved by consent. Between the two parties? That's correct. Can you give me those figures, uh, consent between the two, the outcome of the ADR processes in those periods of time? Mr. Crew, potentially, is how else are these cases resolved? Potentially, so they could be resolved by ADR. They could be resolved on the basis that I'm, I'm speculating here, but an application's received, but it's it's deemed to be without jurisdiction, so yep. it's resolved that way, or it could be resolved through an actual hearing and finalisation. I think it would be helpful if yes, um, would. you could provide the detail as to how the, the matters are actually resolved because you've got 2,100 and something coming in the pipeline. Yep. How, 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 how are we are going we in terms of processing? Of the pipeline? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank Thanks you, Senator you Carr. Carr. So I can provide you the information in relation to I might hand to Mr Matthews to talk about that material. Uh, Chris Matthews, Chief Legal Officer. Uh, so in the 2021 uh, year, uh, in terms of the 1,448 applications finalised in the NDIS division, um, there were 27 matters that were resolved um, following hearing and decision. Um, there were um, some 868 matters that were resolved by a decision being made but by consent between the parties. So that constitutes around about 60% of the um, outcomes in 2021. Uh, 20 um, matters uh, were dismissed by consent. 
Then there was a range of other finalisations. So the application was withdrawn in approximately 29% of cases. 1% um, were dismissed by the tribunal and there was no jurisdiction found in relation to 6% or 91 applications. And that was in, just to clarify, I think you said, I think you may have actually been referring to financial year 1920 rather than 2021. Just no, to, sorry, that was 2021. That was 2021, okay. Senator Still John, we are at the 10 minute mark. Do you uh, have a final question? I potentially have a, uh, yes, I potentially do have a final question and one on notice. So, <coughs> thank um, you. Could you give me that uh, information for the, the six months uh, between July 21 and, and uh, December 21, those same figures? So yes, we could take that on notice. <coughs> yep. And just to clarify, out of the 868 in financial year 21 that was, were resolved by consent between the parties, um, do you have information as to how many of those <coughs> resulted in a positive, a, 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 um, positive outcome for the applicant or whatever the te terminology are, is that the tribunal yeah, uses? So so the decision was varied or set aside, which is generally likely to be favourable to the applicant in 838 cases of those 868. So the, so the vast majority. The vast majority of the, of, what, of the entire resolution process actually uh, culminated in a positive outcome for the applicant. So in terms of all of the matters finalised in 2021 in the NDIS division, 58% uh, uh, were uh, resolved by a decision by consent to vary or set aside the decision under review. So over half. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. That was really useful. Thank you very much, Senator Stilljohn. Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, i just make one quick observation in relation to the statistics and the examination of tribunal members and just maybe propose that one of the root causes of people looking into this data is perception of political appointments. I'll just state that as a, as a, uh, a comment. Uh, I might just, uh, however, ask the tribunal if there's been any discussion or concern raised in relation to the government ignoring the decision of Justice White in relation to um, the National Cabinet matter that uh, he adjudicated over last year. Uh, Senator Patrick, I think that you're, you're asking a question about the substance of a decision which, it's it's a which goes decision. beyond the operations of the AAT. So no, I'm no, actually it goes to the confidence of the AAT. If you have, if you have uh, members of government not following precedent uh, and that, that could be a general question, not following precedent. Sen Senator Patrick, I uh, would suggest to you that you are asking a question in relation to a judicial decision, which is beyond the operation no, no, a... of the AAT and therefore not within scope in terms I, of the questions that I, you Ironically, can ask. Chair, ironically, um, it was a judicial officer that made a decision, sitting as the president of the AAT, and it's for that reason the government said it's not binding. You Be can certainly direct your question to the minister in relation to the government's confidence, uh, but, but to members of the AAT, I would suggest to you that that question is not in order. Well, it, it, it goes to the confidence of the tribunal members themselves, of, of uh, you know, if they're looking, making decisions and then watching people in departments saying, actually, I'm going to ignore that decision. I, 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 think, you sh I think you could direct that question to the minister. Well, the minister, minister can take it if she wants to, but I'm directing it at the, at the officials. If you particularly want me to answer it, I will, but if you... Um, you know, well, you're if you're not asking me, you're not asking me. You're a barrister, um, Correct. Um, Minister, and uh, um, you would understand the weighting of a tribunal decision mm -hmm. by a judicial member sitting as a deputy president, albeit, mm -hmm. being ignored by um, members of the government. 
Well, and when as I say a members of, of government, I'm talking about public officials. Senator Patrick, um, I don't want to go sort of full lawyer on you, but um, no, in terms bring it of on. in terms of understanding um, what authorities are binding on whom. Um, it is the case would that you, the higher the court that makes sure. the decision, the more binding it is. And it would be quite rare, really, for a government of any colour to massively adjust its um, appreciation of what is settled law based on the decision of a tribunal. Not even when... So, so there's no weighting given to, a, to a, a judicial member that sits on the, on the AAT versus perhaps a QC or someone less legally qualified? That's, that's not how these things are generally treated. Um, decisions that come from superior courts, is the terminology that's used, are regarded as uh, binding and the higher the court, the more significant mm. the weight that is applied. Tribunal decisions are usually regarded as um, applicable to the facts of the case that's being dealt with but don't form precedent, um, so to speak, that binds other courts um, in the same way. Now, that's not to say that the decision you're talking about um, is wrong, um, and I, I don't suggest that for a moment, but um, the way that precedent PM works is well established. PM and CR. And, and look, uh, Justice White, who made the decision, is a superior court justice. But not sitting um, yeah, in a superior court, and that does make a difference. Uh, well, um, Senator Patrick, we really are straying into matters, though, that are beyond the financial right, no, no, I just, I'm just oh, no, trying sorry. to understand Sen Senator how Patrick, it is just, that just, public me, can officials I just, are Senator Patrick, supporting the Prime pause? Minister's secrecy addiction. Senator Patrick, can I just ask you to pause for a moment? Uh, I'm just letting you know that you are straying into matters which are beyond the operations and the expenditure what? of the AAT. And it's an AAT decision, respectfully, Chair. I mean, we that, can have a meeting, we can have said, a vote as I to whether this are, is appropriate. You are, mo you are moving beyond the operation and expenditure of the AAT into judicial decision making. The Minister, I think, has done a very good job in addressing your concerns, but can I remind you that we are in estimates and I would ask you to focus your questions on the purpose of estimates. Chair, just to be really clear, I'm talking about a decision of the AAT. That's all I'm talking about. Not, yes, a I not, that. A, not a decision of a superior court, not a decision of a court of record. Yes, I understand that. So how does that relate? As I say, um, we, won't we, are, we won't argue the toss on this, Senator Patrick. I would ask you to bear in mind that estimates is to scrutinise the expenditure and the operations of the AAT. Uh, it does not extend to interrogating uh, the registrar uh, and other officials from the AAT about the decisions of particular uh, members um, or presidents or deputy presidents? Look, in any event, um, I feel as though I've answered the question for Senator Patrick. Could I just conclude by um, rejecting wholeheartedly the suggestion um, that the ordinary operation of the law of precedent, as it has been applied by the agencies of this government, is anything um, nefarious? It is, in fact, utterly consistent with the way that law has been applied in this country for hundreds of years. I disagree fundamentally in relation to this. I think you have officials inside PMMC who are operating in a political manner, uh, uh, basically supporting the Prime Minister's secrecy addiction. And I'll leave it there. Well, I, I wholeheartedly reject that assertion. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Uh, I'm just Senator Carr. Do you have any further questions? I do. I do. Senator uh, Carr. Look, uh, I was particularly uh, concerned with the statement that you made before misrepresenting Mr. Dreyfus, um, and you made some statements in regard to the former president of the uh, AAT and suggested that there's some imputation by uh, Mr. Dreyfus, which is not true. You had not read the full press release. And the full press release was in fact referring to the political appointments by this government to the AAT, not to, uh, it didn't even refer to the question of the donation that had been received. Uh, so I think uh, you ought to quote accurately if you're going to uh, seek to misrepresent uh, the 
the shadow attorney general and the manner in which you have. Uh, I'm not sure who that question is directed at. Is no, it? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. okay. So, 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 so I certainly so. haven't misrepresented no, no, anybody. No, 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 you, no um, I wasn't, I wasn't referring to. But what I'm on the question, um, I um, ask uh, if I could please the uh, officers of the uh, to the the uh, Australian National Audit Office report on the audits of the financial statements of the Australian government entities period ending the 30th of June 2021, which was presented to the parliament on the 14th of December 2021. Um, the audit office said that there'd been identified some instances where part-time members in the migration and refugee division had been paid the equivalent of more than 14 daily fees over a two week period. Uh, this despite the clear requirement of the REM Tribunal that individual part-time members be paid no more than seven hours per day. Uh, now, I was wondering if the uh, acting registrar could uh, tell me, have I represented that correctly? Uh, yes, Senator. Um, that was a finding from the ANAO report. Thank you. Um, uh, and I'll ask if uh, the, uh, you're familiar with the correspondence that the attorney, the shadow attorney general wrote to the president of the tribunal on the 16th of April, 2021, on this issue. Are you familiar with that? I'm not familiar with that correspondence. Well, what I'll do is just to assist you, I'll table that correspondence because um, it's pertinent to the proposition I want to advance here. I could do that. That's including the attachments that um, are associated with this matter. Uh, now, the um, question that arises here is uh, why, um, given that there had been uh, such uh, correspondence and indicating uh, by the shadow attorney that the um, question of what appears to be illegal payments um, hadn't been attended to um, by the AAT. I mean, I note that the Auditor General's report says that the AAT advice is currently seeking legal advice on the appropriateness of the guidelines and procedures employed at the AAT to remunerate members. And that's in December 2021. So why did it take eight months to get this legal advice uh, concerning the matters raised, which go to the question of the lawfulness and the appropriateness of the tribunal's remuneration policies? So I think, Senator, my understanding is that the um, part-time member arrangements for payment were done previously for those individuals on case finalisations. Um, the case finalisations meant that, um, depending on how many you submitted in that 14-day period, will depend what those payments were. The tribunal had been having uh, discussions for some time about um, ensuring there was some consistency um, on how part-time members were paid, because there were variations across the division. And they're also looking at uh, improving um, the ways in which uh, they were applying that system due to what may have been seen as some lack of flexibility um, in, in case allocations. Um, so the tribunal continued to work. It sought legal advice um, alongside, but it continued to progress a trial arrangement where uh, part-time members were um, inputting their, their daily payment fees on a time-related arrangement rather than a case finalisation arrangement. That trial of that system occurred um, early in the 21-22 uh, financial year and uh, began was successful and began implementation in December 21. So we almost have completed. I think there may only be two outstanding members on uh, that have some outstanding matters, but uh, we've almost finalised implementation of the time-related um, arrangements for payment. So this is an issue that went to the issue of case waiting, 
wasn't it? I mean, when you say time related, it was actually an example where there was indeed case waiting within the uh, operations of the tribunal rather than actual time spent. That's correct. There were cases what uh, was amounted to what would be a fair and reasonable time to finalise a particular category of case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's no fault of the individual members <coughs> here, uh, but it does appear that it was an unlawful uh, payment being made. Is that, would you, is that a fair description? I don't know that it's unlawful, Senator. I think the arrangements occurred on a swings and roundabouts arrangement uh, under that system, which again um, was reason to, to reconsider the approach. And we've now moved to implementing um, the time-related payment arrangements. Sorry, are, are you, you've received what legal advice that it was lawful what you were doing? Uh, we've, all, we've got legal advice that's almost finalised, Senator, but despite that legal advice, we, the tribunal chose to change the arrangements for payment to time-related. I see. Senator Carr, you'd be familiar with piecework, people being oh, paid by, well, yeah, by yeah, a job sure, done. Sure. Um, as a long-standing um, Labor senator, no doubt piecework is something you've come across many a time. Um, the setting of rates in, in the old way, shall we say, because it seems there's a much better approach that's been adopted since, um, was, according to um, the, the feedback given by many members of the tribunal, um, in fact, an arrangement in which they um, often gave to the tribunal um, of their time rather yep. than rather than getting a windfall. So, and that's what the Auditor General found, did he? I didn't say that. Uh, well, this is the issue, isn't it? Um, well, the the point is um, superseded in many ways by the fact that a time-based system has been adopted by the AAT since. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I just would have, you know, you, you, I just want to be clear about this, uh, Mr. Acting Register. You're saying your legal advice says that your new system, in fact, the, the system you've had in place for nine years, was legal, despite what the Auditor General said to say. If I, I think Senator Rice said we've moved to the. No, I'm saying we've moved to the time-related system, which is in line with the current remuneration tribunal determination. And you've got legal advice to suggest that your remuneration policy <coughs> is in fact consistent with the law? The, we, we have, I, I think Senator, having moved to the time related system means that um, we've resolved any issues. And as um, Senator Staker indicated, it was uh, on the basis of um, many members giving time to the tribunal. So we it, see this now oh, as, as the appropriate way forward. So the, that's just the position for the Migration and Refugee Division. Is it the same position for Social Services and Child Support Division? So we've now aligned the single system across all divisions. Right. Well, from what date did you do that? So it was different for a different time frame for each division. I'll just get those exact dates. Thank you. So in relation to MRD, uh, for members who work exclusively in the MRD, uh, they transition to the timesheet system from the 29th of November 2021. Uh, SSCSD part-time members and MRD part-time members who work across division uh, transferred, transition to the new timesheet system uh, for all cases in relation to work which commenced from the 13th of December 2021. And for the remaining divisions, uh, the new system from 10 January 2022. Thank you. 
I'll put the rest on notice on that matter, I think. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, Senator Thanks, Carr, you're looking Carr. through those papers. Sorry, um, Madam Chair. I just wanted to reiterate how much members of the AAT do give to the community by their service, uh, many of whom have given above and beyond of their time, even under those um, piecework type arrangements. And I want to put on the record my thanks. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, there being no further questions, um, the committee has concluded its examination of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Uh, I want to thank uh, you, Mr Crewe, um, and your other officers for appearing today. We do appreciate your time and your valuable evidence, and we look forward to seeing some very positive progress in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Excuse me, Chair. Yes, I was just Ms Jones. Um, prior to the break, there was a discussion about whether or not the archives would be required, um, and I just wondered if we were able to update them with any information. Uh, yes, the archives will be required. Oh, okay, thank you. We're still... <coughs> Uh, we don't believe that we're in a position at this stage to release anyone, uh, but we'll let everyone know if that changes. Thanks very much. I could, be, um, I could be mistaken because I wasn't in the room at the time. I understood the only matter that was raised earlier in relation to the archives was about the appointment of a, me, of a successor. Apparently, uh, Other senators wish to right. okay. call the Senator archives. Patrick has a question. That's all right. I just thought if I could resolve yeah. that for you now, then I would, I could I would let them be go. delighted if you could and they could <laughs> dismiss them, but that's not my, uh, I'm not the problem here. That's all right. No problem. Uh, thank you. I'm now pleased to call officers from the Federal Court of Australia and the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia via video conference. Uh, good afternoon. Sorry, we are running a little bit behind time. It's not too bad, about half an hour. Uh, welcome, uh, would officers from the Federal Court of Australia and the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia like to make an opening statement before we go to questions? I think you're on mute. If I, if I can start with the Federal Court, please. No, we're not hearing you, unfortunately. You're unmuted oh, now. Yes, can we you can hear, hear me now? We, we can yes. hear you now. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies. Uh, Sia Lagos, Principal Registrar and CEO of the Federal Court of Australia. Um, no opening statement. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms Lagos. And to the Federal Circuit and Family Court. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, Senators. Uh, David Prankel appearing on behalf of the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia. I've got a short opening statement uh, of around five minutes. Thanks, Mr Pringle. Thank you. Um, I appeared today, I should note as well, with uh, four executives from our court, uh, Virginia Wilson, Anne-Marie Rice, Lisa O'Neill and Janet Carmichael. Given the limited time, the two topics I intend to cover in my brief opening statement are a short update on the implementation of the court's amalgamated structure and case management reforms, and the Lighthouse Project and, the fa and family violence. My comments are made from an administrative and operational perspective. Although only a handful of months into operation since its inception on 1 September, I am pleased to report that the reform structure of the courts is showing promising early signs of successful implementation. These reforms included a legislated single point of entry for the filing of cases in family law, a redesigned and efficient case management pathway, and the shifting of significant work to registrars to support judges and hear family law cases earlier. Since 1 September, when these reforms kicked in, Registrars have undertaken no less than 13,000 court hearings, including busy duty lists and interim defended hearings. This is work that would otherwise have been undertaken by judges who have therefore been able to focus more on their core work, including trials. As a result, average judicial docket sizes for Division II judges have dropped dramatically. When I appeared before the committee in May last year, their average docket size was 330 matters. When I was before you in October, it had dropped to 265 matters. And as of today, it has dropped to an average of 193 matters. This reduction in docket numbers has also been assisted 
by the significant number of appointments of judges in recent times. Factoring in the replacement of retiring judges and newly funded judicial positions, the courts have welcomed the appointment of 29 judges in 2021, nine in Division 1 and 20 in Division 2, as well as two judges appointed to the positions of Deputy Chief Judge in Division 2. This, coupled with boost in registrar resources, has also enhanced the court's ability to conduct more court hearings and provide greater access to justice for rural and regional Australia, including through the highly successful electronic and registrar-led national contravention list. Registrars and court child experts are also helping to resolve cases safely and efficiently, utilising their mediation skills as part of the court's unique dispute resolution program. In fact, over 7,500 dispute, uh, dispute resolution conferences have been conducted in the last 16 months, with more than 50% resolving. Saving costs and trauma for parties and freeing up the court's pathway for more cases to be heard quickly and effectively. The data suggests that for a variety of reasons, including the Chief Justice's reforms and the new case management structure, significant inroads are being made into a very large backlog of family law cases in the system. Already, the pending caseload has reduced by 12% since 1 September, many of which are cases that have been in the court system for years. Our clearance rate for final order applications across both courts is also, despite the significant drag effect of COVID-19, at 133%. Further, the pools of cases awaiting trial in Division 1 have substantially reduced from two to 300, the largest registries, to around 50 cases. These are significant results. All the cases are being determined by judges or are being resolved through dispute resolution, freeing up resources to deal more quickly with new filings, with our core aim being to cut litigation timeframes by half and finalise 90% of all cases within 12 months. I'd like to also note that in 2022, the Chief Justice is requiring that the Federal Circuit and Family Court Division 2 focus considerable time and resources to the important areas of general federal law and migration, where the court intends to review its rules, practice directions and case management procedures so as to improve support for judges and achieve similar efficiencies to those made in the family law area. We will report on that in more detail at our next appearance. Lastly, but perhaps most significantly, we continue to remain focused on risk, responsiveness and early identification of high risk matters, including cases involving family violence. At the forefront of our continued reform agenda is the need to ensure that tailored responses to family violence are appropriately embedded into everything that we do. Notwithstanding the improvements arising from the new court structure, it should be remembered that there remain very substantial challenges in relation to family violence. Data from the Lighthouse Project highlights that more than 60% of our parenting disputes continue to screen as high risk. Our notice of risk data indicates that in eight out of every 10 matters, parties allege at least one serious risk factor, such as family violence, child abuse, compromised mental health or substance abuse with nearly half of our cases indicating four or more of these risk factors. The key to addressing this complex caseload and helping children with vulnerable parties in our court system is not just the continuation of the groundbreaking and universally acknowledged Lighthouse project in three of our court registries, but the expansion of that model to all registries, including for those in rural and regional Australia. Funding for the project itself is due to lapse in around four months, and we remain hopeful that our request made the government will realise not just the continuation of the project, but the rollout of the Lighthouse model nationally as part of a new permanently embedded and world leading case management system to deal with violence against vulnerable Australians and to support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. We are hopeful that we will hear positive news from government soon and that related services that support the court system, such as legal aid who fund legal support for otherwise unrepresented parties and independent children's lawyers, will be similarly supported through additional funding. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Pringle. I will hand over firstly to Senator Scar. 
Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair, and uh, Mr. Pringle. Uh, it's always good to to see you. It's it's nearly always a good news story over the last uh, 12 months when you appear with um, your fellow registrars. And I've, I think I've said on previous occasions how uh, how much a fan I am of registrars. I think uh, uh, you've um, you collectively have done just a fantastic job. Can I ask you, uh, in terms of the docket sizes for Division Two judges, how low can you go? In terms of uh, question. every every uh, every uh, every report, you're you're at 265. You you got there from 330, which was great achievement. You're down to 193. Um, what's the sustainable level that you're actually seeking? How low can you go? How low should you go? Well, it's a very good question, Senator. The reality is the docket system is a very good system, but it's not made to um, deal with hundreds and hundreds of cases. Um, our aim is to try and keep uh, the docket numbers for Division Two judges with a one in front of it. But it's very early days at this stage in terms of um, how the efficiencies of the new case management system will flow. Um, my um, feeling at this stage is that it's <coughs> likely to continue to drop uh, for some time yet, but because we're moving into the back, middle to back end of the new case management model, we'll see some new matters starting to be docketed to judges. Uh, but we're fairly confident we should be able to keep those numbers in and around uh, with a one in front of it, which will make a, any docket of a judge much more manageable. Okay. Uh, in terms of the seven, it's an incredible figure, over 7,500 dispute resolution conferences have been conducted in the last 16 months with more than 50 per cent re resolving. Are there any... Uh, learnings coming out of that process in terms of um, uh, why it is that the, the cases were unresolved for some period of time and what the what the key triggers were in order to achieve resolution so you can build on that body of knowledge um, you've uh, generated over the last 16 months? Senator, there's a couple of things I'll note. Firstly, what's always done conciliation conferences, that is, matters that are in the in the property or financial area um, but we've made that model more sophisticated now um, and secondly the court wasn't previously doing parenting conferences and that's the new part that we've brought in um, i should note also that that 50 percent settlement figure uh, is in relation to the most entrenched uh, cases that have been in the court system sometimes for many years so we expect that that should improve um, as the case has become younger and dealt with at an earlier stage. Uh, the short answer to your question is that we're bringing in, and I might uh, throw to uh, Anne-Marie Rice in a moment, who heads up our dispute resolution in the court, but we're bringing in a different model um, that has never been in the court before, and it's, it's what, in essence, is realising this. There wasn't a built-in fra framework into our case management model previously for this sort of dis dispute resolution event at a relatively early stage of the proceeding. So we're learning a lot about that and we're learning a lot about how effective, particularly in an electronic environment, these um, dispute resolution events can be, uh, including where there's some difficult issues between the parties because we're very mindful of safety and family violence considerations. But I might just check with Anne-Marie Rice, um, Executive Director, Dispute Resolution, see if there's anything she wishes to add to those comments. Uh, yes, please. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Senator, the observation that I would make is that the model that we are using, particularly in our parenting disputes, is deeply thoughtful and sophisticated. And as with all good models, it takes time and resources, not least of the registrars who do so much preparation work in readying the matter for those conferences, whether they're ordered by judges or registrars, but also drawing on the incredible skill set of our court child experts in those really difficult and entrenched matters to help us make sure that we are managing risk, that we're managing a dynamic and that we're really working with where that particular family is at. In addition to those settlement figures, there is another significant <clears throat> proportion of matters that are resolving on an interim basis at these parenting conferences. And we have some real confidence that as parents reach that um, resolution and 
realise that they are able to come to some degrees of compromise, that they're then able to put in place lasting arrangements that enable the matter to settle on a final basis and exit so, the system. So when you say an interim measure, it could well be they come together and the, an agreement is made, uh, conciliated such that for the next 12 months, this is what we'll do, we'll see how that goes, and that can form the basis of a longer standing resolution of the matter. Is that correct? Precisely. Okay. All right. Excellent. Oh, well, um, and in in terms of developing the knowledge that's uh, the knowledge base as to how to run these uh, hearings and and how to deal with the the really human issues that I can I can only begin to imagine, is is that is that all being developed from within the court, or are there other models that you've touched upon from overseas, or uh, has a lot of this been developed? just everyone working together, drawing on the different disciplines within the court? It's a combination of factors, right. Senator. It's a skill set of an enormously experienced registrar cohort. It's a court that has uh, conducted dispute resolution events, albeit in a conciliation form, for many, many, many years. And it's the skills of our court child experts and the external providers, particularly in relation to domestic and family violence, training that's been built up over a very significant period of time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr Pringle, I just want to ask you um, a percentage that's mentioned in the first paragraph of page two of your opening statement. You say, and I quote, our clearance rate for final order applications across both courts is also, despite the significant drag effect of COVID-19, at 133 per cent. So 133 per cent of what? So how do, how do you calculate is, that figure? Thank you. Uh, the clearance rate is a measure of um, how many cases in any given 12 month period come into the system and how right. many we dispose of. Um, so it, in a 12 month period, if you if you clear the same amount of cases as have come in, you've got a 100% clearance rate and that's always a, a very good target to have. During COVID-19, the thick of COVID-19 over the last couple of years, our courts have been able to maintain um, even with the very significant impact of COVID-19, around 96% clearance rate, which is really quite extraordinary. Um, but um, the figure that I quoted in my opening statement is the current figure, um, which shows that it's gone up. Um, that clearance rate can be uh, affected by a multiplicity of factors. Sometimes filings drop off a bit, sometimes clear um, the number of dispositions uh, goes up a bit. Um, but it just goes to show that I think the early signs, and we can kind of be conscious that they are only early signs of the new case management model, is that it's helping to boost our uh, ability to clear cases within the court. Okay. You then, you then refer to pools of cases awaiting trial in Division 1. They've substantially reduced from 200 to 30, 300 in the largest registries down to approximately 50 cases. What is the timeline in terms of getting to trial then once you're in one of those pools of cases uh, in Division 1 waiting for trial? What's the, what's the average time to trial? So those trial pools um, have been a historic um, element within the court in Division 1. And um, the, uh, they're all legacy cases, so cases quite often that have been in the system for many, many years. Um, and they wait. Um, the availability of a judge. Um, now, historically, as I said, the two to three hundred sort of range, they were the bigger registries um, in particular. Um, those have been dropped down now quite considerably. Um, uh, sometimes, um, or one of the major impacts on that has been uh, the Chief's, uh, Chief Justice's call over campaigns and various other uh, efforts to try and shift work around within the court. Um, but uh, what it means is that the the time to trial, those cases were waiting a very long time, sometimes six months, sometimes longer, um, to get a judge. Um, they're now down to only a handful of cases, which means that the next one that goes in, in waiting for a judge should be able to get a judge much more quickly. Um, we can give you time frames to trial if you like. Um, uh, uh, we've got data on that sort of thing as well. But generally, it's really showing the legacy caseload is shrinking and cases are getting listed for trial. Yeah. And then just finally, I want to touch on the, the Lighthouse project, which uh, has uh, been a, a great success. And uh, ideally, 
in terms of uh, building on the success of the Lighthouse project, um, what should we be, con be considering to, to build on the success that that project's demonstrated? Well, the, the Lighthouse project is so groundbreaking in that it has two core elements to it. One is um, to um, provide direct assistance through our family councillors um, that are within the court to those vulnerable um, parties so that they can get health services and other forms of support. Uh, that is really um, something unique to this court system as far as we're aware, um, and it means that we can get immediate support for people as quickly as possible. The second element is to inform our case management pathway. Um, and what it means is we can know at a very early stage what the key risk factors are. Um, and that can then inform all the case management downstream. It allows us, for example, to put high risk cases into a specialist list, which we call the Evett list. And that list has a specialised case management model with judges, senior judicial registrars, registrars and court child experts working as a team to ensure that the case gets what it needs. Um, it's a really sophisticated model um, and those cases that are of a lower risk can go to dispute resolution as well. So it can actually clear cases really well. The data is indicating that um, these cases are going through the system, even the high risk ones, and being finalised and resolved in a really prompt way, um, but with the detailed sort of deep dive that those uh, complex cases need. So in answer to your question, um, really what we need, I suppose, is to take that model or something very similar to it and plumb it into as much of our uh, court as possible nationally. We'd like to do it right across the country. Um, it will help um, in every area. There are some areas, particularly in some regional areas uh, and with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families that really do need that extra support at the moment. They can't access this sort of service unless they're in one of the pilot registries. So we'd like to see that bumped in right across the court. Excellent. I think you made the case for that uh, very well, Minister. <laughs> uh, and uh, I commend you and your team, Mr Pringle. Thank you. Thank you very much, you. Senator Scar. I now give the call to Senator Grogan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to bring your attention to the um, law courts in Launceston. We talked about the last estimates. There are some serious issues with the location, um, the setup. There's only one lift. It's on the third floor. Um, uh, disputing parties are left to travel in the same lift, pa pass each other in the corridors, etc. Um, when we're coming to things like domestic violence, obviously that's that's really not great. Um, I'm wondering where that's up to. We were advised at the last estimates hearing that the, it would, the facility had been identified and it was ready to go early this year. Um, I would contend that we are early this year and wondering what's happening. Thank you for your Senator question. Yes, that's right, as we advised it last time around. My understanding is that there's been um, a slight delay in the terms of the estimated time for when that new building uh, will be available. But I might throw to the federal court on that in managing property matters for for our courts um, to see a label. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'd be happy to assist there. Um, thank you, Senator. We were able to advise that we were aiming for an early, hopefully in the early part of this year, that there'd be uh, significant progress in that project. Unfortunately, because of the COVID restrictions in our ability to go to Launceston as well as um, some delayed the council approval processes involving particularly secure car parking and other arrangements. There's been a slight delay. Uh, we've had that, those processes now completed. We're in the final um, detailed design um, documentation process and going out to market to engage essentially um, the construction builder. And we are now um, aiming for hopefully no later than June this year for finalisation of the project. It's just been difficult to manage it remotely <coughs> and we now have engaged a local project manager to assist us with a much more direct interface um, in, in location. So hmm. it's just been a bit tricky because of COVID and the timing. Well, can I just take back to what um, I believe you said to me at our last estimates hearing? Um, where you said, I advise that there has been extremely good progress in the time we've been undertaking this task. We're expecting the building works to be completed in the early part of next year. We have undertaken securing the premises, gone through probity, procurement, and 
yeah, that seems like you're, you're still at that stage. We're, we're, there's, there's been the added stage of dealing with council, as I understand it, and um, design modification to deal with adjustments on permits and the like. Um, and now we're at the process of engaging a builder, essentially. Um, and and uh, I mean, we're directly focused on this project. It is an absolute priority. There is no other building project that we're undertaking on behalf of all of the courts that is a greater priority. The security issues in terms of entrances, lifts, car spacing, etc., have been significant issues to address, as I understand it, in the council and design stages. Um, and that's been the reason for some of the pushback in timing. Um, but we are absolutely committed to having this done on, a, as, uh, on as expedited basis as, 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 as humanly possible. So you're now saying that the new facilities will be up and running in June? That's, that's been the, um, that's the briefing that I have in relation to the progress from our corporate services team. Um, and can you tell me how much has been spent so far on the project? There was um, $5.4 million in the budget. Yeah, I, do, I don't have that specific actual year-to-date spend detail, but I'm happy to take that question on notice and provide you with that information. If you could, that would be great. Um, so given this delay, are there any mitigation processes in place for the existing facility, which we all know is, um, is not appropriate for the service it's providing? I don't have any details specific to that, but again, I'm happy to take that question on notice as well. We are definitely managing uh, uh, as actively as possible to ensure all the security risks are dealt with. Um, we have specific officers within the court's corporate environment to support that, um, but we are very consciously trying to address uh, the new building infrastructure to meet all of those issues. They are readily acknowledged Everyone understands that they have to be uh, remedied going forward in this new complex. Um, if you could please provide us with some detailed um, information about where, about how you're going about managing the situation. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got something stuck in my throat. It's <laughs> okay. Um, about how you're going about managing the current situation. Uh, which we all know and have known for some time is 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 inadequate and inappropriate, um, and, a, and a and a detailed outlook of of what that budget spend um, has been to date, and given that you now have, I believe you're, you're not going to get surprised by any more hurdles. I think I think that the 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 council process and the design process have been the the delaying hurdles, but they are. Uh, very close. Well, the council process has been finalised, and that, and I know that was an area of challenge. But uh, now we're engaging. Uh, we've got the design, and we're engaging the builder to construct. So you're engaging the builder, or you have engaged a builder? That there's an active. Of, of my my brief essentially says is um, we we are engaging the construction services as we speak. Okay. Um, but I'm so happy you... to provide a detailed outline to you um, on uh, on notice. Thank to, you. To and and a revised, now that you're at that stage, you'll have an understanding about um, how that budget's going to roll at 5.4 million. So Absolutely. if you could give us that detail as well. Once it comes to hand at, at the point of that uh, uh, process being finalised, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. From me, Chair. Oh, thank you very much, Senator Grogan. Uh, Senator Patrick, you are seeking the call. Yeah, thank you very much. And just, uh, this, this won't take very long, I hope. Um, just in response to a question I put on notice, uh, question number 109 uh, from the last estimates, I was asking about uh, circuits to Wyala, um, and the response I got was the Federal Circuit Court of Australia is undertaking a review of all its current of all its circuit locations. The court currently circuits to Mount Gambier, and in 2000, the 2020 calendar year, the court conducted four circuit weeks to. Uh, Gambia, and basically goes on to talk about last circulating uh, in Wyala in, in 06 and 07. So thank you very much for those answers. Um, th the government has provided South Australia with two additional um, 
I can't remember which division is which. The the d division two, I think. Uh, division two, I think. Yeah, judges and and one, div one division one justice, um, additional justice in in South Australia, and uh, I'd been involved in discussions about this, uh, and and about resourcing um, as the as the bill was approaching the Senate, as is my duty to try and understand how things affect South Australia. Um, and yeah, the, the the discussion had been that there would be more resources around, because there would be more resources, it would be possible to do more circuits. Now, I understand you are doing remote um, uh, hearings and so forth. I just wonder whether you've got to a point in that review process where we might see circuits in, in on the Air Peninsula, uh, not normally Wyala. Um, thank you, Senator. Um, the short answer is that that review is actually still ongoing. It's actually quite a um, complex, multi-layer process we have to go through. Judicial resources are one of the considerations, but um, registrar resources and or child experts and others uh, are really critical to that as well. Um, at the moment, um, our biggest difficulty is accessing facilities, state facilities, usually what we rely on to um, uh, in various states and territories to be able to do circuits, um, partly because of COVID-19 and partly because the, those state courts require more time to deal with their backlogs and the like caused by COVID-19. So it's partly getting access to facilities, but also then working out what the model will need to be going forward for each location um, in a blend of judicial, but also registrar resources. And so. Given the new case management model is only months old, um, we're still in the process of assessing that because as we drag resources from one place to another, it obviously can have consequential impacts. Um, so the short answer to your question is we're still looking at that, um, but um, we, our aim, our ultimate aim is to expand our services to regional Australia as far as we possibly can. And rather than just wherever possible, rather than circuiting there only three or four times a year to actually build into our standard business model um, what the cities get. Uh, that is that people in regional and rural Australia can access the same service. Now, sometimes uh, or often that will be electronic, but not exclusively. Our aim is to try and make sure that we go out there face to face as well. But COVID has an impact on that and it'll take just a little bit of time before COVID settles down. And we also deal with the case management issues, um, understanding the case management resources we currently have. Okay, thank you. So that, uh, look at the, it's still under review. Can I ask you, and I am particularly interested in Wyala, uh, just to table the factual information you've gathered in respect of Wyala, so not, not your deliberations, not your findings at this point or, or thoughts, but just the factual information like availability of buildings, like um, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what expertise exists in the area and so forth. Yes, and then look, the review is is both internal in terms of resourcing availability and the like, but also things like facilities. So um, I'll have to take that on notice and, and um, come back to you, Senator. On that. Thank, thank you very much, and that's it for me, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Uh, that concludes the committee's examination of the Federal Court of Australia and the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia. I'd like to thank all officers for. Uh, their evidence and for your commitment and attendance uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senators. Uh, I now call officers from the High Court of Australia. Ms Lynch, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator. Uh, and welcome. Uh, do you have an opening statement? Uh, Philippa Lynch, Chief Executive and Principal Registrar, High Court. No, Senator. Chair, I don't. Uh, thank you. We will now go to questions from Senators. And Senator Carr, you're seeking the call. Senator Carr. Ms Lynch, can I seek your uh, 
advice here. Do you have any comment on the uh, fact that settlement agreement with each of the women in the concerning uh, Dyson Hayden matters included non disclosure agreements preventing disclosure of the amounts of the compensation involved? Uh, Senator, the settlement of that matter was a matter for government. Um, the court handed the matter to its insurer, Comcover, uh, and didn't have any direct role in the settlement of the matter or in the non-disclosure decision. Um, however, the Commissioner Jenkins' respective work report discussed the problem that arises with the use of non-disclosure agreements in the context of workplace sexual harassment. Uh, Commissioner Jenkins wrote, um, page 647, the Law Council of Australia acknowledges the role of the NDAs in the systematic nature of sexual harassment and submitted that treating confidentiality solely as a matter of bargaining between two parties ignores the interest of other parties who might be affected as well as the broader public interest in the rule of law. And she went on to conclude at page five, at 653, issues the view that the better guidance is urgently needed on the use of NDAs in the workplace and sexual harassment matters, especially because of the risk associated, uh, well, that is that may be causes, clauses that are contrary to public policy principles that may enable harassers to escape without appropriate penalty and also engage in further sexual harassment. The power imbalances or unfair bargaining process that have been used in the complaint, to the complaint's disadvantage. So given all of those things, um, does the uh, court have any view uh, as to the appropriateness of those uh, arrangements that have been entered into? Senator, no, I'm not really in a position to comment on that. Oh, um, the court did its indep independent investigation and the Chief Justice made a statement back in June of 2020 on the outcomes of that investigation. There is a view that's been expressed that this is a mechanism by which, uh, in fact, the Commonwealth is able, because this initiated, this NDA is actually initiated at the uh, the assistance of the Commonwealth is a mechanism by which matters are actually kept from the Parliament in terms of the expenditure, the aggregate terms. Um, are you familiar with that argument? Uh, Senator, I am, but we, I was um, not part of any um, decision or advice on the non-disclosure aspects of the settlement. Okay. Well, in regard to the TROM's recommendations, can I ask you... Uh, the uh, Chief Justice uh, made some public statements, like strong public statements on this matter, particularly <laughs> we are ashamed that this could have happened at the High Court. We have made, uh, have made a sincere apology to the six women whose complaints were borne out. We know it would have been difficult to come forward. Their accounts of their experiences at the time have been believed. We have moved to do all we can to make sure the experiences of these women will not be repeated. There is no place for sexual harassment in any workplace. We have strengthened our policies and training to make clear the importance of a respectful workplace at the court and we've made sure there is both support and confidential avenues for complaint if anything like this were to happen again. So can you explain to this committee what progress has been made on implementing the changes at the court? Uh, Senator, I think when I was here at the October estimates in 2020, I tabled the supplementary chambers policy that the justices had endorsed in uh, June of that year, following Dr Tom's recommendations that there be an additional HR policy dealing particularly with the relationships in chambers. Uh, that policy was endorsed again by the justices in December 2020 and in March 21, when there were changes in the composition of the bench. Uh, that policy expl explicitly states that the justices of the High Court are committed to providing a workplace free of inappropriate behaviour and it sets out avenues through which an associate can raise a concern or a complaint about a justice. Uh, the policy also addresses two other recommendations by Dr Tom uh, it makes it very clear that associates 
do not have as part of their duties um, the obligation to attend social functions. Uh, it also identifies the senior registrar as the person who will uh, um, uh, be someone who will act as a conduit to uh, me and to the Chief Justice and will, will form a day-to-day -day working relationship with the associates so they have someone to talk to formally and informally. Uh, we've extensively reviewed the induction processes for associates um, and as part of their induction, a justice of the court now takes the associates through the supplementary policy, places it in the context of the investigation of 2020 with Dr Tom, uh, and the Chief Justice also talks to the associates, including about the, um, the policy. Uh, the document that relates to associates' <coughs> confidentiality obligations has now been amended since July of 2020 to make it very clear that the confidentiality obligations the associates undertake don't relate to matters that go to workplace issues so that they shouldn't feel at all hampered from raising any concerns they have because of the confidentiality they owe in relation to the judicial roles that they assist with. Um, and again, that's also emphasised by the justice who takes them through that at their induction. Um, the associates also, following one of the recommendations from Dr Tom, that the associates, as they finish their time with the court, have the opportunity to have a private discussion with me about their experiences, um, and I can provide that feedback, anonymised and uh, de-identified, back to the justices. Uh, and the justices established a working group with two of the justices, myself and the senior registrar, to keep that policy under review. Uh, I can also say that we now have, have an annual workshop for staff in the court that deals with um, appropriate uh, um, respectful relationships in the workplace. Uh, I can also say that the justices met with Dr Tom and have had a briefing from Elizabeth Broderick, the former sex discrimination commissioner. That briefing focused in particular on the impact of sexual harassment in workplaces where there's a power imbalance and I envisage those, there will be other opportunities for that sort of discussion and um, information uh, in 2022. Um, I can also say that I've retained the services of an external professional counsellor to work with members of the staff who are there to support associates to make sure that we're well equipped to provide support for associates um, in the workplace. Uh, and finally, the Chief Justice Kiefel placed the topic of harassment on the agenda for the Council of Chief Justices. Uh, and the guide to judicial conduct that the council um, publishes through the uh, Australian Inst Australasian Institute of Judicial Administration, the guide was updated in 2020 to deal explicitly with harassment of the justices, mm. and that's publicly available, that document. Well, thank you for that. That's, uh, you've covered all of the recommendations, as I understand them, um, and uh, a comprehensive response to that question. Um, what's the response been from the associates? Um, uh, the associates are um, very actively involved in providing advice and feedback on, on what they see we can do and do better, uh, what, what um, their particular issues they raise with me are. So the associates, and the associates are, are, are actively involved in, in all of this. And as I said, the feedback I get from my discussions with them goes back to the working group of the justices. Um, so we get that sort of feedback loop. Um, mm. So they're all been positive, have they? Oh, uh, Senator, they are all um, um, constructive. I'd say I have a lot of, had a lot of constructive engagement and suggestions from associates about um, their perceptions of all their um, experiences. Um. Well, thank you very much. I don't know if there's any other questions. No? That covers it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Senator Carr. I will now give the call to Senator Patrick. Yeah, I've just got a couple of quick questions. Um, this probably will reflect poorly on me, but on the weekend I often go and look at the High Court cases that are on foot and sometimes read the argument, try and work out which way the court's going to go. The court sits on the weekend. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> Did you say you go to the court on the weekend? No, I go to the court's website. On the oh, weekend. court's oh. website. So no, I would never, I would, ne I would never do guess? that. <laughs> I would never do that, but I do try and guess what the outcome will be. Um, uh, the, as long as you don't ask the registrar about <laughs> any decision making by the High Court, please, no, Senator Patrick. No, no, I won't. But, Thank you so but, much. Um, um, 
the you helpfully have all of the submissions laid out and, 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 and the arguments. And I presume there's no harm in obligation rules be, or concerns because they're normally on appeal and the, 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 the matter's quite public anyway. In, in relation to cases where people are seeking leave to, to appear, do, have I missed the, the website in that it doesn't seem to give the same level of detail? So that material is, is available to search for a, for a fee that is a fee set by the regulations, mm -hmm. not by the court rules. Um, so that material can be searched, but I think it requires the payment of a fee. That's people who have made this application for special leave. Um, as opposed to once the appeal, this leave has been granted and then those, those documents then appear on the... Um, and how quickly do, do you normally respond to, to those sorts of requests? For special leave applications? Yeah. Um, Senator, it's the statistics I think are in our annual report, um, but I can tell you, I have some figures here that I might be able to help you there. Um, of the applications for special leave to appeal decided, in the six months to 31 December 2021, 95% of those applications were finalised within nine months of the filing. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, no, I was referring to just, if someone makes an application to view the files. Oh, sorry, Senator. Um, I think that's, I, can't, I can take that on notice, the timing, but with the advent of the digital lodgement system, that now means that a lot of documents are available to be viewed electronically, so you don't have to come into the registry to view the hard, paper files. So someone might send the, the electronic files to be... To you can view the digital documents on through the digital lodgement system. Okay. Um, I just, I guess where I, where I was particularly interested in is the, the matter that the Commonwealth has, has uh, raised with the High Court um, seeking to censor a judgment of the ACT Supreme Court or Court of Appeal. Um, in the Kaliri case, um, if and I've had a, had the experience in seeking access to documents from the Supreme Court itself, because of the nature of that case, there's all sorts of care being taken as to what members of the public can access. Um, am I likely to, to come across that problem if I seek to to lodge? In fact, uh, to, to, to get to, to to let you know what I had to do in the case where I was seeking just to inspect documents, I had to actually make an application in a case in order to be able to get access to documents, which seemed a bit extreme. This is in the ACT? That was in the ACT, ACT. ACT court. Uh, so no, I, I'm not familiar with... Um, the case? The case mm. to that degree of detail. Mm. Um, but there are matters that are in the High Court that do have statutory, um, statutory confidentiality requirements or, or mm. names will be suppressed. So I, mm. I can't comment on the case that you're talking about, but there is some material that um, is still subject to state in, in immigration matters, so there'll be pseudonyms or statutory... Um, All right, I, I might give it a crack to see how I can access it, and I ask not to be given any special treatment, OK, just so that uh, I can see how, how the process works. <laughs> but, but, but Senator, um, we'd be happy to provide you with information about the digital lodgement system and registering through the system so you can access... No, I'd options. actually like to do it as a, as a Mr Patrick and just see how, how, how easy it is to do. But thank you. And thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Are there being no other questions from Senators? Uh, Chief uh, Principal Registrar, thank you so much for your time today and for your evidence. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Chief. Chair, can I just signal something to the committee, because uh, I'm just seeking some help from the Attorney-General. Um, later on when I talk to the CDDP, uh, uh, it's going to relate to the Kaliri matter. There are two aspects to that matter. One of them is... is uh, Senator Patrick, could we take this offline, please, and just have a discussion sure. in relation... If, if some I'm matters... just hoping there can be a, 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 some, some, someone from the Attorney President at the uh, for General's office at the same time because there are two aspects to that particular matter. All right, matter. Maybe we might take that offline and uh, just discuss your particular requirements. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you again. It's now my pleasure to call officers from the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. We have only 10 minutes to go uh, before our dinner break, but we will do our very best.
EFT. Okay, so quite quick. Kim, do you have questions? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. We might be able to finish this. Okay. That would be... Try and we could. Reports, we might have, if we if we give a little bit of latitude. We yep. might knock it off. Yeah, sure. Miss Fork, uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, do you have an opening statement before we go to questions? Chair, uh, I, I do have an opening statement, but I, I may have overheard the committee wondering whether uh, these part of the proceedings could be concluded before the dinner break. So yes. if you'd prefer, I could dispense with it and uh, simply submit it to the committee for the record, but I'm in your hands. But, but you could table your statement if that's of any interest to you. Well, we, we don't want to rush you by any means, and it's no reflection on the great work that you're doing. Uh, we've got some flexibility, but we thought it would make sense to try and conclude matters with you before we go to dinner. Uh, so we're very happy if you wanted to table your statement. Is there any Thank you, highlight, I'm highlights I'm that you wanted to do that? If there's any highlights that you wanted to share, that's a matter for you, of course. Uh, perhaps I could just make a couple of very brief remarks. All right, terrific. Questions. Thank you. Uh, Angeline Folk, Australian Information Commissioner and Privacy Commissioner. Uh, and since I last appeared at Estimates, there's been a, a number of regulatory matters that the office has been undertaking. Uh, and I wanted to bring a couple of them to your attention. One is a, a joint investigation with the UK ICO office into Clearview AI and the scraping of biometric information from uh, the web. Uh, in breach of Australia's privacy law. Uh, that matter is under appeal currently. Uh, and, and also to just provide a very quick update uh, in relation to the Facebook proceedings. The full bench of the Federal Court last week rejected Facebook's appeal to set aside an earlier ruling of the Federal Court which granted me leave to serve documents on that US-based company. Uh, and of course, this relates to proceedings that I filed in March 2020, alleging that uh, Facebook committed serious or repeated interferences with privacy in contravention of Australian privacy law at the time of the Cambridge analytic matter. Uh, so we welcome the decision of the full bench and looking forward to the hearing of the substantive matters. Uh, but in essence, uh, the cases have in common is, is seeking to hold global businesses to account uh, for the handling of Australians' personal information. And it accords with our regulatory priorities to focus on high privacy impact technologies and the online environment. In relation to our uh, other work, we're engaged with the Attorney General's Department on privacy reform. Uh, and on FOI, we continue to uh, handle an increasing caseload of IC reviews and at the same time, increase our finalisation rates. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Falk. Uh, I've just been informed the, the minister does need to leave at half past six, so we don't have uh, a lot of flexibility, so we may need to run past the break. We see, we'll see how we go. I will start by giving the call to Senator Carr. Thank you. Uh, look, I've got three matters. The first goes uh, <coughs> Commissioner Two. Uh, some matters uh, that uh, FOI application by the nine papers relating to a letter from the Australian Federal Police to Mr Peter Dutton in relation to police probing of Mr George Christensen's frequent travel to the Philippines. And on previous occasions, you said you'd, you thought you could have this matter resolved um, fairly quickly. Um, I'm just wondering what's taken so long? Uh, Senator, uh, I took the question on notice in terms of the time to resolve the matter. Uh, and my response to that question on notice indicated that I anticipated that a decision would be made by the end of this financial year. Uh, and that continues to be my view. Why does it take so long? That's a long time. You've had this under review now for, for a considerable period of time. And, uh, uh, as I said uh, in my brief remarks, we have had a uh, continuing increase in the number of IC review applications received by the office. At the same time, this particular matter has had a number of procedural matters that have need to be worked through. So at the conclusion of that, I will certainly be dealing with the factual and legal issues and a decision will be made. Um, 
All right, the second issue goes to complaint about the Attorney General's Department and the administration of the FOI Act. Uh, the Shadow Attorney General made his complaint on the 1st of March 2020 uh, that's concerning the transfer of an application from the former Attorney General, Mr Christian Porter, to the department. And this is to do with the appointment to uh, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. The uh, request was transferred to the department and that was in breach of the Act. And I think that was acknowledged um, the, uh, which if, if, because it failed the basic uh, test in terms of <coughs> the, the way in which the Act should be properly administered. But given that the department is, the admit, is, the, is legally responsible to administer the Act, I would ask the department what uh, have you actually learnt from this uh, this incident? Thanks, Senator. Um, I, I think um, it is fair to say that as a consequence of that, we have reviewed uh, our procedures and particularly how we engage with ministerial officers uh, around the issue of who uh, is the um, appropriate um, entity in order to uh, respond to FII requests. So. I think um, uh, this was um, some time ago now, uh, but I was briefed when I first came into the role about the matter and the fact that we had uh, looked at strengthening our processes in that regard. I see. And can I ask, Commissioner, why did it take you over 18 months to complete your investigation into the department on this uh, matter? It seems an extraordinary amount of time to complete an investigation. Senator, we've, as I've indicated, the, the numbers of matters being received by the OAIC continue to increase. We've had a significant increase in the number of complaints made to the office. Uh, we've made uh, great progress in resolving those old, some of those old complaints, uh, but that is the time that, that this matter inevitably took. <laughs> it takes as long as it takes. Is that the answer? Senator, it's a, it's a matter of uh, giving each matter the, the, the uh, attention that it deserves uh, and considering uh, the legal issues that are raised uh, in the context of many other matters. Right. The uh, Minister, the, uh, in the first half of last year, the government announced that it would uh, finally appoint uh, a standalone Freedom of Information Commission. I understand that's what, six years or so that uh, proposition's been about. Um, has the position been filled? Uh, it is currently underway and I expect it to be completed um, in the next few weeks. I see. Um, I presume it's a cabinet appointment? It will be, yes. Yeah. Has it gone to cabinet yet? I don't believe so. Do you have a date by which it will be going to Cabinet? Uh, it should be finalised uh, or completed in early 2022. You don't have a date on which it's it scheduled for Cabinet? It should be completed in early 2022. Hmm. Did I say, did I hear you right? You said what, a few weeks you expect it to be announced? Uh, in early 2022. Hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Senator Khan. Look, we've only got two minutes remaining. Senator Rice, can you ask your questions in two minutes? Because we do need to break right on 6.30. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Rice. Thanks, Ms Falk, and thanks, Chair. Look, Ms Falk, so you're the right person to ask about um, FOI review decisions? Yes, Senator. Yes. So, look, I just want to ask in very general terms about a particular FOI review um, is it something that uh, would you be able to outline in sort of general terms where things are at with that review? I can uh, give Senator, you the... ordin ordinarily, uh, I'd prefer not to talk about particular matters that are before the office. Uh, I can, of course, uh, take you through the, the usual processes if that would assist. Yes, I mean, this is a, a review that we've been, again, I think it's because of the um, resource limitations on your office that we've been trying to get some information about the process of this review decision. Um, so, I mean, so look, yes, so, and, and we were told that we were going to have some information by January and it's now February and my office has not been able to make contact with your office to um, get any information about it. 
Um, could you ask? Could yes. You ask so basically, I was wanting to ask what a general sense of the timelines in relation to this, you know, this review. It's MR twenty one double O three five three. Just because it's it's something that, as I said, my office has been trying to get some confirmation of the timelines with this review process. Had been promised January, and here we are, you know, mid February, and basically no response. Crickets. Senator, I will take that on notice, if I may, and uh, come back to you very promptly with an answer to your question. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ms. Thank Falk. you very Thanks, much, Jeff. Senator Rice. Uh, as I indicated, we do need to break for dinner. We will resume in one hour, uh, and we will continue with the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner at 7.30. Many thanks. The thank committee you. is suspended.
is in session and we are continuing with the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. Uh, I know Senator Rice is seeking the call. Oh no, she has, she's finished, hasn't she? Uh, can I ask our senators for questions? Senator Patrick. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, as is uh, traditional, I just want to um, declare that I'm in proceedings with the Information Commissioner in the Federal Court. And if the, if the Information Commissioner doesn't want to answer a question, on that basis, I'll just accept that. Um, Would you also like to declare that this is your favourite subject and possibly your <laughs> favourite public servant? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I, I will say that the Commissioner oh, Fork is... Don't invite Senator Patrick to write a commentary, <laughs> no, while, Minister, please. Sorry, whilst, I shouldn't let you... Whilst I'm in court things. in relation to the, the time it takes for reviews to get through her office. I think she's like a one-arm juggler. She does so much work and uh, I've only got praise for her. So I think highly of Ms Falk too. So there you go. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Do you have a question? I do. Um, now that we've got through the niceties, I'm just looking at this list of in, in, in relation to qu the Quan number 16. As of the 30, 30th of June 2018, 81 IC reviews on hand were over 12 months old. The next year it goes to 250. The next year it goes to 460. And then the next year, 20, June 2021, it's 667 reviews on hand that were over 12 months old. I just, it seems like we're going nowhere. I, I, I wonder, uh, if you're able to provide any advice as to whether the appointment of a new FOI commissioner will help to remedy this particular situation. To whom is that question directed? Uh, to the commissioner. 
Thank you, Senator, uh, and, and uh, acknowledge uh, the kind remarks of both you and uh, Assistant Minister. Uh, uh, in relation to uh, the appointment of an FOI commissioner, so as you're aware, in the last budget we received around $980,000 for both uh, FOI commissioner, an SES uh, officer and two support officers. Uh, Whilst an appointment is yet to be made, there has been an acting arrangement in place with uh, Acting for our Commissioner uh, Ms Hampton, who joins me on the call this evening. Uh, and we have also appointed our SES Officer Band 1 and the support staff. Um, I do see that uh, this is and will continue to make a difference. Um, at the same time, and, and perhaps I should um, say a couple of things about that. Um, we have, as you've noted, uh, Senator, continued to have uh, a large number of matters on hand uh, and the age of the matters increasing. Um, in the last six months, uh, we've had a 38% increase on the same period of IC reviews received uh, for the previous year. Uh, but we've also uh, increased our throughput by 37% in the last six months. Uh, so I do see that um, that additional capability uh, has been assisted by the acting arrangements and the SES Band 1. Um, at the same time, uh, there's a significant cohort of cases on hand uh, and currently the Acting Commissioner and I uh, are working through the modelling that I think, um, Senator, you're familiar with in terms of um, future funding requirements and case officers in order to address that backlog. Uh, but the parameters have shifted, both in terms of having the additional funding, and we're looking at how that is helping the office, but also an exponential additional increase in, in what's coming through the door, more than I had anticipated in that previous modelling. Okay, thank you. I might take some responsibility. I think my national cabinet case made FOI sexy, so maybe it's uh, maybe I've increased uh, demand. Senator Patrick, I, I believe that's an unparliamentary term. That FOI is sexy. No, no I'm trying to promote that idea. Um, please go. The um, I'll, I'll just okay. I'll just go to the so next. Please my last question. Um, so it's, it's, I'm going to be brief, and this is a result of a personal experience in a matter, but. It raised a concern in my mind in relation to perhaps other, uh, other matters. And that is, I have a, and I'm not seeking to adjudicate my uh, FOI matter um, in any way, shape or form, but I have an FOI matter that's been with you for two years and only just recently uh, was advised that you were considering ex exercising a discretion under section 54W, uh, that is to basically discontinue the, the review such that I could take it to the AAT. And, and that's normally helpful at the very start where you look at a matter and go, this is complex, let's get it to the AAT. And I know that you've done that, but is it common practice to, to have a matter that's a couple of years old and then you say to the applicant, well, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm going to stop now. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, as you've said, uh, ordinarily, uh, my delegate would look at exercising a discretion to refer a matter to, uh, or to decline to continue with the matter, and then allow an applicant to go to the AAT uh, uh, early on in the proceedings. But there have been some cases where that issue has arisen later in the proceedings. For example. Uh, one of the factors that would be considered um, is the extent that the matter was going to be contested by either party should a decision be made on appeal, um, or whether it's um, uh, there's other another cohort of matters that are in the AAT and it ought to be uh, considered alongside that. So just speaking generally, it, it can occur, but ordinarily it would happen earlier in the process. Um, can you provide some statistics on that, if, if you wouldn't mind? Just the exercise of the 50, uh, 54W discretion after, say, 12 months? 
I'll take it on notice, Senator, and I just need to have a look at our case management system in terms of the granularity of yeah. the information that I can give you. And just directing one question back to the Attorney General's Department. There is a matter that I have on foot that, uh, that relates to a document that was produced by the Attorney General Porter and somehow in the, in the transfer to a new Attorney General, the document's been lost. How do you lose a Commonwealth record, a letter from the Attorney to the Prime Minister, a letter of advice? Um, draw upon to assist in answering that question. We're in the corporate area and they've gone home, but I can take that on notice and provide you with um, whatever information that I, I can get. Yeah, okay. The matter is subject to an FOI and I'm, the Commissioner's dealing with it, but you know, I, I think I'm still entitled to look and say, you've got a Commonwealth record and somehow it, it disappears and that would be of a concern to me, that's all. So I'll thank take you. It on notice. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Uh, is anyone else seeking the call? Um, there being uh, no other senators um, seeking the call. Look, actually, before we, my apologies, uh, before we finish, uh, Ms. Falk, I'm just wanting to briefly ask you about the Facebook litigation. Um, that yeah. seems to be a very significant yeah, good on you. achievement uh, by your office. Can you detail uh, the outcome of that litigation to date, please. Thank you, Senator. So in March 2020, I lodged proceedings in the Federal Court against both Facebook Inc and Facebook Island, alleging uh, serious and or repeated interferences with the privacy of Australians. Uh, my claim is, uh, following our investigation, uh, is that the default settings on the platform at that time uh, facilitated disclosure at the expense of privacy and also that Facebook failed to have in place reasonable steps to protect the personal information that it held. Uh, so having put that claim before the court, I, I needed um, the court's leave in order to serve uh, Facebook outside of the country. Uh, was granted that in the first instance and it was subsequently appealed by Facebook. And the full court has recently determined that Facebook Inc, the US company, in fact, does have a, a case to answer. Uh, of course, there's always rights of appeal from decisions, uh, but my office is looking forward to progressing the case through to hearing these important substantive matters that are of great concern to the community. Here, here. And so uh, how much more is there to go? You've gone to the federal court, uh, and in fact, it was the full bench of the federal court which has rejected Facebook's appeal to set aside the earlier federal court ruling. Uh, where um, are you going to now with the litigation? What's the next steps? And when are you hoping to get it resolved? And what sort of outcome are you hoping to obtain? Mm. So uh, we are, unfortunately, have only been at this interlocutory stage uh, of uh, being able to serve Facebook, the proceedings. So we are yet to now, we hope to progress to the substantive hearing. It'll be a matter for the federal court as to set the timetable for that. Uh, I'd be hopeful of a significant matter of this kind of public interest that it could be heard in a timely manner. Um, and then I'm seeking civil penalties, which at the time of of these alleged contraventions was $1.7 million per contravention. And we say that over 300,000 Australians' personal information was put at risk by the unauthorised disclosures uh, and at risk of monetisation and deployment for political profiling purposes by Cambridge Analytica. So I seek the federal court to make orders that uh, impose civil penalties against Facebook for the contributions. Have you nominated a total um, penalty that you're seeking? Uh, it'll be a matter for the court. Uh, my, my claim puts forward that uh, it's 1.7 million for each contravention that the court finds. Uh, why are you needing to um, seek leave to serve Facebook in the US and Ireland? Uh, Facebook has an office in Australia. Uh, what, what has been the issue there? Uh, 
so, so Facebook's office within Australia uh, is um, limited to particular uh, aspects of its business. Uh, it's incorporated in the US and also in Ireland. So it's necessary for me to proceed against those corporate entities. And what sort of message do you think this sends to the, the social media platforms and particularly the big tech giants like Facebook? Uh, the message is, is that all global companies that are carrying on a business and collecting or holding uh, personal information in Australia must comply with Australia's privacy law. Can you just very briefly outline the scope of your regulatory powers in this respect? So I have the power to initiate an investigation on my own initiative, which is what occurred in this case. Uh, and I also have the, the ability to compel information. Uh, I can make a determination uh, and find a breach on my own initiative, uh, but I'm not able to issue any penalty. Uh, I could order Facebook to change its practices, for example, but in order to seek a financial penalty, that's a matter for the federal court. In terms of the, the review of the Privacy Act that the Attorney-General's Department is currently leading, I have put forward some proposals that I think would give uh, a strengthened enforcement role for the office, a simplified civil proceeding uh, procedure, uh, and also the ability for my office to issue infringement notices as a, uh, a quick and efficient way of achieving an outcome for Australians. Well, Ms Falk, thank you very much for that update. I do appreciate it. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms Falk, that now concludes the committee's uh, examination of the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. Uh, we thank you very much for your time and for your evidence this evening. Thank you. Uh, it is now my pleasure to call officers from the National Archives of Australia. Ms. Ramagam, good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chair. Uh, do you have an opening statement? Um, sorry, take my mask off. Thank good you. evening, and I don't have an opening statement. Thank you very much. We will go to questions from Senators, and I give the call to Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, and welcome to your first estimates, at least as an Acting Director General. Thank you. Um, does the archives um, assess all of the cabinet papers uh, for each year for possible release? So I'm, I'm really referring to the release you did on the 1st of January this year. Uh, Senator Patricks, I believe we do assess all of the documents that come for release in that year. Um, what percentage of the 2001 Cabinet papers were released on January 2022? Um, Senator, I'll have to take that question on notice, please. I've done um, a calculation and it's about 53 per cent. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. If I could just ask for the record, could you please state your name and the capacity in which you appear here this evening? My apologies, I should have asked that earlier. Chair, I'm Yaso Aramugam, and I'm appearing as the Acting Director General of the National Archives. And you're here with Mr Fox? Yes, Mr Stephen Fox, Assistant Director General, Collection thank, Management. Thank you so much. Sorry, sorry, um, Senator Patrick. That's OK. Um, do you know what percentage were closed, that is, with, wholly withheld from the public? Senator, I'd love to take that question on notice as okay. well, please. Do you accept that it's 12%? Um, do you know what percentage were not yet examined as you hadn't basically had the opportunity to e examine the files for public release? I'll have to take that question okay. on notice as well. Of course, Senator Patrick, um, decisions about whether or not items are not subject to public release um, are made 
strictly in the application of the criteria in the Act that governs the archives, which is the Archives Act. So um, I wouldn't want those listening at home to think that it was something within the discretion, for instance, of the officers at the table. Well, respectfully, I think um, whether information is or is not released is a decision of a National Archives officer and they sometimes get it wrong. Oh, I don't um, cavil with that proposition, yeah. um, but they're not doing it in some sort of arbitrary sense. They're doing it in the application of um, legislation that has been passed by this parliament and um, that has been in place for some time. Sure. Well, I'm happy to ask um, either the Acting Di Director General or you, Minister, is it acceptable that 43% of the 2001 Cabinet papers are still withheld from release? I mean, we've got a system in place where we take Commonwealth records and we put them into a safe place for storage for the purpose of then granting access, um, and the Parliament has decided 20 years is a reasonable time frame, and yet we have 43% of Cabinet, of cabinet records not being released at the, at the, in, once, the, once the open access period has been reached? Look, I'm happy to answer that question. And um, the answer is it's less about the percentage and it's more about the content. Um, the categories of material or the subject matters um, that need to be withheld are made clear on the Act. And um, if the material falls in that scope, then um, it is incumbent upon <coughs> those who work at the archives to act in accordance with the Act. So here's a decision that was made in relation to a Cabinet do document I sought last year. Two pages I got, completely redacted. Okay, now that matter is before the AAT, mm -hmm. and without me making one legal submission, without me making any representation, just the fact that I've lodged something in the AAT, this then gets to release to me, which is, the, which is the document that I sought access to. How do you explain that? How do you explain first getting released this, the only action I take is to make an AAT application and suddenly the information flows? Um, would you like to explain that? Uh, yeah, so without going into too much detail as the matter is before the tribunal, as part of lodging something at the tribunal, we go through a process and we do have witnesses who come in to look, in the, look at the documents and as part of that process, a couple of those folios were released to you. So it's because of the AAT process and the witness coming into Yeah, play. but the, the AAT process in the first, sorry, the, the, the National Archives process in the first instance failed. Someone else has a look at the document and says, well, no, actually, it's not sensitive. So it tells me you've kind of got this George Orwell memory hole attitude that, uh, that you know, that's going on inside the archives. You know, I've got... I've got seven applications in, in relation to Timor documents for this year's release. So of the eight that were available, seven were closed. Now, is it gonna take me, and I'm, I'll, I will do this, I'll end up paying the $900, and by the way, you're gonna end up having to pay that back to me. The taxpayer will have to pay me uh, the, the money back because that's what happens in the AAT when substantially you were wrong. I've got seven applications. Am I going to find myself in a situation where I'm going to take all of those to the AAT, chew up the AAT's time, and then come back and charge you for the six or $7,000 it takes to, to bring those applications to the AAT? I sincerely hope not. Well, uh, well, I, Senator I'm Patrick happy to, does have the call. I'm happy to work with uh, Senator other Patrick, senators. Senator Patrick, would you would you welcome Senator Carr's yes. uh, helpful assistance? He's always helpful. Uh, Senator always Carr, helpful. you have the call. Um, look, because I, I share your concern. So, uh, so as officers of the archives, you're governed by the Act, which is the what, what uh, Senator Stoke has pointed out. Now, in your report, you indicate there are very substantial numbers of applications that are held back because relevant agencies refuse access. 
namely DFAT, on international security grounds or some other grounds. Can you explain to the committee what, circ what are the circumstances whereby applications, for instance, in regard to Timor, I've raised some issues in regard to the massacre of Chinese in uh, Timor, oh, sorry, in uh, Indonesia during the coup, Australia's involvement in that. I recall. I've raised issues in regard to Chile and Australia's involvement in the Allende coup um, and there are a number of others. These matters are going back 50 years. Can you explain to us how this process works and that you as officers are required to respond to effectively the veto of other agencies? Um, thank you, Senator. And before I do that, if I may, um, over the last financial year, so that's over 12 month period, the National Archives um, examined around 280,000 records. Mm -hmm. And of the 280,000 records, 98.5% of records were released. There was only 1.5% of those records that were exempt either partially or wholly. Wholly was only 0.5%. So just from a facts perspective, it's not our goal to um, prevent access. We are bound by the legislation, as the minister pointed out, and it goes into section 33, where we need to work through those exemptions and where they, the record is originating from a particular department. We do need to seek their advice from time to time to ensure that our actions align with um, not compromising in each of those sections of the Act. So if I look at the files that are closed, that is totally exempt from the public in relation to the release this year. There are files relating to our policy with East Timor, Bougainville, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Island, oh, sorry, Indonesia, um, policy towards the South Pacific generally, uh, the 2001 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, and uh, a review of the United Nations peacekeeping operations. I mean, are these I mean, are these so? I just part of the problem here. Yes. I mean, I think we've reduced the open access time from 30 to 20 years. You know, did the Parliament go too far? You know, there's an expectation. The Parliament says we want 20. 20 years is the right number, and yet, in the case of cabinet documents, 43% getting rejected. Look, it's a valid point to raise, Senator Patrick, um, but it's probably a matter for parliamentarians to consider rather than for. Um, our officers who uh, are charged with the duty of executing what we ask them to rather than setting the policy. Well, I had a, an AMSA uh, um, a, a person last night telling me that um, even though there are safety issues, matters aren't really being raised and looked at. I mean, when there's a problem, it's one expects safety. officials to come forward. It's not safety. Hmm. The, the, these are not 20 years. These are sometimes 50 years. Hmm. And it's, it's to do with perceptions of harm to international relations. Mm. So the question really comes back to the review of the Act. This, uh, uh, and perhaps that might be another line of inquiry as to where we're going in terms of the review of the Act, because the substantive argument is what is the mechanism of appeal, given that there were some, what, 24,000 uh, cases, I from a recall, um, of that type, that vicinity, of files actually being held up on the basis of effective veto by security agencies uh, on, uh, at the moment. That something like that number is the current circumstances, I understand it. Now, the question is, what is the appeal mechanism, given your frustration about the release of documents, and the position which we now face, where DFAT's saying they won't even process any more applications because they don't have storage. I mean, this is a ludicrous catch-22 we're in. So I'd ask, perhaps, uh, Senator Patrick, if you don't mind, I mean, where are we going in terms of the review of the Act which allows us to actually deal with this, this substantive policy question? Look, there's, um, there's two useful things I can contribute on that front. Um, the first is to say that um, I have made some decisions and given some instructions in relation to um, reform of the Act. And as I've undertaken to you at previous estimates, 
Um, I will be um, in, um, in, in a pretty short space of time um, pretty keen to get the input of senators like you um, to make sure that these frustrations are understood in the way that we go about that. So exposing um, a draft piece of legislation will be a part of that. Um, at the moment, it's, it's on its way, and um, I'm optimistic that some of the matters you raise will be addressed by it. Um, the other thing to say is that um, in the response to the tune review um, that came out um, on the 1st of July, um, there was included measures for um, a, few, uh, a few aspects that go to the concern you raised, Senator Carr. The first is um, that there was a task for agency management and information management and declassification capability to be built. That, I believe, will assist with the problem that you raise. Um, and in addition to that, um, there was a commitment made for the consolidation of collection storage and in-house digitisation, um, which will help with making sure there is that uh, space problem resolved. But the, the, there will always be a question where the security agencies say, oh, we don't want this released. There's and, a tension there. Yeah, I mean, that's, kind of, a, that's was, inherent in the records. And so the question I ask is that there needs to be, do you accept that there needs to be a mechanism to resolve that? Perhaps a panel of judges, some other form of process to be able to deal with that inherent tension that arises, such as Senator Patrick's just outlined, whereby matters of genuine public interest can be held up because an official somewhere says the events in 1973 are still a matter of significance to the Chile case, for instance, uh, and shouldn't be made available to the public. Look, I acknowledge there is a tension there, and that tension is um, one that has been around for a while and will always be there to some extent. I do think, though, that the commitment that's been made um, for information management and declassification capability is about making sure that agencies understand where those limits should be properly drawn and equipping those within the archives to be able to make the best possible calls when it comes to applying the Act. Um, and I think both of those things will help. I'll take a slightly different tack. So there are obviously choices that are made about what documents are reviewed. Uh, so we're talking about ones which are closed because they haven't been examined. One of them was um, dealing with Australia's response to September 11's terrorist attacks and specifically the application of the ANZUS Treaty. Now that was one of the most important events uh, in this century. And the NAA is effectively stopping people from examining that sort of record. So, um, and I can give you some other ones. There's, there's uh, other examples, Collins class submarines, asylum seekers, people smuggling, unauthorised boat, boat arrivals, uh, foreign ownership of telecommunication carriers and carriage service providers. Now, these are, in some sense, I can see are politically sensitive topics. And I wonder whether there are people trimming their sails based on political wins? Well, I'd suggest that's um, nothing more than speculation. No, no, I, I, I'm asking I the question. The, I yeah. accept the list that you provided at face value. Um, Senator Patrick, you're an honourable person and, hmm. and I accept what you've said. Um, but I think it's also really important to observe um, that if we want to set different parameters to be applied by the agency, um, then that's for us to do. And we can do that yeah. if, if we think it's appropriate. Respectfully, Minister, this actually doesn't go to the application of the Act, but more of the priorities given to uh, uh, having uh, an assessment done as to the, uh, you know, as to look, you know, looking at a document. And um, as I mentioned to Senator Carr earlier, um, questions that you have raised around declassification capability and the ability to assess 
well against the criteria are something that we have invested in um, because we are um, intent on equipping the archives to um, do its job well and to make as much information um, as the Act permits available to Australians. Now, I'm not going to pretend that um, public servants don't at times make incorrect decisions. Um, that's why we have tribunals. That's why we have appeal processes. Um, but overwhelmingly, this is an agency that's about making information available rather than hiding it. Well, that's its purpose. 2001 <laughs> cabinet files still not, uh, still not yet examined include files on climate change policy population policy, petrol and diesel fuel excise, um, legislation to ratify the, st uh, the statute of the International Criminal Court. But you said they're not yet examined rather than... No, I understand that. And so, but my question goes to, these are quite important issues. You know, climate change sure. is, a, is a highly topical issue right now. And I just wonder why in, in selecting the, the particular files that they did to examine, Someone didn't look and say, you know what, climate change, that's a pretty big issue. Let's, uh, let's examine that file to see if we can open it up uh, such that the public can see the thinking back in 2001. Well, I think that's um, the, the plan as far as the archives goes. No. They, will, they will work through those things and they will make them available to Australians. But okay. to suggest that there's any kind of okay. political motive well, is um, baseless, quite frankly. Well, okay. can, um, it's can... insulting to the hard work of the officers at the archives. And it certainly does not reflect um, any instruction that um, has come from government. I'm only saying what people who might look at this list and, 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 you know, and maybe think themselves. And, mm. and in some sense, I'm giving the opportunity for the archives to perhaps look at some of those files and come back and explain the reasoning as to why that was, those particular files were not prioritised for examination. If, if you wouldn't mind looking at those files that were not examined and perhaps providing a rationale for why they weren't, um, uh, why they weren't considered. And that will be my final question. Given that um, it's been something of a conversation, am I yeah, right sure. to paraphrase for a question on notice for um, the Acting Director General? Um, <laughs> Very unusual technique, this. <laughs> well, I just want to make sure that we're getting to the, to the heart of the sure. issue. Um, you'd like, as a question on notice, an explanation of the way that the National Archives goes about prioritising the order in which things are um, and, and examined do, for release. And to do so by reference to the list for 2001, for release this year. Okay, you comfortable with that? Yes. Yep. And I'm, and, and, and thank so, you very much, Senator and, Patrick. I, 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 I'll, I'll give the call now to Senator Carr. Thank you. And can I assume, uh, Minister, that the you're not going to be able to get the Archive Act up before the Parliament, this Parliament? Well, I, I undertook to um, have something to show you in this Parliament, and um, I will have something to show you in this Parliament. OK, so we've effectively only got three days of the Senate remaining. That's not how I understood things. But that's the <laughs> I trip, understood but that... in, the in the time of this government, I would have something okay, to show but, you. But I'll just be It's currently in a queue with the... I understand um, that, but there are three sitting days remaining. So yes, of course. That's effectively the situation. You're, you're suggesting that you'll be able to have a draft piece of legislation to us within those three days. I didn't say that. I said no, I'll... no, I'm just I'm asking the no. question. Is it that your intention? No, I said that in the term of this government, um, as in before, before we go to election, an election, before you call I will have election. something to show you. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, but at the moment, uh, we've given all of the necessary instructions and it's just waiting with the um, drafting yeah. stage with the Office of Parliamentary Council. Mm. I don't know if this committee could handle any more work at the moment, but uh, I mean, because it will require a parliamentary committee and a number of other uh, look, actions. I'm, I'm quite sincere about the the need for this to be a um, you know multi-party collaborative process, mm -hmm. um, and I think, oh, I hope Senator Carr, you'd agree that's the way I've always approached I, I know, I, look, the, I, the operations I, I, of the archives. Look, I'm I'm not I'm not uh, disputing your your assertions. I just. I just wanted to know what your thinking was in terms of the timelines. Could I ask you, uh, as I've indicated earlier, what uh, is the progress in terms of the appointment of a new Director General? Sure. Um, a, a recruitment um, process was undertaken using a um, private so global search agency, given the um, unusual skill set that's required to 
um, run an organisation of this kind. Um, it has received applications, conducted an interview process and made recommendations. Um, and the matter is with Cabinet. Um, you mean a, a nomination is with Cabinet? A nomination is with Cabinet. Yeah, thank you. Does I thank Senator Carr. Does it have an anostia uh, requirement? Sorry, sorry. Um, Senator sorry. Patrick, you're seeking the call? Uh, yes, just, yes, just a supplement. Patrick. Does it have an osteo requirement for the person who... Nadi, Nadi, we've just been talking about all the sorts of records that you have to deal with. Australian eyes only, security clearance. Um, I'd have to check the criteria, I just can't remember. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Maybe Senator Patrick. Uh, just a brief one from me, uh, uh, Acting Director General. I'm just keen to, to hear of the progress in relation to the government's decision to provide the archives with $67.7 million made last July. Uh, how is progress going on the digitisation of your very substantial collection and the preservation of the National Archives? Yeah. Thank you, Senator, for that question. So we received 67.7 million over four years, it, which was announced in, uh, on the 1st of July. And that is for digitization and preservation of the um, at-risk collections, additional staffing and capability to address our backlogs for access applications, and then investment in cybersecurity and further development of the National Archives um, digital archive. So we have made good progress in the first six months of standing up uh, the projects that need to deliver these capabilities. And uh, a significant achievement was the establishment of the digitization hub at the um, National Archives premises in Sanford Street. Um, that came into operation about a couple of weeks ago. And the first um, set of collections from one of, um, one of our officers is now getting digitized. And what this means is now, uh, once it's digitized, it's going to be available for um, all Australians, uh, whereas previously you had to visit a state and territory office to um, view some of these records. So the digitization uh, program is progressing well. Um, the backlog, we are looking at resourcing um, those programs of work and hopefully um, clear those backlogs. It's a staffing issue, recruiting the correct people to make sure they can access exam in applying that act and make the right decisions is important. We discussed that previously. And then the third one is about improving the cyber resilience of our, um, our systems, and that also is progressing well. Madam Chair, you would be amazed by the technology that's being used at the Digitisation Hub. Um, the enormously good quality that's being produced by um, some quite sophisticated scanners to make sure that Australians, no matter where they are in the country, can access mm. really significant records in the collection. And um, the Sydney team of the National Archives are taking care of um, the really delicate um, AV and <coughs> uh, photograph and film collections and um, despite being sensitive and occasionally smelly work, if you believe it, um, they're doing an amazing and swift job. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for that update. Uh, that concludes the committee's examination of the National Archives of Australia. Thank you so much for your time and for your evidence this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Senators. Thank you. I now call officers from the Australian Human Rights Commission via video conference. Hello, Commissioner Oscar. <laughs> Professor Croucher, good evening and welcome to you and your team. Uh, do you have an opening statement? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Emeritus Professor Rosalind Croucher, President, Australian Human Rights Commission. By way of brief opening remarks, Chair, I would like to introduce to the committee the Commission's Chief Executive, Ms Leanne Smith, and the Human Rights Commissioner, Ms Lorraine Finlay,
both of whom commenced with the Commission on 22nd of November last year. As this is also the first appearance of the National Children's Commissioner, Ms Anne Hollands, before this committee, I would also like to introduce her to the committee. Since our last appearance, Chair, in October 2021, the Commission's report set the standard, the completion of the Commission's review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces, led by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Ms Kate Jenkins, has been tabled. It is a singular contribution, if I may say this, a singular contribution of the Commission and a testament to the trust in the Commission as an independent agency in being given the responsibility to discharge such a significant brief. Chair, I appear today with all of the members of the Australian Human Rights Commission, and we look forward, as always, to assisting the committee this evening. I thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, we will now go to questions from senators, and I will give the call to Senator Grogan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming along. Um, I wonder if I could just start, uh, Professor Crouch, with asking you to give us a bit of an overview of your forward work plan, briefly, um, and any key ongoing projects um, that you're working on that, that you feel uh, would be valuable to identify at this time. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, I welcome a question of this kind uh, in, in this context. And um, I'm very mindful that I could easily occupy the entire time that's been allocated to the Commission, <laughs> particularly in the context where all of my fellow Commissioners have been called, um, because each of the Commissioners develops a work plan um, for the period of their Commission, um, resources permitting or willingness to engage in, in partnerships with external support or other government partners. Um, so may I defer that question, please, to specific questions you may have of my fellow commissioners. Um, there are, each of them has a significant um, program of work um, in mind. Um, okay, well, we, we'll, we'll leave that. Um, can you tell us if you've seen any changes in the number of complaints you've been receiving over recent years? Um, yes, I can, and yes, there has been a significant change. Um, to give you a, a snapshot of what would be our average um, in a pre-COVID time, the, the average um, inquiries that the Commission would receive would be 15,000 inquiries a year through our National Information Service as an, an average. And then in a non-COVID context, in terms of complaints that are handled through our um, conciliation service, our investigation and conciliation service, on average we would have 2,000 on any, in any given year. Mm. But with the impact of COVID and also the, um, the changes to the Sex Discrimination Act more recently, but, but over that period of time, particularly the last two to three years, we have seen a significant increase, um, almost to the point of doubling the number of complaints that the Commission manages, um, and a, an increase as well in relation to the sex discrimination complaints that are, um, uh, since the 1st of July last year, for example, there's been a 30% increase in the Sex Discrimination Act complaints. So the that's a snapshot of what the normal was before, normal in an average sense, before the um, impact of the pandemic. But the pandemic has had a significant impact on our, both our national information service, but also our complaints handling as well, Senator. Mm. Um, and would you, I mean, uh, that's obviously one would be concerned that that would see an increase. Um, would you say that some of that increase that you're referring to is also connected to the very excellent work of Commissioner Jenkins? Um, the uh, changes to the Sex Discrimination Act, well, I would also say, I should preface that, I consider the work of all of my colleagues to oh, be indeed, excellent work. Indeed. But the, uh, the changes to the Sex Discrimination Act has opened the door for a lot of other possibilities. The extension to mm. state jurisdictions, for instance, is one aspect of the um, the, the expanded jurisdiction. And I think it is fair to say that 
both the Respect at Work report, well, principally the Respect at Work report, was in a context of a much um, greater heightened awareness about sexual harassment in the mm. workplace, on which uh, Respect at Work focused, and that greater awareness may well have um, given confidence to people to reach out, to inquire, or even perhaps to put in a complaint. Um, there, in, in the period I referred to, 1st of July 2021 to date, for, exa for example, there's been a 17% increase in relation to sexual harassment complaints over that period. Mm. Um, and, and do you have currently sufficient resources to, to meet that increasing workload? The, the issue of the expansion of the, the complaints load is a matter that we have raised um, uh, and we are in ongoing discussion with the, both the attorney and her department in terms of how best to support mm. that expanded workload, both in terms of the, the expanded uh, Sexual Discrimination Act jurisdiction, but also in responding to the COVID complaints, which is a particular mm. surge of the moment, but, but we are seeking um, discussion, we're continuing to those discussions, Senator, in relation to supporting that work of the Commission. Mm. Um, and, I, and just a, a, a quick sort of sideline, again, not to be preferencing any one of your commissioners, um, but do you, have you seen an increase particularly in the disability arena as well, given obviously the COVID impacts that we've seen there? Senator, the Disability Discrimination Act complaints are regularly the biggest cohort mm -hmm. of our complaints um, uh, cohort. Um, the, we'll find a, a, a number, of, uh, for example, from the 1st of July to the 31st of December, so the second half of last year, the DDA Discrimination Act complaints were 52.5% of our complaints during that period, right. just to give you an example. But um, it is regularly the highest proportion of our complaints. Okay. Um, and the, what is the impact then? Obviously, there's been an increase. Um, you haven't, you're obviously, you're negotiating, discussing uh, options about how, that, how you might change that resourcing, but that hasn't occurred at this point. What is the impact of that kind of the quite significant increase that you, you've spoken about in terms of how you cope with that without having a, an additional resource at this point. Uh, thank you, Senator. I think I uh, spoke to this um, in our last um, estimates appearance, but the, the, as you would anticipate, with the load increasing and the number of conciliators remaining the same, all of whom are very experienced, I should add, the, uh, the ability to triage those complaints um, and uh, determine a priority in which they're going to be considered, um, process some out of the system, refer them to other agencies that might be better placed to deal with them, um, and the backlog. The, the backlog will necessarily grow because the, the, the caseload that a, an individual conciliator can handle is... is um, a relatively known quantity and you can't simply just solve it by doubling or tripling their workload. So the impact, as we've flagged on our website, is to push out the backlog. And that in consequence may well have an impact on the satisfaction rates of the people who are involved in the process. We have um, um, uh, been proud of the fact that our um, satisfaction rates are very high and um, for, for example a high satisfaction in terms of the fairness of the process. Indeed the, the respondents marginally um, speak of the process as, as fair um, even more so than the complainants. So we, we do get a strong satisfaction rate but any delays in being able to deal with that backlog is likely to have an impact on such matters. But, but you haven't seen any evidence of that yet? Um, I can't speak to it at this mm. stage. I, um, I would anticipate that the um, satisfaction rates that we survey, that, that are the mm. results of surveys that we do, that will speak in time and in a way that we might be able to come back to an estimates hearing and being able to measure any decline in the satisfaction rate, notwithstanding the excellent um, job that the conciliators of the Commission do. 
Indeed, but there's only so much a person can do with, that, with the volume of, of work. Um, so, do, your, do each of the commissions have a similar staffing number and structure, or are they, are they variable based on, on need? Um, Senator, we, we start from the premise of what um, a, a core support structure for a commissioner should be. Um, we've recently had occasion to work with the department and the Department of Finance in developing a model of support for a commissioner. Um, and that model was seen in the proposed support for the religious discrimination commissioner. And um, the that model was one that was developed through, um, through consultation, through involvement of the Commission and those two major departments. So that is a very good model as to what the support should be. Um, at, we, uh, at, at the moment, we are unable to provide that level of support, but it is the basis of discussions about, with the department and the attorney about what the model of support should be, um, particularly for the commissioners um, of the commission. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I might just... Um... Uh, Senator Grogan, I'm, unfortunately you are at the end of your time. Okay. Do you have a final, very quick question? Uh, no, I might come back, though. Well, we are going to need to finish at nine o'clock with the Commission, so I'm hoping... I've asked Senators going forward to limit their blocks of questions to eight minutes, so we'll do our very best. Uh, uh, I'll now give the call to Senator Rice. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Professor Carrington. Lovely to see you again. Um, I want to go to the interaction between different protected attributes and the provision in the Religious Discrimination Bill as it was passed through the House and the Sex Discrimination Act. And in particular, starting with the practical example that the City Point Christian College in Brisbane gave us to, I mean, as you're, I'm sure, aware from the media coverage, the school sent home a statement that was reported as stating that homosexual acts are immoral, listing them along with bestiality, incest and paedophilia as offensive to God, and that transgender students will be recognised only by their biological sex at the school, and the students should identify with the gender that God bestowed. Now, under current law, so putting the Religious Discrimination Act aside, Section 38.3 of the Sex Discrimination Act would enable that school to discriminate against a student on the basis of their sexual orientation or their gender identity, wouldn't it? Including up to expulsion. Senator, perhaps the, the simplest answer to give is that the Commission is not a, in support of that provision and has um, long been an advocate of the removal of that particular section, Section 38.3 of the Sex Discrimination Act. Mm. But, and the reason you're not in support of it is because it would allow for, for you know, um, discrimination against students and for and potentially expulsion on the grounds of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Senator, I think the the potential impact of that section only became um, more fully appreciated when um, uh, the Ruddock panel, of which I was a member, um, did a very fine analysis of the um, operation of the various uh, provisions that provided um, exceptions um, for religious um, organisations. And I think it came as a surprise to many people at the time that it potentially could have that impact. And um, subsequent events have only, I think, heightened the scrutiny of that provision and uh, affirmed the reason why the Commission has um, been in favour of the um, repeal of that particular aspect of the Sex Discrimination Act. All right. And, and presumably, I mean, with that repeal as, you know, went through the House, but is not yet law of, you know, under the Human Rights Legislation Amendment that did repeal Section 38.3, that would mean that that provision would be removed. So even if, you know, there's some uncertainty as exactly what it would allow, certainly if that was removed, that statement by City Point College would no longer, would constitute discrimination, wouldn't it? And it wouldn't... Wouldn't. Without, without, if I may, without commenting on that particular case, that would be the kind of question that would be raised yes. in, and, in consequence. And presumably that City Point wouldn't be able to rely on those provisions in the SDA. If the provision were removed, it could not rely on it. Yes. So then I want to go to, if the Religious Discrimination Bill 
um, became law about the protection for the school under the proposed section seven of the Religious Discrimination Act. And I think in your um, submissions to the two inquiries, you sort of raised this as, a, as an issue. Um, indeed, um, we put in fulsome submissions both to this committee's inquiry and also to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights. And mm -hmm. myself, um, Commissioner Finlay, and um, Deputy General Counsel Graham Edgerton gave fulsome evidence in, in both committee hearings. And um, perhaps I can simply refer to the evidence that we gave in those hearings on, the, on that particular matter and on those bills. Mm. So, I mean, referring to that then, I mean, that's section seven, um, where it says that a religious body does not discriminate against a person under this act by engaging in good faith in conduct with a person of the same religion as the religious body could reasonably be considered to be in accordance with the doctrines, tenets, beliefs or teachings of that religion. I think your submission, along with many other submissions, basically said that this actually would, you know, would mean that there would be the potential for discrimination that's currently not legal in those circumstances. Uh, Senator, um, if, I, if I can just say this, the, the Commission drew attention to a number of aspects of the bill that we considered problematic that went beyond what a religious discrimination bill of a more orthodox kind, if I can use that um, description in the, the context, um, along the lines of the other four discrimination acts. The, the difficulty is when, it, um, with all the carve-outs and you get double negatives and unexpected consequences, um, it, uh, it creates quite a challenging bill to, to consider. Mm. And, and moving more broadly beyond um, gender identity and, and sexuality, that some of these protections, in particular in section seven, would mean that, say, if a student was exploring their faith and decided you know, in the middle of their secondary school education that they no longer believed in the, the tenets of the school that they were at. Um, you know, my, my friend Colleen Hartland, for example, described herself you know, having become a collapsed Catholic at, at some stage of her life. That, but potentially under that act, a student would be able to, under Section 7, a student would be able to expel a student because of they no longer subscribe to the faith, would they not? Um, rather than giving you a response on that, I, I refer you again to our submission where we um, had considerable difficulties with many of the sections in that earlier part of the bill. Okay. <laughs> um, well, let's, okay, let, let's in, in summary, I mean, bringing the, all of those various parts of the bill together, essentially the Religious Discrimination Bill would provide new ways that students at schools would be able to be, potentially be able to be discriminated against. Is, are you willing to, to agree with that? <laughs> it, it raised conflicts of rights that shouldn't be a question of conflict, Senator, but rather what is the purpose of the bill? The purpose of the bill was to create a protected attribute in terms of belief and um, religion and where it goes beyond that it creates difficulties of the kind that you have set out in your, your questions. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments, and I can't recall whether your submission um, covered this, about how the, inter how the measures in that bill would interact with state laws? Yes, we did um, engage with that issue um, and considered that uh, very troublesome. Um, states do have the... Um, uh, they have the authority in relation to education and have um, come up with their own calibrations of, of issues. And it um, creates considerable difficulty when a, a federal law seeks to intrude upon that space. But more difficulty, uh, the, the, uh, a more difficult consequence, and this is the one that we really highlighted in, a, in our submission and in our evidence, was if it means that if the, um, a matter is in a state tribunal, the potential of a federal defence being raised, which might short circuit the ability of that state tribunal to hear the, the issue. And the state tribunals, which are um, not cost-based jurisdictions, unlike the federal courts, they, they deal with a myriad of issues in a very sensitive and accessible way. 
And as soon as the, the possibility of a federal defence is set up, you have this, this conundrum of possibility where the matter may be referred out of the tribunal because of lack of jurisdiction not being a Chapter 3 court. So um, there are some vexed issues that we navigated in our submission mm -hmm. and that, um, that were created by that provision in the Religious Discrimination Bill. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm sorry. We are, obviously, we're under time limits and there are, I'm trying to accommodate all senators. So thank you very much for uh, confining your questions to the eight minutes. Uh, could I now call Senator Cox, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is for Commissioner Finlay. Um, recently, there was a piece that was published in the ABC, um, and the quote that I want to draw the attention to was the need for additional funding and the lack of an overarching national framework for implementation of OPCAT um, that's been identified by some states as stumbling blocks. Um, has the government sought your advice or the advice of the Commission about what funding is required and what national framework is required to fully implement OPCAT? Thank you very much for the question, Senator. Indeed, in relation to OPCAT, the Commission has consistently, over a long period of time, recognised the importance of Australia fully complying with its OPCAT obligations. And to that extent, I can refer you to past work the Commission has done in terms of how Australia could best implement its OPCAT obligations. In particular, the um, 29th of June 2020, we published the Implementing OPCAT in Australia report. Um, that was the final paper for the Commission as part of our OPCAT project. And it contained 17 recommendations in terms of the best way the Commission felt Australia could fully implement OPCAT. In terms of um, specific discussions since my appointment in relation to the funding of OPCAT, there haven't been um, specific discussions because obviously the Australian Human Rights Commission doesn't have responsibility for the implementation of OPCAT. We're not a national preventive mechanism in the way, for example, that the Commonwealth Ombudsman is. But certainly it's something that we remain um, committed to in terms of understanding its importance. And we would strongly encourage not only the Commonwealth Government but all state and territory governments also to give priority to this because it's only through a um, cooperative mechanism where all of the levels of government recognise the importance of OPCAT that we can achieve the most effective result. Thank you very much. Um, just noting that in my state of Western Australia, there's been two uh, NPMs that have been um, identified or um, provided the opportunity. The Inspector of Custodial Services and the Ombudsman in Western Australia. Um, is this extending also to aged care? Thank you, Senator. In terms of aged care, there are a variety of recommendations that have been given in relation to OPCAT, and um, that's probably a question actually better placed for the Minister or the Commonwealth Ombudsman in terms of the approach that the Commonwealth Government has chosen to take. It was, Senator Cox, something that Ms Chidji, was it Ms Chidji did canvas earlier today. I can, because you've got limited time, refer you to that, or we can get that hand side to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, could the absence of uh, Commonwealth funding jeopardise the proper implementation of OPCAT, not just nationally, but also in states like Western Australia? Well, thank you, Senator. Certainly I would note that Australia currently has not met its OPCAT international obligations by the deadline, which was the 20th of January um, this year. And certainly um, in terms of the Australian Human Rights Commission, we have consistently um, expressed our view that this is an important thing for Australia to do. So we would again encourage not only the Commonwealth Government, but all state and territory governments to take that commitment seriously and to make sure that OPCAT is fully funded and fully implemented. Yeah. So last week in Western Australia, the Department of Justice admitted to the treatment of 15-year-old children in Bankshire Hill Detention Centre mm -hmm. that it did not meet the appropriate standards of care. This is just the latest example of the appalling condition in youth detention facilities. Commissioner, um, can you explain what the implementation of OPCAT will mean for youth justice, particularly in states like mine, like Western Australia? Well, in our view, the implementation of OPCAT is incredibly important because it creates an independent oversight mechanism. So while it doesn't create new minimum standards of treatment in and of itself, having that regular, nationally coordinated, independent oversight mechanism helps shine a light on conditions 
that are problematic and can actually help prevent those conditions from arising in the first place. Mm -hmm. So we see OPCAT as being critical in terms of um, ensuring that minimum conditions are met. And as you mentioned, in cases of um, people who are being detained, that's so important because obviously they're in positions of um, vulnerability and ensuring that their human rights are met is, mm. um, is because, critical. Uh, there, as referenced in the, in the actual media article in relation to this case of 15-year-olds in youth detention, we're talking about 22 hours of lockdown per day in youth detention facilities. And we've already had a Royal Commission on youth detention in this country, mm. in Don Dale. So uh, clearly a breach of human rights that we actually need more attention and more oversight on. Um, I also want to reference in your um, in the ABC article was um, the prison conditions and um, over over the summer, particularly in Western Australia, and I happened to be in Roburn on this day when it was 50.5 degrees, mm. and uh, and the prisoners in some of those cells actually don't have air conditioning or cooling, and the authorities ignored the recommendations to install. Uh, the air conditioning in that prison in particular from the Office of the um, Custodial Inspector. And so I'm interested to hear from you how OPCAT might address these particular issues because they've been described by the Aboriginal Legal Service in West Australia as a serious breach of human rights. And certainly, Senator, you've actually highlighted really the key issue when it comes to the implementation of OPCAT, which is the importance of national, state and territory cooperation because the particular incident that you've referred to or issue that you've raised is a state issue. It's been the subject of considerable recommendations um, over a considerable period of time and still hasn't been addressed at a mm. state level. OPCAT obviously won't in and of itself solve those problems, but what it does do is create um, oversight of them. It shines a light on them and hopefully through that it can help encourage every state and territory government and the national government to ensure that there are those minimum human right protections um, in places of detention across Australia. Mm. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, my second set of questions is to Commissioner Oscar. Uh, just an update uh, Senator on... Cox, there is only one minute remaining, so I'm, I'm apologies, but I'm going to have to ask you to finish up very quickly. Yeah, just one question about Thank the implementation you. of um, the stage three of the Women's Voices report. Uh, thank you, Senator Cox, June Oscar, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. Thank you for the question. Uh, on the 25th of November last year, uh, the Australian government publicly announced a $2.8 million commitment to stage three of We Yanni Udangani, Women's Voices, and um, that is to uh, work uh, towards a summit and to plan for the summit uh, to be held uh, at this point um, in early next year. Um, so our mind, our team um, very much focused on um, implementing stage three of the Women's Voices project. That's great, thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Cox. Senator Steele John. Uh, to a st sorry. No, no, Steele John. You, you got it right. right. You got it right. You Senator Steele John is right. I'm getting. <laughs> Unless you meant to give it to Senator Carr. But, no. no, no, that's right. Please go ahead. Don't doubt yourself, Chair. Sorry. It's, well, I think we're all getting a little bit tired. People never get my name right, so that's fine. <laughs> um, okay, so my. Uh, uh, Questions are to uh, Commissioner Gauntlet. Surprise, surprise. Yes. Um, is Commissioner Gauntlet, ah, lovely, all right. Great. Fantastic, thank you, Commissioner. Um, in the last few months, we've seen uh, many uh, governments, both state and, and federal, change their policy settings um, in ways that have impacted the lives of disabled people in relation to the management of COVID-19. Um, the so-called let it rip strategy, as uh, many jurisdictions have uh, I've decided to pursue, such as New South Wales, have had um, significant consequences on the lives of disabled people. Um, how, in your view, has this let it rip decision impacted the lives of disabled people, and what more needs to be done to understand the impact of these decisions and ultimately protect the rights of disabled people? Oh, you're on mute, Commissioner. Done. 
Ken Gawler, Disability Discrimination Commissioner. Uh, thank you for your question, Senator. Uh, the Omicron variant and the policy responses to the Omicron variant need to be seen within the individuals who are living in Australia at present. 47.3% of Australians live with an underlying health condition. One in five Australians live with a disability. Many of those individuals live in age or disability care and require support workers to um, go about their everyday lives. I don't want to be drawn into um, descriptions of policy, Senator, because I don't know if that's helpful. But what I think is important to say that when policy frameworks are changed relating to the um, COVID-19 response, the policy response needs to be proportionate and reasonable in nature. It is important when deciding on what policy to consider that the issues of the availability of rapid antigen or PCR testing, masks and PPE, the availability of support in the community and the access to hospitals and ICU beds is a very real concern for the community, but in particular people with disability, older Australians and Australians that may experience other forms of structural disadvantage, such as culturally and linguistically diverse communities or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander individuals. The challenge with the policy frameworks that have been changed in Australia has been that it has not appropriately considered the, need, the underlying needs of individuals as people. And what has occurred, unfortunately, is that has meant there has been great stress in the disability community. And what we need to go forward to change this is an emphasis on the collection of data to ensure that we have precise policy frameworks for people with disability to be created, but also that we emphasise the importance of each and every life in Australia and the quality of that life going forward. And what we do need to emphasise as a result of that is that when policies are changed, that we have a clear, unabiding certainty for individuals with disability that they all have the necessary support in the community going forward. And that is a critical human rights issue and one that each and every one of us needs to really comply with and see as important. Thank you, Commissioner. And you referenced that that some of the policy decisions taken in relation to Omicron, uh, I think, and you were breaking up slightly, but I think you said that they they have failed to uphold the the rights of, of disabled people or words to that effect and cause stress, um, unnecessary stress to the disabled community. Um, w which of those decisions are, are are you referring to there? I think it's important not to refer to an individual decision, Senator, because I think when we look at the response to the Omicron outbreak it is, and early decisions relating to COVID, <coughs> the decisions of public health authorities are multifaceted in nature. The availability of rapid antigen tests or PCR tests needs to be seen with the availability of masks, the availability of PPE, the availability of support workers, and the ability of nurses, doctors and allied health professionals to attend their shifts. And whilst it is um, easy to, in a sense, be critical of systemic issues that have occurred, Senator, the one thing I would like to be very clear about is that during the pandemic over the last few years, many nurses, doctors, people working in aged and disability care have gone above and beyond to ensure that people they are working with have been treated with dignity and respect I think that's important to acknowledge, to acknowledge when you're looking at the policy debate that occurs at mm. present. You noted uh, that 47% of the population have an underlying <coughs> health uh, condition. Um, does it concern you from a human rights perspective the way that, uh, that sometimes uh, underlying health conditions uh, are presented in, in the context of um, uh, data in relation to COVID deaths? Uh, yes, it does, Senator. Every life matters, and we need to always respect the dignity of human life and how it is reported in the community. Uh, when we talk about age and COVID-19, it is appropriate to talk about underlying conditions to try and encourage people to get booster vaccines, for example, 
or to put in place certain procedures to ensure they're healthy. But what it should never be seen as is a justification for why there is a loss of life. Many of the individuals, if not all of the individuals, had the underlying health condition when COVID-19 started. They could quite often be alive if not for COVID-19. And so we need to be really respectful of the diversity of people living in the community, that many individuals live with underlying health conditions and that they need to be treated with dignity and respect. And we haven't met that benchmark to, to this point in your view. I think it's um, important to be uh, very careful with my remarks in relation to that question, Senator. Many public health officials, when they are trying to explain um, why certain instances of um, outcomes have occurred, are doing their best. But I think there is a renewed effort required for senior levels of government and senior public health officials to be very careful to distinguish between the point of the correct public health response as it relates to underlying health conditions and informing someone who, for example, might have a cardiovascular condition, which mm. means they're more likely to die of COVID-19 and the need to get a booster relative to making a comment that may be um, disrespectful or, or display a lack of respect for a person who may have died in the circumstances. And have the, I, I agree with you about the need for renewed leadership in that space, Commissioner. Um, I'm curious, has anybody from the Federal Department of Health reached out to, to your office to, to seek your guidance or input into how federal communications in relation to underlying conditions could could be improved? Uh, yes, we've had um, some productive discussions with the Commonwealth Health Department actually last week. And within those discussions, we talked about the importance of um, communication, the importance of appropriate language, the importance of valuing each and every life, and the importance of trying to provide information that was tailored to the disability community and reflected the needs of people with disability because it was a society-wide issue. And I thought the meeting was a productive one. Okay, good. Chair, I, I have a, a second line of questioning, but I'm aware that you're trying to manage the time. I'm happy for you to go to Senator Waters, but then we'll need to come back for me to finish this last line off. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Steele-John. Uh, I am, we are looking at running over beyond the 9.15 uh, tea break. Uh, but we're obviously working very hard to stay at a time. I'll now give the call to Senator Waters. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to my colleague. I'll be as quickly, quick as I can. Uh, my questions are to Commissioner Jenkins. Um, obviously, first place on record, uh, our gratitude and thanks for the impeccable work that you and your team carried out, not just in the Respect at Work report, but also the Set the Standard report. Um, and I note that uh, you've now got ongoing roles in terms of overseeing the implementation of both of those two reports, um, as well as chairing the Respect at Work Council um, and consultation on the MOPS Act review uh, and supporting the work of the uh, Leadership Task Force. So I, I'm interested in um, the, the staffing situation that you've got to support you with that work, given that the calibre of the existing work has been so good. Um, it's important that that uh, be able to continue. So can I ask first how many staff were involved in preparing the Set the Standard report and were they specifically engaged or were they simply redirected internally? Apologies, missed the last part of that question, Senator. Uh, just whether the staff that were utilised on the Set the Standard report were um, uh, fresh hires, if you like, were they engaged specifically for that report or were they redirected internally from within the Commission? Thank you for the question, Senator. Kate Jenkins, Sex Discrimination Commissioner. Um, I'll too pay credit to the uh, all the staff at the Commission, but in particular the team that worked on the Set the Standard report. Um, this is the first Senate estimate since that report's been delivered and they were uh, pretty much the most amazing team. And so just recognising their work from my perspective as well. Um, that team was funded by the government and recruited specifically for that project. 
that was a combination of staff that currently worked, had worked, and also from other locations to ensure we got the correct skill set. Um, the funding for that uh, work, uh, when it finished, um, those staff have gone on to other um, tasks and have taken those skills oh. with them. Some remain and reverted to their original roles at the Commission. Uh, in terms of that particular project, uh, as government considers implementation, I don't have a formal role, but in practice, um, obviously, we are available, those of us left, to support the government and the multi-party task force to take the next step of implementation. And I welcome uh, the response to date, which has been comprehensive and swift. Um, uh, so what I'm currently with in terms of my core staff is as a policy officer, I have one director. Um, that is for a range of reasons, my full direct staff. There are, are other staff, for example, that are funded to assist with some particular projects implementing respect at work. And I have a team that work on the collaboration with the Australian Federal Police and Defence Force. But currently my core staff is um, is really one, well, soon to be recruited, executive assistant and one director. Sorry, you've got two staff and you... In, in my core staff to fulfil my standard functions, that's the current complement. Um, and then there are other staff that are funded for particular projects. Okay. Um, I'm not aware of how many staff that other commissioners have, and it's obviously always been at my party's view that the commission does fabulous work and should be amply resourced, but that does, does seem rather a small team to do the ongoing tasks that um, you've been charged to do. So I was going to ask you whether specific staff have been dedicated to the ongoing implementation work, but it sounds like that answer is two. Is that their sole focus or do they have to do other things as well? So I think we're at that turning point and there is general conversations about the funding of the commission and particularly the support to the commissioners. Uh, so as we're at the start of the year, um, there is conversations, I think, about whether additional resources are required for set the standard, but in terms of our core staff, that's also a matter for discussion and uh, it is a matter for the president and the CEO to um, work on that. Okay, um, thank you, Commissioner. I was going to ask if sufficient funding had been allocated to maintain the staff needed to do the work, but I think you've just uh, possibly anticipated my question there. It sounds like uh, it sounds like you need a few more staff. It, it is. I'm not sure if it's appropriate to ask, but have you estimated the amount of additional staffing support that you would need and the funding to go along with that in order to? Um, not just scrape by, but amply perform the ongoing functions that you've been charged with, as well as have capacity to do the other tasks that your role entails. So I welcome the question, and, and I know all the commissioners are in a similar position sure. in terms of our staffing for our core statutory functions. I can refer back to uh, Professor Crouch's previous response, which talked about what the, uh, really, the probably it's not optimal, the, sort of the required staffing for commissioners, which has been uh, agreed or identified um, with in discussions with the uh, Attorney General's department. So I can refer that question back to oh. Professor Croucher if she would like to elaborate on that topic. Yes, please, thank you. Chair, I'm happy to continue the line there. Uh, Senator, while um, you were not in the room, yes, I, my I, apologies. Re I referred to the um, model that had been uh, agreed to in relation to the Religious Discrimination Commissioner, which was um, the result of discussions um, between the Commission, the Department, the Attorney General's Department, and the Department of Finance. And, and that model involved more staff than Commissioner Jenkins, referred to as the, um, the model upon which further discussions are continuing about support for commissioners and support for the commission more generally. That model involved um, the, the director that Commissioner Jenkins referred to and the, um, um, the EA position, but in addition, um, at least two to three other staff um, in between the EA and the director role. 
Okay, so other commissioners have five staff and the Sex Discrimination Commission no, has two. No, I, forgive me, Senator, that, that's not the case. That is the model that's been agreed to as the appropriate benchmark model okay. for the consideration of what functional models, um, the, a functional model for the Commission should be. And it's one of the pieces around which there is agreement, and it was reflected in the funding for the Religious Discrimination okay. Commissioner. It is not the model that is in place at the moment with respect to our commissioners at this stage. Okay, well, perhaps I might ask for the minister's insight here. Um, if this agreed model is, is essentially five staff, uh, rather than the, the example of the two that Commissioner Jenkins has, um, does that uh, flow that the government will in fact be delivering the staff to fit that model for um, each commission? The government is currently in discussions with the commission uh, in relation to the future model. But what I might do, Chair, is just get Ms Chidji to come to the table uh, just to take you through uh, the additional funding that has been provided to the commission. Thanks, Minister. In the amount of $16 million. So, Ms Chiji, perhaps you'd like to come to the table um, and take the committee through that. Thanks, Ms Chiji. I'm just conscious that there's a number of other folk with questions, and I'm particularly interested in it, it is the short staffing this, of the yeah, Sex Discrimination Commission. on the commissioner. record and the reasons as to why. Um, uh, so, Senator, I can deal with it uh, reasonably quickly. Um, so the government's provided um, an equity injection of 16 million to assist the commission um, to address some cash flow problems it was experienced um, and return it to a sustainable financial footing. Uh, and the department's been working very closely with the commission to identify uh, ways for the commission uh, to return to budget and um, its funding needs. Uh, and uh, so, we're working with the Commission on that um, and we'll provide advice to the Attorney-General on those issues um, and then government uh, can consider future funding needs as well. Um, I mentioned earlier that the sort of core funding for the Commission has been steady over recent years at around 16 million with some additions from time to time for additional work. Um, and then has been touched on, the Commission also gets additional revenue for particular projects um, and respect to work is an example of that. Okay, and in so relation the to the additional $16 million which we have had to provide to the Commission, I'm sure Ms Croucher will be able to take you through how the Commission is able to utilise part of that money to pay for additional staff should the Commission so choose to. Uh, Senator Waters, we are running short on we time. Are, the yes, sounds. we're well yes, over well, your time. So, could, would you be able to wrap this up? In the yes, next thank you. Or so? I thank will. You. I was going to ask about funding for the Respect at Work Council and whether or not budget allocations, uh, whether or not that body had then asked for budget support to support the implementation of Respect at Work and set the standard. Um, so, if there's time for that to be answered, that would be great. But uh, um, it, it's a bit of a concerning picture. Um, that it seems like the Commission ongoing, notwithstanding this equity injection, that there well, still seems to, to be staff constraints. The government has provided the equity injection to the Commission of $16 million. And uh, just to be very, very clear, if the Commission chooses to utilise that money to pay for additional staff, it is able to do that. Is that correct, Ms Croucher? Thank you, Attorney. Um, uh, to some extent, that is that is the case, um, in addition to addressing the issues for which the equity injection was given. Yes. Uh, Senator Waters. I might have yeah. to put some more questions yes. on notice. If, by I think now. you should, Senator Waters. If you can yes, put to the any other questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate Senator. everyone's forbearance in managing the time uh, this evening. We will now suspend for tea for 15 minutes, and I will be returning uh, with the Commission, if you would be so kind, uh, with Senator Grogan, who has some more questions as well. Very happy to help. Thank you very much. The Committee is now in session. We are continuing with the Australian Human Rights Commission, and I give the call to Senator Grogan. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I could go to Commissioner Jenkins. 
Um, in your respect of work report, you discussed the problems that can arise from the use of non-disclosure agreements in the context of workplace sexual harassment. Um, and you point out um, that NDAs have often served to intimidate and silence victims while concealing the behaviour of harassers who have been able to move within industries and continue to engage in sexual harassment without adverse consequences. Can you um, expand on how the NDAs can be used in this way? Frozen? No. no she can't hear. I don't think she can hear. Volume. Can any of the other witnesses hear us? <laughs> no. Nope. Uh, I think we're on mute. So we'll just check with broadcasting for a moment. <clears throat> it doesn't appear. Commissioner Jenkins, can you hear us? No, Someone you've just sent a message. I've just sent a Thanks, message Professor. Asking. No, she cannot hear. She cannot Chair. hear. Okay. Uh, do you, uh, Senator Grogan, do you have any other questions that you could go on with while we try and work out the issues with broadcasting? Oh, you oh, can, can hear now. Me. Excellent. You can hear. Uh, Senator Grogan, could I ask you to repeat your question to Commissioner Jenkins, please? Uh, Commissioner Jenkins, in your respective work report, you discuss the issues that can arise from the use of non-disclosure agreements in the context of sexual harassment um, in the workplace, and you point out, and I'll quote, um, that NDAs have often served to intimidate and silence victims while concealing the behaviour of harassers who have been able to move within industries and continue to engage in sexual harassment without adverse consequences. Can you expand for us on how the NDAs can be used in that way? Yes, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, we actually made a recommendation in uh, respect of work that the government uh, should consider and develop some guidance on appropriate uses of non-disclosure agreements. And I understand the Attorney General's Department is currently in the process of consultation on draft guidance for that purpose. Our finding was that blanket non-disclosure agreements were interfering with the uh, uh, proper processes. However, we did find that there might be some occasions where done appropriately uh, that it might be an acceptable use of uh, confidentiality provisions. So the reason that we raised the concern was that uh, confident. We heard through it, the inquiry that people who'd experienced sexual harassment found they couldn't speak even to partners or counsellors, uh, that also perpetrators could repeat offend with impunity because no one knew of their conduct, and also that organisations lacked the knowledge of cases, which meant that they didn't have the systemic information to be able to improve practices. So for all those reasons, we specifically made a recommendation and I know that there is a draft that's been out for consultation um, and I look forward to that being finalised. I think that will be an important step forward. Similar, uh, similar guidance exists in the United Kingdom that is a really positive step forward. Um, and is there a role with the, um, a negative role with the NDAs in terms of if the disclosure of a sum of money of uh, compensation, for example, um, uh, can be used as a form of deterrent? Uh, so the, I think that these issues, because of the nature of our national inquiry, we the recommendations really identified places where we felt there was additional work required. So that topic uh, was something that we felt that not unusual now. There's been a range of pieces of work where, for example, disclosure of sums might be kept confidential, but people are otherwise not prohibited to speak of their experiences. That has become a more common experience. Uh, there is also another piece of work looking at damages awards as well. So our finding was that when uh, cases went to hearing, often the damages were quite small compared to the harm experienced. Now, in terms of private settlements, uh, we didn't have that information available. Uh, so we, we weren't able to assess whether settlements really were commensurate with the harm experienced. So that would be a negative. But if the um, settlements were appropriate, do you feel that that would, if they were disclosed, the sums were disclosed, that that would be a form of deterrent to a perpetrator? 
Um, uh, I guess the overall 55 recommendations really push uh, towards prevention, uh, but certainly accountability, reporting and accountability is an important part of the process. The reality is most uh, sexual harassment is not reported, only 17%, and most sexual harassment that happens doesn't involve significant sums of money, senior people, it's not sort of a million dollar, there's not a great uh, financial outcome in most cases. So there does need to be impunity, there does need to be accountability, and for that reason, whether it's the sum of money whether or not but just that um, that we have more visibility that sexual harassment occurs and that it's unacceptable that is an important part both of response but also will help prevention mm. so i appreciate that the um, consultation report was put out yesterday um, have you been asked by the government to provide any uh, recommendation on what form uh, the dealing with the with the ndas might look like whether that be a regulation formal sort of legislative pace? So um, I think there's, we're talking about two different items. Yesterday, the government released its consultation paper on the remaining legislative reform provisions that mm. we made recommendations. So many would know in September, the first tranche were passed and the second uh, have been released, which includes the discussion about the positive duty. So just to give a pitch, I would encourage everyone, the consultations open till the 18th of uh, March uh, to participate in that. In terms of the non-disclosure agreement guidance, our recommendation was that guidance should be prepared with the potential to become regulations um, and that that guidance, uh, and we are hearing from private sector employers that they would like to know what would be good practice, uh, that there is very much a sense of if these form of non-disclosure agreements are not assisting. Uh, certainly the better employers I'm dealing with are saying they would like some guidance on what they should do. Um, and so that I expect will be published by the Attorney General's Department and the Fair Work Commission as well as the Human Rights Commission is involved with that um, as guidance for anyone who's looking at uh, settlements of uh, sexual harassment cases. Okay. Um, on the issue of um, positive duty um, that you were talking about, we saw um, uh, Brittany Higgins make some commentary last week um, where she was saying that, you know, we talk extensively about the Jenkins review. Uh, Senator Grogan, um, I'm not sure whether you heard my statement this morning in relation to sub judice. Uh, I would just ask you to exercise great care in relation to any matter which is currently before any court at the moment. Uh, so if you could just, as I say, exercise great care in relation to your question. Uh, yes, I think you'll find that my, my point is more I'm about not, a comment that she I, made I can see where totally. it's going, but I just wanted to speak, yeah. uh, so speak her, in advance so you've got due warning. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms Higgins said that she was shocked that there wasn't much more of a flashpoint moment um, that the issues weren't just about parliament, but they were about all workplaces across Australia. Um, and that uh, those sorry, issues... I'm, I'm sorry, Senator. That's a very broad statement. Maybe uh, if I could finish, I would... you'll find that I'm not no, actually no, I, I, What be... What I'm concerned yeah. about is by putting anything on the record, once it's on the record, it's too late to undo it. So I would ask you not to make any comments in relation to any substantive issue uh, about Ms Higgins' concerns, and I'm just finding struggling with my own words. So could I perhaps ask you to just make your question more general about procedure without referring uh, to uh, any particular individual, please? And please understand this is a very serious matter. It's currently before the ACT Supreme Court. And again, I just want to reiterate that our committee should play no role in making any statement which may um, prejudice uh, that particular trial. So um, I really appreciate your understanding. So, um, Commissioner Jenkins, the issue of uh, the conversation in general um, uh, regarding uh, behaviour within the parliament, 
um, compared with commentary about the behaviour within uh, workplaces across Australia. Um, what is your sense, obviously not referring to anything in part any particular case, but the notion that there's been a, a, a spotlight on behaviours in general within the parliament. Um, do you feel that gives rise to a greater conversation across Australia or um, do you feel that we've kind of missed the boat in, in getting a rise in understanding and awareness across a broader Australian context? I am really confident that uh, this, uh, the, uh, the work we did in Parliament was reviewing the conduct in one particular workplace, that Respect at Work looked at all workplaces across the country. Even in the last month, there's been active discussion about conduct in the mining industry. Over the time I've been in this role, there have been a number of industries that have actively engaged. And I would say in the almost two years since we tabled uh, or the, the, the Respect at Work report was tabled, there has been significant shift both in the private sector in employer um, conduct or em employer practices, but also that the majority of the recommendations that we made have been funded or are in action in some way, including with the work of the Commission. I guess if I consider where this conversation started, I would again take the opportunity to say the conversation that has continued has been about our recommendation about a positive duty to be inserted in the Sex Discrimination Act. That wasn't uh, that wasn't, hasn't been implemented. It has not been rejected by government. It's currently open for consultation. My dealings with organisations like the Business Council of Australia, like the Minerals Council, is that over that time and watching what has happened in so many workplaces, that employers actually do now accept that there is a positive obligation on the employers. Uh, so I guess my this is why I do encourage and I really support the Attorney General's department's consultation on this. I think the more voices that will reinforce that that small change um, is it is time for that. I think that's positive. But I think your question goes to the issues of sexual harassment, of bullying um, and sexual assault in workplaces is a national issue. And I'm really strongly of the view for a range of different reasons, both of the work the Commission's done, but also of society and some really vocal advocates that we're at a turning point. And I think that's a good thing for this country. Thank you. And so the positive duty is an essential element that we must get action on would be the takeaway. In my view, it is, and it's currently in consultation. Thank you very much. I uh, Thank you very much, Senator Grogan. Uh, Senator Steele-John. Um, so my questions will go uh, to, the, to the Disability Discrimination Commissioner once again. Um, in your role uh, uh, as the, I believe it's the chair of the Disability uh, Strategy Advisory Council, um, I, I wondered whether I could ask you in that capacity to share uh, with us your, your view in brief terms, uh, conscious of time, of the role of the council. Uh, the role of the council is to ensure that we work, that government works with people with disability, not for people with disability, and that people with disability are viewed as equals when making decisions relating to policy to concern them, so that we can drive outcomes in areas such as employment, education, health, housing, uh, the criminal justice system, which ensure that we can have a disability policy system that is the envy of the world, and for that council to thrive, it needs to be independently funded, independently resourced and autonomous. And it needs to be respected by the community and given the ability to pass comment so that what we have is disability policy that's created in Australia where we have asked people with disability whether the, whether the outcomes which are sought by government are achievable and I should acknowledge, Senator, in developing the Disability Advisory Council, the fair-minded and authentic manner in which Senator Rustin thought about 
accepting the proposal. This is a proposal that has been advocated for in countries such as England and New Zealand to have a sort of independent monitoring mechanism in place. And the essence of the Disability Advisory Council is it puts people with disability, hopefully at the centre of decisions made in relation to policy concerning them, which is a really important aspect of the disability rights movement in Australia going forward. Thank you, Commissioner. And I, I couldn't agree with you more on a on a personal note. It's it's exciting to see the disability uh, strategy finalised, and I think the announcement of a of the council is a, a step in absolutely the right direction in ensuring that the strategy comes to life and, and goes to work uh, in guiding the work of the government. And I think that your your points there around independence, uh, independently funded. Um, independently supported and autonomous is key because sometimes in relation to disability discrimination tough conversations have got to be had about current practice or proposed change. Um, I wondered if I could ask you about your views on uh, the structures that are required to best enable uh, this independent, autonomous, fully and independently uh, funded outcome. If I take each of those elements individually, Senator, um, in terms of individually, independently funded, there would be a stream of funding provided to the Disability Advisory Council, which would last for the duration of the strategy. It may be reviewed at particular points in time, which would be unrelated to the decision of an individual department, but would rather enable the state the actual Disability Advisory Council itself to undertake research or to make comment or to commission research or to, or to commission consultation. In terms of the second issue being the independent resourcing, the actual Disability Advisory Council itself would have carriage of employing individuals associated with it to provide that assistance. And finally, on the issue of autonomy, the Disability Advisory Council itself would have a monitoring or implementation role where it could comment on the veracity of conduct undertaken under the Australian Disability Strategy in a way where it was able to comment freely of what it thought was appropriate in the circumstances and make those comments in a way that was accessible to not only the disability community, but the community at large, because for the Australian Disability Strategy to be successful, we need whole of community engagement. I, I agree, Commissioner, and one of the things that's been on my mind, not notwithstanding a, at all that I, I think I would genu generally agree with your characterisation of, uh, of Minister Rustin's goodwill uh, in relation to the strategy and the, the proposal of the Council, um, that should funding come from a department for the Council, um, should the Council ever need to, to then criticise or comment upon um, the action of or policy of that department, that that could could potentially be a challenge to to the ability of the council to do that. Um, I'm just trying to think. It's always a challenge to get money from government and then hold it at arm's length. But that is uh, something that the Human Rights Commission has successfully pulled off over many decades. Um, if 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 funding was provided to the to the Human Rights Commission to then provide support to the council. Would that provide a, a, a bit more distance and, and safeguard the autonomy um, and independence as, as you've outlined it to us, do you think? Uh, much like um, the parliamentary workplace review and how that was undertaken with money being provided to the Australian Human Rights Commission and the engagement of staff relating to that review, there is the capability of that taking place. And I think to put in place those structures and procedures means that people with disability can have faith that they will always be represented in policy discussions. And that for people with disability, who, who some of whom live in the most challenging circumstances in Australia, they will always have an advocate at the policy table who they know is independent. Oh. I think that's an incredibly important outcome for this strategy, which makes it materially different to the strategy that was undertaken a decade ago. I agree. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Can I just ask um, first the President, and then it might be a question for the Minister. Um, 
have has the commission been approached by the government in relation to playing such a role around providing funds to the advisory council um the um, the matter i understand has been raised by commissioner gauntlet in in discussion with um with ministers okay so so commissioner gauntlet has raised it with ministers uh, have but ministers haven't yet raised it with you in relation to whether that might be a role that the commission would be willing to play um, Senator, um, that, that's a matter that, that oh. Commissioner Gauntlet has, oh, has led the discussions on. Sorry, so I course. defer to Dr. Gauntlet. Of course. Um, sorry, Commissioner. We have had uh, um, quite constructive discussions um, with Senator Rustin, um, who um, has been both authentic and fair-minded in their feedback, and those discussions are ongoing, um, as are the um, creation of the terms of reference relating to the Disability Advisory Council. There have been some delays due to um, unexpected personal circumstances of people who are required to be dis involved in the discussions, which I don't think it's necessary for me to go into. But I think um, I am hopeful that with good faith, a structure and process could be created that is um, both enviable in terms of Australia's disability policy system as it relates to the world, but also one where the disability community can have great faith that they are represented um, wholeheartedly over the next decade. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and Minister, I, I know you're not the relevant minister to this discussion, but um, uh, having heard Commissioner Gauntless' words and reflected on it a bit myself, and having been involved in both the previous strategy and the process around the new one, this the council's role and its independence are one of the things that will either set it apart or set it up to be one of the many strategies that are created and crafted but don't actually see change. Um, do you do you have any update for us in relation to the the timeline for the resolution of the process and which way the government's leaning? At this point in time, I don't. But I do note the evidence given by Commissioner Gauntlet in relation to the positive discussions and the discussions that are occurring in very good faith with, with Minister Rustin at this point in time. And my understanding is that those discussions, um, Commissioner Gauntlet, are going to continue. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Steele-John. Uh, Professor, that brings to a conclusion the committee's examination of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, particularly this time of night, and to all of your commissioners and officers for your time and hard work and evidence this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now call officers from the Royal Commission into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability via video conference. Just a note, as advised to the Attorney General's Department, uh, we are not going to be calling the Royal Commission into defence and veteran suicide. Um, senators are going to be placing questions uh, to the Royal Commission on notice. Mr Cronin, good evening. And welcome. Uh, do you have an opening statement? Uh, Paul Cronin, Official Secretary, Disability Royal Commission. No, I don't, Chair, but I will just introduce um, those that are with me. Thank uh, you. Uh, Ms Jo Carey, Assistant Secretary from our engagement branches in the room with me. And we should have Miss Emma Appleton on video link from Sydney. We, we have no visibility yet, Chair. I'm sorry, Minister. So we have no visibility. If you do, we don't see. No. You don't either. We haven't seen Emma. We might uh, we might try and get underway, and I know broadcasting is working very hard to bring up the video link. Very challenging in these times with so many people appearing via video conference or video link. Uh, now we'll now move to questions from senators and Senator Steele John. You are seeking the call. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, hello there. Um, I wondered whether we could begin, uh, if you wouldn't mind, by just stepping me through the 
public hearings you were intending to have between now and, and 2021? I, I asked because um, I, I think I, I looked this evening and there's, there's one currently listed publicly, but I'm absolutely sure you've got more on the agenda. Um, so if we could kick off there, that'd be great. Thank you for that. Certainly. Good evening, Senator. Paul Cronin, Official Secretary. Um, we, our first public hearing for 2022 um, will be in February of this year, the 23rd to the 25th of February. Um, that'll be a virtual hearing um, and it'll address the experience of people with disability engaging with disability employment services. In March, we have two hearings scheduled. Um, we have a one day hearing on the 10th of March, which is to take oral submissions um, in relation to an earlier hearing from last year. And then we have a, a five day hearing in Hobart um, from the 28th of March to the 1st of April. Um, and that is the second part of a hearing that we started late last year to do with the experiences of women and girls with disability with a particular focus on family, domestic and sexual violence. Um, in April, we have uh, a three day hearing on, from the 11th to the 13th of April on the experience of people with disability working in Australian disability enterprises. And then on the 28th of April, we have a one day hearing um, which is a virtual hearing and it'll be an oral, oral submissions one day hearing from a, a hearing we had previously last year. Um, Senator, commissioners uh, and the commission are still settling the program for the rest of this year um, and we'll be providing updates to our website um, when that is in place. Okay. In fact, we expect to update it quite shortly. Thank you. Um, now, uh, the community more broadly, um, have been advocating for a hearing on the impact of Omicron. Um, and I'd wonder whether you'd be able to advise if there's been any progress on deciding um, whether to hold a hearing to assess the impact of, of Omicron specifically on the community. Yeah, thanks for the question, Senator. Um, uh, what I can say is the commissioners and the Royal Commission are certainly seized of the importance of the issue and the concern in the disability community and with disability advocacy groups um, on that issue. Mm. Uh, as you know, we held two public hearings last year at very short notice, public mm. hearing five and public hearing 12 uh, into COVID related matters. Public hearing five addressed um, responses uh, from government to um, COVID generally at that time and then COVID, then public hearing, sorry, public hearing uh, 12 last year addressed um, responses to the booster rollout for people with disability. Um, they were two quite significant hearings held at short notice. Um, I think in total, the Commission made 29 recommendations of which the government accepted 27 and noted two across those, those two hearings. Um, the Commission hasn't been um, quiet uh, in relation to this particular issue. As I said, the commissioners are particularly concerned about what they're hearing, what they're reading, and the submissions have been made um, by a range of organisations, including um, People with Disability Australia, um, ACOS, um, AFTO, um, and a range of other um, research organisations um, that have been making submissions in relation to the, the significant areas of concern, if I can put it that, in relation to the Omicron variant. Um, Commissioners have been listening. They've, they, they have been gathering information, if I can put it in those terms, including data. Um, and um, a hearing is one of a number of options, I think it's fair to say, that the Commission is considering. Um, in fact, what I can say is the Commission will very shortly be issuing uh, a statement um, in relation to the Omicron variant and its effect on people with disability. That is uh, uh, very hard. Senator Stilljohn, just pardon me. I just wanted to make everyone aware that Ms Appleton has joined us via video link. Uh, welcome to you, Ms Appleton. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Senator. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Cronin. And that is, that is really heartening to hear. And I'll, I'll, from my own experience and, and reflections that I've heard uh, from the community, um, hearings five and, and 12, uh, are some of the finest work the Commission has done. Thank you. I'll um, pass that on. Yeah, most certainly. Um, in relation to uh, Western Australia um, and, uh, and more, more broadly, the situation we're in where we still haven't 
had a hearing um, in, in WA. We've got about 10 months left on the clock. Um, can you give an update as to, to when there will be a hearing in WA? Senator, we seem to cover this territory regularly and I'm, ple I'm pleased to respond to it. Um, uh, we have been planning, as you know, to hold a hearing or hearings in WA since the beginning of the Commission's um, yeah when it first commenced. Um, clearly, we aren't able to do that presently because of the closure of the, the border with WA. We presently are tentatively looking at a hearing in the second half of this year in Western Australia, but it will be absolutely dependent on COVID and the borders in WA opening. Thank you, Mr Cronin, and I, I suspected you might say that for the last <laughs> time we've had this conversation. The reason I bring it up, not just to be repetitive, yep. it's actually to, to draw to your attention changes made in uh, in relation to our border in Western Australia um, from the February date, I think, I think slightly earlier than that. Um, there's actually the ability for senior government officials in one of the categories that can travel into Western Australia. You do have to quarantine for seven days. Um, and it was my hope that when that change had occurred, there would be the capacity to uh, to kind of bring a presence of the Commission into Western Australia. So I'm just curious, is it that you've been told, have you been told by the WA uh, border authorities that you don't classify as a, a senior government entity? No, we haven't, Senator, we haven't asked that question. Um, and I think in part that's because it's more than just, um, I guess, commissioners travelling to WA. Um, I think you, you've certainly attended one of our earlier public yeah. hearings. Um, and there are a great deal of logistics involved in setting up that hearing, including taking uh, an IT team, a hearing logistics team, um, a range of commission staff, legal staff, um, and other people uh, to the hearing. Um, presently, we've taken the view that logistically um, that is something that we're just not prepared to undertake at the moment. Um, there's also the question of a seven day quarantine, as you said at the other, at, I presume at the Western Australian end, mm. um, and uh, the, cost, the costs and logistics of that to the commission as well. Um, what we've been planning on is that at some point the Western Australia border will open up similar ways to the rest of the country and we can properly take everyone we need to to take to Western Australia to have a, a proper public hearing. Mm, okay. Um, what... I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to think this through because just I... Just a couple I, more minutes to Senator oh, Steeljohn. I'll, well, we'll go around again, but I <laughs> have not finished my first block yet. Um, well, so Senator, we, we are we are time constrained, as you know, so you I, might need to I, put some questions on. Notice. I do. I'm also well schooled in the Senator Carr school of insisting on your right to finish your line of questioning. Um, so, Senator Carr might pull you to one side on that uh, point. I know. <laughs> I know, I know, but come on, I'll probably be uh, You know, it's about the same. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Look, I, I, I really, I get what you're saying, but I do not want us to get to a situation where it's six months out of the end of the commission um, and we haven't yet had a thing, a, a hearing there. Um, I'll be back to this line of questioning at, at estimates. Senator, we... if, I'm, if, I, if I may say, um, one of the interesting challenges for the commission, given it is a national commission, has been keeping an eye on all of the border restrictions across all of the country in the past two years and working out what we can and can't do in particular parts of the country. We keep a very regular eye on the border arrangements for WA uh, and as soon as they change in a way that works for us, um, we'll certainly be looking to, to travel to Western Australia. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, now, disabled people have, have, as I'm sure you're aware by now, uh, been been failed by institutions across Australia for, for many, many decades. Um, and there's quite a, a disgraceful history of state-sponsored institutions subjecting disabled people uh, to violence, abuse, exploitation and neglect. Um, has the Commission uh, had many disabled people uh, that have experienced these uh, phenomena um, 
uh, give evidence who, who kind of were subjected to them prior to, say, the 1990s? Oh, Senator, I think we would need to... You, are you talking public hearings, evidence uh, yeah, in public yeah, hearings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So both submissions and, and public hearings. My broader point goes to what we mm. might broadly term yep. historical instances of violence, exploitation, uh, abuse and neglect, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to what we might loosely term contemporary um, cases. In relation to the public hearings, I, I would need to take that on notice because I, I simply don't have the information in front of me, but we can certainly find that. If you, if you want to draw the line at 1990 and before and 1990 after, we can we can yep. certainly provide you with that information. In relation to submissions, I might just ask Ms Kerry if she has anything she can sure. add to that. Hi, Joanna Kerry, Assistant Secretary Engagement. Um, we certainly um, have had submissions and people attend private sessions um, in relation to experiences they've had that are historical in nature, including prior to the 1990s. Um, I don't have figures on that, Senator, and it may be, I, I would need to check with my team, but it may be quite difficult for us to come up with exact statistics on that. I say that because I don't believe it's part of our coding framework that would allow us to easily extract that information from our system. I um, and having received sort of well over three and a half thousand submissions now and conducted over 800 private sessions, so I'm sure you can appreciate a manual pull would be quite difficult for us. Of course. Could I just ask, maybe on notice, this might help us a little bit, um, would you be able to provide uh, how many uh, individuals over, how many disabled people um, over the age of 55 have given evidence to the Commission? Uh, we should be able to do that. I would just note that um, we rely on people to self-disclose. Of course. So to the, to the extent that they haven't provided us with this information, we wouldn't be able we to tell you. But in of terms course. of what people have reported, I can do that. And, and to the broader question, Mr Cronin, on historical cases, uh, are historical cases a, a, a thematic area the Commission is considering? Um, I wouldn't say the Commission is specifically looking at um, historical cases. We're, we're looking at all cases, essentially, yeah. historic, current, recent. Um, we, we aren't necessarily drawing a line in terms of historical cases, although I know what we're learning from our public hearings and also um, private sessions of submissions, that, that um, obviously historic cases of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation are appointed to the Commission in terms of the issues mm. that we need to be considering as part of our terms of reference. Uh, of course. The, the, maybe you can take it on notice that you might be using a different language set. Mm. What, I'm, what I'm looking for is whether you've considered uh, a, a hearing or hearings in relation to what is sometimes known as the post-deinstitutionalisation era of disability services versus uh, the 1990s period where deinstitutionalisation, so-called, sure. occurred. Sure. Yeah, well, I will take that on notice um, because I'm reasonably certain that um, although we may not have had a specific hearing on that particular issue, that theme has filtered through at least one <laughs> hearing I can think of and there's probably others as well. OK, thank you. Now, the final date for submissions to the Commission uh, is... Uh, is, I think it's the 31st of December 2022? That's correct. Um, noting that the final date for registrations for a private session uh, is the 30th of June 2022, is that correct? Yeah. That is correct. Um, what work is being done to advertise the private sessions? Uh, registration will end on the 30th of June. Ms Kerry, do you want to take that? So we've done a range of activities to date. Um, we did write out to all of the disability representative organisations to let them know, as well as other funded providers, including um, Blue Knot, who provide counselling services, Your Story Disability Legal Support, um, and DSS wrote out to all of the National Disability Advocacy Program providers that are funded to support the DRC to mm -hmm. make them aware. We did that about a week prior to the formal announcement. We've issued a media statement, we've advertised it on our social media channels um, as well as on our website. We are um, embarking on an advertising campaign that will um, further support sharing that information and those closing dates more broadly to the Australian community. 
Mm. Okay. Um, and can you tell me in that context then um, the, the duration of the waiting list currently for a private, uh, uh, in relation to private sessions? We and currently have how that. And tend to clear it. Sorry? How you intend to clear it? Sure. Um, we currently have 350 people actively waiting for a private session um, and pending cancellations, um, we, which are outside of our control, um, we expect that we'll be able to clear that in the next couple of, oh, probably three to four months, which will give us a clear period after registrations close to finish conducting private sessions for all people who wish to have one. Okay, excellent. Um, in February of 2021, it was reported that across all hearings, um, approximately 22.5% of witnesses were disabled people. Um, wondered if we could get an updated figure on that now. Not now. I mean, I mean, if you've got it, that'd be great. But I mean, as of your latest reported on on the area, uh, Senator, I do actually have that here. Oh, um, great. And the figure is, uh, well, hearings to date, of which we've had 20, um, the total number of wit witnesses um, who identify as uh, having a disability is 21.2%. So it's gone down since February? Uh, it may have gone down since February, but that is the number that, uh, that we have. But uh, as I think we've discussed previously, very much it is dependent on the types of hearings that we're having. Some hearings um, are very much framed around um, hearing the stories of people with disability. Um, other hearings contain um, sections where we're keen to hear particularly from government, um, from academics, from professionals. Um, we've had uh, many family members um, give evidence on behalf of people with disability at our hearings. So we have a range of, as well as advocates, I should say, have had um, um, a large proportion of our, our witness list as well. So it's spread across many groups, um, depending on the type of hearing that we're running and the type of evidence that we want to elicit from those hearings. Mm. And you still don't, uh, um, from my memory of our conversations about this previously, um, the Commission didn't have a target of percentages of witnesses that are disabled people still That's not correct. a no we and do you not still have don't have that target no okay um look in the interest of time i will circle back to that at the next estimate session i think um just a couple of questions for your fifth progress report um and i'll quote the figures directly so outlined 43 percent of people um who have registered for a private session um, are, are disabled people, uh, 41.3, apologies. Uh, what I couldn't find in the report was a breakdown of overall submissions. Um, so I wondered if you could outline for me what percentages of, uh, of uh, people who have made submissions identify as disabled people. Yes, I can do that, um, Senator. So 40% um, of our submissions have been received from people who identify as um, having a disability. Um, but again, I'd note that we do have quite a large number of people who provide their submissions um, without identifying information with them. Mm. Um, and what percentage of people who have had uh, uh, private sessions identify as disabled people? Uh, private sessions. Um, Uh, do you want people who have registered for a private session or people who have had a private session? Both would be useful. Both, yep. Um, people who have registered for a private session, it is 52.2%. Um, um, people who have had a private session is 63.9%. Um, um, obviously, we, we preference people with disability in our scheduling. Um, All right. Which is why that percentage is higher. Last two. To, to Senator Grogan, so could I ask you to wrap up? Yep. Yep. Um, one, one more minute, please. And I've been very generous for you, the time, as you know. You you absolutely have. I have two more questions, and then we then I'm done. Um, <laughs> I love that. One. Uh, you, you put me two, two. You put me too close to Senator Carr, uh, Chair. Um, no, the, I, we, we, 
<laughs> okay. I literally, uh, I literally have one minute, and I must go to Senator Grogan. Okay. So um, throughout the commission, there have been uh, some outreach to understand the experience of uh, First Nations children with a disability, particularly out of home care, which has been fantastic. Um, I wondered if you could, in my last question, uh, tell me if you've got any plans to bolster um, the number of submissions made by young people um, across the demographic board, people under 18, um, and also if you could clarify for me what is meant by, in the fifth progress report, uh, that planning is underway for engagement across Australia in 2022 so that more LGBTIQ people living with disability can share their experience with us. So. That's great. It's just a little bit vague, so if I could get a bit more information, that'd be fab. And also in relation to young people. You, and you're asking that on notice, Senator? No, no. If, that, if, if, if information, if you've got info on that, that'd be great. I think Ms Kerry can probably address yep. both those issues, Senator. Um, obviously, both LGBTQI and young people are priority cohorts within um, our terms of reference, and there are also priority cohorts within our community engagement strategy. Mm -hmm. So the team is currently working with um, a range of different organisations um, to plan some potential targeted engagements with both of those cohorts. Um, we've also held some targeted engagements to date with those cohorts. So um, that included one that we um, that we worked with CYDA on, Children mm. and Young People with Disability Australia, um, and spoke to a range of young people there, which was um, incredibly valuable. Um, and we've done similar um, with LGBTQI um, plus people as well, and we'll continue that work throughout 2022. Um, we do target the engagements quite tightly, um, and we look at a range of information and demographics to be able to, to I guess, prioritise where we go and what particular issues we want to explore with those groups as well. Um, I would also note that there, um, particularly, um, we pay a lot of attention to what we're getting from those cohorts in terms of submissions and private session requests as well, so we can map that quite efficiently um, to make sure that we're quite targeted in how we engage. Mm. Could you just take on notice for me if you have an LGBTIQ <laughs> and also a youth engagement strategy document? You know, like if you've actually written it down anyway. Uh, we don't have an engagement strategy document that um, specifically frames out for those particular cohorts. We do have our broader community engagement strategy that's on our website um, that we'd be happy to, to send you the link on. Um, what I can probably do is provide on notice what engagements we've undertaken to date with those cohorts and any future plans that we've got firmed up for them. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. I thank you very much, Senator Steele-John. Senator Grogan. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll try and be quite tasky here. Um, can I just check that you received a letter from um, People with a Disability Australia, an open letter? To do with the Omicron variant? Yes. Uh, yes, it, well, yes in the sense of it was an open letter published on their website, but was never actually um, provided, to you. provided to us. Okay. Um, I, I echo some of the issues um, that Senator Siljon has raised regarding the challenges that we're seeing uh, for people uh, with a disability following the uh, Omicron outbreak. Um, and uh, I will just take the moment to commend your interim report highlighting some of the shortfalls in the Morrison government's response to the pandemic for disabled Australians. Um, and we're keen to understand if you're not going to hold a further hearing, a particular hearing about the Omicron issue, which is what I took from your commentary to Senator Steelejohn, um, whether um, whether you're going to do anything else about that. You did say that hearings weren't the only way for you to address issues. Do you have a do you have a particular plan in place about dealing with these issues? And, and I just highlight um, that there are some really intense issues out there. Uh, yesterday we had a, um, a bunch of um, representatives from the Australian uh, Services Union and from the United Workers Union here um, talking us through some of the issues that they were seeing and the extreme difficulties they've found um, with workers just not, not having enough workers to go around, um, having people in residential scenarios who um, half of them have got 
um, Omicron and half of them are, are not infected and the workers not being able to manage because to fill up the shortfall, they're being sent agency workers who have the right to turn around and say they will not work in a facility where there's an infected person. And so the kind of circumstances they're having to deal with mm. and the terrible impact that that's then having both on them as workers trying to care for those people, but also on, on the people with a disability and the disruption to their care. Um, um, I, I'd, li I'd like to know if, if, if it's not a hearing, what, what else might there be, Mr Cronin? Yes, yeah, Senator, um, we've been hearing similar mm. stories. Um, and we're, the, the Commission and the Commission is particularly very conscious of the serious nature of those, those stories that we're hearing. Um, as I mentioned to Senator Steele, John, um, uh, a hearing isn't necessarily off the table, mm -hmm. um, but in the first instance, um, as I mentioned to, to Senator Steele, John, um, the Commissioners, uh, well, let me go back a step, Commissioners have been busy um, gathering a range of information and data to, um, I guess, establish um, the issues and the serious nature of those issues. Um, and the Commission will be issuing a statement very shortly um, in relation to what it sees in relation to the effect of the Omicron variant on people with disability. Okay, that's good. Um, and just one final question. Um, you mentioned that you're going to have uh, a hearing in April um, uh, for workers in disability services to get that perspective. Have, have you invited the unions to that meeting or is it, or no? Uh, it's a public hearing, I think, is the one you're referring to. Um, uh, it was the one that you mentioned yes. earlier, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suspect the witness list is still being prepared for that particular hearing. Mm. Um, I know at a one of our employment hearings last year, we did have union representation, as I recall. I'll need to check that, but I think that was the case. Mm. Um, uh, these particular hearings, um, well, let me just leave it there, I, I guess, and, and we'll let the team settle what the witness list is going to look like in terms of the themes thereafter or chasing. Mm. But um, uh, if it's appropriate to have that um, uh, union representation um, give evidence at that hearing, um, I suspect we would look to do that. But it may very much well depend on what the, the theme and the aim of the particular hearing is. Mm, indeed. Um, yeah, I would strongly urge you to consider that. They, they would be able to bring a cross range of um, workers into that environment and probably provide you with some pretty solid uh, material to assist you in your work. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Grogan. And that brings to a conclusion the committee's examination of the Royal Commission into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. Uh, Mr Crone and Ms Appleton and Ms Carey, thank you all very much for your time, for your hard work and for your evidence this evening. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senators. It's now my pleasure to call officers from the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions. Ms McNaughton. Good evening, Senator. Good uh, Sarah, evening. Come and come you're appearing uh, interstate via video conference. We can hear yes, you I loud am. and clear. Right. I've also got colleagues in Canberra with you and uh, another colleague in Melbourne by video link. Thank you so much. Do you have an opening statement? Thank you, Senator. Do you, you don't have an opening statement? No. Oh, thank you, Senator. The, the audio is a little bit dodgy, but we will, we will battle through. Uh, we will now go to questions from senators, and I give the call to Senator Patrick. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I just want to go to, firstly, Ms um, McNaughton, the prosecution of Richard Boyle. Um, yes. I just want, can you just give me uh, a, an update on where those proceedings are up to? Uh, before, um, before I ask 
I understand sub judice. Yeah, so okay. Yes, I understand. Before uh, Ms McNaughton, you answer your question, just a reminder that we are running a very tight ship on sub judice and the convention. So any matters that relate to any current proceedings. Uh, Chair, I just, that I, that's not quite correct. The, the, it, you, you're not prevented from talking about court cases. You are prevented by the standing orders from substantially prejudicing prejudic prejudic a, a case, not, a, not talking about a case. No, that was not what, that's not what the um, position is, and that's not no, what I've No, it is I've what the position this. is, and if we need to call no, the no. clerk to get that... No, no, sorry, Senator I'm Patrick. I'm happy to give you the Heffernan advice on that. No, so, sorry, Senator, you misunderstood what I'm saying. Um, the the position is not that senators cannot reference court cases. The position is that questions may, which may involve a substantial danger of prejudice to proceedings, as I indicated in my opening mm. statement this morning, before a court uh, can, of course, um, be sub judice, and that's why I'm just asking all senators to be very aware of the convention. And, I, and everyone has been uh, excellent in that regard, in, including you, Senator Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Ms. McNaughton. Please, um, please go ahead. So, just Thank the you, status Senator. of the proceedings. For an update is that what you're yeah, asking, just Senator? The status of the proceedings. Certainly, the matter is listed for a 21-day trial, which will is due to commence on the 4th of October this year. But there's also a pre-trial hearing listed on the 25th of July, 2022, for five days. And that pre-trial hearing deals with uh, issues arising under or which may arise under the Public Interest Disclosure Act. Okay, thank you. Um, they're open proceedings, aren't they? Um, yes, I understand they are, but there are suppression orders in place in respect of affected taxpayers' business and financial information. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ball was charged on the 4th of January 2019. Oh, I think that's right. Um, I'm just wondering, the, this is taking a long time, and uh, uh, you know, just in terms of fairness on, on a defendant, um, do you consider the time frame unusual, Ms. McNaughton? Actually, no. So, Senator? So, so a three-year criminal trial is not unusual? Well, it just depends on the nature of the matter, um, the fact that we've had delays as a result of um, the pandemic and the like. Matters, unfortunately, do take a long time to get through the court system for a variety of reasons. So I wouldn't say it's out of, out of the range of normal, no. OK, thank you. I might just move to the prosecution of Bernard Cleary. Um, Yes. And, Chair, it might be helpful because there's kind of two intersecting issues in relation to this particular trial. One relates to the closure of the court under the NSI Act, which has been conducted by the Attorney General, and the, the other is the prosecution of Mr Kaliri in respect to the criminal matter. It might be helpful to have someone from the Attorney that might be, the Attorney's Department might be familiar with this. Um, and in that regard, I'm, I wonder if the attorney could give me the total cost that has been expended in that matter for the Commonwealth. I know there's a difference between the, pro, the Director of Public Prosecution yep. and also sure the, uh, uh, the Attorney-General. Oh, we do have the costs. Senator, can you just repeat your question? Just, just the total costs for the Commonwealth, so that would include the DPP and uh, the Attorney, the Attorney General's department in relation to uh, Regina versus Kaliri. Um, uh, Senator, the costs I have got don't go to internal agency costs, but. Sure. Um, I think we provided them earlier as well. I've got the amounts um, for, that include uh, external legal costs that have been incurred. Um, and the total Commonwealth external legal costs 
uh, in the Cleary and Witness K matters, uh, $4,232,569.50. Wow. It's certainly going up. Um, the last time I think we got an answer was three and a half million. And I should say that that says at 31 January. Sure. Thank you. Now, it's true that because this is a criminal matter, there won't be any cost recovery in the event, whichever way the matter falls. Is that right? That's um, correct. Thank you. Um, these proceedings have gone, managed to get to the High Court. I believe there's an application for special leave. Um, it's not really related to, to a criminal matter. C can someone give me uh, an idea of what the Commonwealth is doing in respect of that? What, what are the, what's the Commonwealth seeking from the High Court? Um, so the issue in the High Court is about uh, uh, the publication of the judgment of the ACT, ACT Supreme Court, um, Court of Appeal, um, and uh, uh, see, and the issues with national security information in that judgment. Sure. Now, now is it quite unusual? I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen the executive seek to suppress a judicial officer in terms of a judgment, or am I wrong? Is that is, is there past... I can't, I can't comment on that, Senator. Okay. Mr. G, do you mind just removing your mask, if that is okay? It does make it yes, easier. Just fine. Easier Thanks. to understand you. Thank you. The attorney, it does seem a little bit extraordinary that the executive is seeking to censor a judgment of the, you know, particularly of a superior court, um, the, you know, the highest court in the ACT. Senator, what we're seeking from the High Court is obviously the High Court to consider the application of the NSI Act and what would be appropriate in the circumstances, and it will be a matter for that court to determine. Will the, will the um, attorneys seek to close the High Court in relation to this matter? Uh, Senator, I think those issues are still being worked through about okay. how that matter might proceed. Thank you. we we'll go back to Ms McNaughton. Um, now, to, to satisfy the chair, um, I've actually read through all of the judgments. Um, I think there's 10 of them from, me from memory in respect of uh, uh, Justice, Justice Mossop's rulings. So there's lots and lots of information in the public domain uh, here. And indeed, I have sought affidavits from the court. Uh, the Commonwealth DPP were part of those proceedings uh, so would be aware that I've done so. Um, Senator Patrick, can I just stop you there? The test of sub judice is not whether this information is in the public domain. So it concerns questions which may involve a substantial danger of prejudice to proceedings, and merely discussing those matters in this forum uh, may give rise sure. to such prejudice. So. I would Ms. again. Is a really it, it actually. So. Uh, yes, I know she's. Mm. Uh, I understand she's very experienced, mm. but I'm the chair of this committee, sure. and I am exercising a great deal of caution when it comes to sub judice, and therefore I would ask you to please exercise the oh. same degree of caution. If you wish mm. to, uh, as I say, my responsibilities extend to chairing this committee. So sure. I'd be most grateful if you could um, be very judicious in sure. on this matter. Thank you. Um, I might just sort of give a, a little example of where I'm trying to get to, so, so to, to ease everyone's concern. If, if, I, if someone were charged with DUI, uh, driving under the influence, one would expect the prosecutor to obviously tender evidence related to um, the, the conduct of the person, but there would be preliminary um, evidence that would need to be filed, um, things like a calibration certificate for the um, um, alcohol um, measuring device. Is that, is that fair to say? That, that, that's how you would typically do that? You'd front up to the court and say, it's calibrated, well, it was tested prior to going out and being used, and then Mr X or Mrs X blew you know, 0.5 or whatever it is. There's some preliminary... It matters that are prosecuted by my office, uh, Senator, so I don't quite know how I can assist you. I, I was just trying to give an example. So in this particular instance, this matter involves 
um, uh, and the charges are, are well known, uh, you know, revealing an operation. Uh, my question to you, and this is the only question, I'm, this is my final question to you, and then I'll come back to the, the department um, or the attorney. Are you satisfied in the conduct of these, this prosecution that um, all of the approvals necessary under the Intelligence Services Act were met. It's a bit like saying, was, was the uh, alcohol measuring device calibrated? It's a preliminary. A, a, a brief of evidence has been served in this matter um, and it will proceed in the way um, that all matters that we have uh, decided to commence will proceed. And yes, we are satisfied that there is a sufficient level of evidence according to the prosecution policy of the Commonwealth to bring the proceedings. Senator Patrick, I am, go we are at 10 minutes and I am going to share the call because Senator Scar has indicated he has a few questions. I can return to you. Okay, uh, you. So I'm just going to give the call to Senator Scar. Ms McNaughton, I want to ask some questions about what's been referred to as the ANZ Bank criminal cartel case. Yes. Could you explain to me the circumstances which led to the CDPP withdrawing or discontinuing proceedings in that case? Thank you, Senator, for your question. Um, the, as with all matters that my office uh, prosecutes, they're always under constant review as to whether they continue to meet the prosecution policy of the Commonwealth. And um, in this case, following a further careful review of the evidence and consideration of detailed submissions received from solicitors acting for the accused, we concluded there were no longer reasonable prospects of conviction for the charges before the court. And so that resulted in um, the decision to decline to proceed further. Do you have any observations or reflections in relation to how the CDPP managed that case? We um, dealt with it uh, according to the, the principles that we deal with all cases and, uh, um, and we, um, as I said, applied the prosecution policy at every stage and, and that was the determination we made. I have no further reflection. You, so do you have any reflection on the fact that um, the CDPP was ordered to file its indictment for a third time during the course of the proceedings? They are very complicated provisions and uh, it's, it's unsurprising in some ways that uh, it takes a bit of work for these highly complex provisions to precisely calibrate the indictment. Um, so. Uh, in, in areas where there are novel and complex provisions, sometimes that does that can occur. Is it correct that the judge hearing the case described it at one stage as a complete schmozzle? He didn't describe the case as a complete schmozzle, as I understood uh, his honour Justice Wigney. As I understood it, he was uh, making an observation in relation to um, the, in, the indictment and the number of times the indictment had been um, it. Doesn't the indictment in fact go to the heart of the case and the judge was actually saying three years after the um, proceedings had been launched, he was reflecting on the fact that the indictment, if you want to call it the indictment, was a complete schmozzle and he expressed his dissatisfaction um, in essence that the proceeding was in that situation so long after the proceeding had been instituted? As I indicated, uh, Senator, th and thank you for your question, um, he didn't say that the um, whole proceeding was a schmozzle. He was commenting on the indictment, and in the course of commenting on the indictment, he also made a comment that, um, and these are not the precise words, but words to the effect that it was hardly surprising given the difficulty in the wording of the legislation itself. So there's a bit of context around it, but I don't resolve from the fact that he did make those ob observations. So Ms McNaughton, I'm, I'm trying to be um, 
uh, use a velvet glove in this regard. Um, there have been comments made by a number of the people who were the subject of these criminal proceedings during the course of the week about the devastating impact it's had on their professional lives, that they've been in a state of um, uh, suspended animation, as it were, from a professional perspective for a number of years. You have a situation where the, as I read the, the judge's remarks, you can, um, you can characterise it as you, as you like, but certainly there's no suggestion that the words complete schmozzle um, were not used in the context of this case. You had case, the case was discontinued against the ANZ and one of its senior executives. Then we get to a situation where it was discontinued against the other defendants. I'm giving you the opportunity to provide some objective reflections on whether or not there are any learnings coming out of this for the benefit of the CDPP. Because to be frank, as a senator looking at this and looking, and I haven't asked you how much has been spent in relation to these proceedings, it does raise a number of fundamental questions in my, my mind. Um, what, what reflections does the CDPP have in relation to the conduct of this case? Are you conducting any review, any debrief? Are you bringing in a third party, a senior counsel, to look at the conduct of the case to at least get some learnings from it? Thank you for your question, Senator. Indeed, senior counsel of, of uh, various uh, numbers in relation to both competition and, and crime have been involved in the prosecution side of the proceedings for a number of years. As to any learnings or review, certainly we will be uh, looking closely at, at uh, how this progressed um, and, uh, and certainly we will try and uh, work out what learnings we can have from the conduct of the matter. But from your perspective, you, you you, you're not in a position to offer us any reflections that, gee, we could have done a better job on this, or uh, maybe there's some things we need to seriously consider in relation to this case, because uh, I find that surprising, to be frank, Ms McNaughton. We'll be looking closely at it. As you'd be aware, Senator, the uh, matter only concluded late last week, and uh, we will be certainly uh, looking at the matter and what occurred in the course of the matter, uh, looking at all the various uh, uh, inputs that we've had from very experienced counsel along the way, um, and our and our own internal um, involvement, and we will certainly be looking at all of that, and uh, and seeking to take learnings from it certainly. And will you be making those learnings public? Will you be providing any? Uh, transparency to the public in relation to a case which I assume has cost millions of dollars of taxpayers' money and has, um, has led to this um, situation where it's simply discontinued after the original proceedings were commenced in June 2018, a highly complicated case which no doubt has cost taxpayers millions of dollars. Will you be providing any transparency with respect to those learnings and reflections after you have a reasonable period of time to undertake that process? Well, the external costs to date that we've spent are not in the millions, but 1.26 million thereabouts. Um, and uh, as appropriate, we will be reflecting on, on the matter. And I, uh, just to put some context around it, this is not the only case that my office, indeed other prosecutors' offices, discontinue before finality. It is an appropriate and healthy indication of the prosecution policy of the Commonwealth and that being properly reviewed at every stage. So we will see if there is anything that is um, highly exceptional or unusual in the way that this occurred. But like all the matters we prosecute, we do them according to the prosecution policy of the Commonwealth. Clearly this was um, a, a matter that has attracted um, some attention amongst some of the community. And uh, I understand the interest in it by some of a portion of the community that's um, affected. But the, the way we approached it was the, a, a standard and regular way that we approach all our cases. 
So you referred to the external costs of $1.26 million. Do you have a record of the internal costs? It's hard for us to calibrate our internal costs given that our people do work across more than one matter. So that, that's, that's a difficult um, calculation for us to make that's, that's particularly useful. Okay. All right. Well, look, I, uh, can I just uh, uh, finally, I'll, I'll leave this question on notice perhaps for you, and that is um, uh, whether or not, and I'll give you an opportunity to reflect on it perhaps, but uh, whether or not the CDPP is perhaps going to uh, make a more fulsome statement at the appropriate time with its reflections and observations uh, in relation to the case and, and provide it um, uh, in a public forum for, uh, uh, for the public who have a legitimate interest in this case to reflect upon. Thank and I leave you with Senator that Scott. question on notice, Ms McNaughton. Yes, thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. Before I return to Senator Patrick, I just wanted to put on the record uh, the statement by the ACCC in relation to this matter on the 11th of February 2022, uh, headed CDPP withdraws charges in bank criminal cartel case. Uh, look, I guess one of the most relevant paragraphs is this, and, and the ACCC states, while there can be challenges involved in bringing criminal cartel prosecutions, particularly due to the complexity of the cartel laws, we will continue our efforts to deter, detect and dismantle cartels and will continue to refer serious cartel conduct to the CDPP for its consideration. That is our role and we will continue to fulfil it, even though not all briefs of evidence given to the CDPP will result in the laying of charges or convictions. Well, and, the ACCC, a job next time, Chair. and the ACCC did reference the fact that uh, there have been five successful criminal prosecutions of cartel conduct affecting Australian consumers following ACCC investigations and CDPP prosecution under criminal cartel laws. Uh, and that has resulted in penalties totalling $83.5 million. So you, I just wanted to add a little bit of context to that issue. Uh, I will now hand over to Senator Patrick. Thank you. So just going back to my question, so I don't think you answered it. You answered a slightly different question, so I'll just ask it again. Are you satisfied that approvals in relation to the operation that was carried out met the requirements of the legislation, the intelligence services legislation? Uh, and, this, and this is a question, a senator asking a prosecutor about their um, role. Uh, it's an oversight, that's a genuine oversight question. Are you satisfied? Thank you, Senator. Um, all I can indicate in terms of detail is that in bringing the case, we are satisfied to a prima facie and a reasonable prospect of conviction level that all the elements are satisfied. So I'm trying to avoid a, com a complete schmozzle here where we head down a pathway and um, and we don't <laughs> sorry. We haven't, and we haven't we're just, done the Sorry, we're, we're having a giggle over the use of that the word schmozzle, but Sorry, Senator. Patrick. I always benefit from Senator Scar's contributions to the committee. Um, yeah, that we don't head down a pathway without having done the preliminaries properly, and that's the question I'm asking you. It's the only question I'm going to ask you about about this matter. Senator, the prosecution policy of the Commonwealth requires there to be a prima facie case, a reasonable prospect of conviction, and that the the uh, prosecution is in the public interest. Yes, we are satisfied, and uh, that. The, that test has been met. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go. I'll switch back to the attorney now, and I might ask the chair to permit me to table a document which I provided to the secretariat. It's a statement that was made by the uh, in the Parliament of Timor Leste. Uh, to give you some comfort, I tabled this in the Senate with the permission of uh, the whips, including Senator Dean Smith, uh, and I did undertake. To, because there was only a rough translation, uh, to, uh, to get a, a, an official translation of the, what was tabled in their parliament. Uh, Senator, Senator Patrick. I can. Um, this is a, a committee which makes decisions on its quite independent sure. from any other, any other forum. Just trying to give you some comfort. And while that might give me some comfort, we need to assess the document on its merits 
And this does seem to go very much to the heart of the substantive issues in the case. And I would say to you that this on its phone, I'm looking, I'm reading it very, very quickly, that this is well, not been, an appropriate document to, to be tabled. a couple of hours. just said that this has already been tabled in the Senate. Yes, I understand that, but I have not read the document. Uh, Senator Carr does seem to go to the substantive yeah, issues but, but in the case. It's already been tabled in the Senate. No, that, uh, this committee makes decisions uh, on its own merits in, in terms of the information which comes up for our Senate. committee. You're trying no, it's to not about the Senate. The, you're trying no. to censor the Timor-Leste Parliament, are you? Is that what you're trying to do? No. What there, I'm there, there might be, well, there may Senate, well be Senator some international Patrick, relations issues associated Senator with this. Senator Patrick, uh, what I'm doing is this went um, to the, uh, this raising went concern, excuse me, Senator Patrick, I am raising concerns about matters which may prejudice but you're out a of your trial depth, okay? currently before the court. Now, excuse me, please do not reflect on me as chair. Now, it's open. You're obsessed I, with this issue. We've got professional people in front of the table here. This, what this I'm obsessed says, with an issue about making sure that we don't prejudice trials that are currently. Dr. Kaliri yes, I am. I, it's a very important issue. For his contribution to the revelation. Please of the do Australian not go Secret to the substantive issues in relation to this matter, Senator, for Senator Patrick. Why tapping the East Timor Senator Patrick, could you please not, Senator Patrick? Sorry, during the oil Senator Patrick, you don't have the call, down. and I'm going to ask you to desist from okay, raising these matters. matters. Okay, let me read some reported facts from the case. Senator Patrick, we're going to suspend this hearing. Uh, we will go to a private meeting. Uh, the committee, the committee is now in session. Uh, I just want to update all those present. We have just had a private meeting in relation to the document that Senator Patrick was seeking to table. Uh, the committee has made a decision to defer its consideration um, of the tabling of this document until the committee can obtain further advice. Uh, we have discussed the nature of the questions that Senator Patrick wishes to raise, and he has assured us that it does not go to the substantive issues in relation to the case. Uh, I realise I am exercising a great deal of care in these matters. Senator Patrick has indicated that this document has been largely, a very largely similar document being tabled in the Senate, but in uh, being judicious in relation to these matters, uh, we have deferred our consideration as to the tabling of this document until we can get further advice. So thank you very much, Senator thank Patrick, you. for your cooperation so, on this matter, and I will give the call to you. Thank you. Mr McNaughton, um, are you aware that in the, in the Timor Parliament last week, a document was tabled that basically expressed, well, it expressed a solidarity to, towards Mr Kaliri in relation to the, these prosecutions? And you know, it, it very carefully danced around the idea that they don't want to interfere with the judicial proceedings in another country. But it's clear that the Timorese are quite disturbed by the prosecution. And this, this is a question that goes to public interest, which is an executive decision uh, made by you. I'm just wondering if you're aware of, of, of those, of, of, of what happened in the parliament last week, in the Timor-Leste parliament last week. Uh, thank you, Senator. Not until you mentioned Sorry, it. Sorry, we're just having some issues hearing. Are the microphones, they seem to be down. Oh, that's much better. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Senator. Not until you mentioned it, no. Can I ask you to, um, uh, I might send you a copy. Uh, it might get to you through the committee first. Um, I presume at any point in time, you can look at a, a prosecution and decide to abandon it on, on um, public policy grounds. Is that, is that a possibility? That's interest. Sorry? Well, as, as you're aware, I think, Senator, um, yes, there are, um, in the prosecution policy of the Commonwealth, there are, uh, non there's a non-exhaustive list of public interest factors mentioned there. And yes, we do constantly review our matters as to whether or not uh, other matters might come to our attention that would mean that we'd come to a different view on uh, uh, public policy, for instance, yes. 
Now, in relation to this, uh, Senator Carr asked some questions, I think it was two estimates ago, really trying to canvass whether you had looked at, yeah, whether, whether or not you'd canvassed um, that aspect of this before the prosecution was com had commenced. And the answer was, in essence, no. It wasn't something that was considered. Um, so it's in that vein I ask you to perhaps have a look at that and maybe take, take that on notice. Um, as to whether that changes your view uh, in respect of uh, your, the decision made thus far to prosecute. So you, you, it, well, I glean from that, Senator, that you'd be sending me something and you'd like to, me to take that into account. Yes, and perhaps respond no. to the committee uh, as to your views in respect of um, the public interest decision that you had to make or, or that you so, and make this, this is a statement. Um, Senator Patrick, just in relation to the provision of that document, it probably would be better for that to come through the committee. Well, you, uh, because don't, want it wouldn't... you don't want to own the document. You don't want it to be tabled or be in the possession of the committee. And now, you want, now you're trying to... No, no, I'm just directly. indicating that that would not be you providing the document to um, well, in, the CDPP in, in would, not the, be, mm. would not be would not be an act on behalf of the committee but sure. let's just Understood. let's just consider the document which we are we, which we will do in, as soon as we possibly can and yeah. then we'll have some more clarity about that yeah and if, if we if you decide to allow it to be tabled then i would of course let the committee send that to absolutely to, thank a thanks senator patrick but i reserve my rights if you don't but if it. not you've got the one yeah. that's tabled in the senate already no, i do actually that's yes true. that's exactly right <laughs> that's senator true. patrick so you've okay, got so various I'm, options up your sleeve so but i'm just trying to make it clear that um where we are at the current point in time okay so attorney um my next question is to you um my understanding is this prosecution requires your permission so it it, the provisions that are relevant in this matter require the attorney's consent, but that consent was given by the then Attorney General. Well, thank you, sure. um, and now it is a matter that is with the Commonwealth Director of Prosecution, Public Prosecution. The then Attorney General, Mr. Porter, just to be That's clear. Right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, but there's nothing that stops the, uh, fr stops the attorney from withdrawing that consent. Uh, that would not be uh, the process. So there is a power to discontinue prosecutions, um, but I think as the Attorney-General had well, discussed earlier, mm -hmm. um, it has never been exercised since established um, and uh, would be exceptional. Um, and uh, the CDPP operates as an independent agency making its decisions about continuing prosecutions. Okay, so let's just... I just want to go sideways here then. The Attorney General, again, Christian Porter, um, issued a Section 37 certificate to censor the Auditor General. Um, the uh, new Attorney General, um, Senator Cash, has withdrawn that. So, sorry, to censor the Auditor General, did you say? It's the Auditor General, that's correct. Amazingly, Christian Porter, censored an order to general's In report. relation to this matter? No, completely different matter. Completely different matter. Oh, okay, so I, I needed and to clarify what we were talking about. Sure. So, and, and that act doesn't talk about, you know, a withdrawing or modifying. Um, Senator, this is a different situation where criminal proceedings have now commenced. Mm -hmm. So that consent has been uh, given at a point in mm -hmm. time. The proceedings have now been commenced mm -hmm. by the CDPP. The legislative mechanism in this matter is an exceptional power to discontinue prosecutions, okay. but that has never been sure. used. Well, just because it's never been used doesn't mean, again, that, uh, that, that, that it can't be used. And it's given to the attorney by the parliament because the attorney is the ultimate person responsible to the parliament for prosecutions. So uh, I'll go to the attorney. Um, this. This issue clearly raises um, concerns in Timor-Leste. A friend of Australia's, or you know, we, we haven't treated them like a friend, but they are a friend now. Um, international relations may well not be in the bailiwick of, of the, um, of the uh, Director of Public Prosecutions, but certainly would be in your um, sphere of, of, uh, uh, you know, of exercise of power. Uh, noting that 
and you'll have to take it on face value or go and have a look at what was tabled in the Senate. Noting that the Timorese are incensed about this prosecution uh, and public interest is something that um, could bring about the exercise of, a, of that power that you have, is that something you will consider or will you simply ignore the Timor-Leste government? Parliament, I might uh, say. Well, again, Chair, I am aware, obviously, now through your conversations um, of the document that you have referred to, but as the Director has stated, and Chair, as you have also stated, the legal proceedings remain on foot. That was a decision by the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions, and Chair, it would not be a pro I know what you're, you're trying to do, unfortunately, Senator Patrick, and you have tried this at at previous Senate estimates hearings, it would not be appropriate to comment any further on the matter. This goes to a decision to prosecute that is not a judicial decision. There's, that's, not, that's not something the judiciary do, something the executive does. So you can't suggest that that's subjudicy. That doesn't make any sense. Senator, I, I think as the issue has arisen at previous estimates, Correct. any commentary about issues relating to the public interest in proceeding um, and any of those matters in detail um, risk prejudicing criminal proceedings. Well, you know what? I'm actually concerned about our relationship with, with Timor-Leste. And I'm quite entitled to be concerned about that relationship. I've put an affidavit on in the AAT from a uh, learned professor who, ha who uh, has, has uh, uh, deposed that the spying operation that took place in 2004 has caused the um, Timor-Leste government to, to look more favourably at relations with China. That's of considerable concern. Now, I look at the, the argument in this particular matter before Justice Mossop. One of the reasons that you, I mean, you're adopting a neither confirmed nor denied. Senator pa Patrick, I, I'm just going to interrupt you here. I don't know what you're about to say, but I well, am concerned. Well, you can wait and hear what I've got to say. I'm not going to be silenced by you, Chair. I'm not going to be silenced by you. You don't have a role of censoring me. Uh, excuse okay? me. If I breach a standing order. Excuse Fine. me, uh, Senator Patrick. This not, is not I'm, a question of silence. This is a question of asking you to comply with a very important convention. And uh, I am complying with And it. I'm just asking you well, to exercise a great deal of care again and again and so again, that okay? you don't stray into the substantive issues in relation to this case. I'm talking about relations with Timor Leste, this is a fairly significant matter. I'm talking about, yes, I'm I'm talking happy. about the, the, the effect of this prosecution. Yes, I'm happy for you to ask about that, but not in asking. relation to the substantive allegations that's which are before the court, please. Well, all, anyone who wants to go and look at this can simply go and have a look at some of the reported facts in the case that are being discussed in the affidavits. You know, everyone says this operation didn't take place. Yes, can I just remind That's you, though, that just because, because something's call. in the public domain doesn't mean that it's, it's not prejudicial. It's a bizarre call, and I'll tell you why. Um, the, uh, the operation, uh, the, the fact that the operation took place is confirmed by the conduct of both countries post-event. Senator Patrick, do you have is, a question? And well, I'm sorry, it I, is now 11 o'clock, so I'm just trying to obviously wrap up the uh, proceedings for today. Uh, very conscious of time, so do you think you could move to your question, well, please? Unfortunately, Chair, you've obstructed me all of the way and it's chewed up a lot of time. Okay, so... Well, I'm, that is a reflection on the Chair. I have not obstructed you. I have tried to deal with a very difficult issue and to give you as much scope as I possibly can as chair of this committee. So please, if you could just these, move to your questions. I, know these and I am trying to work very hard government. with you, um, Senator I know, Patrick. You know, there are 60,000 Timorese died supporting us uh, in World War II. And what do, we go, what do we do? We went and stole their oil, the thing that was going to bring them out of poverty. Senator right, Patrick, really, really, could I... They thought we were their friends. Senator Patrick, could I ask you to um, move to your question because we are going to need to finish uh, for this evening, please. Okay, so uh, this goes to the attorney. With the knowledge that I've provided you, and I'm happy again to do it by way of letter or simply referring you to what was tabled in the Senate, uh, with this new information, um, noting the sensitivities of the Parliament of Timor-Leste, 
are you inclined to reconsider your position or it doesn't matter what they, what they think? Uh, well, again, Chair, as the Director has noted, the legal proceedings do remain on foot and so that's would a not no. be You're going to ignore the team or their state So, Senator Patrick, further. could you allow the Minister for complete her answer, oh, I've completed please. my answer. It would not be appropriate for me to comment on this matter okay. any further. OK, well, let's... let's Senator that, Patrick, we are, now over, we are now is over 11 o'clock. We are going claim? to have to complete... Well, uh, the I might invoke the today. standing order 26.4, which means we'll have to end up having a spillover. So just give me a couple more minutes. So you need Are a couple... You, I've asked you the question... Uh, and Chair, just, just to get an indication... Question. I've answered the question. Uh, Senator Patrick, just to get an indication... No, you said time. it's not appropriate. That's Senator not Patrick, public interest immunity. So, Senator Patrick, Senator? can I just ask you to pause? Just you're looking for a couple sure. more minutes. Is yeah, it? that's all. Okay, thank you. I, we're trying to work... I no, know I this is difficult. I know you. this is something that... But Senator Patrick, you, but as you and I have previously discussed, if given the additional information that you have now referred to tonight, you are more than welcome to write to me. Okay. I will do that. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very Chair. much, Senator Patrick. And I would like to thank the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions and uh, um, officer, all of the officers, of course, from the Attorney General's Department for uh, attending this evening for your evidence. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Uh, that now does conclude today's proceedings. I'd like to thank the Minister and the departmental officers for their attendance and Hansar Broadcasting and the Secretariat staff. I'd like to move a motion that we accept table documents received during the day. All those in favour? Yeah. All those against? Yes, that doesn't include the most recent document that was handed to the committee by Senator Patrick, just to be very clear. Uh, all those in favour? All those against that motion is carried. Senators are reminded that written questions on notice should be provided to the Secretariat by 5pm Friday the 25th of February 2022. Thank you again. The hearing is adjourned.